a German officer in occupied Paris European Perspective as a series in social thought and cultural criticism facsimile page from the first Paris Journal, for the 5th of July 1942 forward leads Neiman Murray's bare traits of an inverse causality. The world, as an effect, resembles a tree with a thousand branches, but as memory it leads downwards into the tangled network of the roots. When I confront memories, it often seems like gathering a bundle of seaweed from the ocean, the tiny bit visible from afar, when slowly dragged up into the light, reveals an extensive system of filaments. Ernst Jundier, a German officer in occupied Paris, the 5th of July 1942 First Paris Journal 1941 Sars Pateries. The 18th of February 1941 arrived before dawn at the railroad freight yard in Avesnes, where I was jolted out of a deep sleep. This made me aware of a beautiful dream, I was both a child and a grown man traveling along my old route to school from Wonstorf to Rehberg, a trip we always took by narrow gauge railroad. I got out in Winsler and followed the tracks on foot. It was night for in the area around my father's house I could see shots being fired, high and bright, through the darkness. But at the same time, it was also day, and to my left the fields were bathed in sunshine. One of them was covered with green seedlings, and I could see my mother waiting there, a magnificent young woman. I sat down beside her, and when I got tired, she picked up the edge of the field like a green blanket and pulled it over us. The dream image made me very happy and warmed me for a long time afterward while I stood on the cold loading ramp and supervised the work. March to Sarspiteries, billeted there. I was assigned to two old ladies. One was 82 years old and had already seen three wars. I was able to contribute a bit of sausage to their evening meal, but it was still little better than meager. It consisted essentially of three large potatoes that had stood on the stovetop under a clay dome. This little device was called an E2 foyer, probably because the food inside is steamed by closing off its air supply. Sarspiteries, the 20th of February 1941 strolled near the railroad station. In the ceramics factory, I inquired about the source of the clay that gave the town its reputation. A little beyond the tracks, I reached the pits and saw that these had been excavated from the lovely brown and white sand. I did not discover any of the fossils I was hoping to find. At the bottom of one old abandoned excavation, there were puddles that must occasionally flood with water. There I came upon willows growing at the bottom of one of the pits, taller than a man and covered with tiny, hairy roots. These sprouted like moss from the trunk and branches a nice example demonstrating that each individual part of a plant can reproduce others. The whole organism is suffused with concentrated powers of generation. We humans have lost this art, and once our cultures display leaves and blossoms, we will never again see roots. Yet, when danger mounts in moments of sacrifice, we send out different, more spiritual organs, aerial roots, into the void naturally at the expense of individual lives. All of us benefit from this new growth. As I walked back, a storm of heavy wet snow dappled the landscape. Yet in the gardens, I could still see hazel and laurel blossoms covering the bare branches like swollen lilac blooms. In protected places, I noticed clusters of snowdrops. These seem quite early, especially after the harsh winter. Here they are called Fils de Saint Joseph, Saint Joseph's flowers, whose day is celebrated on the 19th of March. Sarspiteries, the 21st of February 1941. During my early morning sleep, I was in a little pharmacy where I was buying various things. Then Rem woke me up. Before my eyes were open, I briefly noticed a paper bag labeled Braunschweiger rubber cement. It is always strange how we focus on such details. Currently reading Ray Ain, Queen, by Julius, Wreck Jules, Lermina, a book lent to me by the lady who owns my living quarters, it rather amusingly describes the factionalism around 1815 in the style of the Three Musketeers. 
Here you come across passages like the following that surpass the quality of the popular novel, there is something childlike to be found in every conspirator. I can confirm that judgment from personal experience. Sarspiter is, the 22nd of February 1941 dozed in the early morning hours and pondered exotic books like D.J. Hymnist A. Roten Mears, The Secrets of the Red Sea, by Henry de Monfred. The work is bathed in the gleam of coral and mother of pearl and the delicate breath of the sea. Also pondered Merbs Le Jardin des Supplices, The Garden of Torments. This garden, with its paths paved in red brick dust, is filled with green vegetation and great masses of blazing peonies. It draws its luxuriance from the countless corpses of coolies who created it under conditions of murderous toil and have mouldered anonymously in its depths. This book deserves praise for clearly delineating the beauty and savagery of the world, as the two forces whose combination and interplay remind us of sea monsters. Veiled in iridescence, these camouflage the terrifying dangers of their weaponry with alluring hues. In such intense coalescing of hells and heavens, the eye cannot differentiate the details of desire and suffering any more than it can the tangled chaos of a jungle island. Here our planet reveals a most incredible drama to our spirit. Then about Wagner, who appeared to me in a new, more meaningful light for our age. I thought I spotted the error of Baudelaire, who possessed an authentic relationship to the ancient, eternal verities. Thoughts about the mighty mind of the dramatist who breathes artificial breath into past ages and dead cultures so that they move like corpses we can quote. A sorcerer of the highest order who conjures with real blood at the gates of the underworld. One things assume colors that make it hard for even the sharpest eye to distinguish truth from illusion. The actor steps into reality, becomes a historical person, achieves triumphs, garners laurels as green as real ones. What good does it do to contradict or debate with him? He has arrived because his time has come. In this alone lies his guilt which runs deeper than any guilt based on individual action. Art as a hothouse of past ages, it is like a promenade through winter gardens or salons where palm trees bloom. It is hard to take issue with this, for the terrors of destruction are so great, so horrifying, that their will to rescue a single shade is all too understandable. Nietzsche presents a contrast that stands and falls in wintry tempests. These are the exemplars that our youth, like Heracles, beheld at the crossroads. The case of Nietzsche contra Wagner too reminds me of those little toy houses we used to have with their different figures that would emerge depending on the weather conditions. One little figure would stand outside and forecast the weather, prophetically correct but out of step with the moment. The other showed the prevailing climate conditions, whether or not signs of a downturn could be sensed. For that reason, this figure waits in safety, away from the bright light. And yet they both were attached to one and the same little strip of wood fashioned by the carver of the little weather house. St. Michel, the 24th of February 1941 departed from Sarspiteries, in particular from my 82-year-old maiden lady, whom I thanked before dawn while she was still in bed. Then marched to new quarters near St. Michel at first in a light frost and then through damp snow. The numerous destroyed or abandoned houses make the town a forbidding place. A tank juts out of the little river that flows through it. Myths are already being created, people say the driver plunged off the bridge to deprive the Germans of their prize. Wherever the inhabitants have moved back again, they have attached strips of white linen to the doors of their houses to signal their presence. They give an impression of being poorer and more famished than the people of Sarspateries. Swarms of children with bare legs frozen blue huddle at the field kitchens. Rats can be heard scampering in the houses, cats stare from the empty windows. I am living with Rem in the house of a landlady whose husband is a prisoner of war in Germany. She is probably around 40 but is still attractive, lively, and hospitable and likes to talk about her husband whom she provides for diligently. Still, I'd like to think of her as available, she is filled with high spirits stimulated by fresh and vibrant experiences. Such things often dwell in one and the same heart, 
for the moral world cannot be called to account or dissected as neatly as the physical world. By the same token, most men do not behave like Othello, something I never understood before, but know how to forgive, especially in long-lasting marriages. Saint Michel, the 27th of February 1941 Vivid Dream Images, as usual, in the early morning hours. I was taking part in a meeting where people were amusing themselves by imitating dead or forgotten politicians. They were improvising in the spirit of the moment. Here and there someone in the company would rise from his seat and provoke hilarity with his histrionic gestures. I saw a large stout man pretending to be Bismarck, he enjoyed loud applause. It occurred to me that many a subtle gesture elicited much surprise and laughter, but only among a few people. I concluded from this that the people here were my contemporaries, probably my colleagues. But the survivors of small forgotten cliques could be seen wildly applauding figures whose humor was lost upon anyone but them. The group gave the superficial impression of being high level civil servants or retired generals, types known from anecdotes and lost personal accounts that show them carousing in their clubs. There was an undercurrent with a different tone this time concerning the drama of human history, but one devoid of bitterness, producing mirth instead. It was suffused with a trace of childlike innocence, like the kind that comes as no surprise in dignified old retired gentlemen. Also a little bit of plaudite, amikai, give me your applause, friends, if we take the meaning in an ironic or self-deprecating sense. Saint Michel the 1st of March 1941 significant warming over the past two days. At first accompanied by showers, then by sunshine. The snow disappeared in no time with the warm breeze. Water levels rose, and the trees gleamed in the play of color that marks early spring. As for animals, I saw large timarca beetles, bloody-nosed leaf beetles crawling on the hard earth yesterday in the rain, noticed especially how the male of the species showed very broad tusses, leg joints. I imagine that this chrysomlid, member of leaf beetle family chrysomlidae, is related to the early onset of warmer days. When I was a young boy, I noticed this as one of the first signs of life in the bear quarries near Eberg as it glistened blue in the February or March sun. In Algeria and Morocco, I saw them in their large forms as early as December, and their appearance always correlated with a certain mood of melancholy that overcomes me during this period of the year and then disappears when the trees turn green. Then as I was riding my bicycle along the road to Herson, I brushed past a salamander, a female recognizable by the greatly enlarged Mons Veneris, Mound of Venus, visible at this time of year. Its gentle swelling terminates in the brown spotted abdomen tinged with a faint red pigmentation. I carried the little lady, who twisted gently in my fingers, to a damp meadow, thereby saving her life. How many times has the sight of such creatures filled me with new strength, like a source of life? Saint Michel, the 7th of March 1941 Yesterday Rem and I called on Madame Richard's aunt who had invited me for a meal. We talked about being thunderstruck, that coup de foudre, love at first sight as a form of love to be avoided. Field maneuvers in the morning in the vicinity of Famla Butte, during these, I meditated on the theme of worlds, for example, reflections of human relationships in other dimensions, to visualize them better. One might think of polished spheres, such as cloudy opals or rock crystals that reflect the drama more minutely, intensely, and deeply. It could all play out in a large house that can be explored from cellar to attic. Saint Michel, the 27th of March 1941 in Charleville, I was a witness at a military tribunal. I used the opportunity to buy books, like novels by Jide and various works by Rimbord, who was born here and, as I was told by the bookseller, where a small circle of poets preserves his memory. On the return trip I read a beautiful passage about the kaleidoscope in C. La Grain Nimt, If It Die, 1924. Paris, the 6th of April 1941 Saturday and Sunday in Paris. 
spent the evenings in the company of Lieutenant Colonel Andoys in the Rotisserie de la Reine Pedarque near the Saint Lazare Railroad Station and, after that, in Tabarin. There, saw a floor show of naked women before an audience of officers and bureaucrats of the occupying army seated in the front rows. They fired off a volley of champagne corks. The women's bodies were well proportioned except for their feet, which had been deformed by their shoes. Perhaps a further thought, the foot is a kind of degraded hand. Performances like this are geared to the mechanism of the sex drive, the point is inescapable, although it is always one and the same. The rooster-like quality of the Gallic race was powerfully evident. Laypools, the sluts. Then went to Monte Cristo, an establishment where patrons luxuriate on low cushions. Silver chalices, fruit bowls and bottles glinted in the twilight as in an orthodox chapel. Companionship provided by young girls, almost all of them born in France to Russian émigrés. They chattered away in several languages. I sat beside a small, melancholy twenty-year-old and, through the champagne haze, carried on conversations about Pushkin, Uksakov, and Andreff, whose son, Daniel, had been a friend of hers. Today, Sunday, uninterrupted rainfall. I went to the Madeleine twice, its steps were covered with fallen beech leaves. Was at Prunier at noon and in the evening. The city is like an old familiar garden that now lies desolate but where paths and passageways are still recognizable. Its state of preservation is remarkable, almost Hellenistic, clearly, special ploys of the high command are at work. It is alienating to see the white signs on the signposts that the troops have placed throughout the city, gashes in an ancient, organic stand of timber. St. Michel, the 12th of April 1941 New plans, new resolutions, it is not yet too late. During the night a beautiful woman appeared to me. She kissed me many times gently on my eyes, which I kept shut. Afterward, I went to a horrible place where the door that I opened was bound with barbed wire. An ugly old woman was singing vulgar songs. When she turned her back on me, she lifted her skirt dot on the previous night, it was a journey to Tibet. The houses, rooms, and furniture didn't seem to be original anymore. An influence of foreign forms was already discernible, yet the change was slight. I walked through the houses without noting the inhabitants yet I felt their presence in rooms I did not enter. The dream was malevolent in that I was an invisible, demonic being. Tsarist officers appeared as adversaries. We saw and recognized each other from a distance, there was a hierarchy of visibility. St. Michel, the 13th of April 1941 Easter Day Stroll. The brown fields, as yet unplowed, seem bare, but in some places, they are blanketed with delicate low-growing nettle blossoms, almost invisible, approaching ultraviolet, where bumblebees forage as if on a tissue of dreams. The narrow, deeply rutted woodland paths. Even these possess northern and southern slopes where the different plant species grow at different rates. Paris, the 24th of April 1941 got up early for transport to Paris. The regiment has been ordered there for guard duty. The reveille sounded during one of those dreams that are like living tableaus, pose groups full of tension. In them, the dreamer savors a first rate insight, for he soon sinks into them, into the hopes and suffering of the figures, soon he emerges from their constituent parts and sees them integrated into one static image. Thus, the complexity of the content and the poverty of movement contradict each other, the actions remain under the spell of the meaning, and this repression unleashes a feeling of dizziness that often becomes a nightmare. In this state, I saw Jose with the high ranking doctor and his wife, along with me and four orderlies in a room where the furniture reminded me of a hospital. Jose was suffering from rabies and had sunk his teeth into the doctor's wife's neck to infect her, and without a doubt, he had succeeded. I saw his victim, who was being held down on a hospital bed by two orderlies and also saw the wounds from the bite, a slight film of pus was already forming on their red edges. The high ranking doctor was about to give her an injection because she was nearly mad. As he tested the solution in the hypodermic, 
his glance fell upon Jose, serious, pained, yet in complete control of his passion. Jose was also being forcibly subdued by two orderlies, half in the twilight state that follows an attack and half in triumph because his assault had succeeded. I had both hands around his powerful neck, stroking him the way one baits a horse's flanks. Yet at the same time, had he tried to escape, I could have choked him. The little room where we were suffering was so full of radiation that I comprehended his inner being like the text of a book. The remarkable thing about the attack was that after all the years of secret infidelity, Jose now wanted to unite with the high-ranking doctor's wife in death. And in the husband's eyes, I read that he completely understood the gravity of the deed. Although he felt he had been bitten by a viper, he remained conscious and maintained his medical objectivity. In this context, Jose's vicious action was a sign of illness, a symptom of fury. The will to heal was the appropriate response. It struck me as great and wonderful that this master controlled himself calmly in the face of such an onslaught of passion. And yet during this struggle, I felt myself on Jose's side, I patted his broad neck as I would that of a good horse that I might watch streak across the finish line in a storm. I felt that his moral sense was still intact. Nonetheless, he seemed to be like one of those ancient chieftains who took everything of value, gold, weapons, slaves, and women, when they crossed into the realm of death. This body was already inhabited by death, but I sensed in it the immense power of life. Once again, I was the observer of the image as a whole, constructed by my mind in contemplation out of sense and nonsense like a pattern in the wallpaper. Departure from Saint Michel perhaps, we may eventually return to this place. The gentle willows will stay in my memory along with their hawthorn hedges, whose still leafless thickets shelter green globes of mistletoe and dark magpies' nests. The celandine and violets were already blooming among the dead leaves, and nettle shoots were beginning to sprout. This is an undulating landscape, here and there it conceals large farms with stables and barns. The shiny slate roofs reflect like mirrors from its valleys. My thoughts upon gazing at these farmsteads, the age of magic has passed, yet we still possess the keys to bring it to life. But then there are stages when man loses the memory of goodness and truth. There he does not recognize the sources of his unhappiness. In Lon by midday, we drove around the lower portion of the old city. It was with a sense of joy that I saw the cathedral again. From the distance, the perforated spires make an especially powerful impression. I imagine it is possible to grasp the internal structure of the work, the pillars and shafts of the shell, the intellectual aspect of the whole plan. It presents a wealth of kaleidoscopic variations to the eyes of those who drive past, as if the building were turning gently on its axis to the sound of a music box. We reached Paris very late and then marched through dark and desolate streets to Fort Vincennes, where the troops will be billeted. After a walk through the quarters in the early morning hours, I took a room in the Hotel Modern at the Porte de Vincennes. In the early light, a glimpse of the huge pillars on the Place de la Nation. Behind it, in the distance, a hazy view of the Eiffel Tower. Monumental traits become ever more exaggerated when they appear en masse. Vincennes, the 27th of April 1941, first Sunday in Paris. In the meantime, I have moved to an apartment that provides a lovely view of the Donjon des Forts. Powerful feeling of melancholy. Afternoon, to the zoo in Vincennes. Giraffes were eating dried acacia leaves from a high trough, picking them out with their long, pointed tongues. Black bears, a pride of cheetahs, alpine rams from Corsica posing on the crags of a mighty cliff. The stupendous aspect of these pageants, they speak, but we no longer understand their divine nature. Vincennes, the 28th of April 1941 stroll through the streets and alleys of Vincennes. Details a man with a slender sickle mowing the grass of a railroad embankment next to a busy street and stuffing the clippings into a sack, probably collecting fodder for rabbits. In his other hand, he held a small basket to collect little snails that fell out of the grass as he worked. In the outskirts of the big cities, 
Scenes of Chinese frugality are often evident, they bring to mind the grasses and herbs that grow in the crevices of a wall. Vincennes, the 29th of April 1941 Hotel de Ville and Quayes de la Seine semicolon 3 took stock of expenditures. Tristita, melancholy. Looked for solutions, only doubtful ones presented themselves. The monsters of Notre Dame are more brutish than those of Lon. These incarnations stare so knowingly out over the roofs of the cosmopolitan city, surveying realms of lost knowledge, the knowledge, yes, but its existence as well. At Prunia, Rue de Fot. The little room on the first floor is cool and cheerful, with its aquamarine atmosphere, very inviting for the enjoyment of seafood. The round church very nearby, a fig tree flourishes at its wall. Then the Madeleine a church despite everything. Boulevard des Capucines. The Blitz made I a Sistkin for whom I had noticed the day before yesterday on the place du l apostrophe e toy al comma five a tall West Slavic type with long wavy hair. The strange feeling when we begin to notice and pay attention to each other. It is we who beget relationships, a new human being is like a seed that originates deep inside us. An alien image inhabits us. It is like a small wound, a gentle pain when it marks us. How well women know this phenomenon, it always intensifies when the encounter is repeated. Telephone Schlumberger. But like almost all my earlier acquaintances, he is not staying in Paris. When I looked for an escape route between the Pont Neuf and the Pont des Arts, it became clear to me that the labyrinthine nature of our position resides only inside us. This makes the use of force destructive, that would demolish walls, chambers in ourselves, that is not the path to freedom. The hours regulate themselves from the inner mechanism of the clock. When we move the hand, we change the numbers but not the course of fate. No matter where we desert to, we carry the full military kit with us. Inborn. Even in suicide, we cannot escape ourselves. We must ascend, sometimes by suffering, then the world becomes more comprehensible. Vincennes, the 1st of May 1941 Sake occur. Chevalier de la Bar was gruesomely executed at a very early age for not showing proper respect during a procession. I recently read his story in Voltaire. A statue of him at the martyr's stake stands in the consecrated area of the church as an altar to Freemasonry. The choice of the space lends the monument to dialectical flavor and disrupts commiseration with the fate of the unfortunate man. We raise our finger in warning as we leave him. Then play state attorneys. I bought a small bouquet of lilies of the valley in celebration of the day. These were probably responsible for my encounter with Rene, a young office clerk in a department store. The city effortlessly produces such couplings, but then one can't help notice that it was founded on the altar of Venus. It's in the water and in the air. I now sense that more clearly than when I lived here for the first year and a half of the war isolated in barracks and garrisons and billeted on farms. In long periods of asceticism when we tame our thoughts, we get a foretaste of the wisdom of old age, of serenity. Et, then went to the cinema, there I touched her breast. A hot iceberg, a hill in the spring, filled with myriad seeds of life, perhaps something like white anemones. During the newsreel, the room remained illuminated to prevent any demonstrations. Our offensives in Africa, Serbia, and Greece were shown. The mere glimpse of the weapons of annihilation produced screams of fear. Their automated nature, the way the steel plates of the tanks glide, the way the ammunition belts with their bright projectiles are swallowed as they fire. The rings, hinges, armor, observation slits, sections of the tank, the arsenal of life forms that harden like crustaceans, toads, crocodiles, and insects. Hieronymus Bosch had already envisioned them. Subject for study, the ways propaganda turns into terror. The beginnings in particular contained much that people are going to forget. That is when power walks on cat's paws, subtle and cunning. We said goodbye at the opera. 
probably never to meet again. Vincen, the 3rd of May 1941 in the sunshine in front of Brasserie Lorraine on the place day tourneys. These are the moments when I can breathe, like a drowning man. Opposite me a girl in red and blue who combines absolute beauty with an icy manner, a pattern of frost crystals. Whoever thaws her, destroys the form. When I turn off the light I am gladdened by the thought that I shall now be alone for eight, nine hours. I seek solitude as my cave. I also like waking up now and then to enjoy it. Vincen, the 7th of May 1941 on the place day turn is in front of the brasserie again, a pleasant spot I find so appealing. I usually sit here in the sun drinking a cup of tea and enjoying some paper thin sandwiches, almost wafers, which I dedicate to the memory of past abundance. Then, across the Champs Elysees to Rudafot. I always enjoy seeing the fig tree at its entrance in front of the small church. The cliffs of porphyry. Even plants and animals have to differentiate themselves from everything else on the earth. Vincen, the 10th of May 1941, Jardin des Plantes. A jujube tree in full bloom. Some of the blossoms sprang directly from the trunk, so that they gleamed from afar in like coral branches or clumps of pink bees. Large black or amber colored cats can be seen napping in the shop windows. Then the Paulonia, princess tree foxglove tree, trees, still without leaves, blooming in the alleys or in large groups on the squares. Their delicate violet veils cast a spell over the silver grey stone. Amethysts on elephant hide. Vincen, the 11th of May 1941 I drove to the place day tourneys as usual. At the Bastille, I was overcome by the desire to get out. I found myself in a crowd of thousands the only one in uniform, not to mention that it was the feast of Joan of Arc. Still, I took a certain pleasure in walking around and meditating, the way one would walk through a powder magazine, dreaming while holding a burning candle. I later discovered that there had been a few disturbances at the Place de la Concorde. Vincen, the 12th of May 1941 they placed us barefoot around a bright fire and moved us close to it so we could see the skin first reddening, then becoming like parchment, and then cracking open. Then they scourged them with whips. Bundles of vipers were attached to the handles instead of cords. They sank their teeth into the raw flesh and I experienced the bites as relief when compared with the pain of the fire. On what slave ships do such images occur to us? Vincen, the 17th of May 1941 in the night I lay anxious in the dark for a long time, counting the seconds and then counting them again. Then came a horrible morning in the barracks yard of Vincen. I was like someone who is very thirsty, during a break. I slaked my thirst with the foamy freshness of white blossom clusters up against the fortress wall. When I see the blossoms spreading out so peacefully in the sunlight, their serenity seems infinitely deep. I feel that they speak to me in words and sentences that are sweet and comforting, and I am always seized with pain because no sound from any of them can penetrate my ears. We are summoned, but we do not know where to dot. At midday, the colonel arrived with Captain Hall who will be staying here for a while and is supposed to paint a portrait of me. I was with him in the evening in the area around the Madeline and bought gifts for Perpetua.6 in the shop of a negro, conversations about cola nuts and white rum. It was a strange afternoon and confirmed my opinion that it is we who control experience, the world provides us with the means. We are endowed with a certain kind of power that activates the appropriate objects. Thus. If we are males, women will appear. Or, when we are children, presents are showered upon us. And when we are pious, Paris, 20 slash the 21st of May 1941 at noon my company took over guard duty in the Hotel Continental. Before that, mounted guard duty on Avenue Wagram. I had my company perform the drill that we had been practicing for a month and then pass the monument to the unknown soldier in parade step. We went by the monument to Clemens, who had clearly foreseen these things. I nodded to him, as though to a prophet. The night was troubled, even turbulent, 
as more than 40 men who had been detained by patrols on the streets or in bars and hotels were brought before me. These were mostly cases of inebriation or soldiers without leave who had been picked up in the little hotels de passe, brothels. The prostitutes they had been enjoying themselves with were brought along too. After brief interrogations, I entered them all in the large incident log and then had them confined in little cells that had been built on the first floor in great numbers, like bailing cabins. Anyone who had slept with a companion was first disinfected. Breakfast was doled out in the morning, and then the whole group was brought to a disciplinary judge in the same building for sentencing. Along with one of the wagon loads that had been picked up on Montmartre, there was a little 18-year-old prostitute who stood at attention just like the soldiers. Because this little person was especially cheerful and showed bon moral, morale, I had her sit and chat with us in the guardroom. By doing so, I was keeping her like a pet canary in this depressing place. Vincennes, the 24th of May 1941 in the morning in the Hotel Continental as an associate justice on a military tribunal. Three cases. The first involved a drunken driver who had knocked over a gas lamp post with his car. A second before, he had seen something dart across street. Four weeks confinement under close guard. When asked if he had any response to the sentence, I am surprised that the sentence is so lenient. Then a second driver who came to blows with four of his shipmates in a bar and passively resisted arrest, sentenced to 43 days in military jail. During the cross-examination one of the sailors said, he rarely sets foot on land, to characterize the sobriety of a crewmate. He also differentiated between strong inebriation, a big trip and simple tipsiness, a little trip. Finally, a corporal who went berserk in front of the metro station Jean Jaws, attacked several pedestrians, and stabbed people with his bayonet until he was arrested by the military patrol. Postponement because several of those involved did not appear, probably out of fear. In this last case, the perpetrator's fury was evident in the hearing. The proceedings had to be patched together from bits and pieces leaving a series of gaps. The differences between the testimony of the French witnesses and the translation by the interpreter were informative. The method revealed a person as a sensory organ, receiving and transmitting. This practice shows how much gets changed and lost in the process. In the evening in the Ritz with Count Podwills, whom I met for the first time today, although I have been corresponding with him and his wife for years. He brought first Lieutenant Gruninger along with him, who reminded me of characters from Ardingello. Hall joined us. Colonel Spadell, chief of the general staff of the Supreme Military Command, showed a plate for a moment. Vincennes, the 25th of May 1941, the morning visit. Two friends in silk costumes stand in front of a table made of mother of pearl and ivory. They have a folder with colored etchings open in front of them and are viewing the pictures through org nets. The room is colorful, splendid, cheerful. I notice especially the rich in tarshu in the table. Yet there's also something unusual about it. When I take a closer look, I discover a woman kneeling beneath it. Her heavy silk dress, delicately powdered face, colorful hat with feathers blend so perfectly with the furniture that the concealed woman reminds me of one of those butterflies camouflaged to resemble the blossom it perches on. I now become aware of the mood of terror underlying the cheerfulness of the room that streams with morning light, and I realize that this puzzling figure is frozen with fear. The enigmatic nature of the scene was latent in the title, it was not only about the visitor but also about his wife. The female visitor who was all too lovely and all too near. Vincennes, the 26th of May 1941, called on Hall in the afternoon on the fifth story of a house on Rue de Montreuil. The three of us raised several glasses, first to his model, Madeleine, then to a magnificent rainbow over the roofs of Vincennes where it formed a double arch of happiness. Conversations related to the girl's profession, she was an interim news whose job it was to lead clients to a nightclub. She was no beauty but education, a good background, and clearly also good nature would be superfluous to this job. 
there was a sick mother to be provided for and other things like that. As usual with types like her, I am moved by the mixture of superficiality and melancholy. Thus, we navigate toward destruction on ships festooned with garlands. This artificial enhancement that helps to disintegrate these middle class lives merits closer inspection. In the final analysis, this is the last stage of a more general decline. Money holds one of the supreme secrets. If I place a coin on the table and receive a piece of bread for it, this act reflects not only the order of the state but also the universe. It would be worth researching to what extent numismatics, in the higher sense, gets expressed in the symbols stamped on the coins. My contact with Hull does me good and has pulled me back from the brink of those dangerous thoughts that have engulfed me since the beginning of the year. I reached a low point in February when I refused nourishment for a week and in every sense drew down the capital I had accumulated in the past. My situation is that of a man who dwells in the desert between a demon and a corpse. The demon urges him to action, the corpse, to sympathy. In life it has often been the artistically gifted person who came to my aid during such crises. He distributes the treasures of the world. Paris, the 29th of May 1941 To add to the flood of repugnant things that oppress me comes the order to be present at the execution of a soldier sentenced to death for desertion. My first inclination was to report in sick, but that seemed cheap to me. Furthermore, I thought to myself, maybe it is better that you are present rather than someone else. And in truth, I was able to accomplish many things much more humanely than could have been expected. Basically, it was exaggerated curiosity that was the deciding factor. I have seen many people die, but never at a predetermined moment. How will the situation present itself that today threatens every one of us and spreads and spreads its shadow over his existence? And how should we act in this situation? Therefore, I looked at the records that culminated in his sentencing. The matter concerns a corporal who left his unit nine months ago to disappear into the city where a French woman gave him shelter. He moved around, sometimes in civilian clothing and sometimes in the uniform of a naval officer as he went about his affairs. It seems that he felt a false sense of security and not only made his lover jealous but also beat her. She took her revenge by reporting him to the police, who turned him into the German authorities. Yesterday after this, I accompanied the judge to a little spot in the forest near Robinson, the appointed location. In a clearing, an ash tree, its trunk splintered by previous executions. Two groups of bullet holes are visible, a higher one for the head and a lower one for shots to the heart. In among the delicate filaments of the exploded fibers of the tree's heartwood layer, some dark blowflies are resting. They objectify the feeling that I brought with me to this spot, no place of execution can be sufficiently sanitized to efface all vestiges of the knacker's yard. Seven. We drove a long distance today to reach this spot in the forest. The staff doctor and a first lieutenant who was in command were in the car. During the journey, conversations had a particular quality of closeness and intimacy characterized by things like imagine being in a fix like this. In the clearing we meet the detail. We form a sort of corridor of two rows in front of the ash tree. The sun is shining after the rain that fell on our way here, drops of water glisten on the green grass. We wait a while until shortly before five o'clock. Then a car pulls up the narrow forest road. We watch the condemned man get out, followed by two prison guards and the clergyman. Behind them a truck appears, driving the burial detail and military issue coffin, cheapest model, standard size. The man is led between the two rows, at that moment, I am overcome with a feeling of trepidation, as if it was suddenly difficult to breathe. He is placed before the military judge, who stands beside me. I note that his arms have been secured behind his back with handcuffs. He is wearing grey trousers made of good material, a grey silk shirt, and an open military tunic that has been draped over his shoulders. He stands erect and is well built, and his face bears pleasant features of the sort that attract women. The sentence is read aloud. The condemned man follows the procedure with the highest degree of attention, 
and yet I still have the impression that he doesn't understand the text. His eyes are open wide, as though drinking it all in, large, as if his body were suspended from them, he moves his full lips as if he were spelling. His gaze falls on me and stays the for a second on my face with a penetrating, questioning tension. I can tell that the agitation lends him an air of something confused, florid, even childlike. A tiny fly plays about his left cheek and alights several times close to his ear. He shrugs his shoulders and shakes his head. The reading takes barely a minute, but the time seems extraordinarily long to me. The pendulum becomes long and heavy. Then the guards lead the condemned man to the ash tree, the clergyman accompanies him. Heaviness increases in this moment. There is something staggering about it, as if heavy weights had been lowered. I remember that I am supposed to ask whether he wants a blindfold. The clergyman answers yes for him while the guards tie him to the tree with white ropes. The clergyman softly asks him a few questions. I hear him answer them with jaw will, yes sir. Then he kisses a small silver cross while the doctor pins a piece of red cardboard the size of a playing card onto his shirt over his heart. In the meantime, the firing squad has followed a signal from the first lieutenant and has taken up their positions standing behind the clergyman, who still blocks the condemned man. He now steps back after running his hand down the prisoner's side once more. The commands follow and with them I again awaken into consciousness. I want to look away, but I force myself to watch. I catch the moment when the salvo produces five little dark holes in the cardboard, as though drops of dew had landed upon it. Their target is still standing against the tree. His expression shows extraordinary surprise. I see his mouth opening and closing as if he wanted to form vowels and express something with great effort. This situation has something confusing about it, and again time seems attenuated. It also seems that the man is now becoming menacing. Finally, his knees give out. The ropes are loosened and now at last the pallor of death quickly comes over his face, as if a bucket of whitewash had been poured over it. The doctor rushes up and reports. The man is dead. One of the two guards unlocks the handcuffs and wipes the glistening metal clean of blood with a cloth. The corpse is placed in the coffin. It looks as if the little fly were playing around him in a beam of sunlight. Return trip in a new, more powerful state of depression. The staff doctor explains to me that the gestures of the dying are only empty reflexes. He did not see what was most gruesomely clear to me. Vincen, the 30th of May 1941 at the Ritz this noon with Colonel Spadell, Gruninger, and Clemens Bodewills. I have counted Gruninger among my most insightful readers, and probably pupils as well, and it was his idea that I would be in a better position here in Paris than I would be elsewhere. In truth, it's quite possible that this city has not only special gifts but also inspirations for work and other influences for me. Almost more important is the sense that earlier it was always a capital, symbol and fortress of an ancient tradition of heightened life and unifying ideas, which nations especially lack nowadays. Perhaps I'm doing the right thing if I take advantage of the possibility of establishing myself here. The opportunity presented itself without my instigation. In the evening, I was visited by the two sisters who were acquaintances from my lodgings in Noisy Noisy La Grande. The three of us chatted together. The older one is getting divorced from her husband, who squandered her dowry. She speaks of his misconduct and of her lawsuit with Gallic certainty, using the phrases of a kinney notary. I gather that there are no insoluble problems here. It seems that she is not obsessed with enmity toward men, but just toward marriage, and that in her own way she wants to introduce the younger woman, who looks like an Amazon, to life. In all this there is a remarkable contrast between pedagogical dignity and epicurean subject matter. Vincen, the 3rd of June 1941 in the afternoon, went to the little patisserie of La Durée en Rue Royale to say goodbye to the Amazon. Her red leather jacket, the green shoulder bag on its long strap. The mole over the left corner of her mouth rises nervously, 
appealingly, when she smiles and exposes her canine tooth. On Sunday she will be 18 years old. Dot of all the things we used to refer to as style in the old days, the instinctive extravagance that a man displays openly in his own milieu, all that remains is the company of a beautiful woman, and she alone gives the feeling of this vanished condition. The great cities not only refine the senses, they also educate us to things that belong to their own genera, things we would otherwise enjoy only in isolated or specialized contexts. For example, in Barcelona, I noticed that there were specialty shops for all things salted. The pastry bakeries, antiquarian bookshops selling only 18th century bindings, and others, only Russian silver. Current reading, Anatole France, Zur la Pierre Blanche, on the white stone. Alexandria, the thoughts have lost all their organic components thereby permitting a linear analysis that is clearer and more mathematical. The style is filtered through all the strata of skepticism, in this way, the clarity of distilled water communicated itself to him. Prose like this can be read at twice normal speed just because every word stands in its logical place. That is its weakness and its strength. Montage. The 8th of June 1941 took leave of my little apartment in Vincennes. In the bedroom there hangs a photograph of its owners who fled, a photograph I found unpleasant from the start. Their expressions had something strained, distorted, and agitated about them. They bore the marks of a querulous spirit, which is reflected in the contents of their library. I often thought of removing the picture, especially in the evenings, and only the reluctance to change anything about the furnishings prevented me from doing so. It now seemed as if I were discovering a new character trait in the face of this unknown and involuntary landlord, as though from beneath the mask there gleamed and smiled something different, a glimmer of understanding, of sympathy. That struck me as odd, almost as a reward for the fact that in this apartment I had always behaved like a human being. On the other hand, maybe it was a sign that of my own accord I had penetrated the individual surface to that core where we are all united and can understand each other, penetrated to the pain, the suffering, that is the universal substrate. On the afternoon of the 5th of June, we marched off. The girls of Montreal and Vincennes formed two columns in front of the gates of the fort as the beauties of old had when Alexander's troops departed from Babylon. Hull also said goodbye to me. My contact with artists of a free and light-hearted style of life has always been the most valuable. We marched through the woods of Vincennes, then via Nogent, Chelles, Lapin, Messy, and Vinance to Montch, where I spent three days with the company. The name of the town is supposedly derived from Mons Jupiter. I am living here in the house of a Monsieur Petruix and his wife, both of whom are quite aged yet energetic and vivacious. The man is an engineer who carries on his business in Paris during the week. The woman takes care of the house as well as the large garden, which is watered by seven springs and produces a rich fruit and vegetable harvest. As we chatted about flowers and fruits, I recognized in her a dilettante in the best sense. Evidence for this is that she likes to give away the extra produce from her abundant harvest, but never sell it. Monsieur Petruix is a Catalan born in Perpignan. We discussed his language. He told me that of all living tongues, it is closest to Latin. In order to reach old age, he says, people must work. Only the lazy bones dies early. I tell him that in order to grow old, we have to stay young. Villas Cotrits. The 9th of June 1941 marched through the great, steaming woods in heavy rain as far as Villas Cotterets. There I warmed myself at the stove of a doctor in whose house I was billeted. I conversed with him as we ate together, and when he was called away to an urgent case, he left his daughter behind to keep me company. I found her, the wife of a surgeon, to be well read and well travelled. We conversed about Morocco and the Balearic Islands, then about Rembord and Malam, especially about the first trophy of Brismarine, Sea Breeze. Here the study of literature always refers to a finite canon and its contents, while back home, ideally, 
we speak of specific individual works, naming distinct schools and often distinguishing them by their political sympathies. Things are similar when it comes to painting. In Paris, I saw ordinary people stop in front of art dealers' windows and heard them make sound judgments about the pictures on display. Literary appreciation surely corresponds to that of painting. Yet it is remarkable that in a musical people like the Germans, the corresponding sensitivity to sculpture is so poorly developed. Soissons, the 10th of June 1941, we marched as far as Soissons, where I got some sleep in the Lion Rouge. The house facades were riddled with bullet holes. Often it remained unclear whether these were from the last war or this one. Perhaps this is the way the images of each one coalesce in memory. Nuvian Lacombe, the 11th of June 1941, strenuous march to Nuvian Lacombe. High up on the right, the massive ruin of Cousy Le Chateau. Rested at noon in the glass factory of Saint Gobain. The inclement weather forced us to eat inside the building among huge piles of bars and sheets of glass. The sterile quality of this material impressed me. In the evening, despite my fatigue, I did a little hunting for subtiles, brown mushroom beetle. Eight such entertainments are like a bath that washes off the dirt of duty, there is freedom in it. We spent the rainy 12th of June resting. I wrote letters, updated my diary, and worked. In the evening, slightly tipsy from White Bordeaux as I read Giono, Paul Salieu a Melville, Melville, a novel, 1941. In such moods, we are more receptive to books. We also read more into them, we fantasize over them, as over a piano keyboard. St. Algus, the 13th of June 1941 Regimental March with Combat Training. In the Bois de Bergemont. At around 11 o'clock at night, we reached our quarters in St. Algus. I sat for another hour around the stove with my landlord's family, enjoying cider cheese, and bread. We had a good conversation. Finally, the woman made us coffee and offered sugar and a little glass of brandy. I particularly liked the Pitafamilius, a 56-year-old man who wore the same vest at the table that he had worn in the fields. I wondered how such a simple, good-hearted, childlike creature could still exist in this day and age, maybe only because he is so completely disarming. His face especially in the gaze of his blue eyes, communicated not only in a joviality but also an exceedingly gracious quality. I could easily imagine myself being in the company of a vassal from olden times. I sensed this especially at several of his questions, which were directed to me with great delicacy, such as, Vows of Esosian Dame. Do you also have a lady? And his eyes lit up when he heard that I possessed one as well as property. St. Michel, the 14th of June 1941 in the morning, I had coffee in the company of my hosts, and then we marched to Irini for a combat exercise. During the final discussion on a hot hill, General Sud took me aside and informed me that I had been promoted to the staff of the high command. I could see that Spidel had been thinking of me. Time resembles a hot object whose temperature cannot be reduced but can be endured for longer and longer periods by shifting it from one hand to the other. The situation I find myself in reminds me of someone who has a supply of gold coins he needs to change into smaller denominations. He searches in vain in his pockets for the smaller coins. On several occasions, especially back in Deal Misson and during the first half of my stay in Paris, I got swept into the rapids, but I always maintained the minimum amount of breath to make it possible to swim, or at least float. I predicted this situation years ago, but the ways it has come about have surprised me. In the afternoon, we entered our old Saint Michel again. Madame Richard welcomed me with such delight that I found it touching. She said that the time since we had last seen each other had passed so slowly. After the milking was over, Martanti 9 came by with her little basket as usual and asked me whether I had experienced the coup de foudre in Paris. In this mood of mutual domestic familiarity, we all then drank a bottle of wine with Rem. Read my correspondence, 
among it a letter from Hall sent from Rue Montreal in which he recalled the rainbow. It bears a postscript from Germain, expressing the hope of seeing her two captains again, who had turned up at a crossroads in her life. In general, I have to say that one reason my stay in Paris was so fruitful was that it brought me such a wealth of human contact. People still preserve much of their seed corn, which can sprout again as soon as the weather becomes milder and returns to more humane temperatures. Lovely letters from Perpetua. I note the following from 10 June last night I had a strange dream again. In association with young Meyer and Laman I caught a burglar who had hidden in our armoire during the night as you were coming upstairs. Your face, when you heard those men's voices, was the one you usually put on when you encounter unpleasant things. I showed you the thief and you had a good laugh. Then, after you had a good long look at me, you said, you will recall my remark about Holdelin when he says that the fear that holds all our senses in extreme tension gives a person's expression a strange demonic look. When that dissipates, the expression relaxes and a happy serenity spreads over the face. That is what's happening to you at this moment, and I like you better than ever. I am writing these lines at the semicircular table where I have so often read and worked before. Madame Richard has picked some peonies from her garden and placed them in a tall vase among the letters, diaries, magazines, and manuscripts. Once in a while, one of the dark red or pale purple petals falls from one of the open blossoms so that the material disorder of the space is exaggerated by a second, colorful one, but at the same time that disorder is negated. Incidentally, I don't usually update my notes until the following day and I do not date them on the day of their writing but rather the day they occurred. Nonetheless, it happens that some overlap can occur between both dates. That remains one of the imprecisions in perspective that I don't attend to very strictly. This applies all the more to what I have just said about the flowers. Saint Michel, the 17th of June 1941 spent Saturday on the banks of the Glandbach stream, where I have organized sports for the men, the first time this year. While they were doing that, I hunted for subtiles along the beautifully tree-lined banks. In a tree fungus where I once found a reddish-brown orchisia, darkling beetle, before our stay in Paris, this time I discovered a related species with orange spots, and a little bit later on the stump of an old alder tree, a variety Achenmedi, false click beetle. I also glimpsed the dark, otherwise inconspicuous Staphylinidae, rove beetle. In the bright sunshine, they danced with their abdomens pointed upward like black flames upon the fresh crust of river mud in a wild celebration of life. When their armor glistens, the nobility of their black color becomes obvious. I gave some more thought to my project about black and white. For a long time, it has seemed that I must still establish a method before beginning it. For anyone who wants to pursue this, a youth once came to an old hermit and asked him for a rule to guide him through life. The hermit imparted this advice strive for the attainable. The youth thanked him and asked whether it would be immodest to ask for a second word of wisdom as sustenance for his journey, whereupon the hermit added another piece of advice to his first strive for the unattainable. In the evening, in Madame Richard's garden, a bee approached a pink lupine and alighted upon the lower lip of the blossom, which drooped obligingly under its weight. In this way, a second narrow sheath, deep dark red at its tip, opened up. This section holds the pollen receptacles. The bee feasted on this sideways, right at the point indicated by the dark shading. I stood for a long time before an iris with a tripartite crown. Entry to its chalices lay across a golden fleece leading to an amethyst cleft. You flowers, who dreamed you up? Hall arrived late by car. Because it was my sergeant's birthday, I took him along to see the junior officers. It was a hearty feast. At around two o'clock, we pledged our close friendship over toasts. He brought along the photograph from Rue Montreal. The likenesses and also the view had come out well but the rainbow was missing, that symbol of our attachment. The inert lens does not capture those authentic and miraculous qualities. Saint Michel, 
the 18th of June 1941 in a dream I was sitting with my father at a table heaped with food. It was at the end of the meal where others were present. He was in a good mood and posed the question to what extent every gesture, especially a man's gestures in conversation with a woman, carries erotic significance. In doing so, he revealed the structure of gestural language and produced a cynical effect, yet this impression was mitigated by his astonishing erudition. Concerning the gestures, he mentioned those menus to indicate their experience and prowess. He cited Juvenal's reference to the two books of Antiquitans. Then, before the round table broke up, he passed a goblet holding bright red wild strawberries on a mound of white ice cream. I heard him comment on it, but I have unfortunately forgotten what he said, although it was rather more profound than jocular. Paris, the 24th of June 1941, departure to Paris in the very early morning. I was warmly embraced en route de la Bovet by Madame Richard and her aunt, who warned me again about the coup de foudre. Long again with its cathedral, which I love especially. In the woods, the place where the chestnut bushes are beginning to bud marks the boundary of a growing zone. Just on the outskirts of the city, there are tall stands of marvelous wild cherries that glow the color of coral as they ripened. That surpasses the limits of the gardener's art encroaching into the realm of precious stones and jewelry, just like those trees that Aladdin found in the Grotto of the Lamp. For three days now we have been at war with Russia, strange how little the news has touched me. But the ability to absorb facts in times like these is limited unless we do so with a certain callousness. Paris, the 25th of June 1941 standing in front of La Lorraine again on the play State Attorneys. I re-encounter the same clock that has so often been the focus of my gaze. When I take up my position in front of the troops to say goodbye, as I did on Monday, I notice the urge to stand off center. That is a trait that denotes an observer and a prevalence of contemplative leanings. In the evening, Bouillabaisse with Ziegler at Dwent. I waited for him on Avenue de l'Opera in front of a store displaying rugs, weapons, and jewelry from the Sahara. Among these were heavy silver armbands and ankle bracelets, fitted with locks and spikes, ornaments common to lands where slaves and harems are found. Then Cafe de la Pax took stock of the situation as it comes into focus more clearly. Paris, the 26th of June 1941, toward morning, dreams of earthquakes, I saw houses swallowed up. The scene was as confusing as a maelstrom and threatened to make me dizzy and even lose consciousness. At first I struggled against the urge, but then I threw myself into the vortex of annihilation, as into a swirling shaft. The leap produced desire, which was part of the horror, yet also transcended it as the body dissolved into malevolent, fragmented music. Sadness prevailed as when a flag is lowered dot had a further conversation about the situation with Ziegler in the ambassador. Also talked about second sight, a trait inherited in his wife's family. She saw the explosion of the Zeppelin 11 three hours before it was announced on the radio, as well as other things. Yes, there are strange springs that feed our knowledge, for she also saw Nibolo 12 lying on the floor, his face spattered with blood. Paris. The 27th of June 1941 at the table, I joked around with a beautiful three-year-old child I had grown fond of. Thought, that was one of your own children, unbegotten and unborn. In the evening I accompanied the sisters to Montmartre, which was glowing like a volcanic crater. They complement each other like a centaur, a twin being in spirit and flesh. While half asleep I ardently entered into the spirit of language. The consonant groups M N M S M J that express the exalted, the masculine, and masterful became especially distinct. Paris, the 5th of July 1941. I met Morris on the place Danvers, a man still mentally alert and physically active at age 76. He has spent his life guiding rich Englishmen, Americans, and Scandinavians through the city. He has intimate familiarity with all of its far-flung districts. His experience is also extensive in clandestine matters, in the vices of the rich and powerful. 
like the face of all who have passed through such regions, his own betrays a somewhat demonic aspect. While we ate together on the boulevard Rochequart, he gave me a lecture on various techniques of making amorous advances. At a glance, he can tell women who expect money from those who don't, almost infallibly. I find that a rather coarse trait. Despite all his debauchery, I found something pleasant, even lovable in him. At the same time, I also sensed an icy chill in this person, who has spent years unattached relying on himself alone in this metropolis. Paris, the 12th of July 1941 strolled with Madame Scritor to the place to Turter opposite the old Mary near Saker Kerr. I showed her a mullen flower blooming in a dry crevice in a wall. She said she thought it had grown thanks to collaboration du Saint Esprit, collaboration with the Holy Spirit. Conversation about the men who are good husbands and bad lovers. In such cases, women tend to take comfort in the thought that I have always led a double life. I wondered about the reason for such confidences. It can probably be attributed to the loneliness felt by two people who live near each other. A loneliness imbued with something terrifying. Men live there as if suspended over chasms lightly covered with flowers but which conceal snakes and small carcasses in their depths. But why? Ultimately, only because they instill fear and mistrust. If we possessed perfect, divine understanding, our fellow human beings would reveal their secrets to us like children, without suspicion. We ate together in a wine bar on the place Danvas. Here I allowed myself the pleasure of interrogating my companion about details of French history, such as the heraldic significance of the lilies. At the next table, there sat a married couple, obviously people who smell well educated, as the Chinese say. They were becoming increasingly disturbed by our conversation. Several times the man had to restrain his wife with effort when she wanted to interrupt and give me a piece of her mind. Paris. The 14th of July 1941 Bastille Day. The streets were very crowded. When I crossed over the place attorneys in the evening, I felt someone touch my hand. A man carrying a violin under his left arm gripped my hand powerfully as he passed, while giving me a silent but genial look. There was something strangely invigorating about it, and it immediately improved my melancholy mood. The city is sweetheart. Her streets, her squares, as bounteous places where we are surprised by gifts. I get special joy from seeing loving couples who walk with their arms around each other and occasionally pull each other closer for a kiss. Paris, the 19th of July 1941 went to the flea market with Spadell in the afternoon. I spent several hours in this jumbled maze in the kind of mood produced by reading Aladdin and the Magic Lamp. A place where East and West mingle and combine in the most outlandish way. The impression of this fairy tale world is evoked by all the treasures of metalwork, stones, pictures, fabric, and antiquities mixed in with a lot of rubbish. Treasures can be found in cheap market stalls, precious items among the piles of brick a brack. This is the final collecting point for things that have spent their dreamy lives for years, decades and centuries among families and households. They pour out of the rooms, the attics, and the storage rooms and bring anonymous memories with them. They fill the whole market with the emanations of household gods. Paris, the 8th of October 1941 My transfer to Paris left a lacuna in these entries. Even more than that, the events in Russia are responsible for it. These started around the same time and evoked a kind of mental exhaustion, not just in me. It seems that this war is deteriorating in stages organized according to the rules of some unidentified dramatic structure. Of course this sort of thing can only be guessed at because events are sensed by those who are living through them in all their anarchic spirit. The maelstroms are too close, too violent, and nowhere, not even on this ancient island. Are there any places of safety? The breakers are surging into the lagoons. At noon, Spidel and I went to see Ambassador to Brinon, on the corner of Rue Rude and Avenue Foch. They say that the little palais where he received us belongs to his Jewish wife, but that did not prevent him from making jokes at table about the Yupins, 
Yids. There I made the acquaintance of Sakagitri, whom I found very pleasant. His dramatic side also far outweighs his artistic side. He possesses a tropical personality of the sort I imagined Umar Pere had. On his little finger there gleamed a monstrous signet ring with a large embossed monogram SG on the gold surface. I conversed with him about Merb, and he told me that the man had died in his arms as he whispered into his ear, Ne collaborate eyes. Never collaborate, I am recording this for my collection of last words. What he meant was collaborating on comedies, for in those days, the word did not have the odor that it does now sat next to the actress Arlette at table. At the moment, she can be seen in the film Madame Sans Jean, Brazen Lady. Just the word cuckoo, cuckold, is enough to make her laugh, which means that in this country she is almost always in a state of merriment. Orchids in a vase, smooth, stiff, with a lip that divides into trembling feelers. Their color, a shimmering white luster, as though enameled for insect size in the jungle. Lasciviousness and innocence are wondrously united in these blossoms. Puli, burgundy, champagne, just a thimbleful of each. On the occasion of this breakfast, around twenty policemen were stationed in the vicinity. Paris, the 11th of October 1941, went to the Monte Carlo with Nebel in the afternoon, where we discussed the matter of the safe. He had just returned from leave and told me that a novel by Thomas Mann. Ein Tag aus dem Leben der Alten Goethe, A Day in the Life of the Aged Goethe 13 was being circulated clandestinely. Later called on Consul General Schlier on Avenue Sachet. Conversation with Trilla Rochelle, editor of the Nouvelle Revue Francaise, focusing on Malraux, whose career I have followed ever since I got my hands on his novel La Condition Humaine, The Human Condition, many years ago. Since then, I've considered him one to be of those rare observers with an eye for the war ravaged landscape of the 20th century. Went to see Spadell in the evening, who had just been on the telephone with the quartermaster general. Snow has already fallen in the central area of the Eastern Front. Paris, the 13th of October 1941. The morning was brisk, but I spent a pleasant hour in the Tuileries Gardens in the afternoon. It is impossible to be bored out in the sunlight. The we bathe in the fountain of time. Then went to the Quais de la Seine, where I bought a large format temptation of Saint Anthony by Calet in good condition. At the same stall, I pored over a colored drawing of the familiar motif of the bird that must be coaxed back into its cage. The pair of lovers who reclined, half exhausted and half revived, on a bedermia sofa, wore thin, tight clothes. Details of their anatomy were not exactly obvious, but nevertheless could be discerned in the contours of the cloth, resembling impressions of shells and ammonites. In this genre, it is especially important to set a trap for the imagination. This is the art of the embarrassing moment. Herpetology Museum, first in the empirically zoological section, then to works of art and ethnographic collections. Finally, the snake as symbol of magic and cultic power. All this in a southern landscape between labyrinthine gardens and ranges of cliffs crisscrossed with dazzling, winding paths. A flight of marble steps leads upward, and on it black, bronze, and multicolored body slays in the sunlight. The entrance is treacherous, discovered only by the initiated. In the background, near caves, are further buildings, like baths and a temple of Asclepius. The snake as primeval power is an archetype, a platonic idea. The images, whether of life or of the mind, advance toward it without ever reaching it. There is a similarity here to worms, round fish, reptiles, and dinosaurs or to Chinese dragons and fabulous creatures of all sorts. It would good for the house, project, to put the world into architectonic order from its dark cellars to its observatories. The staircases where encounters occur are important. Life takes place in the rooms, chambers, and halls. This is visible in all its detail, as if in pictures painted in shimmering dreamy hues. We move as though on stage but at the same time remain spectators. Pilgrim's Progress
the manuscript would have to be kept partly in the form of stage directions. Add to this the ordeal dimension, cries, which significantly simplify life's relationships. On Tuesday lay orders. They are killing our own, they're interrogating the children. The populated area would have to be paced off, anyone doing so would need to be of advanced age and have extensive experience. Individual rooms, the chamber of irrevocable decisions as a platonic ideal of all courtrooms. The declassification office. Elevators for the more sophisticated who no longer need steps. A cabinet of mirrors. Paris, the 14th of October 1941 went to the hotel. George V in the evening with Spidel. Cyberg was here, who with his pleasant nonchalance personifies all the skills of the cosmopolitan journalist and, even more important, with pronounced self-confidence that underscores and magnifies his talent. To judge by his horoscope, I can only assume the middle of the transit of Jupiter plus a good position of the Sun. As is common with this kind of aspect, the shape of the face departs from oval and approximates round. This impression is intensified by the hair sticking straight out from his head. He thinks the defeat of France is irreversible. But on the other hand, he believes in the continued predominance of this country in matters of taste and culture. Paris, the 15th of October 1941, went with Spidel to Sacagitri's for lunch on Avenue Elysee Rickless. In front of the house, on city property, there stands a bust of his father, the actor Lucian Gittry and in the garden, a female torso in sexual ecstasy by Rodin. When he welcomed me, Gittry handed me a folder containing one letter each by Octave Merb, Leon Bloy, and Abusi, the three authors whom we had discussed at our first meeting, and he told me to add these pieces to my collection. The little sheet by Bloy is especially lovely with its personal comments and the oversized penmanship typical of him. We then looked at books in manuscript, among them Flaubert's Education Sentimental, Sentimental Education, 1869. In a work by Bergson, he showed me the author's dedication a Sacagitri, an admirer to er, to Sacagitri from an admirer, and pointed out the UN, an, as opposed to son, his, as being especially choice. Moliere's travel case filled with first editions of his plays, Napoleon with all his marshals of the empire cast in lead, and many other things dot in the bedroom. Over the bed, the wall has been broken through, as in dining rooms, so as to let plates be passed through from the kitchen. This opening leads to his wife's bed, but it is a bit tight for her, master, says one of the guests. Being Madame Gittery comes at a price. He is promptly informed by the slender lady of the house. A colleague from the theatre arrives late, the most beautiful woman in Paris, twenty years ago, Gittry whispers to me before greeting her dot at the table. The salad was served on silver, the ice cream on a heavy gold service that had belonged to Sarah Bernhardt. I was again astonished by his effusive personality, especially when he told anecdotes of his encounters with royalty. When talking about different people, he would accompany his words with expressive gestures. During the conversation, he used his large horn-rimmed glasses to great dramatic effect. It dawns on me that in the case of such talent, the whole reservoir of personality that a marriage can possess gets used up by the man. And yet my first impression is corrected, because at the same time, this is surely a human being with real heart. I caught a glimpse of the fecund materia prima, primal material that is the root of all character. It is true that we enjoy ourselves in the aura of such idiosyncrasy, and this feeling of well-being produces the climate that promotes his personality. Paris, the 18th of October 1941 at noon in the Ritz with Carl Schmidt who gave a lecture the day before yesterday on the different significance of land and sea under international law. Colonel Spadell, Grun India, and Count Podwills also there conversation about current scholarly and literary controversies. Carl Schmidt compared his situation to that of the white captain in Melville's Benito Cyrano, who was held captive by black slaves, and he quoted the proverb, non possum scribe contraum, keep it is prescribe. 
I cannot write against him who can prescribe. 14 walked along the right bank to the tricade arrow. We discussed the matter thoroughly while doing so. Carl Schmidt finds significance in the fact that layers are beginning to peel away from the human stock and ossify beneath the region where free will exists, similar to the way that animals are the cast off masks of the human image. Man is evolving a new zoological order from himself. The real danger of privilege lies in whether or not one is included in it. I added that this ossification had already been described in the Old Testament and can be seen in the symbol of the bronze serpent. In that age, law represented what technology does today. Finally, we went to the Musée d'Ilham and viewed skulls and masks. Paris, the 19th of October 1941, visited Port Royal with Gruninger and Carl Schmidt. There on top of Pascal's books, I found the little bird's nest again that had so amused me during my first visit. Even in their state of dilapidation, such places still hold more life than when they are preserved as museums. We picked a leaf from Pascal's dying nut tree, then had breakfast in Moulin de Beechel, and spent the night in Rambouillet and Chartres where I saw the cathedral for the very first time. The colorful stained glass had been removed, and as a result, a dimension was lacking. Paris, the 21st of October 1941. The Doctor S called on me in the Majestic 15 to discuss matters of the safe. It concerned letters I had written from Switzerland to Joseph Britbach in 1936 that had been confiscated along with other papers in a bank safe, but not yet read. They contained references to further correspondence such as the one with Valery Umarku. I am cautiously attempting to gain control of these matters through the financial office of the Army High Command. I am keeping my personal papers and journals under lock and key in the Majestic. Because I am under orders from Speedel to process not only the files concerning Operation Sea Lion, 16 but also the struggle for hegemony in France between the military commander and the party, a special steel file cabinet has been set up in my room. Naturally, armor like this only symbolizes personal invulnerability. When this is cast in doubt, then even the strongest locks spring right open. Paris, the 22nd of October 1941 went for a walk with a milliner from the south who grew up near the Spanish border, she had come to me to make inquiries about a comrade. I had the pleasure of buying her a hat in a salon not far from the opera, a little number the size of a hummingbird's nest with a green feather on top. It was remarkable to see how this little person seemed to grow and change with her new adornment, the way a soldier swells with pride after receiving a medal. It wasn't so much a head covering as a decoration. We strolled and chatted through the twilight alleys near the Madeleine. It was Morris who first made me aware of this quarter. During such encounters, a strong feeling of curiosity makes me want to eavesdrop on people I don't know, get into strangers' gardens, or gain entrance to hallways of houses otherwise locked. And thus, I got a glimpse into an ancestral village, a nost, as they say here, with its groves of chestnut trees, chardineries, sheltering mushrooms and ring-neck doves. The wolf breaks into the fold slaughters two or three sheep confined there, but several hundred die in the stampede. Paris, the 23rd of October 1941 discussion with the doctor S at Cremalia, restaurant. A doctor with deft, precise, mercurial intelligence. At first, we conversed about the matter of the secure storage cabinet, then about grammar, then acquaintances we had in common, like Hercule. Finished reading Husman's, of all, with the flow, 1882, in a beautiful edition that I bought from Bears with the dedication from the author to his friend Raffaele, if I interpret the handwriting correctly. The hero of the book, Fromentin, is a bourgeois deus since. 17. The tone of the book is filled with powerful disgust at the counterfeit nature of civilization, every page contains perceptions and judgments that presuppose a nervous dyspepsia. As I read this, the thought occurred to me once again that certain maladies resemble magnifying glasses. They enable us to see more clearly the conditions they correspond to. 
one could categorize the literature of decadence accordingly. How much further we have sunk in the meantime, and how delectable those things have become that nauseate Fromentin, the leathery meat of the food stall, the blue wine, all that muck in general. Hussmans describes one of those points where we begin to delve into all these defects. This is the reason he is experiencing a renaissance today Paris, the 25th of October 1941 lunch with Ines A. Idel at Prunia. She was worried about her son-in-law, whom Hess employed as his astrological advisor but who has been arrested. That surprised me, since I thought that the flight to England had happened with Nilo's knowledge and possibly even on his orders. 18 one could counter this by saying that, with the rediscovery of raison d'etat, reasons of state, even having knowledge of certain secrets has become objectively more dangerous than before. Surely, that's the case here. This daredevil exploit gives an idea of the spirit of the roulette game that controls us. The return of the structures of the absolute state, but without aristocracy, meaning without objectivity, makes catastrophes of unimaginable dimensions possible. Yet they are anticipated in a feeling of fear that tinges even the victories. I heard something from Inasse Idel that I have occasionally heard from other intelligent women, namely that in certain figures of speech and images the precision of language leads us deep into forbidden regions that give the impression of imminent danger. We should always listen to such warnings, even when we must follow our own precepts. Like atoms, words contain a nucleus around which they orbit, vibrating, and they cannot be touched without unleashing nameless powers. Paris, the 2nd of November 1941, where people do intellectual battle, death is part of their strategy. This gives them something impregnable, and the thought that the enemy is intent upon taking their life loses some of its power to instill terror. On the other hand, it is of the highest importance that this should happen in the correct manner, and in a situation heavy with symbolism in which such people can be reliable witnesses. At times, they might give the impression that they shrink from death. In doing so, they resemble a field marshal who hesitates at length until the time is right before giving the signal to attack. There are different ways to conquer. The enemy who senses this in his obtuse way feels appalling frenetic anger when confronted by real intellect. This explains the effort to try to overpower him in vanguard's action, bribe him, or somehow distract him. These encounters produce moments that erase the incidental or historical nature of the enmity, and something evolves that has existed since the beginning of our earth. The roles are reversed in a remarkable way. It almost seems as though the fear were transferred to the side of the attacker, as if he were trying to corrupt his victim by all means possible, but postponing the death that he has prepared for him. A hideous triumph accompanies the butchery. History records situations in which men clutch death like a staff of office. So it was in the Templar's ritual where the Grand Master and the judges suddenly reveal themselves in their true characters. Then a ship dispels the phantasm as it comes into our astonished view flying flags and showing its cannons. In the evening, it would then be burned, but during the night, the site of the conflagration would be guarded so that people could not steal any of the holy relics. The ashes instill fear in the tyrant, who knows he must perish. Paris, the 5th of November 1941 judges at bloody assizes. When they cross the corridors and enter, they have a perfunctory aura about them the erstwhile dignity of macabre marionettes. They are juke juke dancers. 19 that which does not kill me, makes me stronger. 20 and what kills me makes me incredibly strong. In history, ideas do not proceed in linear fashion. They create reactions like the falling weight of a clock as it moves not only the hands but its counterweight as well. This establishes equilibrium. The ideas that correspond to forms are prevented from developing into monstrosities or from persisting within them. In the realm of free will, it's the same kind of pruning that in zoology trims the developing tendrils. Roland has returned from Russia and describes the hideous mechanism for executing prisoners. This is done under the pretext of wanting to measure and weigh them, for which they must strip. Then they are taken to the measuring apparatus, 
which in reality positions the air gun for delivering the coup de grace. Paris, the 10th of November 1941. In every age, there are two theories of evolution. One of these seeks our origin above, and the other, below. Both are true. Human beings may be categorized based on whether they accept one or the other. Paris, the 11th of November 1941. Regarding illnesses. There are differences here in the way these affect the imagination that do not correlate with the severity of the malady. I feel that I tend to ignore disorders of the lungs and heart more than those of the stomach, liver, and lower body in general. Purely with regard to the flesh, it seems there are also qualities of dying. Flames are reserved for unbelievers, thus, not only is cremation increasing but also immolation of the living. Paris. The 12th of November 1941 history is also made up of atoms, and it is impossible to imagine a single one different without changing the entire course of its progress. Marat would have made quite a different impression if his name had been something like Barat, or if when his assassin entered, he had been spending the tower at his desk instead of in the bath. It is precisely assassinations that often cause the greatest changes, and yet essentially they depend on such a concatenation of chance. Sarajevo provides us with a very good example here. When we look back, it is hard to imagine a single pebble in a different position. Should we be able to draw conclusions from this about the future? Should we conclude that the intellect is only capable of finding such seamless progression intelligible if we see all of the future inexorably folded in upon itself? Or is it the present that causes a change in the aggregate condition of the age by monumentalizing and fossilizing everything it touches? The future is fluid, the past is fixed. The whole resembles a game of cards, we have to distinguish between the ones on the table and the others, which are still in play. These observations form a mosaic. Yet we have to see those little pebbles of chance in a higher vision as Boethius does a vision that endures unchanged in his mind. Genuine morality lies outside of time. In the afternoon, read the farewell letters of Count Deschindorvs, who was executed by firing squad. I received these from his defense attorney. They are reading matter of the highest order, I had the feeling that I was holding an enduring document in my hands. Paris. The 13th of November 1941 contrast between the graphs of morale and physical health, even in good physical condition we often may be depressed, whereas the opposite is also true. We experience an upsurge, a spring tide, when our whole potential comes into play. It is good when an important date or significant meeting happens to fall on such days. To the George V, in the evening. I brought the maxims of René Quinton for Colonel Spidell. When he asked me for an inscription, I chose, La Recompense des Hommes, Chris Destimel's chefs, men's reward is to honor their leaders. Under his aegis, here deep in the military machine, we formed a kind of cell of intellectual chivalry, meeting in the belly of the beast trying to preserve regard and compassion for the weak and vulnerable. Conversation with Gruninger about soldiers' obedience and its relation to absolute, even constitutional, monarchy. After a while, this virtue resembles an instinct that continues to exert an influence, but can damage the man who possesses it by making him a tool of unscrupulous forces. This brings him into conflict with the second pillar of chivalry, honor. This the more delicate virtue, is the first extinguished, leaving behind a kind of automaton, a servant without a real master, who is finally little more than a pimp. In such times, the best characters founder upon the rocks, while more cunning intellects cross over into politics. In some lucky cases, a general from an old patrician family who finds himself in this situation laughs at those who try to command him, putting them in their place as the poor rich, rot, they are. Paris, the 14th of November 1941 visit from Dr. Gopel this morning. He brought me greetings from Carlo Schmid from Lille. Afterward, with Gruninger in the print collection of the Louvre, where we viewed lovely old pictures of flowers and snakes. The hour of twilight, night announces its presence like a tide that, murmuring and barely noticed, 
sends forth its first waves. Strange beings arrive with it. This is the hour when owls ready their wings and lepers come out on the street. We made demand of people no more than what is commensurate with their essence, from women love, not justice. Paris, the 15th of November 1941 Invitation to the birthday party for Jacqueline, the milliner from the south. Qui Louis Bleriot. A narrow back staircase led to the fifth floor, and a warren of low garret rooms reminiscent of the catwalks of a theatre. There was her apartment, a tiny bedroom almost completely filled by one of those large beds and as on small ships, a still smaller kitchen where her friend Jeanette, a tall, gaunt, slightly demonic person, prepared the feast. She conjured up seven courses. In addition, there was Bordeaux, Chianti, Café au Rum. In the corner, there hung one of those wooden stakes overgrown with the interlocking coils of a hardy vine. The wood was the sort that carpenters' apprentices at home traditionally used to cut walking sticks for themselves. This had also been trained to curl around the trunk so that the vine resembled a snake. The dimensions of the body, created by the play of muscles, worked well, probably because there are similar forces at work in the plant. The color was also very natural, a yellowish brown, speckled with black of the sort found in swamp dwelling species. In this vein, there was a conversation about snakes in general. Her friend said that when she was a child and lost in the Bernays region, she was once sitting in the garden with her mother who was nursing her little sister. Because the smell of milk attracts snakes, a gigantic adder slithered slowly and unnoticed out of a nearby hedge up to the chair, and frightened her. Her father came out and killed the creature. She recounted that quite graphically in a mythical way. Paris, the 18th of November 1941 concerning this journal. It captures only a certain layer of events that take place in the intellectual and physical spheres. Things that concern our innermost being resist communication almost resist our own perception. There are themes that interweave themselves mysteriously through the years, such as that of the inevitability that consumes our age. This is reminiscent of the grand image of the wave of life in Asian painting, or of the maelstrom in Iapo. There is something extremely instructive in this, for when there is no escape or hope, we are forced to stand still. Our perspective changes. It is nonetheless remarkable that confidence animates me most profoundly. The star of fate shines through the foam of the breaking waves and tattered clouds alike. I don't mean this only personally, but generally. During the past weeks, we reached the nadir and have gotten past it. The efforts we must make to survive our times and gain strength take place out of sight, deep in the mine shafts. So it was in the decisive dream upon the heights of Patmos on my journey to Rhodes. Our life is like a mirror, although it is smudged and hazy, it reveals meaningful things. One day we shall enter into this world of reflections and then attain perfection. The measure of perfection that we shall be able to bear is already implied by our lives. During the lunch break, went to the sales division of the print collection of the Louvre, where I had ordered a few copies of etchings that were out of print. Among these was the beautiful image of a cobra, coiled and erect with its neck flared. The sales clerk, a gaunt, dark-haired girl roughly in her thirties, told me that she always placed this sheet face down on the pile. When she wrapped it up for me, she bade it good by muttering sale bit, filthy beast. Otherwise an amusing person. When I made a comment that she seemed to find unusual, she was taken aback for a moment, and looked me up and down and said, Arbon in acknowledgement. During this brief visit, I leafed through the large folder of etchings by Pavsin. Although I have had an English reproduction of his Heracles at the crossroads hanging over my desk for years, it was only today that I truly realized the mighty, even regal spatiality of this master. This is absolute monarchy. Paris, the 19th of November 1941, paid a visit to the doctoress in the afternoon. An amethyst tinged flight of stairs leads to her apartment. I climb the steps through violet light in the spiral whirl of a seashell. In such centuries old houses, 
time itself is still part of the continuing construction process. There are small depressions, dislocations, and curvatures of the beams, and these change the proportions in a way that no architect could imagine. The Dr. S. thinks that families who rent apartments here never move out but simply become extinct in this place. We then went out to eat on Place Saint Michel. Had garfish served on ice and seaweed. Long strings of the plant covered the plate, and its color was extraordinary. At first glance it appeared black, but closer inspection revealed a dull, dark, malachite green, yet without any mineral hardness, one of life's great delicacies. Accompanying this were oyster shells with their green slate mother of pearl encrustations amid the reflections of silver, porcelain, and crystal. Paris, the 21st of November 1941 at Weber's for half an hour in the evening, the Dr. S. taught me how to open the safe. She also mentioned a doctor who took pictures of the dying so as to capture and study the agonies produced by various illnesses, a thought that I found both astute and repugnant. For some minds, taboos no longer exist. Paris, the 23rd of November 1941 lunch at the Morans on Avenue Charles Floquet. There I also met Gaston Gallimard and Jean Cocteau. Moran epitomizes a kind of worldly sybarite. In one of his books, I found a passage comparing an ocean liner with a leviathan infused with the aroma of chipa. 21 His book about London is commendable, it describes a city as a great house. If the English were to build pyramids, they would include London in the decoration of their tombs. Cocteau, amiable and at the same time, ailing, like someone who dwells in a special, but comfortable, hell. With intelligent women, it is very difficult to overcome physical distance. It is as though they girded their alert intellects with a belt that foils desire. It is too bright within their orbit. Those who lack specific erotic orientation are most assertive. This could be one of those chess moves that ensures the continuity of our species. One can ask advice of a subaltern in a matter, but not regarding the ethical system fundamental to that matter. The dignity of man must be more sacred to us than life itself. The age of humanity is the age in which human beings have become scarce. The true leaders of the world are at home in their graves. In moments of inescapable disruption, individuals must proclaim their allegiance like a warship hoisting its colors. By choosing certain circles in life, such as the Prussian general staff, one may gain access to certain elevated spheres of inside information but exclude himself from the highest. Paris, the 25th of November 1941. I sometimes spend my noon hour in the little cemetery near the Trocade Aero. Moss has grown over many a gravestone and edged the names and inscriptions with borders of green velvet. Things glow in their after image and often more beautifully in memory before they dissolve into the nameless void. After such visits, I usually have a half hour left over when I drink coffee in my room and read books or look at pictures. Today I admired Mumling's series on the procession of the Ten Thousand Virgins. These paintings give a hint of the transfiguration that man can attain, as well as what the artist can perceive. Reading matter, few made opium by Boise Airy, 22 a book that Cocteau recommended and sent to me. Furthermore, this strange story of the island of Juan Fernandez, a present from Dr. Werner, Best. Paris, the 26th of November 1941 dropped in on the print and book dealers on Rue de Tournon in the afternoon. In the antiquarian bookshop of Le Chivalier, with whom I have been corresponding for years. Admired entomological volumes, among them one by Swamadam. Went to the Brasserie Lorraine in the evening with Nebel and Poopit. When Poopit wants to characterize something trivial, like a book that's creating a stir, he says, Sail and exist pa, that does not exist. He likes to work in bed, and then in the morning when he wakes up, he continues his work where he left off. He sleeps with his books spread out around him on the bed and turns over carefully at night so as not to touch them. Paris, the 29th of November 1941 in the afternoon, I met Gruninger at Countess Podwills, 
He had just returned from the Pyrenees. He said he had dreamed about me. In the dream, he asked whether he should depict an ivy covered ruin. I answered yes and added, that suits you. I, on the other hand, want to represent an elephant. This bothered him as a reference to romanticism. In the evening, went to the grand giggle with the doctoress to cheer her up. I didn't find it as amusing as I had before the war, which is probably because horrors have replaced everyday life in the world, and so the presentation has lost its remarkable quality. Montmartre, dark, foggy, and locked down tight by police and soldiers because of an assassination that had taken place. The Paris. The 30th of November 1941 Conversations among men should be conducted like those among gods, among invulnerable beings. To duel with ideas is to use swords of the intellect that cut through matter without pain or effort. The deeper the cut, the purer the enjoyment. In such intellectual encounters, one must be indestructible. Paris, the 3rd of December 1941 at the shop of Le Chevalier on Rue de Tournon in the afternoon. While studying engravings and colored plates in books on insects, I was overcome by a feeling of disgust, as though the presence of cadavers had diminished my enjoyment. There are transgressions that touch the world in its entirety and its whole logical context. At such points, the aesthetic person must turn away from beauty and devote himself to freedom. The terrible thing nowadays is that it cannot be found in any of the parties, and so one has to do battle alone. On the other hand, it is the day laborers of this war we must envy, they fall with honor on a small patch of ground. And yet they too enter another, greater world. Later, at Char Mills on Ruda Belchas. The street is quiet and when I cross the stairwell time stands still in the twilight forecourts. This brings a feeling of security, no one knows my name and no one knows this place of refuge. Voyage auto de ma chamber, voyage around my room, in the old easy chair, as on the flying carpet from 1001 nights. We chat, mostly about words and their meanings, and sometimes look things up in books. The library is rich especially in theological and reference works. Charmill. What I admire about her, her sense of freedom, which is evident in the shape of her forehead. Among human beings there exists a type that is salt of the earth, people who always prevent history from sinking completely into stifling servitude. Individuals know by instinct what freedom is, especially when they are born among policemen and prisoners. You can always find those who belong to the race of the falcon or eagle, they are recognizable even behind prison bars. I had to reach this age to find enjoyment in the intellectual encounter with women, just as Cuban, the old sorcerer, prophesied of me. The change has meant something startling for me, precisely because I had been satisfied with the course of my life like a specialist in burlistics who has watched his shot traverse its prescribed trajectory and then seen it take a new direction into a limitless dimension. He had not known the laws of the stratosphere. In addition, the hunger for human beings grows significantly. In prisons, men see clearly their companions' latent merits. We can do without anything as long as we have other people. Ended the evening later at the Raphael Colon 23 Boise ear, fumes dopium. This book from 1888 was a treasure trove for me. It not only describes life in the Annamese, Vietnamese, swamps and forests but also has intellectual appeal. In the opium dream, there towers above the febrile tropical zones another, crystalline, world. Viewed from this level, even cruelty loses its horror. There is no pain here. That is perhaps the most exquisite quality of opium. It animates the mind's creative power and begets enchanted castles in the imagination. Upon those towers the loss of the swamps and foggy realms of this earth can never inspire fear. The soul creates levels for our passage to death. Paris, the 4th of December 1941 went to the theatre at Palais Royal in dense fog. I returned the Boise ear to Cocteau. He lives nearby on Rue de Montpensier in that very house where Astignac 24 received New St. John's wife. Cocteau was entertaining guests. Among his furnishings, 
I noticed a slate blackboard he uses to illustrate aspects of his conversation with swift chalk marks. I sensed the danger on the way home, especially when the doors in the narrow old streets near the Palais Royal opened onto hazy red lighted areas. Who knows what is brewing in such kitchens, who knows the plans the Lemures 25 are hatching. We pass through this fear in disguise, for if the fog were to lift, we would be recognized by these creatures, and the result would be disaster. Lham Ki Dort, Menu. A man who sleeps is a man diminished, one of Riverol's errors. Paris, the 7th of December 1941 at the German Institute this afternoon. Among those there was Merlin. Tall, raw boned, strong, a bit ungainly, but lively during the discussion, or more accurately, during his monologue. He speaks with a manic, inward directed gaze, which seems to shine from deep within a cave. He no longer looks to the right or the left. He seems to be marching toward some unknown goal. I always have death beside me. And in saying this, he points to the spot beside his seat, as though a puppy were lying the dot he spoke of his consternation, his astonishment, at the fact that we soldiers were not shooting, hanging, and exterminating the juice, astonishment that anyone who had a bayonet was not making unrestrained use of it. If the Bolsheviks were in Paris they would demonstrate it, show how it's done, how to comb through a population, quarter by quarter, house by house. If I had a bayonet, I would know what to do. It was informative to listen to him rant this way for two hours, because he radiated the amazing power of nihilism. People like this hear only a single melody, but they hear it uncommonly powerfully. They resemble machines of iron that follow a single path until they are finally dismantled. It is remarkable when such minds speak about the sciences, such as biology. They apply them the way Stone Age man did, transforming them only into a means to slay others. They take no pleasure in having an idea. They have had many, their yearning drives them toward fortresses from which cannons fire upon the masses and spread fear. Once they have achieved this goal, they interrupt their intellectual work, regardless of what arguments have helped them climb to the top. Then they give themselves over to the pleasure of killing. It was this drive to commit mass murder that propelled them forward in such a meaningless and confused way in the first place. People with such natures could be recognized earlier, in eras when faith could still be tested. Nowadays they hide under the cloak of ideas. These are quite arbitrary, as seen in the fact that when certain goals are achieved, they are discarded like rags. The announcement came today of Japan's declaration of war. Perhaps the year 1942 will be the one when more people than ever before will pass over and enter Hades. Paris, the 8th of December 1941 walked through the deserted streets of the city in the evening. Because of the assassinations, the populace is under curfew in the early evening. Everything lies lifeless in the fog. The sound of radios and chattering children came from the houses as if I were walking among bird cages. In the course of my work about the struggle between the army and the party for authority in France, I am translating the farewell letters of the hostages 26 who have been executed in Nantes. These came to light in the files. I want to preserve them because they would otherwise be lost. Reading them has given me strength. When faced with imminent death, Man seems to emerge from his blind will and realize that love is the most intimate of all connections. Except for love, death is perhaps our only benefactor in this world. In my dream, I felt Dorothea returning from my early childhood days. I felt her approach and touch me with her delicate and slender fingertips. I felt each individual finger, especially at the point where the fingernails begin as she trailed her hands over me. Then she stroked parts of the face, the eyelids, the corners of the eyes, the zygomatic arches. That was a very pleasant characteristic of this being and her whole conception. She performed the most detailed physical survey on me, it almost seemed as though she were trying to sculpt me, for she moved her fingers as though molding a fine pastry dough. Then she turned her attention to the hand but she seemed to make a mistake as she made long strokes across the back of my hand. 
While this was happening I noticed in the magnetism of this contact that she was now caressing the imaginary hand whose fingers were a bit longer than those of the physical one. In parting, she placed her hand upon my forehead and whispered, My dear friend, say your farewell to freedom. For a long time I lay awake in the dark, sad as never before, at least since the days of Vincennes. Paris. The 9th of December 1941 the Japanese are attacking with fierce determination. Perhaps because time is most precious for them. I surprise myself by changing allegiances. Sometimes I am overcome by the mistaken belief that they have declared war on us. It is impossible to untangle, like a sack full of snakes. Paris, the 10th of December 1941 floods. I was in the 19th century with a party of people on an outing who had taken refuge upon toppled oak trees to escape the mud. At the same time, great numbers of snakes were struggling to get to these dry spots. The men lashed out at the creatures with their walking sticks and flung some of them high into the air, so that some smashed when they fell but others landed in the crowd, biting. That caused an outbreak of panic, and people threw themselves into the mud. I was bitten by a living cadaver as it hit me. I thought, if these brutes left the animals alone, we would all be safe. As I translate the letters of the executed hostages as a document for future ages, I notice that the most frequent words are courage and love. Perhaps farewell is even more frequent. It seems that in such situations man senses a compassionate power and abundance of generosity and he can comprehend his actual role as that of victim, as that of benefactor. Kirchhorst, the 24th of December 1941 on furlough in Kirchhorst. Here I feel hardly any urge to write, a good sign for the gravitational pull that Perpetu exerts on me. Why carry on a monologue? Visitors, including Carl Schmidt. He stayed here for two days. During the night, images in the style of Hieronymus Bosch, a crowd of naked people, among them executioners and victims. In the foreground a woman of wonderful beauty whose head the executioner struck off with a single blow. I saw the torso stand for a moment before it crumpled, yet even headless, it seemed desirable. Other henchmen dragged their victims along on their backs so as to slaughter them somewhere else, in private. I saw that they had bound the chins with cloth to prevent any obstruction to the blow. The ducks in the garden. They mate in the puddles on the lawn left by the rain. Then the duck stands in front of the drake and flaps her wings, puffing out her chest, a primeval courtship ritual. 1942 on the train, the 2nd of January 1942 returned to Paris at midnight. Before that, Dinner on Stefan Splatz with Ernstel and Perpetua.27 Looking at the boy in profile, I noticed the genteel but also paint quality his face has acquired. In these times, the two go hand in hand. The year will be extraordinarily perilous, we never know whether we are seeing each other for the last time. Every farewell includes the confidence in a higher reunion. In the compartment, conversation with a lieutenant returning from Russia. His battalion lost a third of its men to the freezing temperatures, in part because of the amputations. The flesh turns white, then black. Conversations like this are now quite common. He says there are field hospitals for soldiers with frostbitten genitals, and even their eyes are endangered. Frost and fire conspire like the two blades of a vicious pair of shears. Paris. The 4th of January 1942 at La Durée's in the company of Nebel and the Doctor S. We spent the afternoon chatting in their hotel, Wagram. I have the impression that, given the nature of the situation, we can no longer continue as caution dictates. As in the act of childbirth, we are forced onward. This is the effect of the reviews of On the Marble Cliffs 28 in the Swiss papers. I like the euphony of the eye in Blibben, remain, stay, in the same way that I like other vowel sounds, such as in Mania, Lat, Remain, Manoia, Fr, Country House, Manor. This is the way we must rediscover language. Grun India, about his conversation with a theologian, evil always appears at first as Lucifer then evolves into Diabolus, 
and finally ends as satanas. This is the way the bringer of light develops, from the one who divides to the one who destroys, or, to express this with the quality of vowels, we see the triad, U, I, A. Paris, the 5th of January 1942 during the midday break bought paper for my manuscript about peace. Began with the outline. Also tested the safe for its security. Paris, the 6th of January 1942. Stavrogin. 29 His disgust with power. No corrupt authority ever tempts him. By contrast, we have the man who comes from below, Pyotr Stepanovich, 30, who understands quite well that under such conditions power becomes a possibility for him. Thus, the humbler man rejoices when he sees the magnificent woman he desires shamed, for only then does she become attainable for him. This also shows up after the fact, in the regiment. Where villains reign, they can be seen exercising infamy without restraint and disregarding the tenets of statecraft. This infamy is celebrated like a mass, in its depths, it conceals the mystery of popular power. Read the manuscript of Maurice Spitz's translation of Garden und Strassen, Gardens and Streets. For the word frillage, certainly, I found Delius Verate, it is true, which in this instance does not sound right to me. Frillage can precede a qualifier, on the other hand, it can also signal emphasis. The closest to it is probably my opinion boils down to, or when we consider this properly, we find that. You could say that it's an intensifier, but it also makes you put your cards on the table. Yet something else is in play here as well, namely a note of exhortation, a kind of cheerful affirmation implied for the reader's benefit. The reader's assent has been tacitly assumed. At the George V in the evening. Among those present were Nebel, Gruninja, Count Podwills, Heller, and Maggie Drescher, a young sculptress. Nebel declaimed the poem to Harmodios and Aristogeiton, to whom there stands a magnificent statue in the Museo Nazionale, Naples. He followed this with verses by Sappho, Sophocles, and Homer. He easily accesses the extraordinary memory he has at his disposal, giving the impression that he is actively creating the poetry. That's the way to quote. By incantation. Paris, the 7th of January 1942 in the afternoon at Pupits on Ruger and Seir. In these narrow streets around St. Sulpice with their antiquarian bookshops, book dealers, and old workshops, I feel so at home, it's as though I had lived among them for 500 years. When I entered the building, I recall that I had first crossed this threshold in the summer of 1938 coming from the Palais du Luxembourg just as today via de Tournon. And so, the circle of years gone by has closed like the clasp of a belt. When I entered I tried to convey this feeling to Poopit, the feeling that overwhelms me so often when I glimpse old familiar things and people, this feeling from the past, bounteous as a net full of fish, becomes clear when we encounter it again. Even though this was difficult to express in a foreign language, I had the impression that he understood me. Charmil. We talked about Proust, and Poopit gave me one of his letters. Then about acquaintances whom she characterized in acerbic detail. Also about the influence of Eros upon physical development. Related to this, the word surplus, flexibility, like this in vulture, detachment seems untranslatable. The first letter from Perpetua. As I had sensed, after they had brought me to the station, the two of them continued talking about me for a long time on their way home through the dark streets. She might buy a house for us near Els, that region in the heart of the, Lundberg. Heath would be just right for the solitary life we both long for. In addition, our letter from Wolfgang, who, the third of us four brothers, has been called up. As a corporal, he has been put in charge of a prison camp in Zolicha. The prisoners will be in good hands there. He writes this curiosity, Yesterday I was sent on official business to Sarau in the Lazitz, area, where I had to deliver a prisoner to the field hospital. While there, I also had to pay a visit to the asylum. There I encountered a woman whose only tick consisted of continuously murmuring Heil Hitler. At least it's a fitting, topical form of insanity. 
even when viewed tactically, exaggerated prudence increases danger. People listen most carefully to those who disguise their voices. There is, incidentally, an aristocratic as well as a Jacobin instinct for anyone not party to this. There are degrees of subtlety and simplicity that are dissembled, and ultimately, what is prudence without providence? Paris, the 9th of January 1942 in the evening, another bottle of Buny with wine stock, who is going to Angers. In him, as well as in Nebel and Friedrich Georg, 31 I can observe the powerfully formative influence that ancient Greek culture still exerts upon modern Germans. Their language, history, art, and philosophy will always remain indispensable for the training of elites. I was thinking again with great animation about the marble cliffs. The book is open-ended, unfinished, it finds its continuation in events. On the other hand, the events harken back and change the book. In this sense, it resembles an ellipse with two foci. One of these marks the author's place, the other, the place of facts. Filaments connect these two as in nuclear fission. Thus, it can change fate, but it's also possible for it to determine the fate of the author. This indicates that he had been working in other realms than language. For example, where dream imagery is powerful. Paris, the 10th of January 1942, T with the Dr. Oris. In the evening, we went to a small cellar restaurant on Rue de Montpensier to meet Poupit and Cocteau. Cocteau was delightful, ailing, ironic, fastidious. He complained that people were sabotaging his plays, letting rats loose, and throwing tear gas bombs onto the stage. Among the anecdotes he recounted, I found the one about the bad tempered coachman especially good. When he was a student in school, he had taken a cab home in the pouring rain after seeing a play in the theatre. Unfamiliar with the standard rates of tipping, he gave the coachman too little and then approached the door of the building where the family, who were friends of his parents, was standing in the rain because the lock was difficult to open. As he greeted them, the coachman called after him, What kind of tip is this? What if I were to tell them where I picked you up? Read a little more back in the Raphael. I finished the novel by Countess Podwills, then started Confession by Can. It is a significant work, recommended to me by Carl Schmidt, its editor. Can's experience is at prayer. He feels it when his prayers get through. His own little cog of destiny turns in conformity with the course of the universe. Woke up at five o'clock. I had dreamed that my father had died. Then I thought about Perpetua for a long time. In the morning, Morris Spitz came and brought his translation. We looked through a series of questionable passages and normalized some of the less common words, particularly names of animals and plants. In such cases it is best to go back to the Latin of Linnaeus's system. That logical, conceptual system makes it possible to elucidate philosophical and poetic differences. Paris, the 13th of January 1942 birthday party at the Raphael. It dawned on me for the first time that the inhabitants of this hotel are trustworthy. That kind of thing is only possible today when the circle is the result of an unspoken self-selection. A vicious joke that Phillips told about Nibelow gave the signal for candid conversation. Coercion and caution separate people like masks, when these are stripped off, exuberant merriment breaks out. I got into a serious conversation with Mers and Hattingen and explained the main ideas of my manuscript about peace to them. Conversation with Luther about surveillance. He said it had been difficult to recruit Englishmen for the job, yet before the war, he had succeeded in recruiting a man of good social position whom they equipped with a shortwave radio that he still uses to transmit weather reports from London. He said this was crucial for the aerial attacks. This Englishman had recently given shelter to an agent who had broken his leg in a parachute landing. For weeks he had to hide and care for the man in his apartment. The first time this agent went out, he was arrested and later executed without ever having betrayed his host. These things have an almost demonic nature, especially when we consider the terrible loneliness such people endure in the midst of a population of millions.
for this reason, I can't commit any details to these pages. Paris, the 14th of January 1942 Charmil. There are conversations that can only be compared to smoking opium together. Part of this is the light-hearted, effortless back and forth, like the gracefully coordinated movements of acrobats. She, incidentally, praises something in my own conversation that others have criticized, that I am almost always thinking of other things and often reply to sentences after my partner makes some good observation, once they have long since dissolved into the greater context. Paris, the 15th of January 1942 in the mail. Ah letter from Fuhr Bloom with a note about the hippopotamus colon 32 I think that your princess has been a bit influenced by the fall of the house of Usher, but she also shows the path to healing. That is good. Poe showed only the decline. The fact is, when I conceived of this story in a dream before visiting Cuban, I experienced a powerful longing to emerge from the maelstrom. We have to view such things as prognostication for these imagined figures begin the circle dance of destiny, keeping it going, sometimes smiling and sometimes terrified. And literature is invisible history, as yet unlived, but also its corrective dot in addition, our letter from Perpetua who in the meantime has taken a look at the house near Bevanson. During the trip she got into a political discussion with the driver. To her amusement, he ended it with the comment, anything but a group where the chairman has lice. By the way, it is one of her greatest qualities that she can converse on all social levels. When she presides at table she puts everyone at ease. Paris, the 17th of January 1942 In my dream, I was at Emery Creators in Pasco looking at insects. He showed me a case filled with examples of the species Sternocera. Instead of showing their typical cylindrical form, all of them were broad and flat. I nonetheless recognized their classification at first sight. I love these variations that still preserve the species. These are the adventurous journeys of an idea across archipelagos of matter. In the afternoon, Charmil picked me up to go swimming. Magnificent sight in the pond. I saw one of the large and marvelous fishes cloaked in tiny bubbles, hovering in the green water. I perceived this from above, foreshortened as is frequently the case with magical things. Paris, the 18th of January 1942 A restless night. Sleep interrupted by long period of wakefulness. I spent the time thinking of Karis, my imaginary son. In the evening, I saw Armand, who wants to go underground. We ate together in the Brasserie Lorraine. After walking up Rue du Faubourg Saint Honore, where I always feel good. He asked me whether I wanted to meet his friend Donozo, and I said no. Later he responded to a comment about both our countries, ah, pour ça je vaudrais vous embrace bien fort. Ah, for that I'd like to give you a big hug, said goodbye on Avenue de Wagram. I then put my uniform on and went to the George V. Spidel, Saeberg, Gruninja, and Rort, chief of the general staff of the First Army with whom I had discussed Rembord and similar things in Hamburg right after World War I. Then Colonel Gerlach, who has come to us from the East as a quartermaster, and in whose conversation one can study the pungent wit of Potsdam. There are always the same conversations in these gatherings, sometimes more, sometimes less emphatic, as though we were in the antechambers of the inevitable. In these situations, I always have to think of Benigson and Zarpaul. Gerlach, in particular, was informed about the lack of winter clothing in the East. This, like the execution of hostages in the West, will become one of the major themes of later research, whether that research is focused on the history of the war or on adjudicating it. On optics. In the afternoon in the Raphael, looking up from my reading, I stared at a round clock. When I turned my gaze away, it remained as a pale, round after image on the wallpaper. I kept my eye focused on a projection from the wall that was closer than the part the clock was fastened to. Here the after image appeared much smaller than the clock. But when I moved my eyes so that my gaze got very close to the clock, 
then its after image merged with it, and they both overlapped. And finally, when I projected it to a point farther away, I had the impression that it grew bigger. This is a nice example for the mental alteration that we project based on distance. By straining the retina in the same way, we enlarge a familiar object in the distance, and we minimize it when it seems closer. E. A. Poe bases his story The Sphinx upon this law. Nowadays, when I wake up at night in the Raphael, as often happens, I can hear the Death Watch beetle in the wooden paneling. It knocks louder and slower, and with greater significance, than the ones I heard in the deadwood of my father's pharmacy. These somber signals probably come from a large dark canobid, wood borer beetle. I found a specimen of one on the staircase last summer and now have it in my collection in Kirchhorst. I could not identify it, it is probably an imported species. These sounds announce a tremendous remoteness from everyday life, sounds from a creature active nearby in the dry wood. And yet, in comparison to other distances, it is close and familiar. We are passengers on one ship. Paris, the 20th of January 1942, in the evening with Dr. Weber in Palais Rothschild. Thanks to his clandestine gold purchases, he has a thorough knowledge of all the occupied territories and the neutral countries. I asked him if he would pay a visit to Brockenderick regarding the matter of the Swiss newspapers. He can also be useful to me in other ways. I enjoy talking with him especially because he's a compatriot who exemplifies the dry humor of the lower Saxon type. He leaves the impression that the world is not about to end all that soon. Incidentally, it is instructive to see a gathering of intellects like those assembled during that remarkable meeting of national revolutionaries at Kritz's at the Itchhoff conference, and to consider them in a European and global context. One can sense what lies at the core of the human being. Sometimes it is the tyrant in the petty bookkeeper or the mass murderer in the ridiculous swaggerer. These histrionics are rare because it takes extraordinary circumstances for this core to reveal itself. It is also remarkable to re-encounter marginalized characters and literary types whose chaotic nocturnal rantings are impossible to forget. How amazing to meet them again in positions of authority where their word is law. There are times when the flimsiest dreams force their way into reality. Yet when Sancho Panza 33 was governor of Barataria, at least he didn't take himself seriously. That's still his most attractive attribute. In yesterday's dispatch, the Russians claim that when they tried to remove the boots from German prisoners, the feet come off too. A typical snippet of propaganda from that icy hell. Paris. The 21st of January 1942 visit to Charmil on Rue de Belchasse. The clock runs faster during our chat, as in the primeval forests of old. Various factors converge to create this effect. Beauty, complete intellectual comprehension, and the presence of danger. I attempt to slow the pace through reflection. This retards the delicate clockwork. I find a human being, that's like saying, I discover the Ganges, Arabia, the Himalayas, the Amazon River. I saunter through that person's secluded places and vast expanses, I note the treasures I find there, and in doing so, I change and grow. In this sense, especially in that person, we are formed by our fellow human beings, our brothers, friends, women. The atmospheric conditions of other climates remain in us so powerfully that after some encounters I feel, this person must have known this or that other one. Contact with human beings stamps us like goldsmith's hallmarks on precious objects. Paris, the 24th of January 1942 in Fontainebleau with Rorick, the commander of the First Army. He lives in the house belonging to the Dolly sisters. I spent the night there. Reminisced about old times, the Hanoverian riding school, Fritsch, Siecht, and the aged Hindenburg, in those days, we lived in the embryo of the Leviathan. The stone floor of the dining room is tiled in green veined marble and lacks a carpet. According to the old custom, it is uncarpeted so that diners could toss bones and scraps of meat onto the floor for the dogs. Fireside chat, first about Momsen and Spengler, 
and then about the progress of the campaign. Our conversation reminded me of the damage Burkhardt caused with his Renaissance, 34 especially those Nietzschean impulses that spread among the educated class. These were intensified by theories from natural science. It is strange how pure speculation can be transformed into will, into passionate action. Simplification corresponds to complication, weight and counterweight in the clock of destiny. Just as there is a second religiosity, there is a second brutality, more pallid and neurotic than the original. I always work hard at such conversations, you have to be less focused on the individual than on the hundreds of thousands of people he represents. In the morning, Lieutenant Ramalo showed me the castle. Charmil. Concerning dreams of flying, she told me that she often thinks she can fly, and demonstrated this with a graceful sweep of both arms. Yet when she does so, she has the feeling of being anchored by a weight hanging from her body. She calls the compulsion to fly a persecution that is always a variety of fear. That could apply to many situations, even to our contemporary one. The upswing that she described with her arms was less that of a bird than one of a delicate dinosaur. Or maybe the gesture contained a hint of both. It makes me think of the wing blowing motion of the Archaeopteryx. Paris. The 25th of January 1942 in the Madeleine Theatre in the afternoon to see a play by Saka Gitri. Enthusiastic applause, Christ Taute Fet Saka. That's pure Saka, cosmopolitan taste is always a matter of perspective and delights in scene changes, mistaken identity, and unexpected characters, as in a house of mirrors. The complications are so intricate that they are already forgotten on the staircase. Who did what to whom seems irrelevant. The nuances are pursued to such an extreme that nothing is spared. A painting of Eleanor Adews in the foyer. It's only in recent years that I seem to have gained an appreciation for this kind of beauty. Her otherworldliness surrounds her like an impenetrable aura. The reason for this may be that we sense a kinship. A relationship in such beings, incest is part of it. It is easier to approach Aphrodite than Athena. When Paris handed over the apple, he created great desire and great suffering by speaking with the natural appetite of the shepherd, the warrior. At a more mature level, he might have discovered that an embrace can also bestow power and wisdom. As always, before turning out the light, I read the Bible, where I have gotten to the end of the books of Moses. There I read the horrible curse that reminds me of Russia, and thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. Deuteronomy 28 hours 23 minutes. My brother-in-law Kurt, von Jansen, laments in a letter that his nose and ears have almost frozen. Young recruits whose feet have frozen get dragged along. For all that, he had originally set out in a huge column of vehicles. In their last dispatch, the Russians claim that the week's fighting has cost us 17,000 dead and several hundred prisoners. And who would not prefer to be among the dead? Paris, the 27th of January 1942 in a letter, Fuhr Bloom writes about her reactions to reading my gardens and streets and particularly to passages she has noted. For example, that one must read the prose as if through latticework. To that, a female friend commented, you have to be able to see the lions behind the bars. It's curious that such images often produce concepts quite contrary to those intended. I meant, namely, that words form a lattice as they yield a glimpse of the unutterable. They engrave the setting for the gem, but the stone itself remains invisible. But I too shall adopt the image of the lion. Refraction produces one of the errors, but also the advantages of style Margi.35 Paris, the 28th of January 1942 reading through a text, my personal sensations and thoughts are always at work like an aura imparting a luster to this strange light. In some sentences or images thoughts come to my consciousness in profusion. I then deal with the first one and leave the others out in the waiting room but occasionally I open the door, just to see if they're still standing around. All the while, I continue reading. While I'm reading, I always have the feeling that I am essentially dealing with my own material. 
This is what an author is supposed to produce. In doing so, he serves himself first, and only then, others. The mail included a letter from Schlechter containing nine drawings for 1001 nights. An image of the city of bronze is wonderfully successful, full of mourning for death and glory. The sight awakened in me the desire to possess the piece, I'd like to have it to complement his Atlantis before its destruction, which has hung in my study for years. Early on my father developed a sharp eye for the magic of the tale of the city of bronze, which is among the most beautiful in this wonderful book. Amiya Musa is a man of profound spirit, a connoisseur of the melancholy of ruins, of the bitter pride that goes before a fall, which in our culture is at the heart of all archaeological effort. Musa considers this to be pure and contemplative. Paris. The 29th of January 1942 wrote to Schlichter concerning the picture of the bronze city. In doing so, I thought of other tales from 1001 Nights, especially the one about Piri Banu. That tale has always seemed like a description of an exalted love affair that makes people willing to forswear or sacrifice inherited royal prerogative for its sake. It is beautiful the way the young prince disappears in this realm, as though into a more spiritual world. In this fairy tale work, he and Musa stand out as princes from ancient Indo European empires, far superior to the Oriental despots and quite comprehensible to us. Right at the beginning, the archery competition with the bow is beautiful, the bow, a life symbol with metaphysical tension for Prince Achmed. His arrow thus flies incomparably far into the unknown and beyond all the others. The castle of Piri Banu is the spiritualized mountain of Venus. The invisible flame is everlasting, but the visible one consumes. Paris, the 30th of January 1942. Today's mail brought a letter from Friedrich Georg, who, in reference to gardens and streets, quotes the sentence of Quintilian. Ratio pegium in orationist multa quam in versu difficilia. The principles governing metrical feet are much more difficult in prose than in verse, here he touches upon a question that has occupied me in recent years, namely how to take prose a step further, give it a new dynamic that unites both strength and grace. We must find new keys to unlock the enormous legacy that lies concealed the dot Paris. The 1st of February 1942 Nebel visited me this morning to discuss an incident that occurred at his listening post. He certainly could not say that nobody had warned him. After he had incurred suspicion through his essay about the insect people, published by Sukamp, he now provoked denunciation.36 in the hallways during the New Year's Eve festivities, they had made fun of the head forester. 37 Nebel has to disappear for a while, but the departure of such a clever mind from this city saddens me. In the afternoon at Madame Bow. Lamotte's where Cocteau read aloud his new play Reinor Det Armide. It was a magical combination of supple and melodious sound, and he was more than up to the task. His lilting voice had both lightness and strength and was especially fitting when describing how the sorceress Armid enchants and snares the bewitched Reinor. He let out cries of file file file. Run run run, launching them into the air like autumnal gossamer. There, in addition to Gaston Gallimard, I met Hella, Wema, the Doctoress, and the actor Mary Eyes, a plebeian Antinous. Afterward, conversation with Cocteau while he recounted amusing anecdotes about a play that used painted human hands representing snakes rising up out of a basket on stage. Actors then lashed out at these beasts with sticks. But it happened that when one of the snakes was struck particularly hard, murd. Shit, was heard from beneath the trapdoor from a bellowing extra dot in Dwent, near the opera. It's one of my old failings that the days when I especially love my neighbors and those when I actually express this to them rarely coincide. At times the spirit of contradiction grips me powerfully. Dreams at night, in deepest sleep, the meaning of the chambers became apparent to me. They bordered on the room where I was sleeping, and each had a door, one for the mother, one for the wife, for the sister, the brother, the father, the mistress. And in the silent power and influence of these rooms, in their overwhelming nearness and grand detachment, there lay something both solemn and fearfully clandestine. 
and then the mother entered. Paris, the 2nd of February 1942 at the Ritz in the evening with the sculptor Brecker, who had invited me and his wife, an intelligent Greek woman, at Rue Bohemian. Madame Brecker devoured our appetizer of sardines without leaving a trace, jarred all eight eights, vow saucy. I just love the heads, don't you? Nebel was there as well, again with his typical Parnas and joviality. When it comes to things he likes, he possesses a delicate touch, as though he were lifting a curtain with a smile to reveal precious objects. He called our modern savagery unique, insofar as it maintains no belief in the indestructibility of the human race and, in contrast with the Inquisition, is determined to destroy and obliterate us all forever. His case, incidentally, was decided with leniency, he was transferred to E. Tamps. Paris, the 3rd of February 1942 in the morning, Jesson called on me in my room in the Majestic. As soon as I saw him, I remembered those good, or rather, precise predictions that I had heard about him a year ago when most people had not given any thought to a Russian war. The value of a clear, highly focused intellect that perceives the inherent logic of things is evident. You can see that in him, in his eyes, and especially upon his brow you see evidence of a consummately rational intellect. Men like him and Poppitz, who was also present at the time, are the last specimens that German idealism has driven into this desert. New predictions. We talked about the rigidity that has made itself felt since the beginning of this year. I perceive it very clearly, as if I carried a gauge inside me that measures currents and countercurrents. Then Valentina, a son of the U boat captain, the old Viking. As a corporal here, he has a minor post as an interpreter for the airmen. He spends most of his time with books or with friends in a studio that he has rented in a garret on the Quai Voltaire. He invited me there, and I had the feeling that the visit was going to be the first in a long friendship. It was gratifying to note his intellectual courage when he entered the room. Stokers in a boiler room where pressure of a million atmospheres throbs behind the escape valves. The manometers rise gently beyond the last red line on the gauge. Things are suddenly silent. Flames flare up behind the tempered glass. Paris, the 4th of February 1942, finished reading La Faustine by Edmund Agincourt. A few weeks ago, I bought a copy of the book signed by the author from Bears. As I read it, I was slightly displeased whenever I came upon a fact that I was familiar with from Goncourt's journals. Things like that can be annoying in artistic works, which should incorporate life experiences more profoundly and unobtrusively. Otherwise they remind us of the sort of picture that disrupts painted imagery with an overlay of collage. A word about the author's method of connecting with the reader, in his preface, Goncourt invites his female readers to send him documents humanes, personal documentation, revealing private details of their lives that could be useful to him as an artist. This gesture is improper, it oversteps the boundaries of the genre that should constrain the work. Faustein shows little composition, and the characters make entrances where they are not necessary, but the author happens to need them. Furthermore, the decadence is so far advanced that it is tolerable only in very well written descriptions. Paris, the 5th of February 1942, new poems by Friedrich Georg arrived from New Berlin. In Zelina, I recognize his old love for female tightrope walkers and circus performers. I had already known peacocks, so full of bright sunshine, as though reflected from faceted gems, and the poem Sundial. A man's true masculinity does not begin to show until he has reached his fortieth year. Paris, the 6th of February 1942 This morning's dreams were of a pond or lagoon edged in stone. I stood there to watch the creatures in the water. Birds would dive beneath the surface and fish would jump out. I listened to a grey speckled coot as it swam over the rocky bottom. Stone grey fishes rose to the surface, dreaming and becoming ever more visible. I watched this from my vantage point on domes that protruded from the water's surface and twice gave way underneath me. I had been standing on the shells of tortoises. Paris. 
the 8th of February 1942 at Spidell's this morning. There was a large crowd in his outer office because of the Sunday signatures. He had just returned from headquarters and showed me the notes he had made on the files. These altered my opinion that strategies of elimination, those efforts to murder by shooting, starving, and exterminating, are produced by a general nihilistic tendency in our age. Of course that is also true, but behind the swarms of herrings, there are sharks driving them on. No doubt there are individuals responsible for the blood of millions, and they go after bloodshed like tigers. Aside from their vulgar instincts, they have an inherently satanic will that takes cold pleasure in destroying human beings, perhaps even humanity. A deep sorrow seems to come over them, a wail of fury when they sense that some power prevents them from devouring as much as their lust demands. You can see them preparing massacres when these seem unnecessary, even when they threaten their own security. It was horrible to hear what Jardel reported about Nuelo's objectives. Let's not forget that many Frenchmen support such plans and are eager to provide the hangman's services. But here in our organization, there are regulations in force that restrain the participation of our partners and even put a stop to clandestine activities. Most of all, it is crucial that any semblance of humanity be diligently avoided. Went to the ex royal in the afternoon with the Dr. S. After that, to visit Valentina on the Quai Voltaire. An ancient elevator supported by a cable alarmed us all the way up as it let out creaking wails of protest. In the garret, we found several little rooms full of old furniture, books were strewn about on tables and easy chairs. The owner received us in casual civilian attire. Whenever time permits, he sneaks off to this hideaway and changes his life with a change of clothes as he whiles away the hours in reading and introspection or in the company of friends. The degree to which he succeeds is a testimony to his freedom and imagination. In this place Cocteau felt himself reminded of times he had spent similarly during World War I. We enjoyed fine conversation in his little lair and were able to gaze out over the ancient roofs of Saint Germain des Pieres. Paris, the 10th of February 1942, called on Nostitz in the evening on Place du Palais Bourbon. Among the guests, I noticed the young Count Kieserling, 38, although he spoke not a word the whole evening. He reclined in an easy chair, half languishing and luxuriating dreamily like a cat. The old families still have a sense of security, even intrinsic elegance, in the most intellectual circles. Paris, the 12th of February 1942, took a walk down Avenue des Tournies in the middle of the day. After these past weeks of bleakness, the first glimmer of spring filled the air with life. Underfoot, the black, hard packed snow still lay on the streets. I was feeling nervous, excited, and whimsical which often happens when spring approaches. Dot on the catastrophe of human life, the heavy wheel that grinds us to a pulp, the shot of the murderer or fanatic that cuts us down. The tinder had accumulated inside us long enough, and now the spark has just been ignited. The explosion comes from inside us. Dot this caused so many of the wounds in World War I. They corresponded to the fiery spirit that exhilarated me and found escape valves because it was too powerful for the body. The same is true of the wild escapades and affairs that result in wounds and often, suicide. Life leaps into the barrel of a revolver. Went to the Raphael. Met Major von Voss, in whom a bit of the 15th century is visible, like a vein of silver in a rock. His bloodstream carries something of the troubadour something of the old free and easy sorcery. There is always good company there. From encounters like this, you can learn history right from its source. Paris, the 15th of February 1942 I dropped in to see the doctoress, who was laid up with sciatica. Conversation about the human body, then about its specific anatomy. She told me that in the early days on her way home from the dissection lab after staring at the deep red color of human flesh, she often felt ravenous. Paris, the 16th of February 1942 Andromeda. 
in the case of such regal daughters, it's the same as with the Germanic tribes, they had to be broken before they embraced Christianity. They can love only when they are prey to the dragon in the abyss. The love of a particular woman is twofold, because on the one hand, she shares what she has in common with millions of other women, and at the same time, she alone possesses what differentiates her from all others. How strange it is that both aspects meet so perfectly in the individual. The Chalice and the Wine. Paris, the 17th of February 1942 visited Carved in the evening at a party that included Cocteau, Weimer, and Poupet, who gave me an autograph of Proust for my collection. That prompted Cocteau to tell about his association with Proust. He would never let anybody dust his rooms, the layer of dust on the furniture was as thick as chinchilla. Upon arrival, you would be asked by the housekeeper whether or not you had brought flowers, whether you were wearing scent, or had been in the company of a woman wearing perfume. He was usually to be found in bed, but dressed and wearing yellow gloves to prevent him biting his nails. He spent a lot of money making workers in the building stop because their noise disturbed him. It was never permitted to open a window. The night table was covered with medicines, inhalers, and sprays. His refined taste did not lack macabre aspects. He would go to the slaughterhouse and ask to be shown how a calf was killed. Concerning poor style, this becomes most apparent in moral contexts, such as when a bad writer tries to justify the shooting of hostages. That is far worse, far more flagrant, than any mere aesthetic offense. Style is essentially based on justice. Only the just man can know how he must weigh each word, each sentence. For this reason, we never see the best writers serving a bad cause. Paris, the 18th of February 1942 visit from Baron von Schramm, back from the Eastern Front. The colossal loss of life in the gruesome cauldrons 39 awakens a longing for the old death, death that was other than being trampled. Schramm expressed the opinion that not everyone was dragged into these lethal rings, just as fate did not send everyone to the Manchester Bone Mills. 40 The crucial distinction is ultimately whether you die a humane death in either of these. Then you draw on personal strength to make your own bed and altar. In those depths, many of our grimmest dreams come true, things become historical reality that we have seen coming for a long time for more than 70 years. Paris, the 22nd of February 1942 called on Klaus Valentina on the Quai Voltaire in the afternoon. There I met Nebel, the outcast of the islands, 41 who is being sent to one of the islands tomorrow, just as in the days of the Roman emperors. Then visited Weimar, who is leaving. While I was there, Madeleine bowed at Gallimard's secretary handed me the page proofs of the translation of Marble Cliffs by Henri Thomas. In the Raphael I woke up to a new attack of melancholy. This just comes, like rain or snow. The enormous distance that separates us human beings became clear to me, a distance that we can gauge in our relationships with our nearest and dearest. We are separated from each other by endless distances like the stars. But that will all change after death. The most beautiful part of death is that it erases this distance while extinguishing the physical light. We shall be in heaven. An idea that makes me feel better, maybe Perpetua is thinking of me at this moment. The struggle of life, the burden of individuality. On the other hand, all that is universal, with its ever rising high water mark. In moments of embrace, we submerge ourselves in it, sink down into strata penetrated by the roots of the tree of life. Of course, there is also superficial, transitory lust, combustible as kindling. Above and beyond this lies marriage, you shall be one flesh. Your sacrament, one bears only half the burden. Finally death, which tears down the walls of individuation. That will be the moment of greatest genius, Matthew 22 30. All of our true bonds have laid aside the mystical knot tied in eternity. We are granted sight when the light is extinguished. Books. It is wonderful to find thoughts, words, and sentences in them that make the reader suspect that the narrative is leading him down a man made trail through uncharted forests, deep and unfamiliar. 
thus, he is led through regions with unknown borders, and only occasionally do tidings of plenty reach him like a breath of fresh air. The author must seem to be distributing unlimited treasure, and by paying in hard currency, he introduces foreign coins, doubloons, with the coats of arms of unexplored lands. Kipling's phrase, but that is another story must be weighed carefully in the text. Paris, the 23rd of February 1942 this afternoon went to the Palais Tall Iran for a tea in honor of the departing Commander-in-Chief, General Otto von Stu Dieras Sislopnigil. He shows a remarkable combination of delicacy, grace, resilience, reminiscent of a court dancer, with traits that are also wooden and melancholy. He uses phrases of elaborate courtliness, wears high patent leather boots and gold buttons on his uniform. He summoned me to talk about the hostage question, as he is concerned about how posterity will judge the exact description in the historical record. This is the reason for his present departure. In his position, one can see only the grand trappings of proconsular power from the outside, not the clandestine plots and other palace intrigues. This problem is fraught with tensions between the embassy and the party in France, which is gradually gaining ground without the support of the high command. On Spidel's orders, the development and continuation of this struggle, wrangling over the lives of the hostages, will be part of my report in the confidential files. The general first touched upon the human, all too human, aspects of the matter. People could see that things had affected his nerves and shaken him to the core. Then he went into the tactical reasons for his resistance. He was of the opinion that it was necessary to tread a middle way, especially considering the damaging potential of the situation. The industries would produce more, the better this matter were managed here. In view of the unexpected course of the Eastern Campaign, he deemed this to be of the highest importance. He argued that our influence in Europe must transcend the current age in which we are a presence brandishing bayonets. He claimed that he had always remained on the side of reason, with never a shred of weakness, which the political leadership had accused him of. Like many old professional soldiers, he was particularly hurt by the allegations of weakness and unreliability. In view of the tremendous superiority of the enemy, he considered retreat to be the only possible tactical option. For this reason, he tried to give special emphasis to the fact that acts of collective retribution were only doing the resistance the greatest favor. This explains the sentence that frequently appeared in his brief communiques to the high command. The reprisals are getting out of hand. With a single revolver shot, a terrorist could incite a powerful ripple effect of hatred. The result was a paradoxical subterfuge of concealing the majority of the assassinations in the report to the high command. The pervasive weakness of the middle class and the aristocracy shows in these generals. They have enough vision to recognize the way things are going, but they lack the authority and ability to oppose minds motivated only by violence. The new masters exploit them like wardens. But what if these last props were to fall? Then horrible leaden terror like the Checker 42 will spread over the land. There is always something timeless in these situations. In this case, it's the figure of the proconsul, one of whom was Pilate. The demos 43 vehemently demanded the blood of the innocents from him as they cheered the murderers on. And from afar, the emperor, who enjoyed divine status, threatened with his thunderbolt. That makes it difficult to maintain the dignity of a senator, he passes judgment as he washes his hands or, as in this case, he disappears like an air aid warden into a Berlin apartment block. Death. A few, too refined for this life, dare to disobey. They seek the void, isolation. Some beings who cleanse the filth of their natures with light often show their noble character in their death masks. What I love about man is his essence beyond the grave and the fellowship with it. Here, love is nothing more than a pallid reflection. Was here was signed, can Dortein got Erganzen. What we are here, a god can augment there. 44 How did Pontius Pilate enter the greed? Question mark 45 We would have to ask the Copts. They honor him as a martyr. In my dreams at night, I am climbing cliff fortifications. Their foundations are so weak that my weight dislodges them, 
and my every movement brings the threat of a terrible plunge. As soon as I sensed that I could no longer keep my balance, I tried to open my eyes and switch off the dream. My action was like that of someone showing a film in which he is also acting, when catastrophes approached, I cut off the electricity. In this respect, I have learned a lot that should stand me in good stead for my daytime life. We generate the world from dreams and, if necessary, must dream more intensely. For these years there was a dream in which my behavior was significant. I was sailing to Rhodes when Lo appeared and engaged me in a test of will. Report on how things unfolded chronologically during the night at Gerstberger's in Air Mate Engine. Vesuvius opened up for a moment, the insight followed that historical forces could not reverse things. The dogs howled outside the house. That must have been preceded by Trot's nighttime visit to the vineyard. They want to confront the dragon and are awaiting the order from you. By daylight, Clouds form above the fearsome Greg. Paris, the 24th of February 1942 visited Farbalus in the evening on Avenue Foch. There I met two professors of philosophy who are brothers and Monsieur Ruvia. The host told a story about an acquaintance who hated priests. Often when the man came home he would fold his hands and say, My God, I thank you for not making me a believer. I thank you. He was once sitting on a bench in the forest in Upper Bavaria looking at the mountains when a tree crashed to the earth beside him. He left because he no longer found the view as pleasant. Il wire day choses, qui rompent la charm. There are things that break the spell. We ate in the study, which was panelled halfway up in dark wood. A large map of the world was mounted in one of the walls. It was completely white, like terra incognita and only the places that its owner had seen were painted in dot Paris, the 28th of February 1942 letters. Mother writes to me from Obersdorf that she is disturbed by the little word nicts, nothing, which is beginning to appear with ever greater connotations. For example on posters, das Volk ist alles, du bist nichts. The nation is everything, you are nothing that would then be a totality composed of zeros. You certainly get that impression at times. The game that the nihilists play is becoming more and more transparent. The high stakes force them to show their cards and often for no reason. Ot reports that in Hamburg there is talk of pulping the remaining copies of Cubans and Deerseite, the other side. That would merely achieve a destruction of paper, whereas with people, it would be a destruction of the flesh. Finally, a letter from Henri Thomas, who is all worked up about the translation of some proper names and place names that have elusive meaning in the marble cliffs. An example is Philahorn, which derives from the obsolete verb philon, meaning to maltreat, abuse, or skin. He chooses Corno Tanners and says that this guild is one of the oldest and that mentioning it would convey a dark, medieval tone as well as one of suspicion. Koppelsperleek, or better, Koppelsperleek, is a place of bleached skulls. 46 for that he uses the expression ruisage, reading. Here I was using a place name of a landscape feature in the region of Gosler. In Germany, the name has already changed to Gollisperleek. For Pulverkopf, he wanted to use Hortflum of Bruskflum, but that choice did not seem to connote enough irony to answer the old artillery soldier whose name is not even known. He had boasted of having a cannon in reserve to use against Christendom. I suggested calling him Olivier Patardia, the old artilleryman, which seemed too coarse for Thomas. He suggested Boutfer, which as well as Fuse, can also mean arsonist, a word that over time has gained an ironic note. Swa. So be it. I have the impression that he was being a little bit devious as he translated, for he knows how to walk like a hunter or trapper along the fault lines of language. Translation demands passion. Paris, the 1st of March 1942 finished reading Frederick Bouillagoy en Francais, French Guiana, a description of a journey the author took in 1862-1863. Good account of the flora, fauna and people of the swamps. Even back then, the native people knew about a kind of vaccine against snake bite. 
One such young man, who thanks to this vaccine thought himself invulnerable, found a delicate coral ladder while he was digging a grave and without listening to any warnings, draped it around himself like a necklace. He was bitten and died immediately. Another man who had also been vaccinated against snakes let pit vipers bite him for money. He also kept a number of them slithering around his dwelling, thus eliminating the need for lock and key, since everyone gladly avoided the place. Paris, the 2nd of March 1942 visit from Gruninger, who has returned from the east. He commanded a battery there. A selection of his capricios, anecdotes, sketches, the 281st Division, deployed with inadequate winter gear, was almost immediately wiped out by the frost and was dubbed the Asthma Division. At a crossing in a trench, a commissar who had been killed in hand-to-hand -hand combat by a German corporal, had frozen solid in a standing position. This corporal, whose frequent duty it was to lead captured officers through the lines, used to take them past his frozen commissar, rather like a sculptor displaying his work. A Russian colonel was captured with the remnants of his regiment, which had been in the cauldron for weeks. When asked the source for his troops' rations, he answered that they had nourished themselves from corpses. When reproached, he added that he himself had eaten only the livers. Paris, the 3rd of March 1942 Today was the first spring day after this grim winter. Joy and exhilaration animated the crowds on the Champs Elysees. The sound of countless shovels removing the slabs of black snow from the streets was almost like Easter bells that aroused an agreeable feeling. In the bookstore at Atruda Castiglia, I bought a three volume page turner, which promises to offer many an enjoyable hour during future winter nights on the Lundberg Heath. It is a story of shipwrecks, winter survival, exposure to the elements. Robinson Crusoe-like adventures, fire storms, famine, and other calamitous incidents on the high seas. The book was published by Cushé, Rouet Maison Serpenti, in the third year of the Republic. A stamp reveals a former owner of the book to have been a Jesuit priory. In this great chess match, women do not always consider the end game, yet they appreciate it when intimations first suggest that direction with subtle clarity and nuance. That is the spice of seduction. In the evening at Rampon with the Pt, who had been a cadet with Friedrich Georg. After dinner, we heard a distant sound that reminded me of an explosion, so I wrote down the exact minute. When we heard further rumblings, we concluded it was a spring storm, not unusual around here at this time of year. When Obt asked the waiter whether it was raining, the man answered with a discreet smile, The guests think it is a storm but I'd prefer to believe that it's bombs. Hearing that, we decided to leave, and outside we heard that anti-aircraft fire really was in progress. The orange-yellow flares of the English hovered over the cityscape. Bombers occasionally darted over the roofs like bats. The shooting continued for a long time after I had gone to bed. I read the essay by Dubose about the Goncourts and a chapter in the book of Samuel. The shelling provided contemporary atmosphere. Paris, the 4th of March 1942. Last night's attack targeted the Renault works and by this evening has cost 500 lives, mostly workers. Ten German soldiers were mortally wounded, and more than a thousand casualties have been admitted to the field hospitals. Although huge factories and 200 dwellings were destroyed, from the vantage point of our quarter, the whole thing looked like stage lighting for a shadow play. Paris, the 5th of March 1942. Yesterday, the Doctor S and I dined on one of the hens sent by dear Madame Richard from Saint Michel. Afterward, I consulted her about a bad cold I felt coming on. After drinking some hot rum in the Raphael, I lay awake most of the night in a semi feverish state. Such hours are not lost. I have the impression that when the temperature is elevated, body and mind work better and faster as a unit, and one surges like water over a weir. For me, feverish nights are always highly creative. I'd like to assume that they have transformative power. In addition to distinguishing sickness from health, they also mark spiritual eras, the way festivals mark the seasons. In the evening, 
paid a visit to Valentina in his studio apartment on the Quai Voltaire. He had turned up a beautiful copy of Docville for me. He also gave me the Cantes Noir by Saint Albin. Heller, Rantzau, and Drescher also there, conversed with them about Tocqueville. From delicate souls like Rantzau, I hear the opinion that in dangerous times like these leadership belongs in the hands of impulsive, brutal types and should be left up to them. Apers on Vera. We'll see later on, that's the point of view of a traveller who has landed in a fluff house and hopes that downstairs they will all kill each other while he is asleep upstairs. It doesn't always work out that way. Paris, the 6th of March 1942 went to lunch at Prunia with Mosakowski, who used to be a colleague of Celery's. If I can believe him, there are certain butchers in the large charnel houses 47 they have built in the border states on the eastern frontier, men who have single handedly slain enough people to populate a mid sized city. Such reports extinguish the colors of the day. You want to close your eyes to them, but it is important to view them like a physician examining a wound. They are symptoms of the monstrous lesion that must be healed, and I believe that it can be healed. If I did not retain that hope, I would immediately go at part as.48 This, of course, goes much deeper than anything political. Its infamy is unremitting. Went with Weinstock and Gruninger to the Raphael in the evening where the air was full of capricios from the Eastern Front. Perhaps one day there will arise a new Goya to depict these desastros, 49 an artist who understands the whole spectrum of human cruelty, including its absolute nadir. Wounded Russians in the forest who screamed for help for hours drew their pistols and fired on German soldiers who finally came to rescue them. This is a sign that the struggle has reached the point of bestiality. An animal shot and lying where it fell begins to bite when it is touched. People have seen corpses lying on the tarmac that have been crushed by thousands of tanks until they are as flat as sheets of paper. The march goes right over them, as if over decals or designs visible in the icy depths of the roads. Gruninja represents the precursor of a type who is above it all, able to cope with a high level of pain and at the same time more subtle in his perceptions. A paradoxical combination, but one that is probably the basis for this development in general, which arises from a pattern of converging forces. At the table, there was a major who had lived in Moscow long before World War I and told stories of sleigh rides, fine furs, varieties of caviar, and dinners of Asiatic splendor. Today that sounds like a dreamland from a sumptuous fairy tale realm, perhaps out of medieval Persia. One of the rich merchants had champagne served in silver chamber pots but immediately ordered it removed when he noticed a guest with an expression of disgust on his face. An example of fusion of coarseness and gentility that has probably changed very little. Read further in the book of Samuel. The rivalry between Saul and David gives us the pattern for every conflict between youthful strength and legitimate power. There is no negotiation here. Paris. The 8th of March 1942 A letter from Friedrich Georg in the mail. Among other things, he gives an account of his visits to the Straubs in Nussdorf, in the very house we used to pass so often on our walks to the Bernau Forest. He describes the light in the apartment as having something flower-like about it, as if the shapes of very bright blossoms formed in the air. After dinner visited a young sculptor, Jebhardt with Weinstock. He partially counts as an emigre and receives clandestine support from people here in the building. On the way, we discussed the situation as usual. It looks as though the three commanders in chief in the West are of one mind, and that we can expect the result in the form of a spring offensive. During such discussions, we passed by the catafalque that had been erected on the Place de la Concorde to honor the victims of the English aerial bombings. Dense crowds of Parisians file past the place. At Jebhart's, we met Princess Baryatinsky. Viewed the sculptures and thought the head by young Drescher particularly striking. The Countess said of Claus Valentina, he is like a bee, everything he touches, he turns to honey. The doctoress then arrived to pick me up, and I accompanied her through the quarter where the antiquarian bookshop are.
these have always have the power to inspire me to dream, purely through the accumulated historical matter that they radiate. In the night, I dreamed of various animals. Among them, a salamander with a blue back and a white abdomen speckled in blue and yellow. The exquisite nature of the colors lay in the fact that they were suffused with the glow of life, like fine damp leather. The freshness and delicacy of this palette melted into the creature. The slate blue and somewhat yellowish white of the underbelly dominated the whole effect. Such glorious luster is only possible when animated by life, like the flames that consume love. Woke up with thoughts of my old plan about the Terrier de Coloris, the theory of colors, which will treat color as a function of surface. The fact that I love the most elusive, and probably also the best, in them, that may be the source of the coldness they perceive in me. We live life merely at its edge, it is but a battlefield where the struggle for life is fought. It is a remote fort, hastily built in the dimension of the citadel into which we shall retreat in death. The goal of life is to gain an idea of what life is. In the absolute sense, of course, that changes nothing, according to the priests, but it helps our journey. We bring our chips to the table and gamble for infinitely high stakes. We are like children who play for beans without knowing that each one of them contains the potential for the marvels of blossoms and may. Paris, the 9th of March 1942, in the evening, with the doctoress who invited me to the Comedie Francaise, les femmes savantes, the wise women. There are still islands where one can find a mooring. In the foyer, Howden's sculpture of the seated Voltaire, combining the traits of age and childhood in a wonderful way. It is beautiful how intellectual liveliness easily triumphs over the gravity of years. Paris, the 10th of March 1942. The work of art must reach a state that renders it superfluous. When eternity illuminates it, its intangible stature increases as it approaches the highest beauty and deepest truth. The thought becomes less and less painful that, as a work of art with its ephemeral symbols, it must perish. The same applies to life itself. There we also have to reach a stage in which it is possible for it to cross over easily and osmotically, a stage in which it turns death. In the evening, in the round salon with the new commander in chief, Heinrich von Stu Dieris Islopnigil.50 We talked about botany and Byzantine history, a subject in which he is well read. Andronikos is a name that keeps coming up even today. He attributed this and other bits of learning to his frequent poor health. He was often bored in the field hospitals and supplemented the Spartan cadet training with his own studies. In contrast to his brother and cousin, he possesses an unmistakable disinvolture detachment, unconcern, and, on top of that, an aristocratic bearing. His steady smile makes him appealing. This is noticeable even in the way the staff treats him. Paris, the 11th of March 1942 Carlo Schmid called on me this morning. Years ago, I spent a whole night drinking with him in Tubingen, and now he is in Lille with the commander-in-chief of Belgium. We talked about his Baudelaire translation, from which he read aloud Les Fairs, The Lighthouses. Then, about the situation. He felt that nowadays it is less a struggle between human beings than a struggle about them. For him, it is possible to see very concretely how they are caught up and led either to the right or the wrong side. Visited Gallimard after dinner. Had a conversation with the head of the firm, its director, Stamaroff and Madeleine Baudot Lamotte about the Falaises de Marba, on the marble cliffs. Gallimard gives the impression of a spiritual as well as intellectual and commanding force, all traits of a good publisher. There must also be something of the gardener in him. Read on in Samuel. With David something new enters the law, a trace of elegance. You can see how the law changes when mankind observes it differently, without challenging it. The forms remain in place, but they are danced. Bal, Jehovah had to be merciless with such rival gods. Even today, we should really try to imagine them in a way that lets us see them, even though their altars have long since fallen into ruin. They are not mere milestones on humanity's path. Dostoyevsky saw Bal in London's railroad stations. In peacetime, I plan to rearrange my reading matter according to a new plan. 
with theology as its basis. Paris, the 12th of March 1942. It is said that since the sterilization and extermination of the mentally ill, the number of children born with mental illness has increased. Similarly, with the suppression of beggars, poverty has become more widespread. And the decimation of the Jews has led to the spreading of Jewish characteristics in the world, which is exhibiting an increase in Old Testament traits. Extermination does not extinguish the primeval images, on the contrary, it liberates them. It seems that poverty, sickness, and all evil rest upon certain people, who support them like pillars, and yet they are the weakest in this world. They are like children who need our special protection. With the destruction of these pillars, the weight of the vault topples. Its collapse crushes the false economists. Feast days of the lemurs, including the murder of men, women, and children. The gruesome spoils are hurriedly buried. Now there come other lemurs to claw them out of the ground. They film the dismembered and half decayed patch of land with macabre gusto. Then they show these films to others. What bizarre forces develop in Carrion. Paris, the 14th of March 1942. Tristita took a walk this afternoon with Charmilla along Avenue du Maine to Rue Maison Dieu, then back across the Montparnasse Cemetery. There we stumbled upon the graves of Dumont Derville and the aviator P. E. Goud. After a bowl of soup, to the Comédie Francaise. Le Misanthrope. During the intermission, I went to take another look at Howden's Voltaire. This time I was struck by its combination of malicious and childlike qualities. A hairdresser talking with the doctoress about the bombing, I'm not afraid of it. The dead are better off than we are. But you don't know that. Yes, I do. I'm sure of it because not a single one of them has ever returned. Paris the 15th of March 1942 took a walk with Armand in the boys, to Boulogne, in the beautiful sunshine. I waited for him under the Arc de Triomphe beside the tomb surrounded with yellow narcissus and purple anemones. Bees were ducking into their blossoms. Thought, in this sea of stone, do they survive on nothing but cut flowers? I now regard that human being as a man of sorrows who has been crushed by the gears and rollers of a machine that has broken him rib from rib and limb from limb. But that does not kill him as a human being, maybe it even does him good. Paris, the 16th of March 1942 Colonel Spadell came to my room in the evening. He brought me an essay that Sternberger had published about me in the Frankfurter, Algemeine Zetung. He also let me have a look at orders. Nilo's shift from Diabolus to Satanus is now more obvious. It is miraculous that the motion of the atom's nucleus spins in every stone, every crumb, and every scrap of paper. All matter is alive, and even when we think things are inert, we simply aren't comprehending their true state. We see only shadows of the absolute, of the undivided light. Paris. The 28th of March 1942 in the evening, paid a visit to Madame Gould in the Bristol, also present were Hella and Jude, whose chronic maritals I had read years ago. Terre d'Alarm. We were sitting together by daylight drinking a champagne from 1911 when the airplanes began to roar and the thunder of the artillery shook the city. As tiny as ants. Conversed about death during all this. Madame Gould had some good observations on this subject, namely that the experience of death is one of the few that no one can take from us. And also that it is one that often enriches us, even though it means us the greatest harm. Fate, she went on, can deprive us of all great encounters, but never of the one with death. She mentioned the fundamental premise of any correct political attitude, have no fear. On a tropical evening, she once saw a butterfly land on the back of a gecko in the light of a garden lamp. For her that symbolized great safety. Then we talked of Merb. I had the impression that this landscape of terror had an attraction for her, a certain appeal that is still potent after all other pleasures of luxury are exhausted. I talked with Jude about Bernanos and Malraux and then about the features of civil war in general. He said that nothing makes it more comprehensible than Cicero's biography. 
he stimulated my desire to go back and focus on that historical period again. The images surface that surface within us. I often see myself on the edge of the Uberlangian forest on a lonely, foggy evening, then again in early spring in Stralau, or as a boy in Braunschweig staring at patterns on the wall. I have the feeling that I have made some significant decisions while I was just dreaming or brooding. It may be possible now and then, though far from all activity, to perceive the rhythms of life's melody. They only emerge in the silences. In them we can then sense the composition, the whole that is the foundation of our existence. This explains the power of memory. It also seems to me that the totality of life does not dawn on us sequentially, but rather as a puzzle that reveals its meaning here and there. Some fantasies of childhood are worthy of old age, on the other hand, some phenomena of old age tap directly into childhood. Perhaps our constitution is at its strongest when we encounter ourselves in the tranquil dreams of solitude, nothing enters, and yet we enter into a new house. Paris, the 30th of March 1942. Klaus Valentina returned from Berlin. He described a horrifying young man, formerly an art teacher who boasted about commanding a death squad in Lithuania and other border territories where they butchered untold numbers of people. After the victims were rounded up, they were first forced to dig mass graves and then lie down in them, where they were shot from above in layers. Before that they were robbed of their last possessions and the rags they were wearing, right down to their shirts. Grotesque pictures of famine in Athens. At the climax of a large Wagner concert. The trombones gave out because the weakened brass players ran out of breath. Paris, the 4th of April 1942, walked through the Elysee Gardens, where a first gentle breath of blossoms and young greenery permeated the darkness. The pods of the chestnut buds were especially aromatic. Dropped in at Valentina's studio in the afternoon to take my mind off things for a while. The former studio of anger is off the courtyard and a tall, slender ash grows beside it, struggling upward to the light as if from out of a mineshaft. Klaus recounted that his father, the old Viking, had once promised him five hundred marks if he would gratify him by producing a grandchild with the beautiful French woman who lived with them. Paris, the 5th of April 1942 visited Valentina with Heller and Podwills, where we also met Rantzau. Conversation focused on whether the war would be over by the autumn, as many augurs predict. In the evening, a spring storm brought hail over the high roof ridges. Then a double rainbow on a blue gray background arched over the ancient roofs and church spires. A fierce bombardment raged during the night or early morning. At breakfast, I discovered that the attack had caused many fires, among them one at the rubber factory of Asneeries. Paris, the 6th of April 1942 conversation with Kosman, the new chief of the general staff. He briefed us on the frightening details from the forests of the Lemures in the east. We are now in the midst of the bestiality that grill Parsifus or.51 Paris, the 7th of April 1942 said farewell to the Paris Committee on the Quai Voltaire. De La Rochelle, Cocteau, Weimar, Heller, Drescher, Rantzau, Princess Bariatinsky, two German lieutenants, and a young French soldier who distinguished himself during the last campaign. Madeleine bowed at Lamotte, who is from Mauritania, wore a hat with black red black cockerel feathers. I would like to have seen Poopert, but unfortunately he is ill. These people make it clear to me the way many and varied branches of my life flow into this city as if into a bay. Paris. The 8th of April 1942 dinner at the home of Lepirouse with Epting and Grosmania, whose face has taken on a powerfully demonic aspect that has replaced joy with the dark, brooding strength of Lucifer. He explained that blood would soon have to flow in France like the bloodletting that revives a patient. One would have to consider carefully whom these measures would apply to. As far as he was concerned, he had no doubt about the parties in question. I certainly had that impression as well. Then about Japan, which he called the real victor in this war. Mannheim, the 9th of April 1942, departure from the Gare de l'Est at 7 o'clock this morning. 
Rem drove me to the station. The sky was a crisp blue, I noticed especially the magical play of color in the water of the rivers and canals. I thought I was seeing sounds that no painter had ever observed. The blues, greens, and grays of the water gleamed like clear, cool stones. The color was more than just color, it was the symbol and essence of the mysterious deep glimpsed in the play and reflection of the surface dot somewhere beyond coolness, a bright russet falcon landed on a thorn bush. Fields full of high glass domes for raising melons and cucumbers, retorts for the finest fermentation in the area of horticultural alchemy. Before reaching Thyakot, I read a little of the Fomona as, counterfeiters, in the sunshine. After the sun had disappeared behind a mountain, the letters began to glow with a deep phosphorescent green dot reached Mannheim in the evening, where Spidel picked me up at the station. I stayed with him. Little Hans, an artist in the way he enjoys things. Such children attract love and presents like magnets. There is also a little daughter, very delicate. When there has been a night air aid, she will not eat the next day. Who knows the burden that weighs upon the shoulders of women? Kirchhorst, the 10th of April 1942 The Spiddles took me to the station in the morning. The shift in social stratification was apparent in the interaction of people on the trains, especially the staff in the dining car or in the hotels, inevitably, differences are being eradicated. This is particularly apparent when you arrive here from France. Late arrival in Hanover. Perpetua picked me up from the station in the car. Kirchhorst, the 22nd of April 1942, on the moor with the children. Our little boy called a salamander a water lizard when he saw it for the first time, which tickled me, as though he had addressed the creature by name. In doing so, he demonstrated an ability to differentiate, which is the foundation for knowledge as surely as gold is the security for paper currency. Kirchhorst, the 24th of April 1942 When I woke up at 6 I wrote down a fragment from an extensive dream negotiation and I, it's best that I proceed with my old subject, the comparative physiology of fishes. Perpetua, if the results turn out favorably, he will be in such a good mood that he will frighten his friends. I, that indicates to me that the future is going to be horrible. Pale, moon-shaped fishes lay on the ground. I inserted my index finger into the mouth of one of them to find a gland, which I could feel as a little bump. Kirchhorst, the 9th of May 1942 on the moor. I heard the first call of the cuckoo, the terracular crier, although I had plenty of money on me. 52 on the other hand, we haven't just cut into the ham but almost finished it up. That's a good indication of the way things stand this year. I took a sunbathe by a peat cutting bank. The color of the old walls that had been sliced by the shovel changes from a rich black to a soft golden brown. Just above the water level, there is a long mossy band, the sun creates red embroidery upon the dew. All this shows order and necessity. Thought, this is only one of the countless aspects, just one of the gashes in the harmony of the world. We must look beyond such formations to perceive the power of its form. It is a fine feeling to stride across the damp peat interpenetrated with a deep, ruddy glow. Here you walk upon layers of the pure stuff of life, more precious than gold. The moor is a primeval landscape and therefore the repository of health and freedom. I sense this so gloriously in these northern refuges. I found a letter from Valentina in the mail. He states that Gallimard had printed the second edition of Falaise's de Marbe. He also reported on a visit of the outcast of the islands, Gerard Nebel, to Quai Voltaire. Reading Matter, Tolstoy's short stories, including the recollection of a billiard marker. It's a good narrative technique that a basically noble but dissipated life is captured and observed in a diary of a servant, as though in a cheap mirror. Between the cracks, we can sense the tragic and authentic image. Unfortunately, I could not find my favorite story, The Death of Ivan Illich in the edition. Gerchhorst, the 12th of May 1942 Drive to the Barbers. Had a conversation there about the Russian prisoners who are being sent from the camps to work here. 
They say there are some tough customers among them. They'd steal the dog's food. Noted verbatim. Gerchhorst, the 17th of May 1942. Frau Lukau brought a letter from Gruninger in which he bewailed the demise of our Arthurian round table in the George V. Other than that, the usual Capricios. After capturing a Russian reconnaissance patrol, his soldiers had discovered among the dead a 17 year old girl who had fought fanatically. How that was possible, no one could say, but the next morning, her naked corpse was lying in the snow. Because Winter is a brilliant sculptor who preserves shapes in their firm, fresh state, the occupying troops had plenty of opportunity to admire the beautiful body. When the base was later recaptured, many a volunteer reported for duty to take pleasure in the sight of that splendid form. My departure from Gerchhorst approaches. I quickly adjusted again to the house and study and also to the garden where I'm leaving behind the beds in good order. Perpetua thinks that I should move into the parsonage again in the autumn. Well, we shall see. How I would like to live here beside her and grow old slowly, but I yearn to get back to work. She, incidentally, found an expression for the remarkable relationship between me and the Lemures. She says that I am swimming. In a different current. Gerchhorst, the 18th of May 1942, I treated Aster, the dog, very badly for constantly running through the garden beds. He has just walked up to me, wagging his tail as I sit beneath the old beech trees. He's not looking at me reproachfully, but rather inquisitively, thoughtfully, Why are you like this? And like an echo I hear inside me, Yes, why are you like this? My current reading, James Riley, Lenore Frage du Brigant in American Le Commerce, Authentic Narrative of the Loss of the American Brig Commerce, 1817, published by Le Normand, Paris, 1818. Some of the shipwrecked sailors are murdered, some are stripped naked by brutal nomads and are driven through the Mauritanian deserts under horrible conditions. They come upon deserted cities bleaching in the sun reminiscent of the visions of Emir Musa. The breach in the wall is visible as well as the abandoned siege machinery in front of it, like an oyster shucking knife flying beside a plate. A scene that Poe could have described plays itself out on a sheer cliff wall rising into the clouds from the sea. A path barely as wide as a hand has been carved into it, and before traversing that terrifying track, People call out from a precipice to make sure that nobody is approaching in the opposite direction. A small caravan of Jews once neglected to do this. They wanted to reach their camp before twilight and, as fate would have it, a group of Moors, who thought no one was on the path, came toward them from the opposite direction. They met in the middle of the path above the terrifying abyss where it was impossible to turn around. After long and useless negotiations, they set upon each other one by one, falling to their deaths in pairs. Riley's attitude, and even his fate, are proof of the power that rational belief still possesses. In the midst of the most horrible suffering, trust directs itself to God and his guidance as though to an effective system of curves in a superior form of higher mathematics. For an intelligent being like Riley, God is the highest intelligence that inhabits the cosmos. Mankind is sustained all the more powerfully, the more logically he thinks. That is reminiscent of the strongest battalions of old Fritz. 53 Paris, the 20th of May 1942. Skulls picked me up in his car at 11 o'clock for the return trip to Paris. Perpetua waved to me in the darkness by making circles with the flashlight. During the trip, read about the Panama scandal, then the biography of the Berlin entomologist Kratz, and last, a collection of classical letters, among these Pliny's appealed to me most of all. Whenever I glanced up, I caught a glimpse of the way fields and gardens were laid out, inspiring in me new aesthetic ideas for the design in Kirchhorst. Rem and Valentino welcomed me at the station in Paris even though the train was delayed. I went to Valentina's studio for a cup of tea and to contemplate the ancient roofs, which after a rainstorm stood out in glistening clarity. Today's mail brought a letter from Gruninja with some new Capricios. As I read it, I thought again about this intellect and its sense of the geometric expansion of power. 
such types are perhaps unknown in other cultures, although foreshadowed by Ostoyevsky. When Bolshevism is measured against the strongest of these fictional characters, its decline is obvious. It is certain that only such characters who understand the fundamentals of power on which the world is based, and are dictated to from above, are capable of confronting the horrible popular revolution that is destroying the world. They are like snakes who have joined a swarm of rats bent on gnawing everything to bits. Where others retreat, they are attracted. Calmly, and with satanic joy, they approach the terrifying ceremonies used by the lemures to spread their horror, and they join in the game. They are also drawn to the muses as Sulla was. That is the essence that Pyotr Stepanovich recognizes in Stavrogin. In the clandestine power struggle in this area, it was Gruninja who delayed, not to say prevented, Nblo's attempts to establish himself and his agents here by about a year. Like Stavrogin, such characters fail because the rot attacks even the small class of leaders that would be necessary to shield the operations, in this case, the generals. Paris, the 22nd of May 1942 in the afternoon, went to Plon on Rougaran CEO with Pupit who seemed to be ailing. He described the most beautiful dedication he'd ever read in a book, a Victor Hugo, Charles Baudelaire. Absolutely for no invention can attain that profundity of substance. In this sense, to make a name for oneself means to give it substance by giving each of its letters the greatest weight and importance. The same applies to language in general. Anyone can say more light, 54 but only in the case of Goethe do those two syllables contain such richness. Thus, the poet bestows with language what the priest does with wine. In doing so, the poet contributes something to all. In the evening, sat in the Raphael reading roots at Jardins 55 over a strong grog. I find the translation by bits a little too polished, but it reads smoothly. Paris, the 23rd of May 1942. When I think about the difficulties of my situation compared with other people, especially those in the majestic, I often get the feeling, you are not here for no reason, fate will untie the knots it has tied, so rise above worries and see them as patterns. Thoughts like that seem almost irresponsible. Of course, when we face dangers in dreams, it is certain that waking up will dissolve them into smoke, but by day, we are not permitted to see though the charade too clearly. We have to take it seriously or people will take advantage. We must dream along with the rest, for better or worse. Someday we will be astonished by the fact that the living do not see us, just as we are puzzled that no signal from the spirit world reaches us today. Perhaps these realities are aligned, but with different modes of seeing like the reflecting and opaque sides of a looking glass. The day will come when the mirror is turned around and its silvered side is covered in the black crepe of morning. We can only gain the night when we have penetrated it with our antennae. Paris, the 24th of May 1942 on the Quai Voltaire this afternoon. The sight of the ancient roofs is wonderfully relaxing for the mind. It tarries the far from our fragmented age. In addition to Valentina, I met Rantzau, Madeleine Baud Otlamot, Jean Cocteau, and the actor Marais. During our discussions about plants, Cocteau told me the most wonderful poetic description for Zittergrass, Quaking Grass, Ladies Espoir Day Painters, The Painter's Despair. Paris, the 30th of May 1942. Between 2 and 4 this morning, the English flew over the city, dropping bombs within the river bend of the Seine. I awoke at 4 from dreams of islands, gardens and animals and kept dozing, but was jolted awake now and then when one of the airplanes approached under fire. But I stayed asleep during these events, as I monitored the danger. When dreaming, it is almost possible to think that you are in control. The crack of the shrapnel in the empty streets, like that of meteorites on a lunar landscape. Went to Parc de Bagatelle 56 in the afternoon where I admired a range of clematis species whose blue and silver grey star-shaped blossoms decorated the wall. The roses were already in bloom. I noticed especially a Mevru van Rossum. 
The bud was still closed and showed at its base a hue of tea rose yellow with flaming veins of beech red radiating out toward its point. It resembled a delicately curved breast pulsating with red wine, its aroma sweet and pungent. Paris, the 1st of June 1942 took an afternoon walk to the place d'Aternis, with its clock on the pharmacy. Then, to the majestic. Today, I move among officers as formerly among zoologists in the aquarium in Naples. We each perceive the same situation and take completely different sides. In the evening, I met Henri Thomas at Valentina's for the first time. Paris, the 2nd of June 1942. Cosman, our new boss, told me that our old comrade N. had committed suicide recently. On the shooting range where he was in charge, he suddenly took his drawn pistol, put it to his head, and pulled the trigger. Although more than ten years have passed since my last encounter with N, even back then I noticed the pressured, mercurial, exaggeratedly ethical component of his character. In personalities like this, suicide is as predictable as the breaking of overstretched strings on a violin. Paris, the 3rd of June 1942 in the Boys de Vincennes. I was thinking about my walks and my worries of last year and paid a call on the woman who was my old concierge who lives opposite the fort. You talk to these simple people the way you talk to children, without creating any subtle disparity between words and their meanings. In times like these, it is desirable to keep a small coterie of such people. There are situations in which they can be more helpful than the rich and powerful. Paris. The 4th of June 1942 in the morning, Carlo Schmid paid me a visit, he had just returned from Belgium. We talked about his translation of Lafels du Mal, The Flowers of Evil. Then about the world and its erotic hierarchy. Then about dream catchers, which he takes to be a kind of person who can capture other people's dreams like a concave mirror and then fulfill them. These people can either elevate or degrade the dreamers. As we walked, he mentioned his 14 year old son who writes letters about stylistic differences in sentences of Tolstoy and Ostoyevsky. The boy is also a remarkable draftsman. I was amazed as I listened because, during the times that we've been together, we have talked about so many different subjects, and for the first time the father was now mentioning such an important relationship in his life. Paris, the 5th of June 1942 in the morning, Rem reported in his field uniform. He has accompanied me as my adjutant since the beginning of the war. Contact like this evolves into something like the relationship between Knight and Squire, which is why I shall find it hard to part from him. Went to Valentina's in the evening where the time passed unobserved and painlessly as we contemplated the ancient towers and roofs. Among today's letters there was one from the Comtis de Cargut that bespeaks highbrow audacity, my family has lived in the same house for five hundred years. My forebears were corsairs in the royal fleet and later famous twins.57 so we've remained quite untamed. She then asks why I emphasize that women are becoming more intelligent. She says that in France they have always been more intuitive and have grasped things more quickly. Based on their intellectual gymnastics, many men have seemed to think and speak intelligently, but how few of them have truly acted and lived in an intelligent manner. Perpetua writes to me that the garden is thriving. In her letter, she enclosed a pressed blossom of bleeding heart from it. I also find beautiful her statement that people can never get used to the loss of freedom. That is the basic difference between free men and slaves. By freedom, most people mean new forms of slavery. Paris, the 6th of June 1942 During World War I we confronted the question of whether man was more powerful than machines. In the meantime, things have gotten more complex. We are now concerned with the problem of whether humans or automatons will dominate the earth. The issue brings up further divisions beyond the imprecise ones that partition the world into nations and groups of nations. All around us men stand fully armed at their battle stations. The result is that we never completely agree intellectually with any partner, there is only greater or lesser rapprochement. 
Above all, we must fight against the tendency within our breast to harden, calcify, ossify. Concerning marionettes and automatons, the decline in that direction is preceded by loss. This hardening is well depicted in the folk tale about the glass heart. The vice that has become commonplace leads to automatism, as it did so terribly in the case of the old prostitutes who became pure sex machines. Something similar is emanating from the stingy old men. They have sold their souls to material things and a life of metal. Sometimes a particular decision precedes the transition, man rejects his salvation. A widespread vice must be the basis for the general transition to automatism and its threat to us. It would be the task of the theologians to explain this to us, but they are silent. What an image of a superman, cowering on the tattered cushions in his carriage with a bullet in his spleen and horsehair stanching his wounds. Such news burns through the hell he has created like a lugubrious, celebratory bonfire. Anyone who would assume the role of the despot has to be invulnerable and insensitive to pain, or else he becomes a burden in the hour of his destruction. Paris, the 7th of June 1942 went to Maxims at noon, where I had been invited by the Morands. The conversation included a discussion of American and English novels like Moby Dick and A High Wind in Jamaica, a book I read years ago in Steglitz with acute suspense like someone who watches children who have been given razors to play with. More talk about Bluebeard and Landrew, who killed 17 women in a suburb near here. A railroad official finally noticed that he always bought only one round-trip ticket. Madame Moran said that she had been his neighbor. After the trial, a small-time innkeeper bought the house where the murders had been committed and named it O'Grill and Du Foyer, the cricket on the hearth. On Rue Royale, I encountered the Yellow Star for the first time in my life. Three young girls who were walking past arm in arm were wearing it. This badge was distributed yesterday, and those who received it had to part with a point from their clothing ration card in return. I then saw the star more frequently that afternoon. I consider things like this, even in my own personal history, a significant date. Such a sight is not without consequence. I was immediately embarrassed to be in uniform. Paris, the 9th of June 1942. Perhaps the least miraculous thing about the cosmos is that most things astonish the mind. There is no difference among miracles, whether one or a billion worlds exist. Paris, the 14th of June 1942. Went to Bagatelle in the afternoon. The Charmil told me that students had recently been arrested for wearing yellow stars with different mottos, such as idealist, and then walking along the Champs Elysees as a demonstration. Such individuals do not yet realize that the time for discussion is past. They also attribute a sense of humor to their adversary. In so doing, they are like children who wave flags while swimming in shark infested waters, they draw attention to themselves. Paris, the 18th of June 1942 reading matter, La Martyrologue de l'Eglise du Japon, the martyrdom of the church in Japan, 1549-1649, by Abbe Profilet, Paris, 1895. The book contains the example of an answer that trumps the threat it elicited. In December 1625, Monica Nazan appeared before the court because, Along with her husband and her little daughters, she had given asylum to the Jesuit priest Jean Baptiste Zola. When the judges threatened to strip her naked, she tore off her girdle herself, crying, There is nothing you can do to me that will make me deny Christ. I would strip off not only my clothing, but my skin. Call on the Comtesse de Cargnet. We talked about the end of the war, and she said she is betting on the Germans. Then we discussed English society and Churchill, whom she has met a few times. She said that all the whiskey he drinks was preserving him like plums and brandy. Paris, the 22nd of June 1942, went to Bears's at midday, where I bought my journal by Leon Bloy. The epigraph that he included after the title reads: "La tempest on chine kini mord que la porvas." Time is a dog that bites only the poor, this is debatable, for our age bites everyone. 
This is the democratic principle contrasted with the aristocratic one. For this reason, time cannot be leased, and no one adds a single second to his own life. I then leafed through an edition of epigrams and poems by Johann Christoph Friedrich Haag, Unger, 1805. I thought the motto preceding the epigrams wasn't bad, in brevitate labor, concision is hard work, because, like a good pedagogue, it furnishes the existential example. Although the price of both volumes was not cheap, I bought them because of the epigram about the bridge, which first caught my eye die bruck here, we can slitch, stark and hock. No ass a main gelt nuck. Here stands a bridge, ingenious, strong, and high. It lacks but water nigh. Paris, the 24th of June 1942 at Bagatelle in the afternoon. Extensive contact with individuals reveals their stories, which accumulate pebble by pebble from chats and anecdotes. Some secrets we share with them alone, and we become intimate. Reading matter, the memoirs of Alexander Dumas and Le Junes Fizz, The Girls, by Monthland. In order not to forget passages that have struck me as I read, I have found it most useful to put a check mark beside them and note the page numbers at the back of the book along with keywords. I could paste in a sheet of paper for the same purpose, something like the book plate that identifies the owner. These are methods that can save a lot of searching. Paris, the 27th of June 1942 went to Gruel in the afternoon to inquire about a case for my journals. There I held in my hand a small skull very artfully carved out of beechwood from the period of Henri IV. Half the head was still covered in skin, while the other was depicted as the bony skull. A snake emerged from an eye socket. While I was admiring it, I was surprised by Weimer and Madeleine Baudot Lamotte, who happened to be standing in front of the shop window. The larger a city is, the more exhilarating and meaningful such an encounter seems. Visited Valentina afterward, who brought me greetings from Carl Schmidt. Went from the to Florence Henri, the photographer on Rue Saint Romain, who lives on the top floor where she tends a lovely roof garden. She asked me to prune her tomatoes, and the aroma of the curly leaves clung to my hands afterward, awakening a longing for Kirchhorst. Paris. The 29th of June 1942 took a Sunday excursion yesterday to saint remy le chevreuse From my dreams during the night, I can recall the wall of an ancient fortification. I was standing there with Perpetua, and we watched as a pale adder emerged from a cavity in the crumbling stonework. The creature was pale as the moon with an oval patch of hair at the back of its neck, parted in the middle. We watched as it slowly climbed up among the decayed stumps of the hazel shrubs along the fortress until it disappeared into a rectangular pit that had been formed when an embrasure collapsed. There had to be another reason why this scene was so disturbing. I believe that we had known the wall for ages, and that we had never noticed an inhabitant like this one, although the walls and fortification had always seemed mysterious. In the morning, the dream had almost vanished become as transparent as the snakeskin itself, but then in the middle of the day, it came back into focus. The patch of hair must probably be understood as a symbol of rank, like a crown, or at least as some human trait. Yet it looked repugnant, the way humans have always degraded animals. Truer, coffer, chest, box, from true and anvertron, confide, in trust. Then there is the word hus true for female spouse, housewife, which I have seen on northern European gravestones. Then there is trude, meaning which. Here the concealed, hidden aspects take on negative connotations. The word trude eln, trundle, spin, belongs to this family and describes how witches navigate through the air. Received news that our little fellow is better. I had been very disturbed by reports of his fever, his cough, and his weight loss. Nowadays, despite our radio and telegraph technology, we are still unable to offer any help from a distance. We probably accomplish more in certain dreams than with all the technology in the world. A second letter from 26 June came from Perpetua around noon. She writes that during the night nine bombs hit Kirchhorst, 
exploding on the meadow behind the Carney Bakery, where they blew the heads off several cows. When considering whether she should take our little boy downstairs or stay where they were, she chose to do the latter. It seemed too risky to get him out of bed. Paris, the 1st of July 1942 The proximity of the Lemures and their bleak rites awakened homesickness for the archipelagos and the worlds of fixed stars, whose expanses revealed to the initiate beyond the cliffs and narrow mountain passes of death. We feel that our home is there, and here we dwell in a strange land. Paris, the 2nd of July 1942 Maggie Gruninja brought me a letter from Friedrich Georg that shows, to my joy, that he is in better condition now. Current reading, Montholent, Lay June's Fizz, The Girls, one of the books that Comtista Cargut sent me, it reminds me of Lay Liaison's Danger Ayers's, Dangerous Liaison's. Certain aspects of the hunting scenes high in the mountains are well done particularly the cold-blooded observation tempered with fascination. The perfect proportion of innocence and consciousness in the creation of molecules from these two elements produces one of the aspects of our age. This combination is seldom successful, because each half destroys the other if they are not joined in a very specific way. The book tells the story of a girl who drinks water from a fountain and swallows a snake's egg. Years later, X-rays reveal the body of a snake deep inside her. This hybrid image shows elements of the primeval within the conscious world. Then I read the memoirs of Alexander Dumas. Connoisseurs prefer these to his novels, which, although I don't like to put aside books I have just begun to read, I have grasped only minimally. The annoying thing about such texts is that their author avoids describing nuanced and gentle impressions while recording and exaggerating lurid ones. Reading them is like walking through meadows thronged with larger than life blossoms, while grasses and moss are absent. Ebb and flow. When we exhale, sleep, dream, the tidal zone is visible with its seaweed and shells, sea stars, and aquatic life among the colored pebbles. Then the mind appears like a quick white bird with red feet and snatches up its prey. The longing for death can become wild, sensual, like the light green sea as it cools upon the beach. Paris, the 4th of July 1942 went to the Tour d'Argent in the evening, that silver tower where Henri IV dined on aigrette pies. Sitting in the dining room is like being in a large airplane looking out over the Seine and its islands. In the rays of evening light, a film of mother of pearl covered the surface of the water. The contrast between the coloration of a weeping willow and its reflection in the water was lovely, in silent introspection the silver green foliage became imperceptibly darker in the water. The people up there on the balcony dining on Supreme of Soul and the famous duck seem like tower sculptures looking down from their demonic comfort upon the grey sea of roofs at their feet beneath which the starving eke out their living. In times like this eating, eating well and much, brings a feeling of power. Paris, the 5th of July 1942 In the mail I found a letter from Clemens Podwills from Kharkov describing the Russians and other things we frequently hear about. He mentions, in particular, the aloofness of the simple Russian women. Bolshevism has barely dented the surface of the innate strength of the people. Certain dreams cannot be recorded. They go back before the old covenant and dismantle the primitive raw materials of humanity. We must suppress what we have seen. The dot memories bear traits of an inverse causality. The world, as an effect, resembles a tree with a thousand branches, but as memory it leads downward into the tangled network of the roots. When I confront memories, it often seems like gathering a bundle of seaweed from the ocean, the tiny bit visible from afar, when slowly dragged up into the light, reveals an extensive system of filaments. As past and future intersect in the narrow neck of the hourglass, there must be a point from which they look like mirror images. In ethics, guilt and retribution refer to this point, and so does the ironclad law of causality in logic. An artistic person senses unity in the conflict, the innermost identity of the world. It is his calling to proclaim this in poetry. We recognize him thus so fittish gibbons, 
Jewest and sins in new Bazirgen and weed as you can. O give us wings of most steadfast minds, to cross over and to return. 58 Paris, the 7th of July 1942 Reading Matter, Leon Bloy, Moon Journal, bound in purple leather and pleasing to the touch. His mind has a certain condensed quality of something boiled down, like a soup made from extinct fishes and mussels whose flavor has intensified. Good to read when the appetite has been destroyed by too much bland food. Incidentally, this time the association, or rather the correspondence, with Haman occurred to me. This lies in a bunch on four absolutes, a comparison between these two authors would produce a good study. Twice he mentions that the den wake him up at night, sometimes knocking at his door, or sometimes he simply hears their names. At that point, he gets up and prays for their salvation. Maybe today we are experiencing the power not only of past but also of future prayers that will be said after we die. This spirit is strongest in its relationship to death. I am thinking here of a beautiful passage in another of his books, in which he says that dying has no greater significance for us than being dusted off as for a piece of furniture. But I find his wild pamphleteering repugnant. For example, when he describes people as barely worthy of cleaning the chamber pots in hospitals or scraping off the residue on the latrines of a Prussian infantry barracks. He reaches levels of hatred that veer off into lewdness, for example, when he describes a former cleric who suggested in a newspaper article that he had made such an impression on women by wearing his cassock that he would have had no trouble seducing one or more of them if he had wanted to. Dot Paris. The 8th of July 1942 went to Prunier for lunch with Gruninger and his young wife. He was brimming with new capricios and passed around some photographs from Russia. I found one quite touching, a young girl who had been injured was lying down having her wound dressed. In order to give her an injection in the buttock, the medic had pulled up her clothing. In the photograph, she is crying, not from pain, but because soldiers were standing around looking at her like an animal caught in a net. In the evening I read the poem by Friedrich Georg about the blue flints, a stone age hymn. Paris, the 9th of July 1942 When I close my eyes, I sometimes see a dark landscape of stones, cliffs, and mountains at the edge of infinity. In the background, on the shore of a black sea, I recognize myself a tiny little figure that almost seems to be drawn in with chalk. That is my forward posting, at the edge of the void. Over there at the abyss, I am fighting for myself. The linden blossoms these days, I don't think I've ever smelled them so powerfully and fervently. I read Carlo Schmidt's translation of Baudelaire's The Cats. The second stanza is especially effective Naquis and Gerigand Naktif and Lassen. Signed in Labdas Schwigen und Dein Act Semicolon Zerenian Hat Hades CG Macht, when C. Den Eckgaft Sich Zubigen W. U. Dieris Sisten. 59 The two last stanzas beautifully describe not only the 1 to 0 advantage of cats over dogs but also the moments of general stillness before action. Paris, the 11th of July 1942 dropped in on Valentina in the afternoon where I met Henri Thomas with his wife. Thomas shows the synthesis of youth, poverty, and dignity, which, when combined with intelligent insight, lends his judgment to certain incorruptibility. His wife, who still lives with her parents, is remarkably gracious. That was evident when she said to me. You want to find an expression in language that describes things with greater clarity than reality does. I try to do the same thing in the theatre. But using my entire body, not just the head. I encouraged Thomas to support her talent, but he said that was difficult, and when it comes to realizing an individual's talent, human beings are basically all alone. Yet support can be useful to other people. I believe rather that it is talent that creates support. Concerning Montholent, whom I compared to a cannonball, Thomas said, yes, but he doesn't penetrate things very deeply. Again, the ancient roofs were magnificent. 
I often sense that it is the pressure of time that distills beauty. Every day I have to tell myself that the signal to evacuate could come at any moment, at which point I, like bias, will take what is mine and leave the rest behind, if need be, even my skin. Then at Char Mills, where I ate dinner and studied the calendar. 60 Paris, the 12th of July 1942 was with a woman in a shop that sold edible snakes. The merchant opened a drawer and, without looking, reached in and yanked out the creatures by the middle of their bodies. Before handing them over, he put miniature muzzles on them, through which the little viper's horns quivered. We paid 12 or 14 marks for a medium size specimen. One sigh had awakened, I kept scratching my head over who the woman had been. Such apparitions are vaguely familiar, often combining several people like a sister, mother, or wife all the primeval elements of femininity combined. We grope our way through a dark web and do not recognize each other. Visited Valentina in the afternoon. Before I entered, I rummaged around in the displays on the quai. I picked up a 1520 copy of Doctrina Moriendi, Doctrines of the Dying, which according to a handwritten entry by the Chancellor of the Church in Paris, Jean de Gerson, was written in the 14th century. A further notation by Balus, the librarian of Colbert, documents that this volume once stood in the Bibliotheca Colbertina. Then went to the Louvre with the Doctor S to look at the sculpture. We ate dinner together and enjoyed lively chit chat. Paris, the 14th of July 1942. What I ought to have is a reserve of good books printed on newsprint books to be read in the bath or while traveling that can then be tossed away. Daily schedule in Kirchhorst. I need two hours in the evening to unwind, time to go through and organize books, clippings, manuscripts, diaries, correspondence. Cura posterior, secondary tasks. Paris, the 16th of July 1942 Five gladioli in a vase on the table in front of me, three white, one pale red, and one salmon colored. Gladioli tend to have hues of a concentrated quality, the life force within the blossoms almost retreats behind the powerful flash of the pure extract of their tint. When looking at these flowers, as with anything of a pure, all too pure, nature, a feeling of emptiness and ennui is hard to avoid. Yet the white examples especially stimulate theological questions. During the noon break, went by Berz's shop and rummaged through the books. I picked up the monographie du there, monograph on tea, by J. G. Habsay, Paris, 1843. It had nice engravings, even if the binding does show some wormholes. Also La Ville la République de Venise, The City and Republic of Venice, by Saint Didier, Paris, Derlein, 1660. The binding is beautiful and indestructible, full vellum with mitred corners and vellum bands on the spine. Finally, Law Tremont's preface A Unlive Future, preface to a future book, published in 1932, again in Paris, the great city of books. On the way I was overcome by the desire to write something, even if it were nothing more than a short story or two. I thought about Riley's shipwreck, 61 and then about the story of the boot black of Rhodes, which I've been pondering for quite a while. Paris, the 18th of July 1942 Architectural dreams in which I saw old Gothic buildings. They were standing in abandoned gardens, not a soul grasped their meaning in the midst of the solitude, and yet I thought them even more beautiful in a cryptic way. They showed a clear sense of structure like that intrinsic to plants and animals, it is their higher nature. Thought, that had been built in for God. Visited the photographer Florence Sonry in the afternoon. Just before that, rummaged around in books on the corner, where I bought, among other things, Les Amours de Charles de Gonzague, The Loves of Carlo Gonzaga, by Giulio Capacida and printed in Cologne in 1666. There was an old book plate inside that read, Paradia Gradia, I forge ahead through adversities. I underscored my agreement by writing my own, Tempestitibus Maturesco, Storms have made me the man I am. 
Jews were arrested here yesterday for deportation. Parents were separated from their children and wailing could be heard in the streets. Never for a moment may I forget that I am surrounded by unfortunate people who endure greatest suffering. What kind of human being, what kind of officer, would I be otherwise? This uniform obligates me to provide protection wherever possible. One has the impression that to do that one must, like Don Quixote, confront millions. Paris, the 19th of July 1942 visited the Pere Lachaise Cemetery in the afternoon. There I wandered around among the monuments with charm ill. Now and then we stumbled upon famous names in the labyrinths of this necropolis without looking for them. We found the gravestone of General Wimpfen holding a sword with a ribbon curled around it bearing the word Sedan. 62 The question mark on grave inscriptions was new to me. Then we found Oscar Wilde, whose monument had been paid for by one of his wealthy lady readers. Tasteless. You can see the tormented spirit who hovers on it being borne aloft by wings that weigh tons. Then we went down a mossy path canopied with green, which leads like the street of forgetting 63 into the valley among crumbling monuments. There we found the grave of Cherubini crowned by an urn, an adder coiled around its foot. Beside this was Chopin's grave with an oval marble relief. The derelict parts of this cemetery are the most beautiful. Comforting epitaphs occasionally gleam from the toppled stones, like a bittersweet iota mist, death is life's rest. Thoughts about the multitudes resting here. There are no spaces large enough to accommodate their ever-increasing armies. A different principle must be applied. They shall find space in a hazelnut. 64 This contact with a being who then disappears with the dark scepter is surely the most wonderful thing in the world. This cannot be compared with birth, which is merely the budding of life already familiar to us. Life lies in death like a small green island in the dark ocean. To fathom this, even at the edges and tidal zones, means real knowledge, compared to which physics and technology are mere trifles. Return to the city by the back streets. Every time I see the winged spirit of the Bastille with his torch and the broken chain in his hands, the sight reinforces the notion of highly dangerous and still potent energy. He combines the impression of great speed with stasis. He represents the spirit of progress raised on high, embodying the triumph of future conflagrations. Just as the rabble and the merchants united in spirit to erect this column, the vengeance of the Furies unites here with Mercury's cunning. This is no longer a symbol but an actual idol surrounded by the terrible tempest that has always illuminated such bronze columns since time immemorial. Paris, the 21st of July 1942 finished reading Law Tremont, preface A and leave a future, preface to a future book. I'm going to read the complete works of this author, which are collected in one volume, to deepen my understanding of him. In this preface, a new version of optimism is predicted, one without God, but differing from notions of progress by taking the perspective of the consciousness of perfection rather than some utopian recollection of it. This gives his argument a metallic quality, gleaming in technological glory and conviction. He writes in an easy-going style, as if we were on a beautiful, fast ship devoid of other passengers, propelled by consciousness rather than electricity. Doubt has been abolished as his air resistance. All that is worthwhile and good is to be found in the material, which the structure makes visible. Our age shows strong evidence of this attitude. An early example among the painters would be Chirico, whose cities are deserted and whose human beings are constructed from bits of armor plate. This is the optimism that our machine technology brings with it and which it cannot do without. The message must be heard in the voice of a speaker who delivers news of a metropolis that has been reduced to rubble and dashes. Paris, the 22nd of July 1942 called on Picasso in the afternoon. He lives in a spacious building in which the floors have been designated as storage rooms and depots. The building on Rue des Grands Augustins appears in Balzac's novels, Ravelac was brought here after he committed the assassination. In one corner, 
a narrow spiral staircase with steps of stone and ancient oak twisted upwards. A piece of paper bearing the little word I see I, here, in blue pencil was pinned to a narrow door. I rang, and the door was opened by a short man in a simple worker's smock, Picasso himself. I had met him briefly once before and again had the impression that I was looking at a magician, an impression that was only intensified by the little green pointed hat he wore. The household consisted of a small dwelling and two further storage rooms, one of which was in the garret. He appeared to use the lower one as a sculpture workshop and the upper one as a painting studio. The floor was tiled in a honeycomb pattern. The walls were colored with a yellow wash and supported by dark oak beams. Ribs of black oak ran across the ceilings. The rooms seemed to be perfectly laid out as a workspace. The sense that time stood still lay heavy in the air. First we looked at old papers downstairs, and then we went up to the second story. Among the pictures standing around, I liked two simple female portraits and then, most especially, a beach scene that blossomed in tones of red and yellow the more I looked at it. We talked about his views on painting and writing from memory. Picasso asked whether there was a real landscape behind the marble cliffs. I found other pictures, like a row of asymmetric heads. Quite monstrous. We have to grant such remarkable talent its own objectivity when we watch it develop such images over years and decades, even when they differ from our own perceptions. He is essentially showing us things as yet unseen and unborn, they are like alchemical experiments, and the word retort was mentioned several times. It had never dawned on me so powerfully and oppressively that the homunculus was more than just an idle fiction. The image of man is predicted magically, and few can sense the terrifying profundity of the decision that the painter makes. Even though I tried more than once to draw him out on this subject, he avoided the topic. Perhaps intentionally, there are chemists who spend their whole lives investigating the elements concealed in a piece of sugar. So I would like to know what color is. On their impact, my pictures would have the same effect if, after they were finished, I were to wrap them up and seal them without showing them to anyone. These are manifestations of the most intuitive nature. Concerning the war, both of us sitting here together would be able to negotiate peace over the course of this afternoon. In the evening people would be able to turn their lights on again. Paris, the 23rd of July 1942 I began reading the book of Esther, where Herodotus's ancient world of splendid pageantry still reigns supreme. Right there in the first chapter we have the feast at Susa lasting months in the Asiatic palace of Arhasuerus who reigned over 127 empires, from India to the land of the Moors. Anyone who appears before him unbidden must die unless he raises his golden scepter, as he did to Esther. Nowadays the only remnants of this terrible magical kingdom are the Jews, the unbending bronze serpent of the old life. I witnessed this once quite clearly. It was the sight of a Polish Jew at the Schlesisser Bahnhof, Silesia Station in Berlin. My thought, that is how you must have stood back then under the Ishtar gate of Babylon. My mail contains more and more letters from survivors writing to me about readers of mine who have been killed in the war. It often seems as though the dead appear as voices from a reading public in tenebra in darkness. Visit from Kurt, who was the model for traits in my character Biedenhorn.65 he could be called a sort of false tough who mingles good living with a sense of entitlement. He's back from the east, where he commands a tank company. He carries his official seal in his pocket so he can issue couriers identification cards, tickets, ration coupons, and whatever else he wishes at will. He uses it to stretch out in special train cars along with his pilfered courier baggage, which he orders the conductors to guard. When hotel staff do not jump to attention, he demands a room, service, and wine in his thundering voice, leaving the hoteliers quaking and apologizing. If he wants to force his way into a room that's off limits, as he did today when he wanted to get into the commissary of the military academy, he doesn't use subterfuge. He inspects the guards in order to find fault with them. Then he has people brought in to carry the merchandise he purchases. 
All this gives him material to joke about over wine. I talked with him for a long time in the Raphael, partly because his conversation embodies a cynical but elemental power, and also because he is significant as a type. He seems to have instinctive insight into our situation. He thinks it is old fashioned of me, one of my whims, that the injustice of this world still grieves me. He says that will never be eradicated, and at this point, I discover a gentle trait in him, the concern of the stronger for the weaker man, which is how I seem to him. This concern is quite specific, he would not feel it if I were under fire with him or attacking someone in authority of the sort that he, as an old Oak man, 66 well knows. On the other hand, it would distress him to see me come to grief as a result of my good nature. He has political ideas of the sort you'd find in a herd of big game. You have to avoid the dominant stags and protect yourself as long as they're in power. While we were conversing so casually about the temper of the times, I wondered whether or not he might still be preferable to those officers who are blindly obedient while honor goes to hell. The Landskunkt 67 represents an authentic type, a powerful contrast to the flaccid idealism that soldiers on as if things were all in order. One gets the feeling that he was, is, and will always be in all regions and at all times, and that he has nothing in common with those living corpses. As danger increases, he feels happier and becomes more necessary. Paris, the 24th of July 1942 beautiful images appear before my closed eyes while dozing. Today it was a honey yellow agate with sepia moss shaped inclusions. It drifted slowly past like a blossom falling into the abyss. Those red flowers one sees now and then in the windows of darkened rooms, they're like cut gems that sparkle in the sunshine. Paris, the 25th of July 1942, the tiger lily on the table in front of me. While I am observing it, all at once the six petals and six stamens fall from it like a magnificent robe rudely ripped off leaving behind only the desiccated pistil with the ovules. At that moment, I become very aware of the force that destroys the flower. O oh, reap your fruit, for thus do the fates cut you down. Went to the Latin quarter in the afternoon, where I admired an edition of Saint Simon in twenty-two volumes. Such a monument to historiographical passion. The work represents one of those points where modernity comes into focus. T with the doctor or S at her place. Afterward, we went to see Valentina, who had invited us to dinner. In addition to him, De Closeyes was there. We talked about Picasso and Leon Bloy. De Closeyes told an anecdote about Bloy that I don't believe, but have written down nonetheless because it gives a hint of the profound and perhaps not undeserved hatred of the literary establishment for this writer as was his habit, he once also asked Paul Bagot for money, without success. After this, Bloy publicly gave Bagot the cold shoulder. Some time passed before Bagot received another letter from Bloy with the request for the immediate loan of 500 francs because his father had died. Bagot puts the money in his pocket and makes his way personally to Montmartre where Bloy lives in one of the obscure hotels. When the porter takes him to Bloy's room, Bagot hears music inside, and when he knocks, Bloy opens the door completely naked. He could see naked women in cold meats and wine on the table. Bloy mockingly invited Bagot to enter, and he accepts the invitation. He first puts the money on the mantelpiece and has a look around. Monsieur Bloy, I believe you wrote me that your father had died? So, you are a pawnbroker? Bloy answers, and opens the door to the next room, where his father's corpse is lying on the bed. What makes the story especially suspect is the setting, which is actually not one where anyone would die. It's also remarkable that Bloy hardly ever mentions his father in his voluminous journals, despite the fact that they are otherwise overly rich in detailed family description. On his own deathbed, Bloy was asked what he felt as he faced death, an immense curious sight, enormous curiosity. That's very good. He had the habit of disarming his listeners by making the first thrust. Then there was talk about celebrities. The Contes de Noes had invited Marshal Joffre. That must have been so boring just before the Battle of the Marne. When he was serving, 
The porter clicked his heels every time he presented a platter. He had spent World War I as a trench fighter with a combat patrol. A German had bitten off one of his thumbs in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He forbids his wife to call the Germans botches, adding, I'm allowed to say botch because I fought them. Paris, the 26th of July 1942 visited Montparnasse Cemetery in the afternoon. After searching for a long time, I finally found the grave of Baudelaire with its tall steel showing a gigantic bat with furled wings dot in the midst of all these dilapidated monuments, I paused a long time in front of the gravestone of Napoleon Charles Louis Roussel, who died on the 27th of February 1854 at the age of 19, having been an artist for half a year. Over the slab that his friends had paid for lay an urn that had fallen from its pedestal. It was covered with moss that gushed from it like a green life force. I am always fascinated by the mystery surrounding such tombs of ordinary people in this sea of graves. Like tracks in the sand, they are soon erased by the wind. In the Raphael, I read Heinrich Hans Jacob, De Theodo. I sense such a narrative gift springing from the popular imagination is now running dry. With it dies the compost of literature the mossy flora on the roots and at the base of the trunks, and for that matter, the whole range of descriptive powers. Then the treetops start to dry out. In the night, I dreamed about a beautiful snake, its iridescent, steel blue scales showed labyrinthine wrinkles like those on a cherry pit. The creature was so large that I could barely put my arms around its neck. I had to carry it a long way because no cage was available. I thought I would like to build a beautiful garden for it, but how could I construct it without having to charge an entrance fee? Paris, the 27th of July 1942. The mail brought me a surprise in the form of the Grishiskata, Greek Gods, by Friedrich Georg. These are the page proofs published by Klostermann. Even though I was familiar with the images and thoughts from conversations we had in New Berlingen, reading them in this format had a very powerful effect upon me. It is beautiful how the ancient and modern worlds meet here, primeval thoughts are grasped with the perspective of our time. One feels that the German has nourished them step by step along their way and that they have reciprocated. The mythical universe is omnipresent here, it resembles the abundance that the gods conceal from us. We wander as beggars in the midst of inexhaustible riches, which the poets pay out to us in coin. Paris, the 28th of July 1942. The unfortunate pharmacist on the corner, his wife has been deported. Such benign individuals would not think of defending themselves, except with reasons. Even when they kill themselves, they are not choosing the lot of the free who have retreated into their last bastions. Rather they seek the night as frightened children seek their mothers. It is appalling how blind even young people have become to the sufferings of the vulnerable, they have simply lost any feeling for it. They have become too weak for the chivalrous life. They have even lost the simple decency that prevents us from injuring the weak. The opposite is true, they take pride in it. After writing these lines before lunch, I called on Botard, that good fellow and took him a prescription that the doctor or s had written for me. When he brought it to me, he gave me a small bar of soap as a gift, as if he sensed that I had been directing good wishes to him. I never allow myself to forget that I am surrounded by sufferers. That is more important than any fame achieved through military or intellectual exploits, or the empty applause of youth whose taste is erratic. I then went to the shop on the Rue du Faubourg Saint Honor that belongs to the lady books Ella with the Limp. There I examined an illustrated volume about a journey up the Nile by Carl Winner from about 1870. Looking at pictures does me good when I'm upset. Paris, the 2nd of August 1942 visited Pereira Lacaze Cemetery, in the afternoon. Here in the city centre, not far from the overpopulated neighborhoods around the Bastille, you can enjoy one of the most tranquil walks. On a mossy path among the graves beneath the canopy of ash and acacia, I came upon an obelisk erected to the memory of the great entomologist Latrell. Just under the scarab above the inscription of his name, a silkworm larva had established itself. 
the scarab lifted up the ball like a sun disk. I laid a blossom on this grave and as I picked it, a small weevil fell out into my hand as a reward. It was one I lacked for my collection. Such an old cemetery is like a quarry. Many generations have contributed to the richness of its variety as well as its individual monuments. When I was looking at many different types of granite and porphyry, I had the thought that in the world of stones, the polished finish embodies what the blossom does for plants, or the mating display for animals. It provides the place where the hidden glory and order that reside deep in matter are visible. By contrast, the crystal structure bursts forth in flowers. A bell rings in the evening to remind visitors to leave the cemetery. You then see them pushing toward the exit, either one by one or in little groups. Their pace is faster than when they wandered around the cemetery. It is almost as though the thought of being locked into this labyrinth of death awakens a dark terror in them. Large cemeteries like this make the unity of culture visible. especially through their power, which rests beyond all struggle. The dead have returned to their maternal ground and are now unassailable, instead of feuding with each other, the names merely accumulate. Here we can see the inviolate nature of people, like a glimpse into rooms behind the stage. Whereas the, the actors become people again, here they are transmuted into spirit. The mighty dead, how could this insight ever be lost? I returned by way of Rue de la Roquette, from which you can sometimes see the guardian spirit of the Bastille gleaming like one of the furies in the distance. Back in my room in the Raphael, I met a Miss Filmish Tom who had come to seek me out for advice. Then I read some Renan and a little of the biography of the Bronze, then finally some of the Book of Job. Chapter 28 contains a foreshadowing of the immense distance separating man from wisdom destruction and death say, we have heard the fame thereof with our ears. Paris, the 3rd of August 1942 finished reading Renan, Das Leben Jesu, The Life of Jesus, and in addition Robert de Traz, La Famille Bronte, The Bronte Family. The Brontes are significant because they seem to possess an intelligence unlike that of other people, one that flows to them indiscriminately, like electric current. You can almost imagine knowledge being conducted through the earth and through the trunk of the tree until it reaches the bird's nest and the young brood in it. Such power could endow heavenly bodies with intelligence. This extraordinary side of the bronze suggests that it is the rule on other stars, in other profound thought systems. In this sense, prophetic dreams that come true, second sight, and prophecies are all extraordinary. In the same way that colors exist outside the visible spectrum, there also exists a dark body of law that is seldom individuated. The harmony and subtle interaction of our life cycles depend on its invisible influence. Paris, the 4th of August 1942 This morning a hair somber dropped in to see me at the Majestic and brought me greetings from Federacy. We spoke about China, which he knows well, having been born there. Then, about Japan. His father, who wanted to have a pair of polo breeches made, entrusted a tailor with the task by giving him a garment purchased in England as a sample. He made it especially clear to the Japanese tailor that he was allowed to cut this model apart so that the new breeches would fit him perfectly. On the day of delivery the tailor arrived with six pairs, all matching their model like mirror images. He had even included the two patches and a worn spot on the inside of one of the knees. Paris, the 5th of August 1942 Perpetua writes me that bombs fell on Hanover in the afternoon of the 2nd of August, killing many people. When the fires started, she heard the old gravedigger Shudkopf yelling from the cemetery, What do you know? Now they're coming in broad daylight. In the parsonage, she keeps a suitcase ready packed with some underwear and the manuscripts. Dinner at the Morans. He did not appear because he was made a minister today. His wife represented him, I also saw the new prefect of police and Princess Murat. I had a conversation with the prefect about what the underworld was up to on Rue de Lap. He was not pleased to hear that I take walks the. Paris, 
the 6th of August 1942 Tolmont Day Rex. I am reading his history acts, brief histories, right now, and I find they surpass St. Simon's history when it comes to meaty substance. They give a kind of social zoology. Yesterday I heard an amusing anecdote about the Marquis de Roquelauer. It conveys the comedy well and exposes the source of the humor as the clash between social conventions and natural artistic relations. During a ball, Madame Orba took Roquelauer by the hand, whereupon he plucked a steward's sleeve and asked him whether it was permissible to dance with this bourgeois woman. The event was turned into a satirical rhyme Roquelauer is done dancer de apostrophe importance semicolon mayis. Sil ni conist par lions, il ni dancer a jamais. Rock will lawyer is a dancer of importance, but if he does not understand how to make the connection, he will never dance at all. Paris, the 8th of August 1942, dropped by Valentina's in the evening. There, in addition to day close eyes, I met a young pilot who is commanding a tank company on the islands. Darkness fell gradually during our conversation. Bats fluttered about the old gables, and swifts settled into their nests. A city like this has its animal element, like a coral reef. Dot walked back to the Eto Isle with day close eyes. We talked about the obelisks and the way they seem to stand in the great squares as magical signages, symbols of spiritual rectitude. They imbue the world of stone with meaning. I sometimes think I see sparks shooting from their tips. It is lovely when they glow in different colors, perhaps red, or are illuminated by an errant ray of light, but glimpsing them can also be frightening. In them we sense the life of cities devoid of people, where their shadows count the hours like an omon. Conversed about Boethius and in that context about the threats of our own age, which, despite everything, need not distract individuals from their normal mode of life, the stillness at the heart of the waterfall. Day Close Eyes observed that this presumed a reference to some point of stasis. He recalled that this was how he had always braved his fear of thunderstorms as a child, sustained by the thought that, high above the clouds, the blue heavens were shining unchanged. D. An appalling man. Made aware of this because every day six to ten people in his forced labor camp die from lack of nourishment and medication, and yet relief is supposed to be provided, have them enlarged the cemetery. Paris, the 9th of August 1942 I wonder whether we ever agreed to our fate at some decisive point in our pre-existence. Perhaps we selected it, as if from among a pile of costumes before a masked ball. But the light in which we rummaged around in the ante room where we made this hasty decision showed the material with its true meaning in the game of life. Perhaps then the beggar's tattered garment appeared more desirable than a regal robe. I'm reading Diabolum Ruux, The Devil in Love, 1772, again and find that the most significant passage is the one in which Biondetto explains that the world is not ruled by chance, but by a system of finely balanced inevitabilities from the course of the stars down to the petty trifles of the gaming table. It seems that cosmic events are determined by a secret law of numbers, which explains why the future is unknowable. After this explanation, she gives Alvarez a few signals that help him win at Faro. Even though he takes no money from her, he does not consider this sort of help to be cheating. That is a subtle detail for in the Kabbalah the devil actually reaches his greatest heights when all traces of his origin are obliterated. By such means, it would be possible to form holy names, the Lord's Prayer, or passages of scripture by applying automatic calculations to create infinite sequences of numbers and combinations. Texts generated in this manner would, of course, merely have the semblance of the letters in common with the true ones but not possess their meaning and healing power. Although Alvarez does not recognize all these connections, his reaction is a nice counter move that shows his basically healthy character, after a winning streak, he tires of the game of Pharaoh. Human beings are privileged in not knowing the future. That is one of the diamonds in our diadem of free will. If we were to lose it, we would become automatons in a world of machines. Paris, 
The 10th of August 1942 in the night, I dreamt of the trenches of World War I. I was in the dugout, but this time the children were sitting with me, and I was showing them picture books. I then went outside and stretched out in a bomb crater. The earth had been turned to powder by the shelling. I rubbed the soft crumbs together in my hands, recognizing it as I did so as the material from which we are made and to which we shall return. I could hardly tell the difference between the soil and my own hand. I lay there like a mummy surrounded by concentrated essence of mummies. Paris, the 11th of August 1942 A letter from Schlechter containing photos of some powerful new pictures and drawings. I look forward to good things from his illustrations for 1001 Nights. Paris, the 12th of August 1942 I was with Friedrich Georg on a cliff at the edge of a desert. We were throwing stones at a little piece of something the size of a snail shell that glistened like a piece of lapis lazuli. We talked about the distance we had to keep from it because it was such highly explosive material. It is odd that our dream conversations so often have to do with the physical world, while in our waking state our discussions are about art. We then made our way down and gathered insects at the damp grassy edge of the desert. They were unlike any genus I was familiar with. I considered whether I should even be taking them, for they differed so greatly from the structures inherent in their type that I took no pleasure in collecting them. I found myself confronting the demiurge like a child who says, I'm not playing anymore. Went to the bagatelle in the afternoon to admire the beautiful flowers, among them the delicious vine, hyacinth bean, with its magnificent broad, purple lilac seed bod, this living thing that does not flaunt its blossoms but rather its fruit. Then the Virginia jasmine with its large, slit blossoms that reach upward like blazing trumpets, a decoration for garden gates in 1001 nights. Star clematis, the flower flies, in their tiger colors, hovered around them, suspended in space, quivering spasmodically over the sea of blossoms. Resting in the grotto, it stands over dirty green water, where a large golden orf with its dark, scaly back, was swimming. It went past like a dark shadow in the depths, shimmering ever brighter as it rose lazily and then broke the surface with a burst of incandescence. Probably influenced by these things, I dreamed at night of a book plate that I would like to own. It showed a swordfish breaking the surface of the water from a matte black background in India ink, it was delicate, Japanese, with an antique gold border. When I woke up, I felt so joyous from the sight of this image that I wanted to have an engraving made, but by daylight this charm faded. The joy we feel in dreams is like the joy of childhood. Within minutes after awakening, we grow into adulthood. Paris. The 13th of August 1942 finished reading Jean Cocteau, essay de critique indirect, essay of indirect criticism. It contains the prophetic dream that the author had already recounted to me when we met at Carvitz. As for me, I can't remember dreams like that, and experiences often seem as though I had just dreamed them. At one point they were experienced most profoundly as platonic ideas that is far more important than their literal fulfillment. This is the way one should consider death so as to become used to the idea of it. I noted the following good observations, Sir Natural here, Natural Domain. Supernatural yesterday, natural tomorrow, certainly true, for the natural laws that Constance Rinan makes such a fuss about will always adjust to reality. They are like the musical accompaniment that falls silent as soon as things become dramatic. Existence knows no law. One could probably put that a bit more cautiously, natural laws are those that we perceive. At all points, when we ourselves enter the equation, we can no longer perceive them. Technology has now been so profoundly implemented that even after the domination of the technicians and their major premises has been broken, we are going to have to deal with its remnants. The terrible fate of its victims is built into this system. Thus, it will remain, in the same way that the ancient law still held sway after the appearance of Christ, as one of our memories, along with its human residue.
the real question is whether these memories curtail freedom. Probably a new form of slavery is the result. This can be reconciled with comfort and even the possession of power, but the chains remain in place. Nonetheless, free men know each other and are recognizable by a new nimbus that suffuses them. Perhaps we are talking only about small groups that preserve freedom, probably among its victims, yet the spiritual gain compensates for its losses many times over. The flowers, the birds, the gems, those things of glowing color or pungent aroma. The sight of them fills us with longing for their places of origin. Paris, the 16th of August 1942, Saturday and Sunday in Vaux de Sene at the house of Rambouillet, as a guest of the commander in chief, who is using this old monastery as his summer residence. My stay here has the advantage that I can do and say what I think is right and not be seen by any lemurs. The woodsy surroundings are damp, even swampy which reflects the rule of the Cistercens, who built like beavers. I saw the venerable and unpretentious gravestone of the early abbot Theobaldus, known as Saint Thibaut de Mali. While there, I read Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, a story that superbly describes the transformation of civilized optimism into utter bestiality. Two Philistines come to the Congo to make money, and there they adopt cannibalistic habits. In broader contexts, Burkhardt described this process as rapid decay. Both men heard the overture of our age. Conrad perceives something more clearly than Kipling, and that is Anglo-Saxon constancy in transitional situations. That is a remarkable and unpredictable trait in our world, which might sooner have been prophesied of the Prussians. The difference between them, however, lies in the fact that the Englishman can tolerate a significantly greater dose of anarchy. If the two were innkeepers in squalid neighborhoods, the Prussian would expect the regulations to be followed in every room. In doing so, he would actually be preserving a certain veneer of order while the entire building was being devoured by nihilism from the inside out. The Englishman would turn a blind eye to the growing disorder at first and just keep on filling the glasses and collecting the money until finally, when the racket on the floor above got out of hand, he would take a few of the customers upstairs, and together they would beat the others to a pulp. From the standpoint of character analysis, the Englishman has the advantage over the Prussian in being phlegmatic, while the other is sanguine, objectively, he has the advantage of the seaman over the landlubber. Seafaring people are used to greater fluctuation. Add to this the frequently noted superiority of the Norman genetic material, which is more favorable for the creation of a leader class than the common Germanic stock. In any case, it is better that such cousins stand back to back, or rather shoulder to shoulder, as they did at Bell Alliance, Waterloo instead of nose to nose. This was always the goal of Prussian policy, which was good as long as landowners were in charge of it and not people elected by a democratic plebiscite. Naturally, the influence of the soil diminishes when population numbers rise and there is a shift to the large cities. But the influence of the seas grows. That is an important difference. We talked about these things over dinner, and then about the situation in general. Took a walk later in the woods with Herr Schnarth, the director of the Hanoverian archives. The conservation and law of strange old things, especially those of Lower Saxony reminds one of ritualistic purification rites with smoke, or of a world of images still present in the moor and the turf, redolent with the smell of fire and earth. The tradition relates to the demons of the landscape, and turns into a sort of ghost hunt. Historical fact intrudes into this twilight realm as in the case of the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest. 68 without any outside sources, that event would have been woven into mythology long ago. In the midst of the tools of the peat-cutting culture in the Hanoverian Museum, the silver treasure of Hildsheim shone brilliantly. Its character appeals to me, it indicates the superiority of the Norns over the formulaic history depicted on it. No matter how colorfully and richly the thread may be dyed, they spin and cut it, and then the pattern fades down the river of time, and only the warp of the fabric remains, that ancient, 
gray sensibility common to us all since time immemorial. The general came around to the topic of the Russian cities and said that it was important for me to be aware of them, especially with respect to particular corrections in the figure of the worker. 69 I responded by saying that for quite a while I have been considering a visit to New York for my sins, but I that was not opposed to a command on the Eastern Front. Paris, the 17th of August 1942 visit to the boys in the afternoon, then tea at Madame Moran's in her garden, where the top of the Eiffel Tower looks down over the tallest trees onto the marble paving stones. Hella, Valentina, Rantzau, and the Marquis de Polignac were there, she and I compared memories of the Capuchin catacombs in Palermo. She said that the sight of this morbid parade of death awakened in her a mad lust for life, and that when she emerged into the daylight, she felt tempted to throw herself at the first decent man to cross her path. Perhaps that was why mummies were thought to have aphrodisiac qualities in ancient times. Capricio, I wonder whether these ancient arts of embalming might still provide nourishment nowadays, and whether in the necropolises you could give a feast with bread made of wheat from the pyramids, broth from the steer god Apis. Then one could excavate carbonized flesh from the necropolises the way we do carbonized plants from coal in coal mines. That would be an inferior form of nourishment, just as coal is an inferior fuel source. Paris, the 18th of August 1942 destroyed papers in the morning, including my plan for an effective piece that I had composed last winter. Conversation with Carlo Schmid, who came to my room and told me about his son again, as well as about his dreams and the Baudelaire translation he has now finished. I bought a notebook in a stationery shop on Avenue Wagram. I was in uniform. I was struck by the expression on the face of a young girl behind the counter, it was clear that she was staring at me with incredible hatred. The pupils of her light blue eyes were like pinpoints, she met my gaze quite openly with a kind of relish, a relish the scorpion uses to pierce his prey with the barb in his tail. I felt that this intensity of human emotion had not existed for a long time. The shafts of such glaring looks can bring us nothing but ruin and death. I sense that it wants to spread like an epidemic or a spark that can be extinguished only deep inside, with difficulty and self-control. Paris, the 19th of August 1942 to the Ritz at noon with Weimar who wants to visit Poupit and Herculean Marseille in the next few days. Discussion of the situation. Gnu Apes la Deluge, we, shall be here, after the Deluge. Call on Charmil for tea right after that. We ate on the Rue de Diras and afterward, crossed the Rue de Faubourg Saint Honor to the Eto Isle under strong sheet lightning. On our way, we occasionally heard the crickets chirping in the bakeries, our conversation was wide ranging and retrospective in nature. Current reading, Schlegel's Lucinda, which gives me the impression that here romanticism could have turned into a way of life, the way details have become perpetuated in bad style through Gents and Van Higgen. Vonience. Here there are just intimations and foreshadowing. Perhaps one day they will form a melody. Then Romanticism would emerge as an intricate prelude to exquisite and refined attainments of our later culture. Today, one can still sense the urge with which it tries to capture talented individuals. It resembles a spirit that influences us with its design and demands to find form in flesh and blood. These individuals can also transform anything into the romantic mode, as Ludwig II did to the Versailles of Louis XIV, or the way Wagner transformed the world of the Norse gods. The romantic key fits 99 treasure houses, madness and death lurk in the hundredth. Paris, the 26th of August 1942 Friedrich Georg writes to me that during the last attack on Hamburg, the type for his second edition of Illusion Der Technik, Illusions of Technology, was melted in the fire. The Doctor S picked me up in the evening for a walk through the old neighborhoods by the light of the full moon. At the monument to Henri IV, we went down to the square du Vert Gallant, where we saw lights in the ship's galleys, and it smelled of stagnant water. We talked about Platon's poetry, whose beauty she compared to the harsh brilliance of the moonlight 
second hand light. Let Eros bathe in reflected light. At times I have difficulty distinguishing between my conscious and unconscious existence. I mean between that part of my life that has been knit together by dreams and the other, by the day. It's similar when I try to create images and characters, when I work as an author, many things coalesce into flesh and blood and develop lives of their own. Man could disappear into the images that he himself has invented in the role of sorcerer, but actually the opposite must happen, the images must raise him up into the light, and then they can fall from him like petals from the fruit. At the moment, we are in the process of implementing the exact opposite dynamic from that of the romantics. Where they dove deep into things, we rise upward. This new, clearer vision is still painful, still unfamiliar. Late ape does, the stubborn, hard headed ones. This is what the September 70 call themselves. The word contains a frightening tenderness, evoking something of the world's malicious child's play. Paris, the 28th of August 1942 Still no news of my journey to the East. At noon had a conversation with Wines talk about Plato and his contemporary appeal. These ideas come to me after having read Friedrich Georg's Grishiskotter, Greek Gods. In the afternoon, I had a visit in the Majestic from Aheres, an owner of factories that make electrical equipment. He posed the question whether moral man is prepared to enter reality today and whether there is any prospect for this. We discussed this a long time, calling to mind Nietzsche, Burkhardt, and Stavrogin. My visitor seemed to be animated by a certain pragmatic moralism, or utopianism, a kind of substantiated rationality like that of the Jesuit fathers who commissioned the vault in St. Michael's Church in Munich. The philosophical tract that was popular 150 years ago. The economy of human life, 71 came to mind. It's good to keep the concrete world in sight and close at hand when having such abstract discussions. It's like a great machine in which the momentum of our conversation sometimes powers a piston and at others, a flywheel. We can seek another person with the intention of being particularly cordial or particularly intimate that day. Yet that is no protection against annoyance. The tuning of the strings to produce a harmonious chord is not controlled by our will. This often happens to me with encounters I've been looking forward to, they seem chilly, and the proper harmony is not re-established until days or weeks later. Dreams of clouds last night. They looked like massive ribbons of snow. With edges of soil like the clumps of earth children used to roll along the ground in wet weather in the spring thaw. Paris, the 29th of August 1942 In the afternoon I went to visit Le Malt on the sixth floor of a house on Rue du Merrill to examine his insect collection. The door was opened by a stout gentleman 60 years old with a full white beard who had obviously been debilitated by his many years in the tropics. He left me alone for a moment in a large room, its walls were covered with cases full of butterflies the way a library would be with books. I saw an aquarium, and a ring-neck dove flew down toward me from the top of one of the cabinets. It cooed at me and hopped onto the index finger of my hand. Then Lemult returned and showed me his magnificent butterflies from the Solomon Islands and other archipelagos of the world. Here I was again reminded of the strange enterprise of accumulating hundreds of thousands of tiny colorful mummies, there is something Egyptian about the activity. These arts, he says, seem so tenuous in our world of destruction. A single such case often represents the result of many years of the most painstaking work. That explains why Lamolt poured out his heart with a distraught account of an anti-aircraft shell that had quite recently exploded nearby. At night I dreamed of climbing a mountain. From a small rivulet, I picked out a green fish with seven pairs of eyes, those in the front were blue, the ones at the back still in an indistinct embryonic stage. When I ascended higher into the icy mountain terrain, the fish stopped moving and froze in my hand. I then entered a mountain chapel. Paris, the 30th of August 1942 visited Bagatelle in the afternoon with Charmil. There was a yellow lantana blossom with a red center. 
The bloom is like velvet and gives forth a delicate velvet aroma. This attracts the butterflies, especially the swallowtail, which hovers over it without spread wings as it inserts its proboscis into the colorful recesses. I've seen these in the Azores, but they were violet, and I'm always overcome by a feeling of homesickness when the sight reminds me of those Hesperides. On those islands and on the Canaries and on the mountains of Rio de Janeiro, I spent hours that revealed to me that there must have been a paradise, so solitary and beautiful, often majestic. Even the sun seemed to shine with a different light, more divine. In such hours, out of all the evils of our modern age, only one remained, that the moment had to pass. Paris, the 31st of August 1942 went by the new antiquarian bookshop I have discovered, Gonard on the Rudo Miram Snil. A new book dealer means a new hobby horse. I especially liked a little square room completely lined with books. I bought the memoirs of Baron Grimm, whose writing, in addition to his letters, will always remain a choice morsel for connoisseurs. Each volume bore the bookplate of a Baron de Crisley, Je regarde et je garde, I watch and I guard a proud motto. In addition, I picked up a detailed account of the shipwreck of the American brig La Sophie, Paris, 1821. And finally, L'Art du Duel, The Art of the Duel, by Tavernier signed by the author to a Gergel, whom he identifies as the king of photographers. Just to poke around among all these things is informative, memory retains in passing a mass of names and dates, and although these facts erode, they deposit a kind of compost in the mind, which nurtures later growth of diffuse knowledge. This can be superior to precision, as it consists of nuances of contour and intellectual currents. Thus, none of my many walks along the quays is ever in vain, just as the appeal of the hunt lies in the chase, not in bagging the prey. Paris, the 1st of September 1942, the 1st of September, along the Quais de la Seine, there already extends a pattern of yellow, jagged, heart shaped poplar leaves. We are now entering the fourth year of this war. Called on Valentina in the evening to watch darkness climb over the rooftops. The swallows and swifts had already moved on. Later, to the Tuileries with Charmil. We sat on a bench as the Big Dipper sparkled overhead and talked about the flower with the golden calyx, the flower of imagination. My current reading, Paul Mirand, Vida Guida Maupassant, The Life of Guida Maupassant. These are bouquets, flowers interlaced with variegated spiders and snake heads. Incidentally, one should not become the biographer of anyone one does not love. Paris. The 2nd of September 1942 visited Parc de Bagatelle in the afternoon. The leaves are turning yellow and asters are coming into bloom. Intimate conversation in the pavilion. Slept poorly at night. There is a sort of dream in which only thoughts form instead of images. We cannot seem to penetrate the deeper vaults of the structure to find solutions. Paris. The 8th of September 1942 went to Valentina's in the evening, on Reed a month and was there, as well as Nebel, who had come from the islands. Nebel told us about a prophecy from the 16th century that had foretold the destruction of Cologne for our time. He claimed that it had been fulfilled quite literally and concretely, for only the city centre within its 16th century limits had been demolished. Then, a discussion of American values, which will be further promoted by the obliteration of our old cities. Further conversation about De Quincey, Nebel had brought an English edition with him that made my mouth water. Talk of bullfighting, which had encouraged Munthaland to run away from home when he was a boy. About the Duke of Saint Simon and the memoirs of Primi Visconti from the court of Louis XIV. Munthaland told the anecdote about the Comte de Gitch that he had run across and which he mentions in one of his books. Paris, the 9th of September 1942 breakfast at the Morands, where, in addition to them, I also saw Benoist Meshin. Talked about Maupassant on the occasion of Morand's biography. He said he owned a large number of unknown letters by this author. Then talk about Denunzio whom Benoist Meshin once visited on his island. On his little battleship, 
D'Annunzio fired off salutes to honor various nations after toasting each of them briefly. At the end, after a particularly heartfelt acclamation of France, the powder from the guns settled into a ring around the ship, which gradually rose into the air. At this D'Annunzio said to his guests, Do you now believe I am a poet? Benoist Meshin then talked about the recruitment of the 650,000 workers that Germany is demanding of France, and about the prospects and disadvantages that await them. Among these he listed the increased dangers for Central Europe that such an accumulation of rootless individuals brings with it from a purely technical aspect, and for France, particular danger by virtue of proximity. This cabinet minister gives the impression of incisive intelligence. His error lies in the fact that he made the wrong decision at the crossroads. He now finds himself upon a path that is becoming ever narrower and more impassable. In this situation, he has to step up his activity, although the results will diminish. In this way his energies are dissipated, his desperate measures will ultimately lead to his downfall. Europe resembles a beautiful woman with too many suitors. She is holding out for the right one. Then I met Charmil at the Eiffel Tower in the Parc de Bagatelle. The asters are beginning to bloom, one in particular bears myriads of pale grey buds hardly larger than pinheads on its bushes. The flower thus brings honour to its name, as if it were reflecting the firmament in a microcosm. Paris, the 10th of September 1942 went to the Ritz in the evening with Hum to hear the correspondent for the Colnus Zetung, Cologne newspaper, Mariaux and his wife. Mariaux reported that in the turmoil of this war, fire had destroyed all his notes and manuscripts, the result of thirty years of work. He compared the condition he's been in since then to that of Peter Schlemiel. The man who lost his shadow. 72 His misfortune made me wonder whether or not I should publish certain of my unpublished materials, like my travel journals, earlier than I had planned to. Appearing in print is a safety measure against these types of losses. During these past years, solipsism has emerged as a particularly difficult hurdle in the evolution of my thought. This is not only a product of isolation. It is also related to a temptation to embrace misanthropy, a trait that one cannot resist strongly enough in oneself. When surrounded by these crowds who have renounced free will, I feel more and more alienated, and sometimes it seems as if these people were not even there or that they were merely specious outlines constructed of half demonic, half mechanical materials. Active solipsism, the power that lets us dream the world. We dream ourselves into health or death, if we could dream more powerfully, we would become immortal. That is seductive, yet you always have to think of the dangers, the way Ricebrook Admirable saw them and described them in his Mirror of Eternal Salvation, one finds other, evil, and diabolical men who say they are God, that heaven and earth were made by their hands, and that they received him along with everything else that exists. These are the temptations of theological speculation, like those visible in the Thebi.73 How puny by comparison is the entire world of technology. Paris, the 13th of September 1942 Sunday stroll to Saint Remy le Chevreuse. It is my habit to have a leisurely breakfast there in the Inchevet. Then I walk up the hill to a large park abandoned by its owner. A good cigar for its gatekeeper the disabled veteran who opens this overgrown garden. I rest on a solitary slope overgrown with low chestnut bushes with a view of green stands of fir and oak, the jays and woodpeckers flying back and forth among them. In the rhythm of resting and thinking, the afternoon passes all too quickly. Paris, the 14th of September 1942 The riddle of life, before it, blocking the way hangs the combination lock of the mind doing its job. The outrageous aspect of this job is that the contents of the safe change according to the method applied to gain access to it. If the lock is ever broken open, it evaporates. Deucement. Carefully, the more delicately we finger it, the more remarkable are the combinations that are revealed. By the same token, they also become simpler. Ultimately, we begin to sense that we are gaining access to our own breast, to ourself, 
and that the riddle of the world is a reflection of the riddle of life. The treasures of the cosmos now pour in. Paris, the 15th of September 1942 Current Reading, Progressing in the Bible, which I have been engaged in systematically for a year. Among the Psalms, Psalm 139 struck me especially, for it is an expression of divine physics. This can be called monistic, because one trunk bears a branched system of contradictions. God is present as far as the depths of hell, and the darkness illuminates him as the light. He inhabits matter, sees our bones growing in the womb, and knows their future. For our thought processes, this psalm sets itself completely apart from the others by its perfect intelligibility. Compared with others, such as the powerful Psalm 90, it is more modern in the same sense that Thucydides is more modern than Herodotus. In contrast with the other songs of destiny, it is composed of the highest spiritual content. Verses 19 to 22 seem to break down and, if I am not mistaken, appear to be by a different author. On the other hand, verse 14 is lovely, when man thanks God for having created him wonderfully made. It makes sense that piety is only imaginable between wonderful beings. The animals express their praise through their behavior and their magnificent coloration, but for this purpose, man has been given the word. Further reading includes the story quit by Fontaine. As I was reading, the thought came to me that a powerful narrative gift can sometimes be a detriment to an author, since delicate intellectual plankton cannot thrive in a swift flood of writing. The fact is that narrative talent was originally a rhetorical gift and thus does not conform to the pen but drags that instrument too quickly in its wake. Of course, it usually reveals a healthy nature, yet lends itself equally easily to a kind of optimism that assays men and things too superficially. But when poetic and narrative power remain in equilibrium at a high level, incomparable creations result, as in Homer. The ancient bards did not separate rhetorical and poetic craft, and fiction was born spontaneously of the quill. This presupposes that poetry is the mother tongue of the human race, as Herman suggests. Finally, Morris de Guerin. In many respects, he represents the highest quality. For example, in the way that his language not only mediates feelings and sensations but is in itself a thoroughly sentimental, animated presence that requires taste to its last syllable. Because Karin is master of this free spirit, which transforms clay into flesh and blood, his language is called as no other to delineate and describe a pantheistically animated world. I noticed that in a journal entry of the 6th of February 1833, Garin gives a list of German poets, yet he does not mention Novelis, whose life and works possess many similarities to his own. Paris, the 16th of September 1942 Wednesday afternoon in the Jardin de Climatation. Among the combined stock of the pheasant house, I noticed a small pair of Sumatra chickens, black, with a deep green luster, making a magnificent display in the full sunshine. The male is powerful and does not only carry the long, curved tail plumage upright in a crescent form as our roosters do but can also drag it like an oriental train. This finery especially befits an animal perched in a tree, as it can then display a cascade of metallic green. Why do we feel such a strong sense of delight when something so familiar, like our good old domestic rooster, reappears in an unexpected guise, transformed on islands beyond the charted seas? This has such a powerful effect on me that I sometimes find myself close to tears. I believe that in such moments, the unimaginably concentrated essence inherent in familiar images is revealed to us. Such a creature seems to be gravid with life, even down to his last cell, and flourishing the magnificently in those zones, it unfurls its profusion. It is the one thing, the archetype visible to us in these bewitching games. The sight even induces a giddy feeling, we plunge from the iridescent effect of the plumage down to the animal's very essence. The hierarchy of rainbows, it is imaginable that the whole universe was built according to an archetype and finds its variation in a myriad of solar systems. Herein lies the charm of collecting, not in any sense of completeness. 
It's a matter of finding points of reference in all this multiplicity that indicate a creative energy. That is both the meaning of gardens and ultimately the meaning of the path of life itself. Then tea in the shade of the trees in the pavilion Darmanville at the edge of the tiny pool of the same name. The gentle strokes of the fish's fins or the fall of a ripe chestnut drew delicate circles of ripples across its surface. They crisscrossed to form an exquisite latticework that reflected the magnificent green of the trees. This network seemed to become ever more delicate at the edges, so that the leaves of a tall catalpa tree in the center were reflected in ovals, only to blur into green bands at the shore and then flutter like flags in a breeze before returning to the deep dot thought. This is the way we ought to spread the new message, pedagogically, using images that reflect familiar concepts. In this focused area the less restrictive law holds sway. But isn't this the way it is? Innovation works by attaching itself to what is acceptable as a gentle contradiction, a possible gradation. Then it turns things inside out. We should be able to trace this in the history of painting using examples that evolve from the use of shadow, mirrors, twilight, or darkness. Incidentally, history shows something similar, innovation bides its time in reflections and at the creative margins, it influences intellectual games, utopias, philosophical theories, and then it gradually becomes concrete, finally seeping in as if by osmosis. The boats that bring the profits of destiny land in the twilight on distant shores. Not to be forgotten are both of those kingfishers whizzing around here at the edge of the metropolis over cushions of duckweed. They make their nests in the small tributary that feeds the little pond. Of all the facets of this gem like animal, I find its display of tail feathers most beautiful. There as your bluebacks flash like turquoise dust. Paris. The 17th of September 1942 Current Reading, Harold Bigby, Potts Cassis, Broken Earthenware, 1909. This book, translated from the English, describes the lives of a series of proletarian Londoners. They have all fallen, physically, spiritually, and morally, into the mire and then have been converted. The book makes it clear just how far an institution like the Anglican Church has strayed from its original mission and how it forsook the pure practice of saving souls. In the terrible chaos of decline, we need guides who know exactly what the drowning man is struggling to breathe. This is where we can learn from the sects, especially the Salvation Army, which can be viewed as the most recent of our great holy orders. As the Benedictines built on the heights and the Cistercians down in the swamps, they have chosen the big cities as their sphere of influence, and from these desperate wastelands, developed their rule of conduct and their tactics. The efforts of these men and women are even more important for their pioneering than for the huge treasure of good works that they have performed. Just as pioneers throw themselves into the breach of an attack, the salvation and conversion of the individual precede the onslaught of faith on the masses. The masses lead superficial lives, ignorant of their innermost nature. Yet they crave knowledge of this, and to relish it better than their means would allow. They accept a little piece of spiritual bread. The details included a passage about alcohol that I liked. Long quotations without sources are included claiming that the irresistible attraction of alcohol is not caused by physical enjoyment, but by its mystical power. It is thus not depravity that leads the unfortunate man to it, but rather hunger for spiritual power. Drink gives the poor and uneducated what others derive from music and libraries, it provides them with enhanced reality. It leads them from the edges of reality into its innermost workings. For many, this narrow zone in which they experience a breath of air is a place close to the realm of inebriation. Consequently, people make a considerable mistake in thinking they can combat drunkenness as a species of gluttony focused on liquid. The air and nitrogen oxide are cited as keys to this mystical insight. They give us a glimpse of a deeper truth that is revealed as one falls from precipice to precipice. This is absolutely correct and is also described in the little study by Maupassant about the ether that I translated many years ago. The author considers the possibility that there does not have to be only a single condition of consciousness, but rather many different ones, separated by membranes, 
membranes that can be permeable in a state of hallucination. I pursued some similar thoughts when I was studying various kinds of hallucinatory states. I pictured normal consciousness as a disc attached horizontally to an axis. Depending on the drug administered, the varieties of intoxication change the angles of the axis, and with that the orientation of the plane, and with that the characters, which light up. One full revolution of this disc completes the sum of these changes, and with it the entire mental universe in spherical form. Once I have voyaged across all the seas of hallucination, rested upon all its islands, passed time in all its bays, and explored all its archipelagos and magical cities, then I have completed that great circle, that journey around the earth in a thousand nights and have traversed the equator of my consciousness. That is the grand tour the excursion into the mental cosmos, that place where countless adventurers have come to grief. Paris, the 18th of September 1942 I sat on a bench near the Eto Isle during the afternoon and fed pigeons, they were so trusting that they perched their little coral colored feet on my hand. The sight of a pigeon's neck always carries me back to childhood. It was a time when nothing seemed more wonderful than this green, golden, and purple play of color that the tiny feathers produce when the bird pecks grains from the earth, or when the male parades before the female making his cooing sound. In this dazzling display, the modest gray pigmentation is transmuted into a higher opalescent hue igniting the light concealed deep within. Walked along the Rue du Faubourg Saint Honore in the company of Charmel, who encouraged me to buy a little paperback she saw lying in the window of an antiquarian bookshop. It was apparently a translation from a manuscript by an ancient Brahmin.74 in fact, a casual glance revealed it to be a good find. In addition, I also bought the Historia General de Larens, General History of Thieves, by Dorbricourt in the Editio Princeps, first printed edition, of 1623. We sat for a while on the place to Turta in the garden of Mere Catherine and then ambled around Sacre-Cœur in lazy spirals. The city has become my second spiritual home and represents more and more strongly the essence of what I love and cherish about ancient culture. Paris, the 21st of September 1942 at the age of three, children display the full dignity of the moral person combined with exhilaration, which they lay to lose. Visited Vincennes in the afternoon, where a particular reason led me to pay a call on the old woman who used to be my concierge. Our acquaintances are like colored strings that fate has placed in our hands. When we combine and braid them, we see patterns whose value and order determine the measure of harmony granted to us. Not everybody knows how to husband these resources. Paris the 23rd of September 1942 walked with Charmil in the forest of Vincennes. We discussed what these years had brought and the chaos we see approaching. The weather was rainy, the damp paths were strewn with shiny chestnuts. In the night I dreamed about the soldiers I was with. They were wearing small round medals on their chests, awarded for having shot the wounded. I concluded from their conversation that these were awarded by some international organization and had the endorsement of something like the Red Cross, quite right. That is the point on which you still agree. Paris, the 24th of September 1942 Poupit and Hella paid me a visit in the Raphael. We talked about the memoirs of Gail Lux, which have just appeared with Plon. Poupit said that at a recent dinner he had seen Madame Gail Lux who had shot the publisher Carmit in 1914. She appeared wearing elbow-length red gloves. Objects that have absorbed aromas for years have particular appeal, mortars, bath towels, spice grinders, or sometimes whole buildings, like the ancient pharmacies or tobacco storehouses that I saw in Bayeux. Paris, the 25th of September 1942 have been reading documents and contemporary accounts of events during the French Revolution. The fate of the royal family is so melancholy and opens up such depressing insights into the shame of the human race. It is as if one were seeing swarms of rats surrounding defenseless victims, ultimately to pounce on them. In the afternoon, 
Claus Valentina dropped by the Majestic and gave me an edition of the works of Vico issued by Michelet in 1835. Paris, the 27th of September 1942 walked in the rain through the forest of Vincennes. We took the path around Lac des Minims with its islands and, at the edge of the woods, watched people bowling. Their casual nonchalance had amused me greatly once when I was here with Hall. The you encounter men between 40 and 60 years of age, mostly lower level civil servants and businessmen. From behind a pair of boundary lines on a cement lane, they pitch metal balls approximately the size of their open hand and try to hit a smaller ball roughly the size of a pomegranate. They give the impression that the fall of empires, the collapse of military campaigns, are here only vaguely comprehended. It is restorative to watch these games, like being among philosophers. We then visited the stalls of a small circus and watched a jack of all trades who was in makeup as he was energetically scrubbing three elephants in the courtyard before their performance. The rain ran down the tent and formed puddles at the edges. One of the elephants furtively used his trunk to fish out chopped straw that had been washed into them by the rain. He formed little balls of his pickings and crammed them contentedly into his mouth. To make them completely presentable, after their toilette was finished, this jack of all trades forced them to relieve themselves. When he cracked his whip and shouted kai kai kai, the obedient beasts stood up on their hind legs and produced tremendous amounts of water and excrement. The jack of all trades was apparently afraid that he was not going to finish the cleaning process before the beginning of the performance. This increased the humor of the process significantly. In general, the comical nature of such absurd activities, like making elephants move their bowels, is enhanced by the level of seriousness motivating the pursuit. This is also the key to the real comedy in Don Quixote, which is raised to the third power the when the narrator seems to take the adventure seriously. Paris, the 29th of September 1942 Very wakeful night, tossed and turned feverishly, but still the hours fly by. I glide across the surface of sleep without sleeping, the way wonders on black ice. As is my habit, I traced the paths of times past, step by step. When I do this, I land on an island and awaken memories. This time I was again climbing the mountains of Las Palmas. The air was filled with the spray of a heavy, warm rain, and I saw the fennel in all its wondrous freshness, its green sap pulsing through the delicate gossamer of its emerald veins. The heart of the plant was revealed. These were perhaps my most exalted moments on this earth more yielding than the embraces of beautiful women. When I bent down over such a miracle of life, I had to fight for breath, as though submerged by a wave rising from a blue sea. A small star-shaped blossom is no less an object of veneration than the entire firmament. Thought, all night we sleep with our bodies in the same position, but our state of mind is always making its way through new underbrush, encountering a new ambush. Thus, we often lie in sinister places on isolated terrain, infinitely far from our goal. This accounts for the often inexplicable fatigue after deep sleep. Pepecha writes me that the most recent attack on Munich destroyed Rodolphe's studio. Fortunately, none of his pictures were stored there. The loss of the portrait that I sat for in New Berlin would not have bothered me much. Siegler dropped by in the morning and told me about the attack on Hamburg. The firebombs were dropped in batches of up to 70 pieces. To keep the fire brigades from extinguishing them, every tenth bomb was packed with explosives. When the print shop was in flames, 1500 fires were already raging in the city. In the evening heard a lecture by a little Mauritanian with a certain cynical complacency who spoke about propaganda techniques used to influence the masses. This type of man is certainly novel or at least in comparison to the 19th century, downright new. The advantage that people like this truly possess lies in their negative qualities. They have thrown off the moral baggage sooner than the majority of other people and introduced the laws of mechanical engineering into politics. But this advantage will be overtaken, not by moral human beings, who are necessarily inferior to them relative to their unrestrained violence 
but rather by people just like them who have learned at their feet. Ultimately, the stupidest man says to himself, if he respects nothing, then why should he insist we respect him? It is, therefore, an error to expect religion and by it it restore order. Animalistic tendencies are produced at the zoological level, and demonic ones on the demonic level. This means that the shark is devoured by the Leviathan and the devil by Beelzebub. Paris, the 30th of September 1942 corrected the letters from Norway. 75 I had doubts about molten rivers of lead. Unjustified because rivers can also be frozen and solid. The flaw that I sense here is incidentally inherent in language itself and is a result of one of the tiny spaces in the mosaic. Language lacks the concept solid river as an independent noun. The ventral side of many terrestrial animals, such as the flatfishes, the turbel area, flatworms, and the snakes, is drab. Nature is a frugal painter. Visited the National Library in the afternoon. The catalogue room, I often wished I could possess folios where I could look up every printed book. But here one sees the research tools no individual could own, no matter how rich he might be. These match the stature of the great man, that is to say, the state. So it is with this system of catalogues. Standing before them, one senses an intellectual mechanism designed by a methodical mind. Here I spoke with Dr. Fuchs who is working on a comprehensive catalogue of German libraries, which will represent a major work of human industry worthy of the bee. The enterprise of collecting and cataloguing on a grand scale seems to be in its infancy, here we stand before a new style of chinoiserie, a Mandarin culture devoid of creativity that nonetheless knows how to conjure the existing ideograms. In the area of archives, we can look forward to the emergence of a more severe, more modest, but also more enjoyable scholarship that possesses downright anarchic traits when compared to that of the 19th century. Many of the strands of this scholarship will connect with that of the 18th century, to Linnaeus, to the encyclopedists, and to the rationalist school of theology. It will be easier to live with intellectuals like these, they can be manipulated. They are the conservators in the world of carnage. We have new pyramids and catacombs in our future, the subterranean bustling of an ant colony. In the days of the pharaohs, priests tried to protect the king and his household from the world of transience, today this is happening with methodically organized material of inquiring minds, down to the last trivial detail. Afterward visited the manuscript room where magnificent objects were on display, such as the Gospel of Charlemagne, the Bible of Charles the Bald and the Book of Hours of the Duke de Berry, which was opened to the calendar for August and September. The space was like a shrine where tiny motes of dust hovered in the clear air, as if we had entered a picture by mumbling. Archival order achieves its highest form when the choicest pieces also have the power of relics, the precious nature of these things is intensified by the aura of ancient authority. This is where one should counter historical developments and install a new clerisy to be the custodians of such things. Of course, their way must be prepared by a new sense of responsibility. One cannot expect that of a state that uses its police to protect its monument to the unknown soldier. Among the musical pieces, there was the score to Debussy's opera Pelis et Melisande, which revealed something amazingly precise. It resembled the blueprint for an electrical circuit, the heads of the notes were little glass insulators arranged on wires. In the evening, we went to the Rotisserie Nikon Avenue Wagram with Heller and Siegler, whose visits to Paris are always a pleasure. We discussed the situation and for the last ten years have agreed in our appraisal of it. Then we spoke about acquaintances, among them Gerard, Nebel, whose wife is so called one quarter Jewish. For this reason, the house committee of the building where she lives has banned her from the air aid shelter. It's hard to imagine that a sense of purity of blood is so finely developed among the secondary school teachers of Hamburg who live there. To compensate for that, however, they are uncannily acute at sniffing out scapegoats. Later I read the wisdom of Solomon and then slept very little and poorly, which has been typical recently. Sleep is the principle opposed to the will.
which is why I am becoming more alert the more I try to force it. For its part, thought stays on the path of the will. One can thus think of all those things one wants to think of, but on the other hand, we cannot banish thoughts we do not want to think. Here is where the anecdote about the farmer belongs, he was promised treasure but only on the condition that he would not think of a bear when he dug it up. The joke is deeper than it seems, it shows the path leading to the treasures of the earth. Paris, the 2nd of October 1942 Perpetua writes to me that the end of our century will perhaps be even more terrible than the beginning and middle have been. I do not tend to believe that, and I have often thought that people will look back upon it like the baby Heracles who strangled the snakes in his cradle. But she's quite right when she says that in an age like ours, we must develop the habits of lizards, we must learn to seek out those rare sunny spots and use them. This is also true of the war, we cannot always be wandering uselessly when it will end. We have no control over that date. Yet we still have the capacity to spread joy in the teeth of the storms, joy for ourselves and for others. When we do so, we hold a tiny shred of peace in our hands. I've also heard from her that the astrologer's father has been missing for some time. It is assumed that Russian prisoners of war murdered him for his clothes. That reminds me of the terrible fate of old Kugeljan. Years ago, incidentally, I predicted the resurgence of gangs of robbers without imagining precisely how history would fulfill my prophecy. I was simply deriving my prediction from negative evidence, such as overweening power and the nationalization of injustice. I met the Dr. Ores in the evening at the play state attorneys for one of those cups of lemon verbena tea she has prescribed for me. Since I have started to worry about the state of my health, this hour together is also an office visit. When I got to bed, I read in the journals of Leon Bloy and then a bit further in the Book of Wisdom. The inclusion of a document of such great skepticism in the canon, and the assumption that it is one of the authentic books, is surprising and only comprehensible when we view the Bible as landscape, a piece of creation where different sections complement and balance each other. In this sense, one ascends to heights where the old golden eagle with his white crown builds his eyrie. The air has become thinner, and the earth reveals its design. No gaze is more piercing than that of the wise king, yet Job penetrated deeper. In old age, he still brought forth fruit, for pain cultivated his soil. The preacher sees pain as vanity. In doing so, he has ignored the life of Lear while enjoying that of the aging Faust. He transformed lands into lush gardens, planted forests and vineyards, and in his pleasure domes lived with multitudes of female slaves and singers. But all that was as vain as the wind, and this notion is more terrible than the one that sees it as the veil of Maya. 76 Each life holds a certain number of things that, out of consideration, a human being does not confide to his dearest friend. They are like the stones you find in chickens' stomachs that are not digested along with everything else. Men preserves the basest and the best so anxiously. Even when confession has relieved him of the burden of evil, he still wears his best for God alone. The part of us that is noble, good, and holy resides far from the social sphere, it cannot be communicated. Incidentally, women are significantly more secretive in this respect. They are often the true graves of past love affairs, and does there exist even one of them about whom a husband, a lover, knows everything, even when she is lying in his arms? Anyone who has encountered an old lover after many years has been frightened by this mastery of silence. Daughters of the earth indeed. Some knowledge that finds sanctuary in our breast is terrifying and lonely, fatherhood is one such. The horrors of Medea rear up in a thoroughly middle class world. Thus, the dilemma of the woman who watches her husband cherish a child through the years, a child that is not his. Two people who love each other should tell each other everything. But are they strong enough to do so? I would like to confess something to you, but I'm afraid you'll hear me as a priest in your own right and not someone who listens with wisdom, as a representative of God. I fear you might become my judge. That is the prodigious, but also healing, significance of prayer, 
namely that for a moment it opens the recesses of the heart and lets light shine in. For human beings, especially in our northern latitudes, it opens the only portal to truth, to the ultimate, radical honesty. Without it, people could not live with their nearest and dearest without suspicion and dark thoughts. And at times, when caution would not silence our tongues, then consideration would do so. Thoughts about negating consonants, those that convey something pejorative, especially n and p. Ps, bedges, pied, petty, pyre. The p is also used as a sound denoting pure contempt. The foot as a symbol of the lesser human being, as a degraded hand. After the war, I want to work on these connections, especially the way in which the human body is represented by language. To do so it would, of course, be a good idea if I were to move in again with Friedrich Georg, who animates conversation a great deal. Paris, the 3rd of October 1942 in the afternoon, I dropped by the bookshop in the Palais Royal, where I bought the 1812 Krebel an edition printed by Didot. One can see from the green calf bindings what a powerful sense of style the empire possessed. It naturally had access to the guild of artisans of the ancient regime, and that's more important than the style, that is a matter of substance. Today France still enjoys this advantage of traditions passed down from hand to hand, and will certainly retain these thanks to its largely rational policies. But what is important in this country at the moment is that its old haunts, the cities, will not be ploughed under and on its ruins chain stores from Chicago would be built, which is what will happen in Germany. To activate the huge potential slumbering here, to consign it to the flames, that is the goal of both warring parties, and only a small group of people is keeping the scales in balance. That this could have succeeded for this long is all the more astonishing since it contradicts the brutal politics of the day. I decided not to erase the comments of the book dealer on the inside of the flyleaf. His notes about the condition, plates, the value of the various editions, etc., contribute a note to what Feltes calls the authenticity of the book. I make my own note on the book plate regarding the time and place of my purchase, or of the giver and occasionally other special circumstances. Dinner in the Dr. Ores's apartment. Watched her cook. The way in which she goes about it shows something of the femme savant, especially in the way she times things and plans the sequence of the various tasks and procedures. In this way, cooking has the appearance of a well thought out process, rather like a chemical experiment. Incidentally, just the acquisition of ingredients has become a feat in itself. The shops are almost empty, and hunger is spreading. Currently reading, Conan Doyle. We reach an age when even good mysteries bore us. Our appreciation for the kaleidoscopic shifting of facts begins to wane, the elements are all too familiar. This is also true of life. We reach a point when we master the facts that satiate us. We number our years as three score and ten. One could add to that, and that is quite sufficient. Anyone who, up to then, has not learned enough to be promoted to the next grade must go back to the beginning and make it up. This explains the childish aspect of broken down old men, especially the lecherous, stingy, cruel, and petty ones. In them, chaos has displaced the awareness that promotes successful old age, which carries quite precise external signs. Paris, the 4th of October 1942, outing to Saint Remy les Chevreuils. Rambled through the woods after breakfast. The mushrooms are thriving in all this moisture, their caps gleam in the moss among the spider webs heavy with dewdrops. I saw a round puffball that had long white spines on its cap, obviously the hedgehog member of this outlandish group. A squirrel was romping high in a chestnut tree, a lovely burnished red against the wet green foliage. It had tossed shiny nuts down for the winter. We shared in his harvest. Quite melancholy because I am becoming more unhappy with my physical condition. I have been losing weight for weeks. I often grow weary of this business and treat the body as a mutineer, but it is better to open my ears and listen to what it wants. In the evening, read further in La Porte des Humbles, The Gate of the Humble, by Leon Bloy.
I always find his writing satisfying despite his maniacal and indiscriminate diatribes against everything Germanic. He would like to destroy London with a single bomb, while he sees Denmark as a kind of filthy Sodom. I think, however, that by this time I've learned to value people's intellect, although their motivations are different from mine, and to see them in their pure state devoid of contradictions. Read further in the Song of Songs. Paris, the 5th of October 1942 in the afternoon, I thumbed through Pius by Krebelin. The method by which language is revealed here seems unparalleled. It is so smooth and perfectly burnished that it cannot be improved. For language to attain new sounds or new colors, we would have to penetrate words with chemical processes. Decadence would be the inevitable result. The verses follow upon one another with a beautiful lightness and move toward the rhymes with such unforced grace. Here in poetry, language is at play more naturally, not more artfully. What makes these verses so supple is surely the wealth of one syllable words, which creates the dactylic meter. Lanuitist plus Claire Gale fond de mon coeur. The night is more clear than the depths of my heart. Back to the Quai Voltaire in the evening, where I met the Valentina brothers and Poopit. Silver grey mists cloaked the houses, and above them slate blue clouds with a brown ring of dusk. Some tones had already been drained away. The shaft of light from Saint Germain des Prez looked washed out, and only the dark tower roof shone through. The light grey limestone used to construct so many houses, pavement, bridges, and quays shows countless concave impressions made by the shell of the slender world snail. I am always pleased when my eye falls upon one of them, they are part of those secret heraldic beasts, the microcosmic embellishments of this city. Paris. The 6th of October 1942 finished reading La Porte des Humbles by Leon Bloy. I can sense the old lion mellowing. Such hard cider takes 70 years to lose its kick. Reading provides me with such pleasure, especially during the noonday break. The true appeal of journals is not their strange or extraordinary content. Much more challenging is the description of simple daily routines, familiar rules that govern life. That is done very successfully here, a reader is a participant in everyday activity. Thus do the passing years repay us once more, in the same way that many a summer has provided the wood that warms us as it burns in the fireplace. The book contains predictions, including one that concerns the Russian Revolution. This period actually provides us with an apocalyptic vision of our own. From one of the final sentences, we hear the sage say, I am expecting the Cossacks and the Holy Ghost. Then, shortly before the end, on the 16th of October 1917, we read an oracular utterance, I am no longer eating. I lack appetite. Everything about me needs to change. Death was to accomplish this and left its stamp on Blois features, which were then judged to be majestic, serene, and commanding. His life demonstrates that it is not our errors that threaten our authority when we pass through the final gate of honor that our spirit has yearned for. It could more likely be our shortcomings, which are taken as nakedness there. We shed them as Don Quixote his armor, and our disrobing is greeted with laughter. Visited the bookshop of Jean Bannier in the afternoon, at Atruda Castiglian. There I picked up Roma Subterranea, Underground Rome, by Aringus a work containing many plates and inscriptions from the catacombs that can be seen as a predecessor to Rossi's Roma Soterania. In our zones of fire and devastation, the peace offered by such tombs hewn into the rock holds great appeal for its promise of eternal slumber in the earth's womb. But, even more important, however, was the beautiful copy of Breton's La China en miniature, China in miniatures, which I bought. I had tiptoed around this several times like the fox around the bait before the trap springs shut. The purchase was beyond my means, but what we gain from books makes the investment worthwhile, although I have the feeling that I am stacking them up for the heap of rubble that the house could someday all too easily be reduced to. Still, I am browsing with great enjoyment in these six volumes with their miniatures that are more than 130 years old yet still glowing in the brightest colors.
The distances created by deserts and oceans are hardly greater than the space of heaven, and therefore life in these foreign realms often seems to us like images from a distant planet. Concerning abnormalities, below all the soft soap artists and snake oil salesmen that authors write about there lies a deep seated atavistic stratum, the memory of a time when our whole skin was still mucous membrane. This membrane is a precursor of skin evolutionary remnant from the ocean's cradle and of our Neptunian origins. Here the sense of touch struggles to grasp similar states, like those that open to our vision when we perceive the color red. But one can also find types different from the sanguine solarian, namely lymphatics with little pigmentation, a preference for steam baths, hairdressers salons, and mirrors, for the lunarians, it is the world of caves. They exhibit blood disorders and a tendency toward eczema and pruritus. Exaggerated symptoms, often manic cleanliness. Occasional albinism, fear of microbes, and loathing of snakes, are common. These abnormalities are not really disorders, they are elements that have been released, elements that are present in all of us, latent and potent. In our dreams, they often climb up from the chasms. The deeper these things lie concealed within us, the more powerful is our alienation, our horror when nature works as a chemical analyst to reveal them in their pure form. With that, the snake emerges from its hole. This explains the terrible excitement that can grip a metropolis in response to news of a rape murder. When this happens, we all feel the sound of the bolt sliding shut in our own netherworld. The misguided attempts of certain doctors are surely questionable when they try to protect a perpetrator from justice by portraying him as sick. That point of view would be defensible if the sickness were not the sickness that afflicts us all but is merely manifest in him and could be surgically removed. Like an ancient human sacrifice, he is immured under the bridge buttresses of the community. What's at stake here is less the poor criminal than the millions of his brethren. Paris, the 7th of October 1942 slept poorly. Was awakened in the early hours by a strange but gentle rain inside me. I have the impression that the body is trying to say something, yet in the artificial lives we lead, we understand its sentences and vocabulary hardly any better than we would those of an old tenant farmer conversing with us at our city address about things like parish fairs, harvests, and stunted crops. We can dismiss him with money, but we have to give the body pills. In both cases, back to the land, that means to the earth and its elements. Read in the newspapers, a book that reaches an edition of one million copies is always something unusual a remarkable event in the intellectual world. It is evident that a deep need exists for such a work. The success of Mythos 77 is one of those signs that lets us perceive the latent will of a coming era. Thus speaks the wise caster in the Volcus Abibicta of the 7th of October 1942 about the Mythos by Rosenberg, the dullest collection of hastily copied platitudes imaginable. The same caster argued in the same publication almost ten years ago, well, didn't Herr Spengler read the newspapers? Thus, a philosopher refers another philosopher to the newspapers for his source of inspiration, and this in Germany and quite openly. That simply never should have been articulated so blatantly. And let it be noted that this caster is considered the most prominent voice in his field, the chief spokesman of the heroic school of philosophy. This is but one small example of the quality of the air we have to breathe. People like this caster, incidentally, belong to the type of truffle hunting pigs found in any revolution. Because their coarse fellow ideologues are incapable of identifying their most exquisite opponents, they co opt the corrupt higher level intellects to sniff them out. And once their opponents have been exposed, they can then be attacked, when possible, through police intervention. Whenever I noticed him referring to me, I expected the police at my house with a search warrant. Caster even called on the police to go after Spengler, and there are those in the inner circle who say he has that on his conscience. Paris, the 8th of October 1942 went to Bears in the evening, where I looked at books. I bought the old Malleus Maleficarum, Hammer of Witches, 
by Springer in the Venice edition of 1574. The purchase would have excited me more twenty years ago, when I was studying hallucinogens along with magic and Satanism. Paris, the 9th of October 1942 in the afternoon, road through the Bois de Boulogne, where the leaves are turning. Colonel Kosman told me that my command posting to Russia could get serious in the next few days. Preliminary orders have already been received. Since my life here has taken on a new form, this disruption could be a welcome one. While pondering this, I knocked a glass off the washstand, and it smashed to pieces. I shall try to have Rem assigned to me as my adjutant. Paris, the 11th of October 1942, Sunday, went to the Rue de Belchasse in the afternoon. Perhaps my last time crossing this threshold into the stairwell where the amethyst spiral always gives me a feeling of anxiety, the kind one feels when keeping tremendous secrets. I noticed the pattern of the tiny snail shells on the stone threshold, the sight of these in this city has often brought me such delight. Paris, the 12th of October 1942 slept very poorly, which is certainly the result of illness. At the moment when I am supposed to go to Russia, I can't simply report to the infirmary. Such coincidences have often arisen in my life, they create a real dilemma. Among my letters was one from Amel Bainin, an Azerbaijani writer who enclosed her novel Army. A beautifully pressed lily of the valley falls out as I thumb through the volume. From its dark brown stalk, Ten yellow ones branch off into little bell-shaped blossoms as if embossed on heavy paper. Sure essence, the 13th of October 1942 slept very poorly again. In the morning I went to the senior staff doctor, who recommended a short stay in the infirmary in Sure essence, which can still be arranged before my marching orders come through. Have just arrived there. I am spending my time partly lying on the bed reading, and partly looking out the window, which provides a view of Montana Valerian. Its foliage is still mostly green but sprinkled with patches ranging from copper-hued to fiery red and yellow. Foliage also covers the fort, the ancient Bulagin from 1871, up to its roof. The images from last night are still in my mind. I recall standing in the parlor with my father, along with several siblings, one of whom was squirming in a laundry basket. I wanted to make a comment about this and turned to my father several times. He seemed to ignore me deliberately. I was finally able to make myself heard, you were not successful in achieving the optimal combination in any of us. My conclusion is based on the virtues that I see in us as a whole, but are not present in any one of us individually. The old man thought about this for a few seconds, vacantly gazing with an acid stare, and then said dryly, you may be right. Similar things as well that I would like to have written down, but I was afraid I would become wide awake if I turned on the light. Deep melancholy. Rem arrived yesterday, so I am not at a loss for someone to run errands. Sure essence, the 14th of October 1942 I called on the doctor or in the evening and brought her red zinnias. She didn't stop pestering me about going to the staff doctor. She even had a meeting with the head medical officer here. To return to yesterday's dream, the document about death should perhaps begin with a chapter that emphasizes the operation of chance in our individual lives. We would not exist had our father married a different woman, or our mother a different man. Assuming this marriage continues, we are chosen from among millions of embryos. We are thus random combinations of the absolute. We resemble winning lottery tickets with values written on them in the characters of fate are then paid out in earthly currency, in the form of talent that we should make the most of. We could draw the conclusion that as individuals we are imperfect, and that eternity is neither suitable nor bearable to us. Moreover, we have to revert to the absolute, and this possibility is offered to us by death. Death has both an external and an internal form. The latter is usually visible in the physiognomy of the dead. Death has its mysteries, which the mystery of love nonetheless transcends. We become adepts when he takes us by the hand. The smile of surprise is a spiritual one, 
yet its reflection penetrates the physical world as far back as the features of the dying man. Consider here what I wrote about the Wheel of Fortune in the number disc. Current reading, Paul Bagot, Voyagers is, Women Travelers, 1917, a collection of short stories that introduces the author in a way that does not invite a second reading. The thick shell of convention is hardly scratched here to reveal the human content beneath. Read further in the book of Chinese miniatures, where I noticed a description of a snake merchant. At the bottom of his basket is a bowl filled with a concentrated brew of viper flesh. And above this, a container holding live snakes. In the ancient pharmacies of the West, we also attribute particular healing powers to risking our lives. The serpent, a Tellurian animal, is a powerful medicine. I again found the journals of Emperor Kangsa mentioned, as I have so often in the course of my reading over the past years. I have been eager to find this work for a long time. The attraction of such power of mind transcends empires and centuries. Read further in Isaiah, the prophet of destruction, whose heart laments for Mob like a harp. A good visionary for our age as well. I have a tendency to distance myself from people I love. It's as if their image has developed such power in me that their physical presence becomes intolerable. The man who murders his mistress chooses the opposite path, to possess her he extinguishes her likeness. Perhaps this is how immortals treat us. A shared death is always a significant act, beautifully described in Axel by Villiers de Lisladum. In this respect, Clist seems like someone in a hurry. He took the first good one that came along. 78 I say to you today you will be with me in paradise. That also applies to the unrepentant thief. We're just not supposed to say that too loudly. Sure essence, the 15th of October 1942 had a bad night. I dreamed of doctors who had treated me, including an imaginary one whose waiting room seemed quite familiar. After waking up, it took a long time for me to distinguish this mirage from reality, perhaps its specificity was nurtured by memories of earlier dream visions. Very worn out in the morning, but still mentally alert. I appreciated the natural vault presented to my eyes by the green and yellow trees in the gardens. Got further in Isaiah, who luxuriates in images of destruction. His essential vision is one of the obliteration of the historical world, its old cities fields, and vineyards, and of the triumph of the elements. This produces recovery and preparation for the new, indestructible reconstitution by the divine spirit. Men and empires will someday become just as the inner eye perceives them. This imagery could be seen as a sort of three-field system of agriculture, the tilling of the earth, the fallow period, harvesting the fruits of the spirit. The centerpiece of the triptych when the earth lies dormant is its own inherent beauty, painted by a connoisseur of blooming deserts and fecund wildernesses. To this field, God has applied his measuring rod. Dot was weighed and found to have gotten very thin. But this morning, I measured my mental weight against the sight of the trees. This is not the first time in my life that the ebb of the body and the flow of images coincide as if sickness made things visible that were otherwise concealed. Dot had a visit from Valentina and the doctoress in the afternoon. She placed a purple cattleya orchid with bearded lower lip and vanilla yellow calyx on my table. It's good to see the way the little nurse from Holstein, who likes to see me reading the Bible, avoids this flower like a dubious insect as she works. Sure essence, the 16th of October 1942 Another night of distress. In one dream image, I was waiting with Friedrich Georg in a room where the floor was tiled in white porcelain. The walls were built of glass bricks, and in the room stood cylindrical vessels of glass and ceramic, roughly in the shape and size of our water heaters. We were playing a game, throwing glass balls the size of snowberries, but only one in ten was white like these. The others were colorless and invisible in flight. The balls hit the ground with a dry smack and then bounced against the walls and the vessels, creating mathematical designs of angles and straight lines as they did so. The path of the invisible balls delighted our imaginations, 
while the white ones resembled guidelines whose network gave the sensual connection to the all too intellectual, all too abstract game. Thought, that must have been one of the weightless cells deep inside the cloister of the workaday world. Read further in Isaiah, accompanied by Lichtenberg's aphorisms and Schopenhauer's Perger, two reliable old sources of comfort when in need. I read these while walking up and down in the room with the tube that they had forced down my throat hanging out of my mouth. Lichtenberg's judgment on Jean Paul, if he starts over again from the beginning, he will become great. Even though this presupposes an impossibility, from an individual standpoint, it still points to the procreative, spermatic force of Jean Paul's prowse. Many stories by Stifter bring forth such shoots. I have always regretted that Hebel could not start over again from the beginning, especially by adding greater potency to his journals. We say, that's as certain as 2 times 2 equals 4, but we don't say, as 1 times 1 equals 1. The first version is actually clearer, it has already overcome the hurdle of the identity theorem. How to counter the objection that I no longer use certain expressions that I formulated years ago? expressions that have now become common, such as the word total, gold is withdrawn in times of inflation. That comes from a letter to Gruninger, who enjoys such reposts. Sure essence, the 18th of October 1942 Sunday. In the morning, the top of the Eiffel Tower was shrouded in fog. Friedrich Georg wrote yesterday, mainly about reading Isaiah, which I notice he began to read at about the same time as I did. There are so many invisible threads uniting us. Visit from Charmil, who brought me flowers. What is it that attracts me to her so? Probably the childlike nature that I recognize in her. We meet people who awaken in us the desire to give them presents, that is the reason I regret not having been blessed with worldly goods. Toward evening, Saker Kerr emerged, at times beaming brightly from atop its hill and at others half hidden in a violet haze. There is something phantasmagorical about this structure. Distance increases its magic, letting us see it as a symbol of all that is miraculous in it. Sure essence, the 20th of October 1942 intense air raids in the night, Lafrouse, extreme dread. Then comes the reckoning, from Charlemagne to Charles V, from the Reformation to the chaos of World War I. I was fishing on the seashore and caught a giant sea turtle. Once I had landed it, it got away from me and dug itself into the earth. While in pursuit, I not only injured myself on the fish hook, but a disgusting sea creature crawled out of the turtle and right over me with its many feet. That was the first time that a turtle had appeared to me in a figure in a dream and with such significance at that dot I was discharged at noon with an entry in my service record that read alkaline gastritis. I think the doctoress was fearing much worse. She was pleased at the diagnosis and conferred again with the senior doctor, whom she knows from Bergman's clinic. Rem then picked me up, and we drove together to the Majestic to prepare for the journey. Paris. The 21st of October 1942 in a volume that appeared in 1757, I read the court records of the case brought against Damien's. The assassination attempt took place in the first month of this same year. The historical introduction also includes a detailed description of the horrible execution. Louis XV's demeanor during the attack upon his person was regal. He identified the perpetrator, recognizable as the only man who kept his head covered. The king commanded that he be arrested and decreed that no harm should be done to him. Went to Shainikin the evening where we played American Roulette, Pinball. Paris, the 22nd of October 1942 Bad Night. Lafrouse. Since I can't possibly report in sick now. I went to a French doctor on Rue Newton whose assurances were very helpful, more helpful than the doctors in the infirmary with all their equipment. When he heard that I was off to Russia, he didn't want to take any payment. Telephone Ritter von Schramm. Dropped by Morin's in the afternoon and poked around in his books one last time. I spent a further enjoyable hour in his little antiquarian bookshop. There I discovered something I had been seeking for a long time the work by Magius, 
to Tintinabulis, on bells, including the track to Aquilio, on the rack, bound with it in one volume. Then De Secretis, on Secrets, by Wekeres, a treasure drove. The Spanish journey by Swinburne bound in Red Morocco. Among other things, I finally came upon the trial of Charles I, where I browsed in the description of the execution, which showed the king's great dignity, far above bodily concerns, like a ship's passenger standing on the gangplank, taking his leave of friends and entourage before a long journey. I shall miss the world of books, I have spent precious hours in it, oases in a world of carnage. Walking along either bank of the Seine represents perfection in its own right, time flows by easily. It is hard to imagine how to improve on this, and it would not be anywhere near as beautiful if the books cost nothing. The water is part of it all. In Shainik in the evening. Conversation there about little Alka, the rider on the wagon shaft. 79 This was punctuated by a brief air raid alarm and a few rounds of gunfire in the darkness. Played some more American roulette, a maze where the course of nickel balls lights up electric bulbs and rows of numbers. It's the old game of chance under the guise of technology. Paris, the 23rd of October 1942, reporting for leave today. So I called on Cosman and the Commander-in-Chief who told me that on his staff there would always be a little Wartburg stubgeon, little Wartburg roommate waiting for me. I found everybody more cordial, maybe that was just a reflection of my own improved morale. Life is opinion, says Marcus Aurelius. The General is one of those people who entered my life as an unexpected gift at a time when it had become hard to breathe. He circulated books of mine here that could no longer be published in the fatherland, and he still has high hopes for me. The morning passed with the transfer of current business to New Hawes, I locked the rest up in the safe and am taking the key with me. As a farewell, I visited a church, St. Pierre de Chalet. I took it as a good sign that a red carpet had been laid down on the steps, and the large portal decorated with curtains. But this was closed and I had to enter through a side door. Upon leaving, however, I found it open, and once I was outside, after having thoughtlessly walked through it, noticed that it had been decorated and prepared for a funeral. This convoluted configuration revived me, I was able to find a kind of irony in it superior to the Socratic. Rebus, by means of things that could be a motto. Paid a visit to Ruder Faubourg Saint Honor once again. There I walk across patterns in the carpet of my past. Also went to Ruda Castiglian, where I bought a seal as a memento of this day. It's strange how often I come across the image of a turtle on my walks after having dreamed of it. All these signs surround us, yet the eye chooses but a few of them. Departure from Charmil at Shainik near the place day turnies. Air raid alarm, but fortunately it was soon lifted, otherwise, I would have missed the train to Berlin. Two notes from the Caucasus Skirch Horst, the 24th of October 1942 passed through Cologne in the middle of the day. I gazed from the window of the dining car at the city's destroyed neighborhoods. The buildings and rows of houses radiated a grim, palatial grandeur through their destruction. We glide through this alien, colder world. This is the dwelling of death. Dusseldorf also looked mournful. Fresh ruins and red roof tiles bore witness to the firestorm. This too is one of the stepping stones to Americanism, in place of our old haunts, we shall have cities that are the brainchildren of engineers. But perhaps only herds of sheep will graze upon the ruins, as in those old pictures of the Roman Forum. Perpetua picked me up at the station in the evening. Schultz had been saving fuel for a long time for this trip. I sent Trem home to his wife in Magdeburg for a few days leave. Kirch Horst, the 2nd of November 1942 back in Kirch Horst, where I am less tempted to write entries in my journal. This is the setting to recover. That is perhaps the best claim to be made for any place. Upon arrival, I noticed that the quantity of books, correspondence, and collections was making me uneasy. 
they demanded my immediate attention and, thanks to my more relaxed state, I realized that everything lives from and depends upon involvement, upon mental, and physical responsibility. We possess things thanks to a special virtue, a kind of magnetic power. In this sense, wealth is not merely a gift but also an aptitude corresponding to the scope of one's reach. It is clear that most people lack the inner capacity for wealth or even modest property. If it should nonetheless come to them from some outside source, then it disappears without a trace. It may be that this even brings misfortune with it. For this reason, old wealth is crucial so that not only the gift, but also the talent necessary to keep and use it freely, may be bequeathed to the child and subsequent generations. Diet, even in relation to things and possessions that we acquire. Otherwise, instead of making our life easier, we must assume the role of guardians, servants, and custodians in life. The weather is autumnal, occasionally grey, punctuated by sunshine. The soft golden yellow of the poplars along the road to New Warmbuchen fits beautifully with the pale blue sky that arches over our unremarkable landscape. Kirchhorst, the 5th of November 1942 at night dreams of ancient cave systems on Crete, where soldiers were swarming like ants. An explosive charge had just obliterated thousands of them. When I woke up, it occurred to me that Crete was the island of the labyrinth. Foggy day. Heavy fringes of dew accumulated on the reddish black cabbage leaves like those little silver bubbles that form on the ruddy seaweed from deep in the ocean. Brox was the first to note this, just as his oeuvre is rich in examples of the way a new sense of nature emerges from the gravitas of the Baroque, although it is often indistinguishable from it. Thus, the ever-changing fabric of the ages becomes interwoven, like the color gradations on the throat of a pigeon. Thought, nature has forgotten the hydrogen animals, those lighter than air creatures that swim through the atmosphere like whales through the seas. In doing so, she deprived us of the true giants by adopting the more elegant solution of flight from the outset. Concerning the habit of touching wood to avert some inauspicious omen. This can probably be traced back to some particular event, yet some customs become ingrained only when they possess inherent symbolism. This might lie in the organic nature of wood. We reach out to it as something that has grown, and transposing the gesture to suggest fate, we imply our lifespan with its own destiny, in contrast to the lifeless mechanism of seconds, which merely count the tempus mortuum, time of death. The breaking of glass as a symbol of luck could then be interpreted as a corollary, as an explosion of mechanical form and release its living essence. Kirchhorst. The 6th of November 1942 Friedrich Georg writes to me from New Berlingen about lilies and the amorous, foxtail lily, bulbs that he planted in the garden in Olsnig. It gives me great joy to learn that he has finished not only a new collection of poems but also a second work on mythology with the title Die Titanen, The Titans. He seems to be hard at work. At times in happy hours, I sense that fate has granted me not only the gratitude of a person who enjoys good fortune but also a sense of wonder that I have benefited equally from our camaraderie. Walked across the lonely fields in the evening through the fog and drizzle. Clumps of trees shimmered hazily in the distance and between them and old farms, like grey arcs carrying their cargoes of man and beast. Finished reading Louis Thomas, Le General de Galifet, General de Galifet, 1909, in an edition enriched by both an autograph of the author and one of the general. Galifet offers a model of the sanguine temperament appropriate to a good cavalryman and especially a commander of the hussars. It is the temperament of a man who must be able to move and make decisions quickly, easily, and forcefully. Sanguine optimism drives vigorously toward its goals, albeit goals that are usually short-term and narrow in their perspective. The world spirit propels characters like this to the fore wherever quick intervention is called for, as at Sedan and during the riots. Galifet is also typical for the history of modern brutality and for the rediscovery of bestial methods. He got his early training in Mexico. As I read, 
I recalled an old project of mine, the diagram of a historical process showing the order proceeding from left to right according to natural law. It starts at one end with the rank of tribune and moves to that of senator with Marius and Sulla, with Marat and Galafit. Someday I would like to venture a brief typology of history, it would resemble a description of the tiny crystals in a kaleidoscope. What did Galafit lack to make him a Sulla, and what differentiated him from a Bulana? I read further in Chamfort, sampling him in small doses. His maxims are much more pointed and less appealing than those of Riverol. In the afternoon, I harvested carrots, celeriac, and red beets, and put them in the cellar. This kind of work, with the earth, makes me feel my health returning. Kirchhorst, the 9th of November 1942 in the morning, dreams about future air aids. A hybrid machine the size of the Eiffel Tower flew through the fire above a settlement, beside it was a structure resembling a radio tower. On its platform there stood an observer wearing a long coat, he was taking notes and throwing these down in smoke canisters. In the afternoon, I attended the burial of old Frau Kolschorn. As always happens at such events, I noticed a group of five to seven middle-aged men wearing morning coats and top hats. These were the village fathers of Gerchhorst. Because the community does not own a hearse, neighbors carry the casket to the cemetery. This is announced in the following way, Jervadam OMIT and Sarg Phaeton. Your father has to help carry the casket. One visit to the neighbors in the evening, but just as we were beginning to chat, the air raid sirens started up in Hanover. We gathered in a downstairs room with our coats and suitcases as if we were in the cabin of a ship in distress at sea. People's behavior during these attacks has changed. It shows how close the catastrophe has come. Dot through the window, I could see the bright red tracer bullets being fired from the bull, section of Hanover, into the cloud cover, as well as the flickering illumination of the shells and the fires in the city. The house was shaken to its foundation several times, although the bombs were falling far away. The presence of children lends the events an even more oppressive and gloomy feeling. Kirchhorst, the 10th of November 1942. We hear that yesterday's attack involved only about 15 aircraft. I am bothered by the landing of the Americans in North Africa even more than by these things. As I respond to contemporary events, I perceive a level of empathy in myself that marks a man who realizes he is caught up less in a world war than in a global civil war. For that reason, I find myself entangled in very different conflicts from those of the hostile nations. The solution to those conflicts is secondary. Berlin, the 12th of November 1942 departed this morning along with Mother and Perpetua. As I was saying goodbye, I showed our little boy a lovely drake that was swimming happily around in a puddle near the train stop. Never before have I embarked on a journey knowing so little about the course it will take or what it might achieve. I am like a fisherman casting his net into murky waters on a winter's day. Studied some physiognomy during the trip, the subtle, almost imperceptible trace of experience that I saw at the corner of the mouth of a young girl. Lust etches its presence in the face as sharply a diamond dot in Dalam in the evening, we are staying with Karl Schmidt. Dot Berlin. The 13th of November 1942 Friday, the 13th of November. The day brings the first snow of the year. Strolled with Karl Schmidt through the Grunwald forest in the morning. Dot Berlin. The 15th of November 1942 My reading matter, the journal Zalmoxis was named for a Scythian Heracles mentioned by Herodotus. I read two articles. One about the customs involving methods of digging up and using the mandrake root, and a second one about the symbolism aquatique. They discussed the connections among the moon, women, and the sea. Both are by Mercy Iliad, the editor. Carl Schmidt filled me in on him as well as on his mentor, René Guénon. The etymological associations between seashells and the female genitalia are very informative. Latin kinka and Danish cudifisk for muscle reflect this, whereas cud is synonymous with vulva. The agenda evident in this journal is very promising, instead of following strict logic, 
pictograms emerge. This gives the impression of caviar, of fish roe. Every sentence contains fecundity. Carl Schmidt also gave me a book by De Gubernitis, La Mythologie des Plants, The Mythology of Plants. Sixty years ago, the author was a professor of Sanskrit and mythology in Florence. Strolled through Dalam during the evening blackout. We talked about the daily Bible verses of the Moravians, the quatrains of Nostradamus, about Isaiah and prophecies in general. The fact that prophecies come true, even transcending distant ages, is the mark that lets us recognize the real prophetic power of their vision. With the passage of time, what the seer observes in the elements repeats as though refracted through a prism. His gaze does not pause on the history, but rather on the subject matter, nor on the future, but on the law. It is justifiable then that the mere knowledge of future dates and conjunctions betrays symptoms of a sick mind or of vulgar magic. It was late when we visited Poppets, where I also met Say Airbrush, the surgeon. Conversation about the difference between military and medical authority is embodied in the role of the military physician, where they are more or less united but also produce tensions. There followed a discussion about the large edition of classical writers that the minister too is planning. Say Airbrush said goodbye early to go see a first lieutenant whose pelvis had been fractured by a Russian shell. He feared that his art would be of little use here, in the best case scenario, however, the pieces of bone would knit themselves together again like the shards of a clay pot. As he put it, still, a visit during this crisis might have a positive effect upon the patient. Lotson, the 17th of November 1942 departure from the Silesian station, Berlin, yesterday at 9 o'clock. Perpetu accompanied me there, we sat in the waiting room for a while. Brother Physicus III was at the train along with Rem, whom I am forced to leave behind. After leaving the station, I was soon fast asleep and did not wake up until we reached Majuria 4 in the late morning. The land reminded me somewhat of deer, there was something modestly furtive about the brown pelt of the earth and the tranquil eyes of the lakes. Spent the day at the camps in the forest around Angerberg and Lotzen, where I was issued identification papers and tickets, and am now in Lotzen in a downright dingy hotel room. Lotzen, the 18th of November 1942. I have stayed in Lotzen because all the seats in the airplane to Kiev were full. They have been reduced because of a crash caused by ice on the wings three days ago. Visited the bleak cemetery in the morning. To the museum in the afternoon, a place that is more of a hero's shrine since memorabilia from combat in East Prussia in 1914 are collected there. The visit made me uneasy, the memory of all this is still too fresh. The corpse of this war has not yet decomposed which explains the ghostly resurrection of so many of its apparitions. Spectres in Graveyards. Lotson, the 19th of November 1942 went to the airfield in the morning, but several seats in the plane were eliminated because of the weather. I'll be staying here until tomorrow. Before eating, I took a short walk through the fields, where I observed two crested larks in front of an abandoned barn. Thought, when traveling, we have to be as warmly insulated as these birds are by their plumage. How often I envy them when I see them in the snowy woods sitting upon a branch, solitary but not abandoned. Feathers have been given to them, whereas we have received the spiritual aura that protects us from the loss of warmth. This bolsters and nourishes man through prayer, and for this very reason is beyond price. In the afternoon, I drove with Major Dietrichsdorf to Widmanen where we had been invited by a comrade who owns an estate there. It was almost dark. Illuminated by the rays of the setting sun, the lay a placid lake covered with brown and purple mists, by morning, these displayed a gentle, cool, green reflection. Along its shores stood young birch trees, their white trunks glistened through the soft brown of the surrounding thicket. In Widman and we were welcomed with coffee and mountains of cake. We then drank East Prussian Bernfang, a concoction of honey and alcohol. The honey is supposed to appeal to the sweet tooth, but it is then anesthetized by the high-octane alcohol. During the evening, 
there appeared sausages, with cook, drumsticks and breast of goose. Along with this came conversation, mainly about the delicacies. Life in these eastern provinces revolves more slowly, with greater gravitational force, greater lethargy, with easy enjoyment. Here we approach bear country. Our host was a great hunter. I noticed a spotted nutcracker among the stuffed animals in his room. I had never seen one before, a brown bird with pale speckling and tail feathers with whitish tips, perfectly camouflaged for a seamless disappearance into Nordic conifer forests at dusk. Lotson, the 20th of November 1942 in the morning strolled around the Boyne Fortress semicolon 5 its angular redoubts are wreathed by sparse woods of birch and elder. Flocks of crows swarmed in the bare treetops. I reached the hill on the lake where there stands a tall iron crucifix as a memorial to Bruno von Kvart, a missionary to this region, who suffered a martyr's death on the 9th of March 1009. Current reading, got further in Jeremiah and also thumbed through on Rebon, Lamortetz's problems, death and its problems. There I found quoted the morbid opinion of Parmenides who attributes sentience to corpses. They are supposedly aware of silence, cold, and darkness. As I read this, I thought of the uncanny changes I saw on the faces of the dying horses during our advance. In the evening, I went back out into the dark to visit the lake, as the moon shone through the clouds. I felt renewed in a strength and was immediately more curious about the course this journey would take. Kiev, the 21st of November 1942, take off at 9 o'clock through low lying cloud banks and light snowfall. Once we had gained altitude, I could again see the lakes around lots and bounded by birches and bands of blanched rushes. Then fields under a dusting of snow that revealed the brown earth and green shoots beneath this blanket. Conifer forests followed, and yellowed cracks in the land with networks of branching streams gleaming blue against the frost. And then the shiny dark earth of the peak ditches. In between, separated by large expanses in brownish grey islands, lay the cultivated earth with some solitary settlements, or others stretching along the roads. The cottages or stables seemed to be fast asleep yet tracks in the snow leading out from them were evidence that their inhabitants had already fetched hay, straw, and provisions from their barns, haystacks, and vegetable stores. The clouds grew heavier toward noon, and our aircraft flew low over the ground. I had dozed off for a while, then I woke up to notice a change in our situation. A long, pale red flame trailed from the engine cowling. At the same time, the aircraft struggled to land but not, as I thought, due to a carburetor fire, but because we had reached Kiev. Amazement and terror combined at the sight of all this to create a state of petrified attention. At such moments, something primeval and familiar awakens within us. Once we were on the ground, I spoke with the pilot about the crash that had happened the previous week on this runway. The aircraft had burned out. The corpses of the passengers were found pressed against the door, which had sealed tightly shut. In Kiev, I was billeted in the Palace Hotel. Although the sinks lacked hand towels and the study had no ink, and several marble steps were missing from the stairs, this is supposed to be the best hotel in occupied Russia. No matter how long you turned the faucets, they produced no water, let alone warm water. The same was true of the flush toilets. As a result, the whole palace hotel was filled with a noxious soda. I took advantage of the hour that was still left before dark to walk through the streets in the city, and was glad to return after this sojourn. As true as it is that our earth harbors enchanted lands, we also encounter others, where disenchantment reigns and nothing magical remains. Rostov, the 22nd of November 1942 I shared my room with a young artillery captain. Despite my objections, he insisted on covering me with his coat when it got cold. When I woke up, I saw that he had made do with a thin blanket. He also frightened away a big rat that had emerged from the crannies of the hotel and made for my paltry rations. Reveille before dawn. Departure through hazy weather around six in the morning. 
the flight took us across the huge expanse of the wheat fields of the Ukraine, where in some places the fields were still covered in faded stubble, while on most of them the fresh topsoil already glistened. Very few trees, but on the other hand, frequent deep branching, washed out gullies that give the impression that the good soil reaches immense depths here and only its uppermost, thinnest layer is cultivated. Reached Starlino 6 at 9 o'clock, and after another hour we were in Rostov. There the weather became so unsettled that the pilot thought it advisable to take only the courier baggage to Voroshilovsk and leave the passengers behind all the more so because a thick crust of ice was already forming on the wing sections of his aircraft. I decided to travel on to Voroshilovsk the following day by train and then spent the night in the officers' quarters. That is what they call one of these squalid buildings where sacks of straw are laid out in rows in the rooms and a stench lingers in the hallways. Stroll through city, images of despair repeat themselves. In Rio on Las Palmas, or on many an ocean beach, the walks I have taken have seemed like beautifully composed melodies. But here dissonance assaulted my heart. I watched some ragged children playing as they slid along the ice, and I marveled as if I had glimpsed a colored light in Hades. The only products for sale are black sunflower seeds, offered in shallow baskets by women from the steps of burnt out houses. High atop the trees in the middle of the busy avenue A I noticed clusters of crow's nests. Unfortunately, I did not pack enough equipment. I had no idea that little things like a pocket mirror, knife, sewing thread, or string are precious items here. Luckily I constantly come across people who help me. Not infrequently they are some of my readers, whose help I count among my fortune. Rostov. The 23rd of November 1942 I was able to scare up a bowl of soup in the soldiers mess this morning. Changed money, the Russian banknotes, still bear Lenin's portrait. To compute the exchange rate, the female civil servant used an abacus with large balls that she flicked back and forth. I am told these machines can't be compared to the ones children at home use. Anyone who can master them can supposedly achieve a result more quickly than with pencil and paper. In the afternoon, went to one of the few cafes permitted to operate on the free market. A small piece of cake costs two marks there, and an egg, three. It makes me sad to see people dozing and killing time, as though in waiting rooms before their trains depart for some terrible destination and it's the privileged few sitting here. I continue to study people on the street, which again reinforces my impression of the Orient as a place of disenchantment. The eye has to grow accustomed to the most unpleasant sights imaginable, there is no oasis, no respite. Technology is the only thing that functions in good order, the railroad, the cars, the airplanes, loudspeakers, and naturally everything belonging to the world of weaponry. Otherwise, there is a complete absence of everything organic, of nourishment, clothing, warmth, light. This is even more pronounced for the higher aspects of life, for joy, happiness, and cheer, and for any benevolent power of art. And all this on some of the richest soil on the globe. The story of the Tower of Babel always seems to repeat itself. In this place, however, we do not find it under construction but rather in the stage after its collapse and the confusion of languages. These rational constructs always contain the seeds of their own destruction. They have an icy chill that attracts fire the way iron attracts lightning. The empty windows of the burnt-out office buildings show red calcination near their rooftops where the pure flame leapt out. Along each side, they bear the dark traces of the escaping smoke. The floors have collapsed. The steam radiators dangle on the bare walls. A tangle of twisted metal rises from the cellars, and neglected children comb through the heaps of ashes with hooks looking for bits of wood. One walks through a world of rubble that is home to rats. When it comes to commerce here, all one sees except for women selling sunflower seeds are boys with shoe cleaning brushes or people who have constructed little carts so they can carry soldiers' gear. They prefer bread to cigarettes or money. People's clothing here looks like disguises, as if they have put on every garment they own and don't take them off at night. 
coats are rarer than thickly padded jackets. Like so many other things, these are reduced to rags. For head covering, they wear caps with earlaps or trimmed flaps. You also see Soviet caps made of tan cloth and with a high crease in the center. Almost all these people, and especially the women, carry sacks over their shoulders. The sight of them indicates a burdensome, onerous existence. They bustle about hurriedly, restlessly but without any noticeable purpose, as if they were in an anthill that has been pried open. Among all these you see many uniforms, even Hungarian and Romanian, as well as ones that are completely unknown, like those of Ukrainian volunteers or of the local security service. After nightfall, you can hear gunfire from the desolate factory yards over near the railroad station. In the afternoon, vacationers waiting for their trains were stopped and sent to the front in hastily assembled marching units. There is news that the Russians have broken through north of Stalingrad. Voroshilovsk, the 24th of November 1942, toward evening, I continued on my journey, heading toward Kropotkin where we arrived at four in the morning. There I slept on the counter in the waiting room until the train left for Voroshilovsk. Within two short days, I have adjusted to this existence in cramped train compartments, in cold halls, without water, without service, without warm rations. But I observe others who are worse off, such as the Russians standing in open freight cars or on the running boards in the icy wind. Our route leads through the fertile Cuban steppe semicolon 7. The crops have been harvested, but the fields are mostly untilled. Their dimensions are huge and the boundaries are out of sight. From this treeless expanse now and again there arises a cluster of silos, tanks, or warehouses. These contain heaps of yellow or brown wheat that gleam like some higher power created by the fertility of the good earth. There are still traces of the cultivation of wheat, corn, castor bean, sunflowers, and tobacco. The edges of the train embankment are covered with the desiccated, parched brown flora of thistles and other composite blossoms. There is also a plant that resembles a horsetail, but in the form and size of a small fir tree. This plant stock reminds me of the Japanese tea blossoms that I used to dissolve in warm water when I was a child. Then, too, I would try to guess their species by attempting to imagine them in bloom. Arrival in Voroshilovsk after dark. I am billeted in the office building of the GPU, a place of gigantic dimensions like everything else under the authority of the police and prison systems. I have a little room here with a table a chair, a bed, and, most important, intact window panes. For shaving, I have even found a piece of broken mirror to use. After my experiences of the past few days, I recognize the value inherent in such objects. Voroshilovsk, the 25th of November 1942 The weather is rainy, the streets are covered with mud. I am going to be stuck here for a while. A few streets I have walked down have made a more positive impression than the things I've seen up until now. In particular, the houses from the Tsarist period radiate a certain warmth, while those monstrous Soviet boxes oppress the country for miles around. In the afternoon, I climbed the hill where the Orthodox Church stands, a crudely finished Byzantine style building with its onion dome half blown away. The old buildings always project something primitive, but it is still more pleasant than the abstract nullity of the new construction. Here one can quote Gautier, La barbary vaut my yuxque la platitude. Barbarism is better than a platitude, where platitude is best translated as nihilism. In the afternoon, the commander in chief of the army group, General Colonel von Klist Komenin, appeared and dined with us. I knew him already from my years in Hanover. Discussed Giraud, the French general now in command in Tunis. Right after his retreat, Hitler is supposed to have said that further unpleasantness could be expected from him. The women's voices, especially those of the girls, are not actually melodious, yet they are pleasant. They convey strength and serenity, one could almost imagine them resonating with the deep tones of life's music. 
mechanical and impersonal changes seem to pass over such natures without affecting them. I noticed something similar among South American Negroes, their deep, enduring joy after generations of slavery. Incidentally, the staff doctor, von Gravenitz, told me that physical exams showed the great majority of the girls to be virgins. This is also apparent from their faces, but it is difficult to say, whether, this is more readable from their foreheads or their eyes. A silver glow of chastity suffuses the face. Its light does not have the glow of active virtue, but more a second-hand reflection, like moonlight. It lets us perceive the sun, the source of such serenity. Voroshilovsk, the 26th of November 1942 snow flurries accompanied by high winds. I tried to climb the church tower to have a look around, but I found the upper steps badly charred. Thus, I had to make do with a view from halfway up. Then I made my way toward a sparse wood that I had spied. Unfortunately, I found it to be impassable, so I had to be satisfied with the captivating sight of a flock of birds swooping nimbly through the bushes and hedges. They resembled our titmouse but seemed to my eyes to be larger and more brightly colored. At lunch, I saw Major von Oppen, the son of my former regimental commander. Among other things, we discussed the poem Der Taurus, which Friedrich Georg dedicated to the memory of Oppen's father who is buried the dot ten in the afternoon got a vaccination for typhus. Inoculation remains a remarkable act. I used to like to compare it to baptism, yet the more precise analogy to the spiritual world is perhaps represented by Holy Communion. We use the living experience that others have collected for us through their sacrifice, sickness, or through snake bite. The lymph of the Lamb that has suffered for us. Miracles are prefigured and preserved for us in matter, they are its most exalted expression. In the evening, Lieutenant Colonel Schuchart explained the situation to me. Using the large map, he showed me the recent Russian breakthrough of the lines formerly held by our adjoining army group. The thrust destroyed the sections of the front held by the Romanians and let the 6th Army be surrounded. A cauldron like this has to be supplied by air until a land bridge can be established. 11 Life in these areas surrounded by carnage presents the most extreme challenges. The threat resembles that of a besieged city from classical times when no one could expect mercy. This is true of morale as well. For weeks and months, death could be seen approaching from afar. Many scores are settled this way for the political structures that the states had assumed have been turned inside out. Voroshilovsk, the 27th of November 1942 visited the city museum in the morning. This had been founded under the Tsars and is mainly a zoological collection that has suffered over time. I saw snakes faded by sunlight, curled around branches as white, scaly forms and others as desiccated mummies in display jars because the alcohol had evaporated. Yet at one time all these objects had obviously been displayed with love and a certain joy in design. Informed viewers can discern such things from little clues. My gaze also fell upon a small label that indicated the activity of groups of local amateurs, Acta Societati Centomologici Staropolitani, 1926. Proceedings of the Entomological Society of Stavropol, 1926. Stavropol is the old name of Voroshilovsk. Among the taxidermy specimens, I noticed two double headed animals, a goat and a calf. The goat showed a deformity resembling a Janus head, whereas in the case of the calf, two snouts but only three eyes had formed, with the extra one located like that of Polyphemus 12 in the center of the forehead. This intrusion was not without its aesthetic elegance. It gave the impression of an intentional composition, rather than one of a zoological, mythological creature. Incidentally, it would be a good project, either for the natural scientist or for a humanist, to work on the concept of two headedness. The conclusion reached would probably be that the phenomenon is part of the lower strata of life, either the vegetative or the demonic. The advantages one could imagine such as a special synesthetic intelligence or the ability to converse with oneself in the most astonishing way, 
were allotted to us more simply and cleverly in the form of the hemispherical structure of the brain. The Siamese twins were not so much connected with each other as they were shackled together. 13 Despite the early hour, I noticed a number of visitors in rapt attention at the display cases. I observed two women in peasant clothing conversing about the objects. One of them seemed particularly enchanted by some of them, such as a pink shell that was armed with long spikes, like a hedgehog. In the evening, I was a guest of Lieutenant Colonel Merck, the quartermaster a man who excels in that precise business-like style characteristic of people in charge of supplies. Two Korean women, twin sisters, served us with elegance. Conversation with Captain Dyatlov, who had managed a large estate here before the war. We discussed crops and yields that were possible on the soil types here. The fertility is enormous, but as always in such cases, this also applies to the blights. Icy winds can ruin the budding cereal crop in minutes, and we trust forms such thick clouds during the harvest that the horses are blinded. Furthermore, there are legions of grasshoppers and june beetles, and thistles with stalks that can grow as thick as a man's arm. Farmers fear a thorny vine that rolls up into a ball when it reaches maturity and, after rotting at the root, separates and is carried across the fields by the autumn winds casting its seed as it goes. The Roshilovsk, the 29th of November 1942 visited the large town market in the morning, it was crowded with people, but there was very little merchandise to be had. The prices are those of famine times. I paid three marks for a little spool of thread that I saw for sale in France for a few pennies a short while ago. Listeners were crowded around a singing beggar with a freshly bandaged arm stump. It seemed that they were listening less to the music than to their long, drawn out text. It was a Homeric image. A funeral procession then passed by. Two women in front carried a wooden cross decorated with a wreath, and following them were four more carrying the coffin lid on their shoulders as though it were a boat decorated with flowers. Four young men bore the coffin slung from linen cloths. In it lay the dead woman. She was approximately 36 years old, had dark hair and a face with sharp features. Her head lay on a bed of flowers. She was carried feet first, and at that end, lay a black book. I had encountered this orthodox practice most recently on the island of Rhodes in the public display of the dead, and I approve. It's almost as if the deceased were consciously bidding farewell before descending into darkness. During these days, I conceived of a new project, the path of Masira. The narrator Athfraid begins at the moment when he has wandered through the great desert and can make out indications that he is approaching the coast. Salt accretions, grasshoppers, and snakes appear at first, a world of animals and plants that seems born from the arid sand. Then come thorn bushes in bloom, and, finally, palm trees and traces of earlier settlements. Yet the land is desolate and abandoned, now and then, his march goes past destroyed cities whose walls have been breached and huge siege machinery stands in the sand. Thread is in possession of a map drawn by Fortunio showing half the text as lettered and the other half consisting of landscape hieroglyphs, all describing the path to Gadamar, where Fortunio had found a mine of precious stones. The study of this map presents difficulties, Athfraid wishes he had taken the sea route because each reference leads to the next one like the links of a chain. It seems that Fortunio has given the map's owner a task to be rewarded with the discovery of the treasure. The details of this mission are at first thrilling, but then they involve intellectual powers as they finally emerge as ethical trials. Each evening, Athfraid unfolds this remarkable map like the bellows of an accordion. He would have given up his quest long ago had it not been for the glimpse of one of the jewels that Fortunio showed him as a test, an opal the size and shape of a goose egg, possessing iridescent, mystical depths. Looking at this stone long enough reveals magical scenes and images from the past and future. This stone was mined in the Earth's mythical period and offers a last remnant of the vanished riches of the Golden Age. With his followers, Athfred must traverse the path of Masairu across a frightening track high above the coastal surf. 
This represents ethical patterns of plot and topography. The track has been cut so steeply and narrowly into the smooth cliff face that no more than a single human foot or mule's hoof can make its way across. The two points of access are invisible to each other, and, to prevent caravans from meeting on the path, there is a kind of turret at each end. From this vantage point, travelers must call out their intention to enter the path. Athfred neglects this warning and thus brings misfortune to a caravan of Jews from off for approaching from the opposite direction at the same time. Both parties meet with their mules on the narrowest, most frightening spot above the abyss, the point where any thought of turning around fills the heart with terror. How can this conflict, which threatens to end with the destruction of one or both groups, be solved question mark 14 while I was walking across the market square thinking about this subject, it seemed to me a shame to have to delete any piece of it, it lends itself to a parable about the path of life itself. The map would then have to reveal fate, so that we could read it the way we read the lines on someone's palm. The load of precious stones is the eternal city described in St. John's vision in the book of Revelation, it is the goal that rewards the path. Thinking like this, one could derive much significance from the material dot of course, this inspiration occurs to me at the least opportune moment, and today I laid aside the first page that I have written. Better days may come when I have more freedom. Voroshilovsk, the 30th of November 1942 visited the cemetery, the most derelict one I have ever seen. It is a square area bounded by a half-collapsed wall. The lack of names is striking, there are hardly any inscriptions, whether on the moss-covered grave markers or on weather-beaten St. Andrew's cross is cut from soft golden brown limestone. On one of these, I thought I could decipher the word incised in Greek letters, Petera. It made me think of Cuban and his dream city Pearl, like so much else here. Fifteen, The grave mounds are choked with brambles, thistles and burrs also run riot everywhere. Among these, apparently without any plan, new places have been dug out, as yet unmarked by either a stone or wooden monument. Old bones are bleaching on the churned up ground. Vertebrae, ribs, and leg bones are scattered like pieces of a puzzle. I also noticed the greenish skull of a child on top of a wall. Dot back through the crumbling suburbs. In the construction of the houses, in the facial features of the people, in countless mostly imponderable details, the senses pick up echoes and hints of Asia. I sensed this especially when I saw a little boy with his hands folded across his body in a distinctive way. Such fundamental things are perceived as subtle, invisible messages. Scholars think they have found traces of the third eye, the eye in the forehead that was perhaps the eye for such primeval images. Originally, we perceived the lands, animals, springs, and trees as figures, gods and demons, the way we nowadays perceive surfaces and shapes. Voroshilovsk, the 1st of December 1942 visit to the Research Institute for Plague Control, which is staffed by Russian scholars and employees. The fertile soil of this country is an Eldorado for epidemics and sicknesses like Ukrainian fever, dysentery, typhus, diphtheria, and a virulent variety of a jaundice pathogen that has not yet been isolated. They say that the plague returns every ten years. It appeared in 1912, 1922, and 1932, so its time is again fast approaching. It is brought by caravans from the region of Astrakhan. A mass extinction of rodents precedes it heralding its arrival. In such cases, the institute sends out an expedition comprising zoologists, bacteriologists, and collectors to do more thorough research. The advance of the contagion is observed and combated by means of quarantine in small stations, so called plague houses. Particular care is given to the extermination of rats, a function fulfilled by specialized rat catchers called deratizers, who can be found on every collective farm. Professor Hack the research director, put me at ease during our conversation. A Frenchman would call this relationship between people humane, but it is a different, more primitive tinge with Russians and springs from deeper currents. In France, 
The endearing quality of an individual is produced by subtle exertion, by psychological action, here it is the product of lethargy. It has a more feminine, but also a darker, a moral quality about it. Professor Hack has been placed under a mild form of banishment called minus six. This means that he must avoid entering the six largest cities in the country. Because the Plague Research Institute also produces large quantities of vaccine, it was placed under the protection of the German troops after the invasion and assigned the responsibility for a collective farm where, before this, the Russian state had employed and fed 800 mentally ill people. To clear the estate for the Plague Institute, these patients were exterminated by the security service. Such an act betrays the tendency of the technician to substitute hygiene for morality, similar to the way he substitutes propaganda for truth. Voroshilovsk, the 2nd of December 1942 hints of the executioner's presence are often so palpable that all desire to work, to create images and thoughts, dies. Evil deeds have a negating, upsetting consequence human growth becomes stunted as if polluted by invisible decay. In its proximity, things lose their magic, their aroma, and taste. The mind is exhausted by the tasks it has set itself, tasks that used to refresh and engage. Yet, it is precisely against such things that it must now struggle. The palette of the flowers along the deadly mountain ridge must never fade from our sight even though they are but a hand's breadth from the abyss. This is the situation I described in Cliffs, on the Marble Cliffs. Voroshilovsk, the 4th of December 1942 The foggy weather was sufficiently clear by evening that I could just make out the stars through the veil but not really see them. The sunflower seeds that they sell everywhere here are black with fine white striation. You see people, young and old, nibbling them whether they are walking or standing, by popping them quickly into their mouths and cracking them deftly. The shell is then spit out and the little seed eaten. On the one hand, this resembles a pastime like smoking, and on the other hand, it seems to be a kind of homeopathic nourishment. The saying goes that these are good for building firm breasts for women. All the paths and pavement are covered with the shells that have been spat out as if you were walking along behind a procession of rodents. In my dealings with people, I have noticed that I do not speak much to the middle sort, whether of intelligence or character. My contact with very simple as well as highly developed natures, however, presents no difficulty. I seem to resemble a pianist playing only the keys at the extreme ends of the keyboard and just having to make do without the rest. It's either peasants and fishermen or people of the highest quality. The rest of my social dealings consist of arduous attention to the mundane, rummaging through my pockets looking for change. I often get the feeling that I am moving within a world for which I am not adequately equipped. Voroshilovsk, the 6th of December 1942 Sunday, clear frosty conditions. A little snow lies on the ground. In the morning, I took a walk through the woods and at the sight of that light, pure dusting I thought of the wondrous verse that Perpetua once murmured to herself upon waking up in our Leipzig garret es schenit der Wind das Argst zu, windblown snowbanks hide the worst, in those days, we lived in a studio. At night, we could watch the stars in their course and, in winter, the softly falling snowflakes. My impressions from the woods were a little more cheerful. The peasant women approached me carrying long, curved yokes with buckets of water or small bundles swinging at the ends. Even the yokes on the small panch horses 16 dance high over their shoulders and are pleasant to see when they trot. That conjures up a bygone age, times of plenty. I feel that this land has been depleted by abstract concepts and that it would blossom again under the sun of a benevolent paternal force especially when I hear the people speak with their vowels that echo deep joy and resonate gentle laughter, I am reminded of winter days when flowing springs were audible beneath ice and snow. Finished reading Jeremiah, which I had begun on the 18th of October in Shuresens. My journey takes me through the book of books, and the eventful world provides the evidence for it. Jeremiah's visions can't quite measure up to those of Isaiah whose incomparable power towers over his. 
Isaiah describes the fate of the universe, whereas Jeremiah is the prophet of political configurations. As such, he plays a significant role, he is the professional prophet, the subtlest tool of national sentiment. He still unites the powers of priest, poet, and statesman. He views the decay of the state not as a cosmic catastrophe stimulating horror and lust, but rather as political collapse, the shipwreck of the state that introduces in its wake a deviation from the divine order. The situation he sees confronting him is that of Nebuchadnezzar's threat, a power that he can assess differently and more accurately than the king can. He advises Zadikiah without success. It is hard for us to discern the difficulties of his office because we are so far removed from theocracies. To do justice to them, you would have to compare Jeremiah's duties to that of a gifted visionary at the Prussian court in 1805. In that year, he would have to have predicted not only how the year 1806 would end but also 1812 and, then, armed with this knowledge, have warned the king against Napoleon. In such cases, one is not only opposed by the pro-war faction but also by the common man. It is hard to exaggerate the courage that Jeremiah displayed, for it presupposes that there was no doubt of divine guidance. That is what gave him such certainty. Voroshilovsk, the 7th of December 1942 yesterday was a significant day. I got a glimpse of, this is you. Not since South America have I felt such a force. Can there be such things as geographical, or better? geomantic influences on character? I don't mean just on behavior as Pascal and Stendhal have understood it, but rather influence upon our essence. That would mean that in other latitudes we could undergo disintegration and then reconstitution. This would correspond to corporeal transformations, at first we are enveloped in fevers, and then we recover our health. We would be world citizens in the highest sense if the globe in its totality were to form and shape us. World leaders are elevated to such status by their nations. The legend of the supernatural conception of Alexander the Great is akin to this. A lightning bolt strikes the mother, strikes the earth in her womb. The great poets like Dante in his Excurses and Goethe in the West Oslichard of 17 interpret this spiritually. So do the world religions with the exception of Islam, which is too influenced by climate. Take St. Peter's vision of the animals, the enjoyment of their flesh symbolizes the assimilation of all the empires and nations of this world. 18. The evening was crystal clear. The great constellations glittered in a light such as I know only from the southern hemisphere. I wonder whether people in other ages ever felt this sensation of tremendous cold that comes over us at the sight. Lately, I found this most accurately described in a few verses by Friedrich Georg. I had a dream in which I was engaged in various tasks. The only image that remains is the scene that preceded awakening, a car with a hood that had a small weevil, the hazelnut borer, as radiator ornament. But here it was the size of a lamb and shone like a cherry red, striated horn, translucent in the sunlight. The impact of seven bombs dropped by a Russian plane at dawn awakened me at the moment when I was admiring this figure. It was a radiant morning, not a cloud darkened the blue vault of heaven. I climbed the church tower, an octagonal cylinder resting on a square base. The tower supports a squat onion shaped dome on top. For the first time, I could look out over the town as a whole with all its far flung, square dwellings of low houses with a few gigantic new buildings sticking up here and there. These are either a barracks or a police station. To build such boxes, several million people had to be exterminated. In the morning light, Mount Elbrus with its twin peaks seemed to rise up right in front of the gates like shining silver walls of snow, and yet it is several days march from here. It dwarfs the dark Caucasus range over which it towers. This sight made the earth speak to me again for the first time in a long while, as a work of God's hand. On my way back, I passed a group of prisoners doing road repair under guard. They had spread their coats out along the edge and passers by had laid the occasional donation on them. I saw banknotes, slices of bread, onions, and one of the tomatoes they like to pickle in vinegar here when they're still green. 
This was the first kind of gesture I have noticed in this landscape, aside from a few children at play or the fine camaraderie among the German soldiers. All the parts worked together here. The residents who donated, the prisoners who were poor, and the guards who permitted this activity. Kropotkin, the 9th of December 1942 departed last night with the courier train to meet the 17th Army. The train resembled an automobile on tracks pulling a freight car. After a short journey, we stopped on the tracks for part of the night due to snow squalls. Because we were able to scare up some wood, a little stove warmed us for an hour or two. Dot arrived in Kropotkin in the morning, where I spent the day waiting for the train to Belorchinsk. Many hundreds of soldiers were waiting in the huge, bare railroad station just like me. They stood together in silent groups or sat on their gear. At various times, they crowded around windows where soup or coffee was being served. In this vast space, you sensed the presence of powerful forces that drive human beings without ever being revealed to their sight, raw, colossal power. Hence the impression that every fiber of our will is being commandeered, while our comprehension remains idle. If pure intuition were possible, such as on a painter's canvas, that would surely bring great solace and relief. But at this stage, it is as impossible as the interpretation of events by a great historian or better yet, in a novel. We do not even know the names of the powers that have squared off against each other. A thought at this moment, freedom in the 19th century sense cannot be restored. As many people still dream, it must rise up to new and freezing heights of the historical process and higher still, like an eagle soaring above the turrets that tower above the chaos. Even freedom must pass through the pain. It must be earned again. Belorchinsk, the 10th of December 1942 I departed from Kropotkin after a 15 hour delay. The word delay of course loses its meaning here. We have to adjust to a visceral condition that destroys all patience. The rain was pouring down, so I permitted myself some time to read by candlelight in the compartment. Even with my reading matter, I now live a la fortune du pot, by pot luck, by having to pick up many an unappetizing item, such as in this case Abu Telfan by Wilhelm Rabe. I brought this along from Voroshilovsk, a book I had heard praised by my grandfather, the school teacher, although I was never especially curious about it. The constantly repeated ironic embellishments in this prose resemble the gilded metal mounts on imitation rococo of the sort seen on walnut furniture from this period. Things like, the poplar trees are again showing that they are capable of casting very long shadows. Or, the white fog, which had unfortunately already been used by the honest one specker boat common 19 also made its presence felt upon the meadows. This provincial irony is one of the symptoms of the 19th century, some authors seem to be plagued by its chronic itch. Yet these Russian years claim not only human victims but also books. They turn yellow like leaves before the frost, and someday it will be noticed that whole literatures have silently ceased to exist. Dot arrived in Belorinsk in the early morning hours. Waiting on the muddy train platform I studied the magnificent, luminous constellations. It's remarkable how they captivate the spirit in new ways when you are approaching a world of suffering. Boethius mentions them in this context in his final, most beautiful verse. In the bed assigned to me, I discovered two drivers whose vehicle had gotten stuck in the mud. The hut had only one room divided in half by a large stove, it contained two more beds where the housewife slept along with her female friend. They crawled into bed together, freeing up a warm berth for me. I visited the commander in chief, Lieutenant General Yu, around midday, bringing him greetings from his predecessor, Heinrich von Stolpnigel. Discussion about our positions. Whereas the cold temperatures had been the most dangerous aspect of the first Russian winter, now at least on this section of the front, it's the damp that is even more debilitating. For the most part, the troops in the wet forests are huddled in foxholes, because the advance has been halted for the past three weeks. Tarpaulins offer the only protection. 
flooding in the brooks and rivers has washed the bridges away. Supplies are held up. Aircraft cannot even drop anything over these foggy woods. Exertion reaches its extreme limit here, at which point men die of exhaustion. In the afternoon, I was present at the interrogation of a captured 19 year old Russian lieutenant. His soft, unshaven beard growth looked innately girlish. The boy wore a shearling cap and carried a long wooden staff in his hand. He was a farmer's son, who had gone to engineering school and before his capture had led a mortar unit. The general impression reinforced this, a peasant turned mechanic. There was something ponderous and deliberate in his hand motions. I could imagine that these hands had not forgotten their work with wood, although by now they had grown used to the feel of iron. Discussion with interrogating officer, a bolt who compared Russia to a glass of milk from which the thin layer of cream had been skimmed off. A new layer will have to rise to the top, or else it won't taste right. That is graphic. The question is, what sort of sweetness remains finely dispersed within the milk? This could be a leavening agent when times are calm again. To put it differently, has the cruel imposition of technical abstraction penetrated the fertile human substrate? I would say no, based purely on the impression conveyed by the voices and physiognomy of the people. Relapse. It was extraordinary, at the very moment when I realized it, a heavy piece of the ceiling fell down, leaving a hole shaped like the outline of Sicily. Belorshinsk. The 11th of December 1942 Because frost had formed overnight, I took a walk around the town where yesterday the muddy paths were impassable. Today they lay like broad village ponds under sheer ice. The houses are small one-story buildings roofed with reeds, shingles, or tin the color of red lead. The bottommost layers of the reed roofs are constructed of the strong stalks, the upper ones are made from the leafy sections, resembling shocks of yellow hair. A remarkable style of canopy roof decorates the entry doors of the more stately buildings and partially protects the steps from rain but these structures are also for show. The feature probably harkens back to a time when tents influenced architecture. The decoration of these walkways roofed with tin suggests fringe or tassels. Inside the cottages, it is not uncommon to see heat-loving plants, such as tall rubber trees or lemon bushes bearing fruit. The small rooms with their large stoves are like greenhouses. Poplar trees grow in profusion out of the gardens and at the edges of the broad streets. The dense branches were glorious in the sunlight. A small military cemetery contained the dead from a field hospital as well as a few from aircraft that had crashed over the town. As many as thirty graves had been dug and marked with crosses, a number of others had been dug for future use, something that Meister Anton in Hebel's Marie Magdalena decries as a sacrilege. Twenty outside, on the banks of the Bel Air River. It churns with dirty grey floodwaters. Along its banks there extended a field position with barriers and foxholes that were being worked on by groups of women under the supervision of soldiers from the Corps of Engineers. In an narrow gorge lay a dead horse. The last shred of flesh had been scraped from its skeleton. From this vantage point, the city with its wooden huts and roofs covered in green moss doesn't look bad. You can still feel the vitality that comes from handwork and the organic mellowing that make the place livable. Afterward, I spent time with my landlady, Frau Valla, short for Valentina. Her husband had been away since the beginning of the war in the field with a chemical warfare unit. Living with her is a 16 year old friend, Victoria, daughter of a doctor, who spoke a little German and had also read Schiller. Like almost all her other compatriots, she admires him as the archetypal poet, oh, Schiller, super. She is now obligated to go work in Germany and is looking forward to it. She is a high school student, but her classmates who are over 16 have been mobilized as partisans. She told me about a 14-year-old girlfriend of hers who had been shot near the river, conveying this in an unemotional tone that was by no means harsh. That left a deep impression on me. Had a conversation in the evening with Major K, primarily about the partisans, it is his job to locate and engage them. The fighting is merciless enough between the regular troops. 
a soldier will go to any extreme to avoid capture. This explains the tenacity with which these cauldrons are defended. Russian orders have been found that place a bounty on captured soldiers who are delivered alive, prisoners the intelligence service can then use in its interrogations. Other orders state that the prisoners must first be brought before military officers and only then, before the political officers. This means that they follow a clear sequence for squeezing the lemon. The opponents expect no mercy from each other and their propaganda only reinforces this opinion. By way of an example, last winter a sleigh carrying wounded Russian officers blundered into the German positions. At the moment the men realized their error, they pulled the pins on the hand grenades they had concealed between their bodies. Prisoners are nonetheless taken in order to increase the workforce and also to attract deserters. But the partisans stand beyond the reach of military law, inasmuch as one can even still speak of such a concept. They are surrounded in their forests like packs of wolves to be exterminated. I have heard things here of the most bestial nature. On the way home, I ponder these things. In such intervals, a thought forms that I used to spin out in various scenarios. It is this, where everything is permitted, first anarchy, then tighter order is the result. Anyone, who arbitrarily underestimates his opponent, cannot expect pardon himself. And so new and tougher rules of combat evolved. That seemed to me like a tempting theory, but in practice, we inevitably confront the moment when we must raise a hand against defenseless non combatants. This is only possible in cold blooded combat with beasts or in wars that atheists wage against each other. At that point, only the Red Cross has any clear mission. There will always be areas where we cannot allow ourselves to accept the rules of the opponent. War is not a cake divided up by the parties until it's all gone, there is always a piece left over to share. This is the divine part that remains outside the fray, separate from the struggle between pure bestiality and demonic power. Even Homer recognized and respected this. The truly powerful man, the one destined to rule, will be distinguished by the fact that he does not appear as an enemy filled with hatred. He also feels responsible for his opponent. That his strength is superior to that of the others is apparent at more sophisticated levels than physical violence, which serves only to persuade his subordinates. Make up the 12th of December 1942 yesterday's meeting tells me that I am not going to get a full briefing on the status of this country. There are simply too many places that are off limits to me. These include all those where violence is being perpetrated upon defenseless people and also where reprisals and punitive measures are being applied collectively. Incidentally, I have no hope for change. Things of this sort are part of the zeitgeist, we can see that being eagerly embraced everywhere. Adversaries copy each other. I wonder if it might be good to visit these places of terror as a witness in order to see and remember what sort of people the perpetrators and the victims are. With his The House of the Dead, Ostoyevsky had enormous influence. But he was not there as a volunteer, but rather as a prisoner. There are also limits to what we are capable of seeing. Otherwise we would have to be ordained to higher holy orders than our age is capable of bestowing. The departure for makeup that was planned for the morning was postponed until dark. I was again the guest of the commander, along with a short Saxon general whose car had gotten mired here in the mud. He described the difficulties he had experienced in Kharkov. At first, 75 people starved to death each day, but he had underreported this number as 25. He spoke of police tactics with the attitude of a gamekeeper, for example, I consider the view quite erroneous that the 13 and 14 year old youths captured with the partisans should not be liquidated. Anyone who has grown up that way, without a father or mother, will never turn out well. A bullet is the only right thing. By the way, that's what the Russians do with them too. Citing evidence, he told an anecdote about a sergeant who had picked up a nine-year-old and a twelve-year-old lad overnight out of pity, in the morning, he was found with his throat cut. Said farewell to Frau Valla. My billet in her parlor with the large stove wasn't bad, a sort of cabbage soup comfort. 
our life's paths lead us to strange way stations. In Makeup, I was the guest of the supple Lee commander. I was billeted in a house that had no light except for a tiny flame illuminating an icon. But the commander sent me a honey colored candle that gave off a delightful aroma. Uransky, the 13th of December 1942, I departed for Uransky before dawn. Just past Makeup, the road took a turn into the mountains. Signs at the edge of the woods, Aktung, partisan alert. Keep weapons at the ready. The wooded areas are secured against the Russians on the opposite side by sparse positions, often no more than outposts. The larger areas beyond are only traversed by troops along the roads. They are not only threatened by partisans, or bandits, to quote the German term used for them but also by scouting parties and patrols from the regular forces, as when the car of a division commander was recently ambushed and hit by a high explosive charge. The ground was frozen solid, making it easy for our car to go uphill. It followed the road to two apps, made famous by the German paratroopers' attack and the Russian defense. The track had already been cleared, only heavy vehicles like steamrollers and tractors were occasionally visible on the slopes. In the undergrowth lay a horse frozen to the ground. Its flesh had only been stripped from the upper portion, with the result that its bare ribcage and frozen blue and red intestines made it look like a detail from an anatomical atlas. The forest was thick and leafy, and untended growths of young oak trees spread out in curtained rows as far as the eye could see to the point where the jagged white peaks of the lofty mountain range met the blue mountains. In some places, woodpeckers flew down from stands of older trees to peck at the brittle wood. Their bright raspberry breasts shone here and there against the snowy tree trunks. In Uransky, I am told that these hills are overgrown in part with bushes and, as for the rest, with shoots that propagate directly from the tree stumps. The reforestation took place mostly under Russian authority, since the Circassians who lived here, being cattlemen, kept the land open. Only a few huge surviving trees were spared. These are therefore called Circassian oaks. Other places in these vast forests are still habitats for bears. Here there still exist patches of virgin stock, but otherwise this sea of forest has an inherent primeval power of its own. The eye notices the first thing that will be exploited, nature as yet unspoiled by swarms of people passing through. At Kadishanskaya a bridge had been flooded out. Soldiers from the Corps of Engineers conveyed us over the torrential river, the Shishkoma 21 in inflatable dinghies. Beside me a young infantryman crouched on his gear. The last time I sat in a thing like this we got a direct hit that ripped it in half and killed four comrades. I and one other man got away with our lives. That was on the Loire. And so this war provides generations to come with material for tales to tell their children and their children's children. People will forever hear about how the narrator drew one of the lucky numbers in the terrifying lottery. Of course, it is only the accounts of the survivors we hear, since they are the ones who write history. In the utterly devastated town of Uransky, I reported to an Austrian, General Duangelis, the commander of the 44th Paratroop Corps. He showed me our positions on the map. The advance along the road from Makop to Tuaps has brought heavy losses since the Russians have taken cover in the extensive, dense forests and defended them with skill and tenacity. Thus, it happened that, to use the words of Clauswitz, the attack reached its zenith just before the watershed and came to a standstill just short of its strategic goals. Such a situation is fraught with calamity at every step. After tough close quarter combat in the undergrowth, torrential rainfall destroyed the bridges and made roads impassable. Now the troops have been pinned down for weeks in sodden foxholes, being worn down as much by the cold and damp as by enemy fire and frequent attacks. In the afternoon went up into the mountain forest that rises above the huts of Urinsky. The undergrowth level consisted of rhododendrons that were already bearing greenish yellow buds. I returned by way of the narrow valley of a mountain stream that flowed over Green Mall. It was here that the populace survived the fighting by hiding in small caves. 
you could still see the remnants and traces of their campsites. Uransky, the 14th of December 1942 Starry Night. I spent it in the bare bed chamber of the Cossack hut that was equipped with only a metal bed frame for sleeping. Luckily the large stove built of rough stone was in working condition so that a good fire produced heat for the first few hours. Before falling asleep, I listened for a while to the cricket of this hearth whose voice rang out in full-throated melody, more a chime than a chirp. The next morning was intensely cold. Russian aircraft could be heard circling over the valley in the distance, releasing strings of bombs. This was punctuated by the brisk pumping action of our flak, anti-aircraft guns. In the morning, the weather was clear and I went out with 1st Lieutenant Strubelt to get a view of the terrain on both sides of the road to two apps. We drove in a car that had a row of bullet holes at the back of the roof, traces of an attack by partisans. A railroad line had been built through the Shish Valley along our road. It looked like a muddy hellhole. The river had reached a high water mark a few days ago. By now it had fallen to the point where long banks of gravel glittered among the whirlpools, the section where the valley was the widest had room for gun emplacements, command posts, field dressing stations, and ammunition depots. At those spots, the road had been churned by the wheels into thick yellow-brown mire that seemed bottomless. Parts of horses and cars projected from it. Rows of tents and huts had been built a little higher up the slope. Bluish smoke hovered over them and Russian or Turkoman prisoners could be seen splitting wood in front of their doors. The scene gave the impression of a caravansary that had been built at the edges of a wide current of thick silt. The nature of this material and its dull hue conveyed the essence of lethargic, creeping activity. Streaks of flame blazed up amidst all this as our artillery fired on a battalion position the Russians had breached that morning. Columns of herded animals and processions of bearers with Asiatic faces crept through the morass. Among them was a large number of Armenians, with their dark penetrating eyes, large hooked noses, and olive skin, often heavily pockmarked. You could also see the Mongol types of the Turkomans, with their smooth black hair and occasionally, with the beautiful, tall physiques of the Caucasian tribes like the Gruzinians and Georgians. A few individuals shuffled by so wearily that one could see their near-fatal exhaustion. Strubelt actually told me that some of them would lie still in holes in the earth in order to expire like animals. We turned away from the valley and drove farther into the winter forest, climbing gradually. High mountain peaks were visible in passing as they shone briefly. Some of them were in Russian hands. In other words, we were visible, but in this region, the enemy is saving his ammunition he must carry with such great effort through the mud to the gun emplacements. For a moment, a plane appeared and then veered away abruptly when two grey clouds of smoke materialized near it. As the pilot banked, the underside of his aircraft shone like the silver belly of a trout displaying two Soviet stars in place of its red spots. We stopped at the Elizabeth Polsky Pass near a small cemetery, actually just a group of graves. For one of these, the grave of an anti-aircraft gunner, his comrades had constructed a fence of slender yellow shell casings by hand. These were arranged like those bottles sometimes seen stuck bottom up into the earth along the edges of our own garden beds. Nearby the last resting places of three soldiers from the Corps of Engineers had been lovingly fenced with garlands of oak leaves strung in makeshift rows. The grave of a Turkoman bearer was marked by a wooden post with a foreign inscription, perhaps a verse from the Quran. We ascended the north side of the mountain where a layer of new snow had thawed overnight and frozen again. The new crystal formations produced patterns of broad needles that glistened with a bluish tint. After driving up the mountain for three quarters of an hour, we reached the ridge, which revealed a view of a sea of forested mountains for miles around. The closest ones had mossy green coloration that came from the lichen covering the bare branches. The blue mountain ranges got darker and darker, and behind them rose the snow-capped peaks, with their ashen slopes and sharp crags. 
Opposite us towered Mount Indiuk with a long ridge ending sharply in twin peaks and connecting to a domed ridge. A white cone rose up behind it. On our flank to the right, the Gora Sarai towered upward to a Russian observation post in position at the summit. For that reason, we retreated back into the undergrowth when we unfolded our white maps. We had reached the ridge at a point where an artillery lieutenant had been directing the fire toward the spot where the Russians had broken through that morning. Far down behind us from the dense forest floor, the deep roar of the large guns could be heard. Then their shells spiraled up over our heads, their shrill whistles slowly fading into the distance and finally dying out in the green valleys with the dull barely audible reports of their impacts. White clouds then billowed up from the conifer groves and hung suspended in the humid air for a long time. We watched this activity for a while across the broad expanse. Afterward, I walked a bit on the south slope, which was protected from view by dense tree growth. The sun warmed its ridge and dappled the pale foliage as if it were a beautiful spring day. The north side was covered with beech trees. These had grown a layer of moss from all the rain and bore a lush growth of black crescent shaped tinder fungus. But here on this side, the oak trees predominated. Plants also flourished, such as large bushes of hellebore beside delicate alpine violets with their light, spotted leaves on a purple background. It reminded me of home, I felt as though I had often been on such oak covered slopes. The Caucasus is not only an ancient wealth of peoples, languages, and races, it also preserves animals, plants, and topography of far-flung regions from Europe and Asia. Memories awaken in these mountain ranges. The meaning of the earth seems more palpable, just as the minerals and precious stones are more visible, and water here springs from its source. Uransky. The 16th of December 1942 inspected our position above Shormian with 1st Lieutenant Hausler. At the outset, we accompanied General Vogel as far as the field headquarters of Regiment 228. We reached this by climbing up a steep and narrow depression made by the meltwater as it ripped deep into the forest floor. On each side, Huts were pasted into the clay like swallows' nests showing only their front walls facing outward. Inside, these were close and dirty, but brick stoves radiated good heat. There is no lack of wood in this ocean of forests. We then climbed through the dense but leafless woods and stayed on a path that had been trodden deep into the brown mud by the pack animals and their guides. Walking was difficult, the path had recently come under rocket fire. and one hit had killed one of the animals, a lovely little dark brown horse that lay dead in the mire. Dark blood had flowed into yellowish clay-colored pools of water left by its hoof prints and settled there, undiluted. The trees, mostly oaks, were thickly covered with liverwort, and thick, silvery-green tresses hung from their branches like beards. These gave the forest a soft, swaying quality. In the winter sunlight, the woodpeckers and the agile nuthatches flitted from trunk to trunk as squawking jays flew around. These last, a local Caucasian variant recognizable by the black crests atop their heads, animated the forest. Yet I still felt that the zeitgeist was trying to extinguish all beauty in us. We perceive it as if we were gazing out through the bars of prison windows. We climbed upward along a trail that had been blazed in order to reach a high elevation emplacement that jutted out like a nose. Neither barbed wire nor any continuous trench demarcated it from no man's land. All that was visible was a group of molehills scattered through the forest. Each of these hills concealed a small shelter, an excavated hole that had been shored up with tree trunks and then covered in earth. Here and there a tarpaulin had been spread on top, providing only inadequate protection from the rain. The company commander, a young Tyrolean from Kufstein, showed us around his domain. Close by on the other slope, the Russians had dug in. We could make out one of their pillboxes from a minor variance in coloration from the grey green shimmer of the forest floor. As if to prove the point, a loud volley of gunfire whipped across in our direction. The only bullets we heard distinctly were those that whistled as they ricocheted through the branches. 
one of them tore the sight off a machine gun. We jumped into the foxholes for cover and let the storm pass over. Such situations make me recognize both their half comical and half upsetting aspects. I have long since passed the age, or better said the condition, when I find such things amusing and immediately try to outdo them. In order to smoke out our foxholes, the Russians had hauled an armor piercing artillery piece up the mountain. The small shells exploded on impact within the target areas, causing many casualties. Countless trees that had been shorn off at mid height bore witness to their force. It was dull, melancholy, and dank. After the sleepless night, most of the unit was lying down asleep, individual sentries were scanning the forest. Others were polishing the fresh rust off their weapons. A short fellow from Thinia had soaked himself from head to foot and was having a comrade slowly pour warm water over his body. I spoke with these men, who have landed here at the end of the world. They have taken part in the difficult offensive and fought their way forward through these mountains step by step, only to dig themselves in here when the force of the thrust diminished. They have been holding their position under fire and without relief for a long time. Casualties, direct hits, sicknesses like those brought on by exhaustion and damp, deplete their numbers each day, numbers that were low at the outset. They are truly living on the edge of existence. During the descent to Shormian, we again passed by the horse we had seen that morning. In the meantime, it had been butchered down to its bones and small intestines. Turkoman soldiers perform this duty, eaters of horse flesh in huge quantities whose yellow faces could be seen bending over canisters full of bubbling goulash. Shormian was badly battle scarred, it comes under fire daily. One hit is enough to dismantle the huts like houses of cards so that their construction can be studied, four walls whose flimsy timbers have been covered with a mixture of clay and cow dung, the roofs are covered with wooden shingles split paper thin. Two pieces of furniture protrude from the ruined ground plans. The large stone oven and the metal bed frame. This town is a way station for our vehicles. Stretcher bearers carry the wounded down from the mountains to this point. A cemetery with crosses damaged by shelling is evidence that this first station has taken already taken its deadly toll. At a wound dressing station, one of the reconstructed huts, we met Dr. Fuchs performing the duties of both doctor and soldier. He hospitably invited us to eat with him. The place is not marked because the Red Cross means nothing here. Just yesterday a rocket struck the adjoining house, severely injuring a stretcher bearer. The wounded come in intermittent batches once the battle picks up, and then there's a lot to do. The injured leave the woods at dark and arrive in a state of extreme exhaustion, some even dying on the way. This morning, for example, the doctor heard a cry outside, please come help me. He found a soldier with outstretched hands who had collapsed into the mud and lacked the strength to get up by himself. After eating, our host treated us to a cup of coffee and a piece of Christmas cake that his wife had sent him. We then took our leave from this unassuming helper, whose shelter even had a cultivated air about it a trait that people of character seldom lose. On the subject of mythology, the secret of the Odyssey and its influence lies in the fact that it is a metaphor for life's journey. The image of Scylla and Charybdis conceals a primeval configuration. The man burdened by the wrath of the gods moves between two dangers, each more terrible than the other. In these cauldron battles, he seems to stand between death in battle and death in captivity. He finds he is forced into the tortuous narrow gap between the two. Dot if a great poet of our age ever wanted to express how human beings long for peace when they are pushed to the limits of destruction, he would have to write a continuation of the Odyssey as a new epic or as an idyll, Odysseus with Penelope. Uransky, the 18th of December 1942 walk to the Gora Sarai, a peak whose summit the Russians occupy. Sarai, a word of Tatar origin means barn, and Gora is Russian for mountain. I got this explanation from a young interpreter, whom Hausler had brought along to carry a machine gun because the region is rife with partisans. He is German-Russian, descended from Swabian emigrants. 22 His parents lived as prosperous farmers in the Crimea near Eupatoria. 
as Kuliks, 23 they were deported to Omsk in Siberia and forced to leave their 8 year old son behind. He has not heard anything from them since 1936. We climbed up the mountain through a dense mixed forest growth of young oaks, aspens, and beeches. At times, we made our way through bushes with pink and bright green branches as well as little islands in marshes with tall stands of cattails hung with brown cotton fluff. On the way, a corporal carrying an axe joined us. He was out hunting for a Christmas tree. After an ascent of two hours, we reached the ridge that concealed a row of pillboxes behind it. The sentries were positioned slightly higher so they could see down into the valley on the other side. We inspected their line, which had been drawn up very carelessly. There was a gaping hole in the right flank, then came a battalion of Turkoman troops. Here the corporal crept forward with his axe and returned after an hour with a beautiful fir tree. Its needles showed pale growth lines on their undersides. We rested at the quarters of the company commander, who then took us to an elevated point where two weeks ago the Russians had been able to break through. In doing so, they had slaughtered all the men. The graves along the heights were crowned with crosses that had been planted with Christmas roses, hellebore. From the, the summit was visible, a bare peak with bunkers in the nearby undergrowth. At that moment a cluster of rockets hit the earth with a loud explosion. It startled an enormous eagle that soared in lazy circles over the chaos. During the descent following this, Hausler briefed us about an execution of partisans. Behind us I heard the interpreter laughing, so I studied him a bit more closely. I thought I could tell from his features, the parchment texture of his skin, the grim look in his eyes that he was the type of person who longs for such bloodshed. The mechanical habit of killing produces the same ravages in the facial features that mechanical sexuality does. Visit General Vogel for tea, he sent me back to Kerensky with a bodyguard. Just yesterday after dark, two couriers were ambushed, shot, and their corpses stripped to their shirts. Navajinsky, the 19th of December 1942 departure at noon for the field headquarters of the 97th Division. The commander, General Rupp, was waiting for me at the demolished bridge over the Shish. We crossed the silted river of yellow clay in an inflatable dinghy. We had to cross a steep mountain ridge in order to reach staff headquarters because an explosion had made a tunnel through the mountain impassable. We wriggled our way through dense undergrowth, and then crossed over cliffs through Hart's Tongue Fern, which had opened its long tender leaves. We encountered hundreds of Russian and Asiatic bearers on the narrow path. They were laden with rations, equipment, and ammunition. On the descending slope lay a dead man with long black hair on his face. He was covered with clay from his head to his feet, which had been robbed of their boots. He was barely distinguishable from the mud. The general leaned down over him and then, without a word, continued on his way. Despite any imaginable comment to the contrary, I have never seen a dead body more out of place than here. Flotsam on a loveless sea. Back in the valley, we again came to the shish. The towering railroad bridge had been blown up here as well. High water had rammed driftwood against it, moving the huge structure downstream. Among its trestles hung trees, wagons, gun carriages, and even a dead horse dangling by its halter among the branches of an oak tree. Set among these titanic dimensions, the animal looked as tiny as a drowned cat. The staff was quartered in a station master's house. I sat beside the general, who was affable, shy, and a bit melancholy. I had the feeling that despite a few peculiarities, he was loved by his officers. Like Chikikov among the landowners and dead souls, I am driving around with the generals and observing their metamorphosis into workers. One has to abandon the hope that any traits of a Sulla or Napoleon might develop from this class. They are specialists in the area of command technology and as interchangeable and expendable as the next best worker at a machine. Spent the night in the blockhouse of the ordnance officer. The gaps between the heavy oak beams are packed with moss. Three bedsteads, a card table, and a desk. Two telephones ring in brief succession. Outside a sloshing, 
scraping sound is audible, people and animals are slogging through the mud. A Russian prisoner cowers by the stove, an Ivan and puts wood on the fire when it dies down. Navajinsky, the 20th of December 1942 climbed with major wire order to an observation point placed high above the valley. In the soggy mist, we passed through clearings of mighty beaches with patches of black fungus on their bark. Among these towered oaks and wild pear trees with light grey crackled trunks. The trail had been marked by blazes on the trees, our steps through the viscous mud exposed the flat tubers of the cyclamen. Once we had reached our objective, a hut concealed underneath cut branches, we lit a small fire and trained our field glasses on the wooded area. Dense, heavy mists curled through the valleys, obscuring our sight but at the same time making the contours as distinct as on a relief map. Our field of vision was cut off by the highest parts of the watershed. The position at the foot of Mount Indiuk, which towered up to the right with its twin peaks and steep ridge, had come under fire today. To the left is the tallest peak, Mount Samashko, giving a view of the Black Sea. This was under German control but had to be abandoned because it was too hard to supply. The access points to such peaks soon become littered with the corpses of bearers and pack animals. Up on a bare snow covered batch, the field glasses picked out a small group of Russians apparently crawling around aimlessly in one direction and then another like ants. Resisting this impression, I saw men for the first time as though through a telescope pointed at the moon. Thought. During World War I, we would have been permitted to fire at them. Navajinsky, the 21st of December 1942 Early departure along the Shish Valley with Norse Tire. The trees along the highest ridges were covered with hoarfrost. From afar, the branches stand out from the mass of darker growth in the valleys as if dusted with silver powder. How remarkable that a small deviation of a couple of degrees from the norm is a sufficient difference to create such enchantment. There is something about this that gives help both to living and dying. We rested upon reaching Captain Mergena, the commander of a combat unit. His combat position turned out to be a White House set alone like a forester's hut in a mud choked clearing. In the midst of this wasteland scattered with the detritus of war, I noticed a number of neatly tended graves that had been especially decorated for Christmas with holly and mistletoe. The farmstead was surrounded by deep craters, but its inhabitants had not yet moved out. The contrast between warm rooms and hostile marshlands is all too great. The combat unit of the 26 year old commander consisted of a battalion of engineers, a company of bicycle infantry, and a few other units. After a cup of coffee, we made the ascent to the position defended by the Corps of Engineers Battalion. Here I found the conditions somewhat better than in the other sections. Some modest barbed wire was strung between the sentry posts along the steep ridge between the trees. In front of this a triple row of mines was set out. Laying mines, especially at night, is dangerous business. In order to be found again, the mines must be laid out in a pattern. They also have to be well concealed, because it happens that the Russians sometimes dig them up and bury them in front of their own positions. The S mine is the type generally used here. 24 went triggered, the device is launched into the air to approximately a man's height where it then explodes. The trigger mechanism is either a tripwire activated by a footfall or by contact with the three wires that project from the earth like feelers. Their zone is paced off very cautiously especially in the dark, but things often happen anyway. As an example, a while ago, a cadet was checking the mines with a corporal. They kept their eyes on the tension wire but did not notice that this had frozen to a clump of earth, which pulled the wire away when the cadet stepped on it. The corporal shouted, look out, smoke, and threw himself on the ground. He survived, but the explosion ripped his companion apart. Before the mine springs upward, it makes a hissing noise for a few seconds, just enough time to get down. Sometimes the fuse can also be set off by rabbits or foxes, as happened a few weeks ago when a great stag that had been rutting in the valley for a long time was blown up. Captain Abd, with whom I talked about these things, 
recently stepped on a mine himself and threw himself down on the ground. He was not hit, because this one had not been placed according to my instructions, as he added. An old Prussian would have enjoyed that additional comment. The position was thus more secure, but the men were nonetheless thoroughly exhausted. Three men are sheltered in each of the tunnels connected to a small combat position. One of them does sentry duty, then comes the work detail, getting rations, maintaining the trenches, laying mines, cleaning weapons, and cutting wood. All this with no respite since the end of October under heavy fire in a position established after a period of long and intense fighting. It was easy to see that there had been a lot of shooting in the woods. The forest was pockmarked with many shell craters, new ones as well, which looked freshly greased on the bottom, the earth was rippled at their edges. Inside these hung a knot of mist. The tops of the trees were lopped off. Because the Russians do not spare their rockets. One or another of the lookout patrols always gets picked off. Visited the battalion commander, Captain Sperling, in his shelter framed in oak timbers. Rougher tree trunks supported the ceiling. Two crude cots, shelves on the walls with canned goods on them, as well as cooking utensils, weapons, blankets, field glasses. The commander was fatigued, unshaven, looking like someone who had tossed and turned all night. He had been jumping from tree to tree in the dark, sodden forest, waiting for an attack while the rocket launchers churned up the dirt and ripped down the treetops. 25 one dead, one wounded, so it went night after night. Our own artillery had even dropped a shell behind his own slope position, no talk of being pinned down here. You'll have to answer to me if the shells fizzle out in the trees. And so, the classic exchange between artillery and infantry, Nobody grouses anymore. They're getting apathetic. That worries me. He talks about his ceiling made of beams that can withstand shells but not survive heavy rocket fire. Losses, it has happened that some days we don't have any. Sickness, rheumatism, jaundice, kidney infection, which makes the extremities swell, the troops die as they march to the field dressing station. I heard all these conversations in World War I. But in the meantime, the suffering has become more dismal, more compulsory, and is rather the rule than the exception. We find ourselves here in one of those great bone mills that have been familiar since Sebastopol and the Russo-Japanese War. 26 The technology, the world of automatons, must converge with the power of the earth and its ability to suffer in order to give rise to this sort of thing. By contrast, Verdun, the Somme, and Flanders 27 are mere episodes. It is impossible for such images to affect other areas such as air and sea combat. Ideologically, this Second World War is completely distinct from the first. It is probably the greatest confrontation about free will since the Persian Wars. 28 and again the fronts have been drawn up completely differently from the way they look on the map. Germans lost World War I together with the Russians and it could be that they will lose the second along with the French. Descent around 12 o'clock. In order to target the men going for rations, the artillery started to pepper the ravines with concentrated shelling, causing Sperling some apprehension about his own shelter. The barrage sounded truly massive, like mountain ranges breaking apart and collapsing with a crash. Back through the Shish Valley. A figure of mud lay on the riverbank, a dead Russian face down his head resting on his right arm as if he were asleep. I saw his blackened neck and hand. The corpse was so swollen that the mud was caked on it like the pelt of a seal or the skin of a big fish. And so there he lay, no better than a drowned cat, a disgrace. In the Urals, in Moscow, or in Siberia, a wife and children have been waiting for him for years. Following this, our own discussion of that topic gave me the opportunity to marvel again at the general numbing process, even among educated people. Individuals have the feeling of being passive participants, enmeshed in a huge mechanism. In the evening, I read a strange phrase in the military communique that mentions the danger of a threat to the flanks. This is likely to be a reference to the threat against Rostov, 
for that is without doubt the strategic target of the Russian attacks. 29 There is always the prospect of being caught up in mass catastrophes like a fish trapped with its school in a net cast by a distant hand. Yet it is up to us whether we too shall suffer mass death, death dominated by fear. Uransky, the 22nd of December 1942 returned to Kurinsky in the morning. I again passed the railroad bridge that had been washed downstream. The dead horse, so tiny in the distance, still hung on one of the trees that decorated the structure like bouquets of flowers. The middle plank of a wooden walkway had just broken where gun carriages were crossing so that a draft horse plunged through the opening and dangled in its harness with its head just above the rough waves. For a few long moments its nostrils kept being submerged in the water while up above the agitated drivers were scrambling around helplessly. Then a corporal with bayonet drawn sprang down onto the bridge from the bank and slashed through the straps, letting the animal tumble into the water and swim to safety. An aura of unease, of abnormality lay over the place, a mood of crisis. Crossed the ridge with the tunnel again. Omar, a good natured Azerbaijani who had been looking after me for the past few days, followed with my gear. The dead bearer was still lying there in the mud even though many hundreds of men had passed him by every day. The display of corpses seems to be part of the system, I don't mean the human system, but that of the daimon who rules over such places. That tightens the reins. A bit farther up, I saw two new dead bodies, one of which had been stripped to his underwear. He was lying in the stream, his powerful chest protruding, blue from the frost. His right arm was crooked behind his head, as though he were sleeping, on his skull glistened a bloody wound. For all I could tell, people had tried to rob the shirt off the other corpse too, but without success. Yet it had been pulled up far enough here to reveal a small, pallid entry wound near the heart. Mountain troops with heavy packs hurried past, and lines of bearers loaded with beams, coils of wire, rations, and ammunition. None of them had shaved in a long time, they were all caked with mud, and the odor of humanity emanated from them, people who had been strangers to soap and water for weeks. They barely glanced at the corpses, but they start with fright when a shot from a heavy mortar down below resounds like a boom out of a large empty kettle. Interspersed were pack animals that had wallowed in muck like great rats with clotted pelts dot on the cable car across the shish. At great height on a narrow board swinging over the river, both fists clenched around a cable, I comprehend the landscape like a picture in one of those moments that goes deeper than any painting. The little ripples down below take on something stiff and eternally frozen in time, a bit like the pale edges of the scales on the body of a snake. I am swaying next to one of the tall bridge abutments with Romanesque windows that remain standing like a shattered tower. An office appears out through one of the fissures in the way people look out of those hollow eggs in Bosch paintings and glimpse bizarre machines. The officer is calling numbers over to the crew of a heavy cannon. Down below, the artillerymen are visible around a grey monster, then they stand back and cover their ears as a red tongue of flame flashes through the air. Immediately afterward, the head calling out numbers emerges from the wall again. Injured men with bright white bandages are ferried across the river and then taken on stretchers to the ambulances, which have driven up en masse. Their red crosses have been camouflaged. Like ants, hundreds and thousands of bearers in long lines bring forward planks and wire. Through all this, melodies of Christmas carols in a supernatural voice fill the enormous cauldron. A propaganda unit's loudspeaker is playing Silent Night, Holy Night. And accompanying this, the constant furious pounding of mortar shelling echoes through the mountains. Uransky, the 23rd of December 1942 in the evening, Demart brought the first mail from Maykop, a parcel containing Christmas cake, the holiday bread baked by Perpetua with hazelnuts from the vicarage garden. Included were letters from her from mother, from Carl Schmidt. He writes about nihilism, which he equates with fire when he considers the four elements. Nihilism, he says, is the urge to be incinerated in crematoria. These ashes then produce the phoenix, 
that is to say a realm of the air. Carl Schmitt is among the few people who try to assess the process in categories that are not entirely short-sighted, such as the national, the social, and the economic arguments. Blindness increases with awareness, humans move in a labyrinth of light. They no longer know the power of darkness. Who can even imagine the scale? whose delight requires dramatic effects like those I witnessed yesterday while hanging from my cable. Immensity is triumphantly enthroned at its center. It is obvious that at some level a deep enjoyment is derived from these hells. Reading matter, Der Wolf by Lons, a book I haven't read since childhood. 30 I found a copy here in one of the bunker libraries. Despite its crude and woodcut-like style, traces of the old sagas of the old nomos, shape the description.31 I am engrossed by the book because the plot is set nearby, actually not far from Kirchhorst. Then read further in Ezekiel. The vision that introduces his book conceals an insight into the structure of the world. This transcends the boldest thoughts, the most elevated works of art. We enter the region of absolute concepts and explore them in a state of ecstasis. 32 In this tangible model is revealed the luster of the world and its overworlds. Uransky, the 24th of December 1942 Dreams last night. I had long talks with Friedrich Georg and others, and I was showing him around Paris. One of them, a short fellow from Saxony, all people possess the capacity to lead happy lives but they just never make use of it. Walk into the Shish Valley after breakfast to spend a little time for a short beetle hunt. Such activity serves to preserve my dignity, as a symbol of my free will in the world. Celebrate it Christmas in the afternoon. As we did so, we saluted the troops of the 6th Army. If they were to be defeated by this encirclement, then the entire southern portion of the front would start to crumble. That would correspond exactly to what Spadell predicted to me last spring as the probable consequence of a Caucasus offensive. He said it would open an umbrella, meaning that it would lead to the construction of huge fronts with narrow points of access. In the evening, we got together in the little space that Captain Dix had set up in town in the former bathhouse. Leather seats from a bus are arranged around the smoker's table. The colossal wooden wheel of a Russian artillery piece hangs from the ceiling as a chandelier. The occasional chirp of a cricket, gentle and dreamlike, comes from the walls of the immense stove now and then. We ate roast duck and had sweet Crimean champagne to go with it. I soon withdrew to my Cossack hut to devote myself to studying the extensive correspondence that Demart had delivered to me during the party. The most important contents were four letters from Perpetua. Friedrich Georg writes about a trip to Freiburg and conversations with the professors there who observe the passage of time from their alemannic retreats. Grunert writes about the Amurus, foxtail lily, and lilies and lets me know that he is sending some beautifully blossoming Liam species. His letter contains a marginal note referring to the Magister and a meeting with him in a London pub just before the outbreak of war. Claus Valentina writes about our circle of friends in Paris. Two letters from people I didn't know contain references to authors, one of them to Sir Thomas Brown, who lived from 1605 to 1681, the other to Justice Mark Ord and his work Jebby Tynes and Glorbigen, Prayers of an Unbeliever. A photocopy of a will informs me that another unknown correspondent who used to write to me, but who in the meantime has been killed in action has designated me as the heir of his literary remains. There is also a strange message from a Dr. Bloom from Monchen Gladbach about a passage that he read in my garden Unstrassen, Gardens and Streets. In the description of Domremy, I mention the grave monument of a Lieutenant Trainers, who was killed there on the 26th of June 1940. I am now told that this young officer had been a horticultural genius an enthusiastic breeder of fine fruits and flowers, preferring the Amaryllis above all others. Surpassing even the Dutch gardeners, he was often able to achieve eight huge blossoms on one stem, from the purest white to the deepest crimson, and wrote about all of his flowers in a journal. Bloom believes it was no accident that I memorialized this rare person, and I agree with him. In addition, letters from Spadell, Staple, Hall. 
Gruninja, and Freyhold, who tells me that he is going to send me a salmon from the coast of Finland. Strange, how the game of cat's cradle keeps playing out in life even in the midst of carnage. If there were no more mail deliveries, we would have to confide in the ether.uransky, the 25th of December 1942 in the morning, I attended a service of a young Catholic cleric who performed his office superbly. Then took communion from the Protestant pastor, also a young corporal, who distributed it with great dignity. Following this, went to the shish to hunt for beetles. In a rotten tree stump found a nest of diperis bolti, darkling beetles, with red femurs, this is the Caucasian aberration. The study of insects has consumed much time in my life, but you have to see such things as an arena where you can practice the art of precise differentiation. These provide insight into the most delicate features of the landscapes. After forty years, one learns to read wing covers as texts, like a Chinese scholar who knows a hundred thousand ideograms. Armies of schoolmasters and pedants devised the system, work that took nearly two hundred years. Visited the Mernaya ravine in the afternoon with First Lieutenant Strubelt, one of Hilsha's intelligent pupils. When our conversation came around to the predicament of the Sixth Army, I became aware of a bond that had never before seemed so clear, in these cauldrons, each and every one of us is melted down and remolded, even if he is not physically present. Accordingly, neutrality does not exist. We struggled in the fog through the stands of oak and wild pear trees that envelop the low hilltops in thick forestation. On one of these slopes we came upon a cluster of graves. Among them was that of Herbert Gogol, killed here as a private in the Corps of Engineers on the 4th of October 1942. The sight of these crosses in this primeval, foggy, wet forest interwoven with grey lichen, filled me with deep sadness at so much anguish. Thought, they have huddled together here like children in the sinister enchanted forest. Apsheronskaya, the 27th of December 1942 in Apsheronskaya for two or three days in order to bathe here and have things repaired that were badly damaged by the mountain walking. The place has been taken over by supply and relief troops and also field hospitals enclosed by a rapidly expanding wreath of cemeteries. We sow the ground profusely with our dead. Many of those buried here must have died of epidemics, a fact I conclude from the doctor's names that appear frequently on the crosses. I answer my mail in the evening. I stop working when a nearby loudspeaker started up. This kind of disturbance has become more and more outrageous since the days when Luther threw his inkwell at a blowfly. I find that they create acoustic images similar to the visual ones found on the great pictures of temptation by Bosch, Bruegel, and Granache. These brazen, underworld noises, demonic grunts, intrude upon intellectual work like the laughter of fauns peering over the edges of cliffs into the landscape, or like the mad cheers resounding from the depths of the elves' caves. What's more, it can't be turned off. That would be sacrilege. Upsheronskaya, the 28th of December 1942, walked to the opposite bank of the Shish across a long narrow suspension bridge that swayed from two cables like vines. At this point, the river is broader than upstream in the mountains, its beautiful stone green water flows along a bed of dark slate with vertical striations. Magnificent stretches of woods extend along the other bank. I came upon a settlement of grey wooden houses where smoke emerged from ramshackle shingle roofs and, in spite of the cold, women sat in front of them busying themselves beside little stoves that had been set up outdoors. The settlement seemed medieval, barely spawned from the earth, a world of wood and clay. Add to this the machines, so important here, that were allotted to the white men in America. And so I noticed a sawmill. All around it for quite a distance the forest had been cut down to the ground. Such a sight makes clear the devouring and gluttonous aspect that Friedrich Georg has described in his Illusions of Technology. This runs its course as long as it has natural resources and leaves behind a soil weakened and forever infertile. We lack minds like that of old Marwitz, 
men who will ensure that we take only from the increase of the earth and not from its capital. Cuties, the 29th of December 1942 dreams last night, among other things, I was thumbing through a history of this war, which was arranged systematically. It contained a paragraph on declarations of war dealing with several types, beginning with the simple invasion and including the performance of significant ceremonies. Departure in the morning, initially from the railroad station in Miak and then via Usfilti and Gurazais to Qutais. From Gurazais onward, I used a truck because the deep tracks had made the road impassable for light vehicles. It had frozen, but the pressure of the wheels soon thawed the top layer making the surface resemble a piece of buttered bread. Then came the slopes, potholes, and other obstacles that forced us to push the vehicle through the muck. The driver, a sway by and from Eslingen, was a man of choleric temperament who took all these hardships very much to heart, if you have any feelings at all for a vehicle, you could just weep. Now and again he would let out particularly strong sighs, poor little truck, referring to this enormous behemoth.33 forest enveloped our route, choking it off in places with long green ropes of moss hanging from the branches. The road passed by the ruined drilling towers and other demolished facilities of the oil fields. We could see individuals staggering among the wreckage like ants. Cuties. The 30th of December 1942 This place resembles a mud hole with plank walks connecting individual points with each other, such as the staff quarters, the field hospitals, and the mess. Except for these paths any effort made to get around is almost futile. As a result, deaths from exhaustion are not uncommon. The deluge of sludge even penetrates the interiors of the buildings. In the morning, I was in a field hospital that rose from the center of a yellowish-brown morass. As I entered, the casket of a first lieutenant was being carried toward me. Yesterday he succumbed to his sixth wound of this war. Back in Poland, he had sacrificed an eye. Under such conditions you must try to secure at least the three most basic requirements for comfort, to be warm, dry, and fed. This had been accomplished. The patients in their heated shelters could be seen dozing in apathetic groups. Exposure to the cold is the leading cause of ailments, especially in their severest forms like kidney and lung infections. Frostbite was prevalent, caused here by the constant soaking and evaporation even at temperatures above freezing. You get the feeling that every last bit has been drained from the troops. Their bodies completely lack any reserves meaning that a mere flesh wound can be fatal because the body lacks the capacity to heal. There are also fatal cases of diarrhea. The countless mines that still carpet this town continue to do damage. For example, recently a Russian was found at the edge of the road with his legs blown off. Because detonators were discovered on him, he was immediately executed, a gesture that may have mingled humanity with bestiality but which correlates with the decline in our ability to discriminate moral categories. The realm of death becomes a depository, there we stick anything that seems upsetting where it won't be seen again. But that may well be wrong. Cuties. The 31st of December 1942 dreams at night, I was party to a conversation between a lady wearing a riding costume and a middle-aged gentleman. I was carrying on this conversation myself, sometimes as one partner, sometimes as the other, otherwise I just listened. I was individualized in the dialogue. This revealed the true chasm that exists between participant and observer, the unity of this process became clear to me in the vision, then took on a dialectic quality whenever it was my turn to speak. The image captures my situation in general. In the morning, I visited Herr Mayweg, the commander of a unit in the Technical Petroleum Brigade and Shirakaya Bolka. This is the designation for a part military, part technology group, it is their mission to discover, secure, and develop the conquered oil regions. Shirakaya Bolka, meaning the wide ravine, was one of those places that produced considerable quantities. Before their retreat, the Russians were extremely thorough in destroying all oil wells and other equipment. They filled the drill holes with cement reinforced with pieces of iron, springs, screws, and old drill bits. 
They also submerged iron mushroom shaped devices. When these are drilled and lifted up, they spread out and tear apart the mechanism. After a lengthy conversation, we mounted horses and rode across the terrain. With its toppled drilling towers and exploded boiler houses, it looked like those containers for old iron that plumbers have. Rusted, bent, dismantled pieces lay scattered around and among them stood the blasted machines, boilers, tanks. To get anywhere with this chaos would have been depressing. Here and there across the terrain one saw a lone man or a troop wandering around as if they were in the middle of a puzzle that had been dumped out on the floor. Fresh mine craters gaped, especially over near the drilling towers. The sight of sappers looking for mines as they carefully poked the soil with their pointed iron forks awakened the oppressive feeling that comes when the earth can no longer be trusted. But I still had my good horse under me. At lunch, we drank Caucasian wine and discussed the vast topic of how long the war might last. Mayweg had lived ten years as an oil engineer in Texas and was of the opinion that the war with Russia would create a new Limes, Frontier 34, and also play itself out against America, but at the price of the English and French empires. I countered by saying that it is precisely the violence of the war that contradicts this. The still undecided conclusion would be the worst imaginable. The widespread prognosis of an infinite continuation derives essentially from a lack of imagination. It occurs to people who see no way out. Detail Russian prisoners Mayweg had selected from all the various camps to work on the reconstruction drilling technicians, geologists, local oil workers. A combat unit had been commandeered at a railroad station as bearers. There were 500 men, of these 350 died along the roads. From the rest, another 120 died from exhaustion when they returned so that only 30 survived. New Year's Eve party at staff headquarters in the evening. Here again I saw that during these years any pure joy of celebration is not possible. On that note General Muller told about the monstrous atrocities perpetrated by the security service after entering Kiev. Trains were again mentioned that carried Jews into poison gas tunnels. Those are rumors, and I note them as such, but extermination is certainly occurring on a huge scale. This put me in mind of the wife of good old Potard 35 back in Paris, who was so worried about his wife. When you have been party to such individual fates and begun to comprehend the statistics that apply to the wicked crimes carried out in the charnel houses, 36 an enormity is exposed that makes you throw up your hands in despair. I am overcome by a loathing for the uniforms, the epaulets, the medals, the weapons, all the glamour I have loved so much. Ancient chivalry is dead, wars are waged by technicians. Mankind has thus reached the stage described by Dostoevsky in Rascal Nikov. 37 He views people like himself as vermin. That is precisely what he must guard against if he is not to sink to the level of the insects. That terrible old saying applies to him as well as to his victims, this is you. I then went outside where the stars shone brightly and the artillery shells streaked like sheet lightning against the sky. The eternal symbols and signs, the Great Bear, Orion, Vega, the Pleiades, the Band of the Milky Way. What are we human beings and our earthly years before such glory? What is our fleeting torment? At midnight, through the noise of the carousers, I vividly recalled my loves and felt their greetings touch me. 1943 Apsheronskaya the 1st of January 1943 Prophetic New Year's Dreams, I was waiting in a large inn, discussing other travellers' luggage with a doorman who had silver embroidered keys on his uniform. He told me that they were embarrassed to admit they did not wish to be separated from their bags because these signified more than just containers for their possessions. Their contents included the rest of their journey and all their reputation and credit. These were like a ship. The last thing we leave behind on an ocean voyage, they were like our own skin. I vaguely understood that the inn was the world and the suitcases, life. For Alexander, I then carved an arrow from a rose shoot so he could use with his bow. 
its tip bore a scarlet bud. Dot got up early for the return journey to Upsheronskaya. The sun shone gloriously on the mountains, and the woods breathed the violet palette of early spring. I was in a good mood as well, like a fencer returning to the arena. The minor, mundane tasks on this first day of the year are more precious, washing, shaving, eating breakfast, and making journal entries, all are symbolic acts of celebration. Three good resolutions. The first, live moderately, because almost all the difficulties in my life have been the result of breaches of moderation. Second, always have a care for unfortunate people. It is an innate human trait not to recognize true misfortune. This goes deeper, we avert our gaze from it, and then sympathy gets neglected. Finally, I want to banish contemplation of individual refuge in this chaos of all potential catastrophes. It is more important to act with dignity. We only secure ourselves shelter at superficial points within a totality that remains concealed from us, and it is precisely such delusions of our own devising that can kill us. The road surface did not seem quite as bottomless as it had on the way here. As a matter of fact, I probably counted 500 people working on it. A further 500 were bringing up supplies on wagons or horses. Such images reflect the gravitational field of the wider area. Within this space, even individual mountains like the Semisho take on the burden of Atlas. Spengler's superb prognosis also came to mind. In Apsheronskaya, Massenbuck and I then met together before taking a walk through the woods. The mountains gleamed white on the horizon. We discussed the atrocities of our age. A third man with us said that he considered them inevitable. He went on, the German petty bourgeoisie had been reduced to a state of panic by the slaughter of the Russian middle class after 1917 and by the execution of millions in the cellars, and this turned them into something horrifying. As a result, something emerged from the right that was an even more hideous threat than when it came from the left. Such discussions clarify how deeply technology has already penetrated the moral sphere. Man feels he is inside a huge machine from which there is no escape. Fear reigns everywhere supreme, be it in obfuscation, grotesque concealment, or all-powerful mistrust. Wherever two people encounter one another, they are suspicious of each other, it begins with their greeting. Make up the 2nd of January 1943 nearly 50 bombs fell on the town during the night. In the morning, I departed for make up. The journey led past troops that had been relieved and were pulling medieval supply carts behind them. Generally speaking, I am reminded more of the Thirty Years' War than of the previous one, not just because of the look of things but also because of the obvious religious questions that loom large. The weather was mild and clear. In the morning, I visited the cultural park where plaster figures of modern supermen were crumbling, and then went to the steep banks of the Belaya. In the afternoon, I was received by General Conrad, commander of the Caucasus Front. He showed me the large situation map and said that the retreat was in preparation. The pounding suffered by the 6th Army had shaken the entire southern flank. He was of the opinion that during the last year, our forces had been squandered by people who understood everything except how to wage war. The general continued saying that their neglect of the concentration of forces was especially dilettantish. Clausewitz would be turning in his grave. People followed their every whim, every fleeting idea, and propaganda goals trumped those of strategy. He said that we could attack the Caucasus, Egypt, Leningrad, and Stalingrad, just not all at once, especially while we were still caught up in secondary objectives. Tebeda. The 3rd of January 1943 when I arrived at the airfield at 8 in the morning, a German reconnaissance plane was just landing. On his morning rounds over Tuby, he had taken an anti-aircraft hit in the left wing, where a hole the size of a watermelon could be seen. Four fighters were then on top of him. The gunner on board put a burst of 20 rounds into his own rudder when he swung his gun into position. In the course of the firefight, a hit from a fixed cannon ripped up the right steering mechanism, and over thirty bullets drilled through the plane. Its grey paint peeled off revealing silver furrows in the metal. 
The fuel tank also showed leaks. The pilot, a first lieutenant, washed out, overtired, inhaling cigarettes, explained that the dogfight that had just taken place. The holes in the fuel tank seal off automatically with a layer of rubber. Discussion about getting out of a burning aircraft. Impossible over Russian territory. It amounts to the same thing whether you shoot yourself in the head when you're up there or wait until you bail out. I then got aboard a Fiesella Storch, 38 a small liaison aircraft with room for the pilot and one passenger. As we gained altitude, the dimensions of the settlement came into focus, equilateral squares of houses surrounding garden plots. We swayed slowly over the ground in that direction. I was delighted to be able to observe birds, like the geese hurrying away in formation or the chickens flapping their wings as they ran for the cover of hedges and fences, their typical reaction in response to an actual stalk. Birds of prey with the wings of sparrow hawks flew away from us, clouds of titmouse and finch shimmered above the landscape of sunflowers. I thought of a conversation I had with my father around 1911. His subject was whether the day would come when human beings in flight above us would cause as little surprise as a flock of cranes. In those days, I had a future-oriented, romantic feeling, as if we still had the age of the dinosaurs ahead of us. That is a trait I have shed. The optics at the center of cataracts is different from the optics used to correct them. All this corresponds to our wishes, our great desires. We put all our energy into them. From the airfield at Cherkesk, we went by car up to the Cuban Valley, one of the grand and solemn plains, before reaching the highlands. Its ice green waters bore glacial flows downstream. The broad gorge was surrounded by brown, serrated peaks, those facing the valley were steep and formed white cliffs with smooth or vertically corrugated faces. These patterns alternated with those resembling organ pipes and others like beautifully folded shapes. Then came canyons with mesas of reddish brown or pink stone in horizontal strata, so that we seemed to be driving past giants masonry. Down below us the broad riverbed with its white, glossy pebbles. In Chumarinsk and other villages, little wooden mosque with their crescent moons dominated the town centers. Mounted shepherds drove their sheep and cows along in front of them. Others led donkeys heavily laden with wood down from the forests. They wore the burqa, the stiff shearling coat native to the people of Karakay. The mountains gradually appeared closer and presented jagged openings that permitted glimpses of the blue white giants of the high mountains. Near Mikoy and Shakar, the seat of the local government rose out of nowhere. The path turns down into the Tebuda Valley. Teboda, a spa town for long ailments, has a veneer of homey comfort, of affluence of the sort one looks for in the valleys of the Harz region or in the Tyrolean Alps. With Colonel von Leswire, who commands a fighting unit of mountain troops, I am a known quantity in the midst of an army of 100,000. He welcomed me cordially into the circle of his small staff. The towering mountains have an invigorating effect, as I have often experienced. They make the blood lighter and freer and communication more candid and comradely. Keeping a journal, the short entries are often as dry as instant tea. Writing them down is like pouring hot water over them to release their aroma. Teboda, the 4th of January 1943 pushed farther into the Teboda Valley, as far as the field headquarters of Captain Schmidt. With his mountain troops, he is blocking two passes up the I used the motorcycle, a vehicle for difficult climbs. The narrow path led between stands of gigantic conifers and upward toward moss covered boulders. A small brook trickled down it beneath the snowdrops encapsulated under domes of ice. On the right, the waters of the Tebuda flowed between pale deposits of screve and with multiple channels, then came the Imanaus, which is fed by the glaciers. I was buoyant with a sort of high altitude intoxication. High above in the Amanaus Gorge stand the wooden buildings of a mountain climbing school as well as a sanatorium. Here Schmidt welcomed me to his headquarters, the ice giants towering above us, to the left the massif of the Domyolgen, then the Kragikaraka Needle, the eastern and the western Belayakaya, 
and between them, the unusual pinnacle of the Suffragio. The sentries securing the passes are stationed on the mighty Amanaus Glacio with its fields of green glare ice, deep fissures, and sparkling crevasses. They still have seven more hours to hike up to their huts of ice and snow. Their path leads among rock falls, avalanches, and grim precipices. Schmidt explained to me that all the mountaineering dangers are dwarfed by those of the war. During a difficult ascent thoughts are concentrated on the enemy. A message had just reached him, Russian scouts had burrowed into position in dugouts in the snow, a firefight was underway. These dugouts are each papered with newsprint and heated by a candle, that is the only trace of comfort. I had planned to stay up here as long as possible and to make forays high into the glacier region. I felt at home and sensed that up in these massifs one more of those great sources lived on, as Tolstoy had felt so powerfully. But as I was discussing the details of my stay with Schmidt, a radio message came from Tebeda ordering immediate retreat. That can only mean that the situation in Stalingrad has deteriorated. The weather has been clear here for weeks but has suddenly become threatening. It was apparent that the warm black sea air was making its way across the passes in eddies and billowing swathes, wafting vapor attached itself to the mountain peaks. I glanced back from the hollow for a last look at these giants, saw their ridges, peaks, precipices. Boldest, highest thoughts, combined with all the dark terrors of power. Such places reveal a blueprint of the world. In Tebedu as well, I found everything in a state of agitation. The first tank division was abandoning its positions, the Caucasus front is in flux. Within days, positions will be abandoned that cost more blood and toil to capture than the brain can comprehend. As a result of the tumult, much will be left behind. The colonel has received the order to explode munitions and destroy supplies. The crosses are also to be removed from the graves and their traces obliterated. Otherwise his mood was philosophical. For example, I wonder who will be pinching Anastasia's bottom a week from now. His remark referred to one of the two serving maids who has been waiting on us at table. They were crying and said that the Russians would slit their throats, whereupon the colonel made room for them in the convoy. Tebeda. The 5th of January 1943 back in the Tebeda Valley again this morning in gentle rain. Who knows when a German's eye will ever gaze on these forests again. I'm afraid that when the war is over large sections of the planet will be hermetically sealed off from each other. I especially wanted to take in the sight of the ancient trees once more. The fact that they are becoming extinct on this planet is the most alarming sign of all. They are not only the mightiest symbols of pristine terrestrial power but also of the ancestral spirit embedded in the wood of our cradles, beds, and coffins. In them is enshrined the sacred life that is lost to man when they are felled. Yet here they still stood erect, mighty firs, their trunks clasped by a thick garment of branches, beeches of shimmering silver, thick barked primeval oaks, and the grey wild bear. I said farewell to these giants like Gulliver before he goes to the land of Lilliput, where gargantian proportions are the product of interpretation rather than natural growth. All this was revealed to me as in a fleeting dream like Christmas marvels glimpsed by a child through a keyhole, yet memory preserves the proportions. We need to know what the world has to offer so that we do not capitulate too easily. Voroshilovsk the 6th of January 1943 arose early for the journey to Voroshilovsk. Thanks to the heavy snowfall, I saw little of Tebeda and then of the Cuban Valley. Trifling, casual thoughts and fantasies, full of intellectual power. I attribute this to the mountain air and to honey, that powerful nectar, the old food not only of the gods but, also, of the hermit and the recluse food I had practically lived on in recent days. If I could only always have enough of it and, in addition, white bread and red wine, then my mental wings would spread like a butterfly apostrophe s. The road was choked with retreating columns. Karuke rode among them in their black coats. They drove their cattle down from the mountain slopes or turned into side valleys. 
people are in a tough spot because they had welcomed the Germans as liberators. If they do not follow the retreat, they will probably have to flee into the impassable mountains in order to escape slaughter. The terrible part is the changing balance of power and the short-term nature of errors that take an ever higher toll in blood. Beyond Cherkesk, the road disappeared completely in the snow as it wound its way between cornstalks and dry sunflower stems. Then these signs gradually petered out too, and the driver followed a wheel track for a long time that was the only visible trail. This led us only as far as a large haystack then made a loop around it and doubled back upon itself. No choice but to go back. A second attempt ended at a river that wound its dark course through the snow desert. Meanwhile, we were losing the daylight and the mist was rising. We finally reached a barn where people had been threshing, and a young lad showed us the way by galloping beside us on horseback. He did not want to get in, as he apparently feared we might not let him go. Back on a deeply rutted track, we reached a slope covered in fine clay as brown and glistening as cocoa butter. We tried to push the car forward, but the wheels spun in place covering us with thick mud from head to foot. A couple of peasants working nearby came to help us and threw their backs into the job. In doing so, their broad shoulders pushed in our car windows as they lifted. Dot. Following this, we tried to drive around the spot with the result that the car broke through a snow-covered layer of ice into a bog hole. I was watching it sink ever deeper when a carter came by, hitched up his horse, and pulled us out of this mess with a rope. We continued to drive through the night as the snowstorm enveloped us with thousands of shining flakes whirled into the field of our headlights and then went dark, as though they had melted away. Arrived late in Voroshilovsk. Our Odyssey gave me an inkling of the power with which the steps assault the mind. This assault suggests a contradiction felt as a dull, paralyzing anxiety, such as I have never felt at sea. Voroshilovsk, the 7th of January 1943. Among the staff officers, I found the mood more depressed than among the troops. This makes sense, because they have an overview of the situation. Cauldron battles produce a frame of mind unknown in earlier wars from our history. Energia sets in when we are about to hit rock bottom. That cannot be a result of the facts, no matter how terrible the prospects are of dying in frost and snow huddled together with masses of the dead and dying. It is rather the mood of people who believe that destruction is absolute. At a higher level staff headquarters, you can hear the rustling of the net being tightened you can observe its mesh closing almost daily. Tempers can be the object of study over weeks as panic sets in gently like placid currents of water predicting the imperceptible but approaching flood. During this phase, people isolate themselves from each other, they fall silent and become reflective as they were during puberty. But the weakest specimens provide evidence of what we can expect. They are the points of least resistance. Like the little first lieutenant I found shaking in a fit of weeping when I went to his office. The populace is also restive. Goods they were hoarding appear on the market, the value of the currency rises. The peasants desire the Russian banknotes because they must stay behind, the city dwellers want the German ones because some of them will accompany the retreat. Similar things were reported by the first tank division and also that some people who had set out with them along with their wives and children dropped behind by the second or third day and are now in a much more dangerous situation than before, their attempt to flee will seal their fate. The Russians are of course trying to blow up bridges and railroads and are deploying numerous troops of saboteurs for this purpose, some infiltrate through gaps in the front, while others are parachuted in. An officer from military intelligence told me details about one such troop of six members, three men and three women. Two of the men were officers in the Red Army and one was a radio operator, one of the women was a radio operator, the other a scout and quartermaster, the third was a nurse. They were captured as they spent the night under the cover of a haystack. They had not been able to complete their mission to blow up bridges, because the parachute carrying the explosives had landed in the village. The women, all high school graduates, had served as soldiers in the Red Army and been assigned to a sabotage course. One day, 
they were told to get ready and to board an aircraft, where they were pushed out behind the German lines without being told their mission. Their equipment consisted of machine guns, even the nurse carried one, a radio, canned rations, dynamite, and a first aid kit. A sign of humanity, during their arrest, one of the girls ran up to a Russian doctor accompanying the mayor and the German soldiers. She tried to embrace him and addressed him as father. She then began to cry and said that he looked just like her own father. The old nihilists of 1905 celebrate their resurrection in such people. Naturally, under different conditions. Their means, their mission, their way of living have remained the same. But nowadays the state provides the explosives. The Roshilovsk, the 8th of January 1943, went to the marketplace early. It was crowded with people. The situation encourages selling, since it's easier to carry money than goods. The food is now sumptuous, the men are wolfing down the supplies. In gardens, I saw soldiers smoking geese, mountains of pork were heaped upon the table. I could sense the whirlwind of terror that announced the approach of the Eastern Army columns. At noon, visited the commander in chief, Colonel General von Klist whom I found anxiously studying his map. Nice to have stepped out of the hubbub of the marketplace right into the center of things. The field marshal's perspective is incredibly oversimplified but at the same time fiendishly detached. The fates of individuals vanish from sight, though they are mentally present. A combination that creates an incredibly oppressive mood. Dot in the ante room, the intelligence officer handed me a telegram, my father is seriously ill. At the same time rumors are circulating that the railway to Rostov has been disrupted. I happened to meet First Lieutenant Krause, with whom I've been in contact from earlier matters, especially since the secret meeting at the Itchhoff.39 he was waiting for a plane from Berlin and offered it to me for my return. While we were discussing this, the Chief of Staff of the Commander-in-Chief sent word to me that a seat was being reserved for me in the courier aircraft scheduled to take off from our Mafia tomorrow morning. A car is leaving for there in two hours. Kiev, the 9th of January 1943 had vivid thoughts of my father during the night flight. I have not seen him since 1940 when I was on leave in Lznig after the campaign in France. I have spoken with him a few times on the phone. Of course. Now in the fatigue of the early morning hour, I saw his eyes beaming in the dark sky, they were large and had a deeper, more vivid blue than ever before, the eyes that are essentially so appropriate to him. I now saw them gazing on me full of love. One day I would like to describe him like a mother possessing male intelligence, with a deeper sense of justice. Rival in our mafia at two o'clock, where I dozed a bit on the full male sacks. Sleepy secretaries were sorting letters and parcels while bombs were falling on the town. In the midst of this restless slumber, the nocturnal side of the war oppressed me. Part of this is just sleeplessness from all those interminable night watches at the front door back home behind the lines. At six o'clock took off in a green painted craft that bore the name Globetrotter and was piloted by a Prince of Coburg Gotha. Two hours later, we were flying over the frozen, green don dotted with white ice flows. The roads were choked with columns of people streaming westward. In Rostov, we landed for a moment on an airfield where swarms of bombers were loading huge projectiles. In Kiev I spent the night in an old hotel that now seemed very comfortable. Everything is relative. I shared my room with an officer from World War I who had come from the Stalingrad cauldron. It seems that there the airfields are under targeted bombardment. They are clogged with destroyed aircraft. Inmates of a large prison camp that used to be part of the compound at first survived by eating horse flesh, then they turned to cannibalism, finally. They died of starvation. People who escape the cauldrons are disfigured, carry scars, perhaps the stigmata of future glory. Lotson. The 10th of January 1943 arrived in Lotzen around noon and immediately booked long distance calls to Gerchhorst and Lznig. At 7 o'clock, I learned from Perpetua that my good father had died, just as I had clearly felt it. He is to be buried in Lznig on Wednesday, 
so I have arrived in time, which is a great comfort. As I have often done in recent days, I spent a long time thinking about him, about his lot in life, his character, his humanity. In a sleeping car, the 11th of January 1943 made some purchases in Lotson, where it was bitter cold. Departure to Berlin in the evening. Colonel Ratk, head of the Department of Military Affairs, was on the train. Conversation about the situation in Rostov, which he considers reparable. Then, about the war in general. After the first three value judgments, one recognizes someone from the other camp and retreats behind polite clichés. Gerchhorst, the 21st of January 1943, looking back. During the trip to Lznig on the 12th of January I noticed the faces of the other travelers. They were pale, artificially bloated, the flesh a temptation for serious, debilitating illness. Most people slept, laid low by extreme exhaustion. The German greeting 40, that most potent symbol of voluntary coercion or coerced volunteering. Individuals give it upon entering or leaving the train compartment, that is to say, when they are discernible as individuals. But amidst the anonymity of crowds this gesture gets no response. During a trip like this, there is ample opportunity to study the nuances that tyranny is capable of. After paying a short visit to my siblings in Lznig, I went straight to the cemetery where the caretaker gave me the key to the mortuary chapel. It was already dusk when I opened the gate. Far in the distance, high and solemn on a bier in an open casket, my father was laid out wearing white tie. I approached slowly and lit the candles to the right and left of his head. I gazed at his face for a long time. It seemed so unfamiliar. The lower portion particularly, the chin and lower lip, were those of someone else, someone I didn't know. When I went to his left side and stood back to view his brow and cheek, the red line of his familiar sabbath scar was visible. I was able to make the connection again. I saw him as I had countless times before, chatting after eating while sitting in his easy chair. Such a joy to find him thus before the earth conceals him from me. Thought, I wonder if he is aware of this visit. I touched his arm, which had gotten so thin, his cold hand, and shed a tear upon it as if to thaw it. What is the meaning of the immense silence that surrounds the dead? Then I returned for tea in the familiar old dining room where the conversation centered on him. He had gotten sick on the first day of Christmas and gone to bed after having spent a few days on the sofa. Now you will just have to see how you will manage alone, he said a little while later. His health deteriorated quickly and the doctor ordered him taken to the hospital, where his condition was diagnosed as double pneumonia. Friedrich Georg had the impression that he was focusing increasingly on himself, and not making any time to see visitors. Take a seat and water were the last words he heard him say. He saw him on Friday afternoon. During the night, Sunday, at one o'clock according to the nurse, he died. That would make it about the same time I saw his eyes appear during my journey to Armavia. When I looked back through my journals I was also struck by the discovery that precisely one year before to the hour, I had awakened in sadness because I had dreamed of his death. He was 74 years old when he died, 10 years older than his father and 10 years younger than his mother. This again confirms my view that one of the ways to calculate the age we will probably attain, is to take the midpoint between the lifetimes of our parents, assuming that they died of natural causes. That night I slept in his room, where he used to read in bed by the soft light or play chess. The books he had been reading during his last days were lying on the night table, J.J.'s History of the Greeks, works about the deciphering of hieroglyphics, and periodicals about chess. I felt very close to him here and sensed a deep pain when I observed the well-ordered domesticity with its libraries, laboratories, telescopes, and apparatus. In his last days, he had set up a large Electrophorus 41 with an X-ray tube in a special room in the attic. The house is our garment, an extended self that we arrange around us. When we pass away, it soon loses its form in the same way that the body does. But here everything was still fresh, 
as if each object had just been set aside by a human hand. The burial service was on the following day, only family members attended, just as he had wished. We all took his hand one last time, so cold, said my mother when she touched it. I note that when I returned to the house I felt an almost uncontrollable exhilaration. That is a primeval human trait in the wake of mysteries from which we have become estranged. On Saturday, I traveled to Gerchhorst for several days. On the train, we were subjected to four inspections. Once by police detectives. Kirchhorst, the 22nd of January 1943, I immersed myself in those new publications by Friedrich Georg that we had talked about during our walks in Lznig. I read the Titanen and the West Wind, where I found many pieces that were new to me, among them Dies Vogel, Icebird, and the Selbstbildnis, Self-Portrait. His poems about animals are suffused with magical insight and serenity, quite different from impressionistic treatments of such creatures based on external observations. This poetry reveals a dichotomy that has long been observable in painting. Today's mail included a letter from Fuhr Bloom, who describes a New Year's dream in which she heard the name of a city that sounded like Todos or Tosdo. The recollection of this caused her to avoid taking a particular train to Hanover on the 3rd of January, a train that was then wrecked. She interprets Tosdo as so Todd, thus death. Kirchhorst the 23rd of January 1943 Current Reading, Les Aventures de Lazarille de Tormes, The Adventures of Lazarillo de Tormes, in the beautiful edition printed by Didachny in Paris in 1801 and illustrated by Ranzanet. The paper, printing, binding, and engravings all contribute to my enjoyment of the content. Then read further in the Histoires des Obligents, Offensive Stories, by Leon Bloy. Here I found the following sentence paraphrasing a fundamental thought in the Marmor Clippen, the Marble Cliffs, I harbored the suspicion that this world is modeled on the perfidious prototype of the charnel house. This also implies a challenge. Berlin. The 24th of January 1943 I've been in Berlin since yesterday for a short visit, where I have again been staying with Karl Schmidt. Today, I participated in the traditional wreath-laying ceremony of the Knights of the Order Paula Merite at the monument to Frederick the Great. I had the distinct feeling that this time was to be the last. That splendid utterance of Murat, I wear medals so that people will shoot at me. I have only to reverse this sentiment in order to comprehend my own situation. They are still talismans. Heavy damage in Dalam. 42 The last air raid not only crushed whole blocks of buildings but also lifted the roofs off of entire districts and blew in thousands of windows. Air pressure often acts in strange ways. For example, it penetrated a neighboring house by getting under a balcony door without damaging it, but once inside the room, tore a piano stool in half. Walk through the park at night conversation about the death of Albrecht Eric Gunter, and then about dreams. In a dream, Carl Schmidt was involved in a conversation about conditions he finds difficult to accept. To others who marveled at his expertise or even doubted it, he answered, Don't you know that I am Don Capusco? A marvelous expression to capture danger and adventure and absurdity all at once and one that includes subtle insight. The day before yesterday Tripoli was evacuated. Kirchhorst, the 9th of February 1943 back in Kirchhorst, where I'll be on leave until 18 February. I am falling behind in my journal entries. I have been bothered for weeks by a slight migraine, the likes of which I have hardly ever known. This accompanies far-reaching ruminations that the mind is not free of, even when life is most solitary. The effects of these are felt not only in the basic elements of life but even in one's moral core. Aside from moments when the spells are bad, the pain is conducive to a feeling of sympathy. Today I walked the long circuit through Stell, Mormule, Silas Lage, Old Horst, and New Warmbugen. Even at a quick march this takes three hours. To the right in the fields stands the shed with writing painted on one side that reads, 
Bergdorf Asparagus Nurseries. The bright lettering is as readable in the distance as a newspaper headline, making the building itself almost disappear. Such advertising can change arbitrarily until it gets obliterated by wind and weather and the honest old shed in the background is visible again, like an obedient donkey that bore the letters on its back. This is how true forms survive over the course of time. Thoughts about the link between intoxication and productivity. Although they are mutually exclusive in combination, they correlate with one another like discovery and description, like exploration and geography. In a state of inebriation or euphoria, the mind advances more adventurously and more spontaneously. It experiences things in the realm of infinity. There can be no poetry without such experience. Incidentally, the jolt that accompanies the conception of poetic quirks is not to be confused with intoxication, it is like the transposition of molecules just before crystallization. Love materializes in the same way, through vibrations as we become attuned to a higher chord. The sight of Mormiel made me think of Friedrich Georg in the conversation we had here in 1939 about the illusions of technology. 43 Since this book evokes the spirit of silence, it was fated to remain unpublished at the time. It was incompatible with events. Then discussed Schopenhauer and his metaphysics of sexual love. It's a good thing that he finds the magnet of the erotic encounter in the resulting child and not in the individuals themselves. But the child is essentially only a symbol of the higher unity consummated here. In this sense, the fulfillment is the more significant, more direct testimony, expression. Plato unveils the mysteries better in his symposium. Biology obfuscates Schopenhauer's work. Villiers de Lisladam apprehends the timeless, colorless core of the flame of love more deeply. Ninja's admiration for Axel is understandable. 44 Finally, some remarks about certain facets of my life in connection with the entries that I recorded about my good father. Among them there is much that I consider taboo, I have not explained the obscure and murky passages. As Rousseau remarked, such things do not require honesty. Honest confession is nothing to be scorned, but in reality, it is more important that the author achieve liberating energy in response to his ephemeral creation. He will succeed at this, whether as poet or thinker, to the same extent that he transcends his individuality. When coming this way again, one might cross the moor from Silla Slage to New Warm Udiarasis Chen. Kirchhorst. The 10th of February 1943 had breakfast with Stout Han, Wickenberg, and Perpetua. Then read Rambord whose Batova represents a last beacon of hope, not only for the literature of the 19th century but also for Copernican literature. After this end point, all literature must be grounded in a new cosmology, whether it is the product of physics or not. According to such terms the terrifying Isidore Ducas only appears contemporary, he is modern. The tropical fevers have run their course, the path now leads to the polar seas. Then I worked in the collection, especially with the order of the genus Galarucca, beetle. Specimens can be found in the marshy ground of our terrain. Related species turn up mostly in similar habitats or, to use the language of the hunter, similar territory. Yet there are exceptions, as in the case of the Simonus beetle, where a small group lives on aphids instead of sap. The theories about this focus either on environment or on characteristics, for these are the essential features that drive the struggle for life. Both explanations seem to be one-sided, learned arguments that are futile. All these theories illuminate only layers of reality. We need to lay them all on top of one another like blueprints and peer through them at the colorful map of nature. Of course, we also need new eyes to do this. I described the process in my Sicilian a brief, Sicilian letter. 45 went to the barber in the nearby county town. He repeated the story of the wicked nature of the Russians who devour the dog's food themselves, and he had some new thoughts on the subject as well. He said that they shouldn't be given a single seed to plant because they would eat these up right away, they even gobble up raw asparagus. Generally speaking, nothing edible is sacred to them, as he put it. Despite all this, 
This barber is a good-natured man. Kirchhorst, the 13th of February 1943. Current reading: Dead Souls by Gogol after a long hiatus. This novel would be even more powerful without all the musings and the all too frequent intrusions of authorial consciousness to remind us that he is painting genre pictures. Due to the heavy rainstorms, I spent a long time in bed this morning, even having my breakfast there. While doing so, I had thoughts about the protective strategies of plant eaters that are so conspicuous in many classes of the animal kingdom. The oversized and plant like nature of these defenses can reach branch like proportions, as in the case of stags and many insects that live on wood. Even the shedding of antlers has a vegetable quality to it. Nothing similar is found among predatory animals. The defensive aspect of these protuberances is probably just a secondary characteristic, a conclusion I draw from the fact that they belong mostly to an animal's sexual characteristics and are produced in species that never use them defensively, such as in many beetles found in dung or others in wood or dry rot. The oversized excrescences are part of their physical structure and form not only the jaws but other parts of the chitinous exoskeleton as well. You get the feeling that these herbivores like to make themselves look more terrifying than they are. Our kind of life, our essence, is our arsenal, from it we gather our weapons when we need them. This thought stands in significant contrast to the formulaic model of the struggle for life. Different premises apply here, such as when God appoints a man to an office, he also gives him the wits for it. 46 There are predators with all the attributes and characteristics of herbivores, such as whales that graze for their prey. Kirchhorst, the 14th of February 1943 Heavy Rainstorms. I brought a plum branch in from the garden to force. It is in full bloom indoors. The bare wood is covered with a profusion of small white stars. Migraine worsening, as if under heavy clouds. Kirchhorst. The 15th of February 1943 Yesterday the Russians captured Rostov. In the mail there was a letter from Edmund's sister, Fritzi, who is contemplating her escape from Poland. We offered her and her children refuge here. Friedrich Georg writes from New Berlin. -Gen. It may be that we are reaching the point when our opponents will have to do the thinking for us. And if they don't do so out of revenge, they will cast us into a black hole. Kirchhorst, the 17th of February 1943 We have beautiful sunshine today after days of stormy, rainy weather. This morning among the gooseberry bushes, I picked fresh parsley, green, mossy, and encrusted in frozen dew. The Goncourts wrote about Domier that his descriptions of the middle class had reached a degree of reality bordering on the fantastic. That can be seen wherever realism reaches a climax. The final brush strokes then add unreal touches. Yesterday the Russians captured Kharkov. We are expecting Fritzi Schultz, who is fleeing from Alexandrov with her children. Her ancestors settled there over a hundred years ago. Before my departure, I am thinking about how to preserve a portion of my manuscripts. In doing so, I must take into account the possibility of the house being ransacked and plundered, and of protecting them from aerial bombardment and fire. Considering how difficult it is to find suitable hiding places for things, it is quite astonishing how much old paper has come down to us over time. Three Second Paris Journal Paris, the 19th of February 1943 returned to Paris yesterday afternoon. Perpetua took me to the train and waved for a long time as it pulled out of the station. On the train, conversation with two captains who offered the opinion that this year Nilo was going to attack using new methods, probably gas. They did not exactly seem to condone this, but restricted themselves to that moral passivity typical of modern man. In such cases, arguments relating to technology are the most forceful. For example, Given our inferiority in the air, any such undertaking equals suicide. If Nulo is planning anything of the sort, then domestic political concerns are going to be crucial as they are for all his ideas. Propaganda takes precedence over everything else. 
In this case, it would be important to him to drive a wedge between nations that cannot even be reconciled by the best of intentions. In this he is consistent with his own genius, relying on dissension, partisanship, and hatred. We have come to know the tribunes. One a brief digression here, when people with minds like this hear reports from the other side about such crimes, a trace of demonic joy rather than horror flickers across their faces. The defamation of one's enemy is a cult among the courtiers in the realm of darkness. After having seen cities like Rostov, Paris holds a new and incomparable glory for me, despite the fact that scarcity has become more widespread, with the exception of books. I celebrated my return to them by purchasing a beautiful monograph on Turner. It contains an account of his remarkable biography, previously unfamiliar to me. Fate seldom beckons so powerfully. In his last years, he stopped painting and turned to drink. There will always be artists who outlive their calling, this is particularly true in cases where talent appears early. Ultimately, they resemble retired civil servants following their own inclinations the way Rimbaud turned to earning money in Turner to drink. Paris, the 21st of February 1943 went to the Tour d'Argent for lunch with Hella and Kuhn, the painter. We talked about the how books and paintings exert influence even when unobserved. Docum in earnest getten. In our hearts this is achieved. To this thought will be incomprehensible to contemporaries who exalt communication and publication, meaning that they have replaced spiritual connections with technology. Come to that, does it matter whether the prayers of a monk are ever heard by those for whom he is praying? Wieland still knew this. He told Karamzin that he could have written his works on a lonely island with the same zeal, in the certainty that the muses would be listening to them. Then we went to Lemuris, where Kuhn, who is serving as a corporal for the commandant, showed us pictures. I especially liked a resplendent dove whose rosy and dark palette intermingled with that of the city in the background. It was called Twilight in the City. We discussed this on our way home and also talked about the atmosphere of twilight and about the influence it exerts. Dusk transforms individuals into figures, removes personal details from people, and turns them into general impressions, a man, a woman, or simply a human being. In this way, the light itself resembles the artist, in whom much twilight and darkness must dwell in order for him to perceive figures. At this moment, in the evening, I am thumbing through an issue of Verve from 1939, where I find excerpts by Pierre Riverdi, an author I do not know. I jot down the following, I wear a protective suit of armor forged completely of errors. Etre emu, cursed respire avec son curd. To be moved is to breathe with one's heart. His arrow is poisoned, he has dipped it into his own wound. On the walls of the buildings of Paris, I now frequently see the year 1918 scrawled in chalk. Also Stalingrad. Three who knows whether or not they will be defeated along with us? Paris, the 23rd of February 1943 in the morning, I looked at a portfolio of pictures taken by the propaganda branch of our troops blowing up the harbour area in Marseille. This was one more destruction of a place that was out of the ordinary and one I had grown to love. During the midday break, I always permit myself a visual treat. Today, for example, I browsed in my Turner edition, his maritime views, with their shades of green, blue, and grey, convey icy chill. Their reflections lend them a feeling of depth. Then went to the little cemetery near the Trocadero where I again looked at the mortuary chapel of Marie Bashkertz, a place where you sense the uncanny presence of the deceased. There were already many types of plants in bloom, such as wallflower and colorful mosses. In the bookshop on place Victor Hugo, I found another series of works by Leon Bloy, whom I wish to study more thoroughly. Every major catastrophe has an effect on the supply of books and casts legions of them into oblivion. Only after the earthquake, do we see what ground the author relied on in times of safety. I took a short walk in the evening. The fog was denser than I had ever seen it, so thick that the rays of light that penetrated the darkness through cracks looked as solid as beams, 
so that I was almost afraid I was going to bump against them. I also met a lot of people who were trying to find their way to the Ito Island was unable to give them directions, but we had been standing right there the whole time. Paris, the 24th of February 1943 The true measure of our worth is other people's growth in response to the power of our love. Through this, we experience our own value and the meaning of the terrifying thought, thou art weighed in the balance and found wanting. This is most obvious when we fail. There is a kind of dying that is worse than death, it happens when a beloved person obliterates the image of us that lived inside him. We are extinguished in that person. This can occur because of dark emanations that we convey. The blossoms close quietly before our eyes. Paris, the 25th of February 1943 Sleepless night punctuated by moments of waking dreams, first there was a nightmare in which grass was being mowed, then scenes like those in a marionette theatre. There were also melodies that reached a crescendo in threatening bolts. According to the rules of an arcane moral aesthetic, it is more dignified to fall on your face than your back. Paris, the 28th of February 1943 gave a lecture about my mission. In the meantime Stalingrad has fallen. This has made our predicament more acute. If, according to Clausewitz, war is the continuation of politics by other means, this implies that the more absolute the methods used to wage war, the less politics can influence it. There is no negotiation in battle, no one has a free hand and no one has the energy for it. In this sense, the war in the East has absolutely reached a magnitude that Clausewitz could never have imagined, even after the experiences of 1812. It is a war of states, peoples, citizens, and religions, with brutal escalation. In the West, we still have a free hand for a little while. This is one of the advantages of the two-front war. It defines the fate of the center with its classic pattern of threat. Apparently, 17,634 is the ray of hope for those in power. At night they send our columns to paint that date on the walls and cross out 1918 and Stalingrad. But the miracle of miracles lay in the fact that Der Old Fritz, Old Fritz V enjoyed the sympathy of the world. Not Sonilo, who is seen as the enemy of the world and it would not matter whether one of his three great adversaries were to die, the war would still be prolonged. Wishful thinking focuses less on the idea that one of them could extend the hand of peace, than on the hope that he will capitulate. Thus we are becoming progressively icier, more rigid, we cannot thaw by ourselves. Imported Cuban cigars in glass tubes stood on the table. In Lisbon. These are traded for the French cognac that high-ranking staff members on the other side hate to part with, but at least it's a form of communication. My duties have been increased to include oversight of postal censorship in the occupied territory, a ludicrous yet delicate business in every conceivable way. Paris, the 1st of March 1943 in the evening. I pondered the word shwa diarisisman.6 this could be a chapter title in a book about the natural history of the human race. Three things constitute Schwarman, heightened vibrancy of life, communal gathering, and recurrence. The vibrancy of life, or vibration as seen in a swarm of midges, is collective energy, it unites the individual with its species. Their communal gathering serves its purposes in the forms of wedding, harvest, hiking, and games. In earlier times, the rhythm of Schwarman was surely primeval, determined by the influence of the moon and the sun upon the earth and its vegetation. When we sit beneath large trees in full bloom and filled with the buzzing of bees, we received the wonderful sensation of what Schwarman means. Times of day such as twilight and moments when electrically charged air precedes the storm can be important here as well. These natural cosmic signs are the substrate beneath ever-changing historical periods. They remain as the facts of the ceremonies whose significance seems to change with rituals and cultures. What changes, however, is only the devotional portion, while the primeval aspect remains unaltered. Hence, the pagan side to every Christian festival. Incidentally, 
The designation Schwarmgister 7 is well chosen to characterize an aberration, when at its core, there lies a confusion between the devotional and primeval aspects of the rituals. Paris, the 3rd of March 1943 midday on the banks of the Seine with Charmil. We strolled down along the quay, from the place de Lma to the Via Duc de Passy and sat down there on a wooden railing watching the water flow by. Milk thistle, with its seven golden crowns, was already blooming in a crevasse of a wall, in one of these blossoms, there sat a large metallic green fly. Once again, I noticed many examples of ammonites, the small land snail, in the cut stone of the breastwork along the riverbank. Paris, the 4th of March 1943 Hella and I visited Florence School for breakfast, she has recently moved into an apartment on Avenue de Malakoff. There we also met Jew and, Maria Louise Bowski and the painter B. E. Rod. Conversation in front of a vitrine filled with Egyptian artifacts from Rosetta. Our hostess showed us ancient ungant jars and tear vials from classical graves. From these, she playfully scratched off the thin dark purplish blue and mother of pearl layer, the accumulation of millennia, letting the iridescent dust swirl in the light. She even gave some of them away. I could not turn down the gift of a beautiful pale grey scarab with an extensive inscription on its space. She then brought out books and manuscripts that had been bound by Gruel. One of the volumes of old illustrations was missing three pages, torn out so that she could give them to a visitor who had admired them. While we ate, I picked up details about Riverdi, whom I had mentioned because both Berard and Madame Bowski are friends of his. One mind can suggest and reveal itself through a single epigram. Had a conversation with Jew and about his work methods. Hercule had sent me his chroniques maritals, marital chronicles, years ago. He rises at four in the morning after barely six hours of sleep and then sits over his manuscripts until eight. Then he goes to the Lycee where he teaches. Those quiet morning hours that he spends with a hot water bottle on his knees are the most enjoyable for him. Then we talked about sentence construction, punctuation, and especially the semicolon, something he couldn't do without but considers a necessary alternative to the period in cases where the phrasing continues on logically. About Leon Bloy, Jew and heard details of Bloy's life from Rictus that were new to me. Bloy is not yet a classic writer, but some day he will be. It always takes a while for literary works to slough off their contemporary masks. But they must also pass through their own purgatorial fires before they outlast their critics. Paris, the 5th of March 1943 went to the Tricadero during the noon daybreak to admire the crocuses covering the grassy banks in clusters of blue, white, and gold. The colors sparkle like jewels that shine from their slender florets, these are the first and purest lights in the annual blossom cycle. Today finished reading Leon Bloy, Quatrans de Captivite Cochnzorman, four years in captivity at Cochnzorman, including his journals from 1900 through 1904. This time, I particularly noticed how utterly untouched the author is by the illusions of technology. He lives as an anti-modern hermit in the midst of the throbbing crowds animated by the excitement of the Great World Exposition of 1900. He sees automobiles looming as instruments of death. He generally associates technology with impending catastrophes and thus sees the methods of rapid transport like motor cars and locomotives as inventions of minds bent on escape. It could soon be important to reach other continents quickly. On the 15th of March 1904, he uses the underground for the first time. In its catacombs, he grudgingly admits a certain subterranean. Albeit demonic. Beauty. The whole system stimulates in him the impression that the end of idyllic springs and forests, of sunrises and sunsets, has arrived. The general impression of the death of the human soul. The inscription from a sundial is appropriate for this attitude that awaits judgment, it is later than you think. Paris, the 6th of March 1943, visited Pupit in the afternoon on Ruberin's ear. 
His top floor lodgings are stuffed with books and paintings. There I met the novelist Meg Grit, with whom I had corresponded during peacetime. The Doctor S was there as well. May such islands of serenity long endure. Since the beginning of the year, I have been bothered by a mild migraine. Nonetheless, since January, I have been filled with a powerful trust in a turn for the better. In times of weakness and melancholy, we forget that ultimately all will be well. A word to men. Our position with respect to two different women can resemble that of the judge pronouncing a Solomonic verdict, yet we are also the child. We deliver ourselves into the custody of the one who does not want to cut us in half. Paris, the 9th of March 1943 in the afternoon went to a showing of the old surrealist film, Le Sang d'un Poet, Blood of a Poet, Cocteau had sent me a ticket. Certain scenes reminded me of my plan for the house, in the way it presented glimpses through the keyholes of a series of hotel rooms, but only in its superficial structure. In one of them, we see the execution by firing squad of Maximilian of Mexico, which is then repeated in two more versions, in another, we see a young girl being taught how to fly under threat of corporal punishment. The film shows the universe as a beehive of secret cells where the disconnected progression of scenes of a life condemned to manic rigidity is playing. The world is a rationally constructed insane asylum. It is appropriate to this genre that the surrealists discovered Lord Tremont and Emily Bronte, as is their curious preference for Clist, whose Cathjan von Heilbronn seems to be the only work of his they know to the exclusion of his marionette and Hürter, on the puppet theatre ate the work in which he conceived his dangerous formula. They never noticed others such as Klinner, Lichtenberg, Buchner, or even Hoffman. When we look beneath the surface, we have to ask ourselves why the Marquis de Sade is not the Grand Master of this order. Paris, the 10th of March 1943 visited Baumgarten the evening on Rupier Charon for our usual chess game. While playing this game, you might not glimpse the absolute superiority of a person's mind, but you do encounter a special form of it. A kind of logical pressure is revealed, as well as the muted reaction of the other player. This gives us an idea of how simpletons must suffer. On my way home I was running fast, as was my habit, and in the dark I had a painful collision with one of the barriers in front of our office buildings that have been erected to prevent attacks. As long as these things happen to us, we are not completely rational. Such harm comes from inside us. Things that injure us this way surge up as if from the depths of our reflected selves. Secret cemetery is a concept of modern coinage. Corpses are hidden from adversaries so that they cannot be exhumed and photographed. Such activities among the lemures are evidence of an incredible increase in wickedness. Paris the 11th of March 1943 visited Florence Gould for lunch. There, Maria Louise Bowes could ascribe her visit to Valentina, with a regiment of young men like him, the Germans could have captured France without a single cannon shot. Florence then recounted her activity as an operating room nurse in Limoges, I found it much more bearable to see a leg amputated than a hand. Then on marriage, I can live perfectly well within marriage. This is obvious because I have been happily married twice. I would just make an exception in the case of Jund because he loves appalling women. Jund, but I'm not in favor of tantrums measured out in tiny doses. Paris, the 12th of March 1943 Current Reading, Kant's Magics, Magical Stories, by Pusan Lin. One of them has a nice image. A man of letters who feels compelled to go chop wood in distant forests wears himself out to the point where he gets blisters like silkworm cocoons on his hands and feet. In one of these tales, we read of a concoction that reveals whether one is dealing with a female demon. We are supposed to take the creature whose humanity is in doubt and place it in the sunlight to see whether part of its shadow is missing. The importance of this becomes clear in an extremely vicious trick that one of these sorceresses plays on a young Chinese man. She succeeds in beguiling him in a garden so that he embraces her, yet at the same time he falls to the ground with a terrible cry of pain. 
It is revealed that he has thrown his arms around a huge log with a hole bored into it where there lurks a poisonous scorpion with a sting in its tail. A word about the jokes that go around the table in the Raphael. A couple are quite witty, for example, die but a quote a word stagion, when die funeral builder interamped word and nine perhaps some people have kept journals of the jokes that have emerged during all these years. That would be worthwhile because their chronology is revealing. There is also an act of stylistic discourtesy that comes to light in phrases like nicts when a jure ls, nothing less than, or ne ignora, do not ignore. They are like snarls woven into the weft of prose and left up to the reader to disentangle. Toxic little fish berries of irony. 10 Paris, the 14th of March 1943 in the afternoon I visited Marcel Jund, who lives in a little house on Rue du Commandant Marc and. It is one of tiny nooks in Paris that I've grown so fond of over the years. We sat together in his diminutive garden with his wife and Marie Laurencin. Although the garden is barely wider than a hand towel, it produces masses of flowers. The woman reminds me of those musks one comes upon in old wine producing villages. 11 They fascinate us less by their facial expressions than by the rigidity that these wooden and brightly painted faces project. We took a tour through the apartment consisting of one room on each of three floors, except for its little kitchen. Downstairs there is a small salon, in the middle, the bedroom, and on the top floor, almost like the observatory in a planetarium a library that has been set up as a living space. The walls of the bedroom are painted black and decorated with gold ornamentation to complement the scarlet lacquer Chinese furniture. The sight of these silent chambers was oppressive, yet Juhand enjoys spending time and working here in the early hours when his wife is asleep. It was lovely to hear him tell how the birds gradually awaken and the way their songs echo and answer each other. Hella joined us later and we went to sit in the library. Juhant showed us his manuscripts, he gave me one as a present, as well as his books on medicinal herbs, and his collections of photographs. One folder of images of his wife also contained nude photographs of her from her days as a dancer. Yet that did not surprise me because I knew from his books that, in the summertime especially, she liked to go about the apartment unclothed. And in this state, she dealt with tradesmen, workmen, or the gasman. Conversations. One concerned Madame Juhan's grandfather, a postman who worked in his vineyard at four in the morning before delivering the mail. Working in this vineyard was his prayer. He considered wine the universal medicine and even administered it to children when they were ill. We then talked about snakes because a friend of theirs once brought a dozen to the house. The creatures dispersed throughout the apartment and would turn up months later under the carpets. One of them had the habit of winding its way up the base of a standing lamp in the evening, it then coiled itself around the middle of the lampshade, the warmest spot. Once again my impression of the Parisian streets, houses, buildings, and dwellings was confirmed, they are the archives of a substance interwoven by ancient life filled to the brim with bits of evidence with all sorts of memories. Sick bed visit to Florence in the evening. She injured her foot in Celine's house. She said that, despite his substantial income, this author always suffers from penury because he donates everything to the streetwalkers who come to him when they are sick. If all buildings were to be destroyed, language would remain intact as an enchanted castle with towers and turrets and ancient vaults and passageways that nobody will ever completely explore. There in the shafts, oubliettes, and caverns we will be able to tarry and abandon ourselves to this world. Finished reading the Kant's magics. I took great pleasure in this sentence from the book, here on earth only human beings of exalted spirit are capable of great love because they alone do not sacrifice the idea to external stimuli. Paris, the 17th of March 1943 Concerning my text The Worker. 12 The description is precise, yet it resembles a finely etched medal lacking a reverse side. A second section would have to describe the subordination of those dynamic principles I described as a static sequence of greater status. When the house has been furnished, the mechanics and the electricians leave. 
But who will be the head of the house? Who knows whether I'm ever going to find the time to work on this while I'm here, yet Friedrich Georg was able to make significant progress in this area with his illusion air technique, illusions of technology. This shows that we are truly brothers, always united in spirit. Blood and spirit. The connection between the two has often been claimed, insofar as blood corpuscles and serum also show a spiritual correlation. Here we must differentiate between material and spiritual layers, a dual game of the worlds of images and thoughts. Yet in life both are closely allied, and only rarely are they separate from each other. Images are carried off by the torrent of thought. Correspondingly, we can differentiate between a prose that is like serum and one that is like corpuscles. There are grades of embellishment through images ending with Hermann's hieroglyphic style. There are also curious interpenetrations, as in the case of Lichtenberg. Here we are dealing with an imagistic style refracted by the intellect, a kind of mortification. To stay with the analogy, you could say that the two elements have separated from one another and then been artificially recombined. Irony must always be preceded by such a rupture. Paris, the 20th of March 1943 had a conversation about executions with the President 13 at midday. In his role as chief of prosecutor, he has seen a great number of these. Regarding types of executioners, for the most part, horse butchers apply for the profession. Those among them who still use the axe show a certain artistic pride in comparison with guillotine operators. Theirs is the consciousness of custom handwork. At the first execution, Undinilo, the executioner, who had taken off his tailcoat for the beheading, gave his report in his shirt sleeves, top hat askew upon his head, carrying in his left hand the axe dripping with blood. Raising his right arm for the German salute, comma 14, he said, Execution accomplished. The neuroanatomists, who want to embalm the skull and its contents when it is still as fresh as possible, lie in wait for the blow like vultures. Once at the execution of a man who had strung himself up in his cell, but had been cut down while still alive, they were visible in droves at the foot of the scaffold. It is claimed that precisely after this kind of suicide attempt, a certain kind of mental illness sets in later in life and that this inclination shows up early in changes to the brain. In the afternoon visited a church in St. Gervais, one I had never seen before. The narrow streets that encircle it preserve a bit of the Middle Ages. The irreplaceable quality of such buildings, with each one, part of the root system is destroyed. Visited the chapel of St. Philomla, a saint I had not heard of before. There I saw a collection of huts from which flames erupted as if from little round flasks, some were copper, others bronze, a few were gold. This seemed to be a good place to ponder the turn of events of the year that had begun in the Caucasus. On 29th of March, 1918, a projectile from the German shelling of Paris 15 penetrated the vault of this church, killing numerous worshippers assembled here for a Good Friday service. A special chapel is dedicated to their memory with windows showing a speech banner bearing the inscription, Hodi Mechameritis in Paradiso, today you shall be with me in paradise. Afterward I went to the Quayais to look at books. This is always a particularly satisfying hour, an oasis in time. There I purchased Leprises du Seigneur Edouard Coleman, Gentil Homme, Pour Avoir Conspire à la Mort du Roi de la Grande Bretagne. The trial of Sir Edward Coleman, gentleman, who conspired to kill the King of Great Britain, Hamburg, 1679. I heard from Florence that Jewant had said after my visit to him that I was difficile a developer, difficult to draw out. That assessment could come from a photographer of the Psyche. Moisson, the 21st of March 1943 departure to Moisson where I have been ordered to take a training course. From the railroad station in Bonnier Ears, we marched along the Seine Valley, and on our left on the far side, saw a towering chain of chalk cliffs. In front of them stood the fortress and chateau of La roche Guyon, and also a solitary bell tower built over the vault of the cave church of Otile. I am living under the roof of an old priest named Lazaire, 
who spent his life as a Jesuit building churches in China and has devoted the rest of his days to this undesirable parish on poor soil. His looks are pleasant in a childlike way, even though he's blind in one eye. I conversed with him about topography and found him to be of the opinion that it is not worthwhile to travel far, since we always encounter the same formations wherever we go, just a few different patterns that are the basis for everything. This opinion comes from one who has insulated himself, someone who loves life on the other side of the prism to the point where he can say that it isn't worth looking at the spectrum because its frequencies are already contained in sunlight yet you have to respond that the frequencies also give human eyes the ability to see colors, in itself a precious gift. The discussion reminded me of one of my early doubts, whether we lose a pleasure when we retreat into our unique self, a pleasure that only time and variety can provide. And I wondered whether or not this concealed the very reason for our existence, namely that God requires individuation. I often had this feeling when observing insects and sea creatures and all of life's astonishing miracles. The pain is great at the thought that one day we take our leave of all this. By contrast, it must be said that when we revert, we shall regain organs that we do not know about, although they are located and prefigured within us, such as the lungs of the child that the mother carries in her womb. Our physical eyes will with just like our umbilical cords we shall be equipped with new vision. And just as we see colors here in refraction, there we see their essence with greater enjoyment in the undivided light. Had a conversation this evening about the East and also about cannibalism. It has been claimed that people have been observed enjoying testicles. This is supposedly not explained by hunger alone. Captured partisans have apparently been found to carry these among their rations to trade for things like cigarettes. When it comes to such bestial, or even demonic, traits from our basest motivations, I always think of Bader and his theory. Purely economic doctrines must necessarily lead to cannibalism. Moisson, the 23rd of March 1943. New pleasures I have experienced here the sight of cherry blossoms as they produce a miraculous awakening from their dormancy, like a butterfly spreading its wings as it creeps out of its dark chrysalis. This new glory heightens the barren soil of the fields and the grey walls of the houses, they are animated by a delicate chromatic veil. This pink blossom is more frugal than the white, but brings more blossoms when they bud on the bare branch, making a deeper impression upon one's mood. The gentle curtain signifies that the year has begun its magic show. Then to the morning fire on the hearth. In the cold room the night before, I stacked up the pile of wood consisting of dry vines and oak bark and then I set these alight in the morning a half hour before getting out of bed. The sight of the open fire giving warmth and light is a cheerful beginning to the day's activities. Moisson, the 26th of March 1943 had field duty in the morning on the dry heath. It was covered with pale grey and green lichen, with a sparse growth of birch and conifer. Once again we confront things we have lived through, and we overcome them. It is a spiral, if these experiences are not meaningless they become the material for higher conquests. This is how world wars I and to strike me. It is said that in death the chronicle of our life will pass before our eyes. Then coincidence will be sanctified by necessity. A more exalted seal will leave its stamp upon it once the sealing wax has melted in the pain. Incredibly hot today on this heath with its stands of conifers. In the light of noon, a creature whirred past me in the air that I did not recognize, it moved its glassy wings in a blaze of pale pink and opal light and trailed two long, beautifully curved horns behind it like trains or pennants. Then I realized that it was the male long-horned beetle I was seeing in flight for the first time. Such lightning-fast impressions hold immense happiness, and we sense the secret workings of nature. The insect appears in its authentic guise, in its magical dances, and in the costume given it by nature. This is one of the most intense pleasures that consciousness can grant us, we penetrate the depths of life's dream and coexist with its creatures.
It is as if a small spark ignited in us the intense and uncomplicated desire that infuses them. In the afternoon, I took a second excursion to Oat Island La Roche Guyane with Munchausen and Baumgart. This landscape, with its deep and frequently hollowed out chalk cliffs that follow the river's course like organ pipes towering above it, contains an element that makes us feel it has been settled by human beings since the dawn of time. The chronology is evident in La Roche Guyane. Here in the white ivy covered cliffs, you see the dark entrances to deep, branching caverns. Some of these still serve as storehouses and stables. Close by them come the bulky fortifications from the Norman period, and finally in the foreground, there stands the proud chateau with its towers built over the course of gentler centuries. Yet beneath all this lie the deep cellars where the spirit of antiquity hovers. The caves with their bands of flint are still preserved, perhaps containing treasures with gold and weapons, along with bodies of the slain and giant ancestors that may lie with dragons in many a secret, collapsed corridor. You can even sense this magical presence out in the open air. Paris, the 27th of March 1943 return journey to Paris in the evening after having sat by the fire in the morning making various entries in my journal. Piles of birthday mail were already awaiting me at the Raphael. I first read the letters from acquaintances and from my readership, then those from intimate friends, and finally those from closest family members, particularly Perpetu and Friedrich Georg. Perpetu describes her dreams. She cast a net in order to catch a fish, but instead she tugged at it with great effort and finally pulled up an anchor with these words incised on it. Persian Divan the 12th of April 1998, Rimbaud to his last friends. She scrubbed off the patina and realized that the anchor was made of pure gold. We are allowed to assign rank to our nearest and dearest. Our position on firm ground, at the right place, becomes evident. Likewise, the faithlessness of our pupils, friends, and lovers reproaches us. Their suicides even more so. That is evidence of shaky foundations. When misfortune befalls us, as it did Socrates, one last symposium must still be possible. Paris, the 28th of March 1943 at Valentinus. He brought me a letter from Berlin from Karl Schmidt containing a dream image that he had jotted down for me in the early morning hours. He also included a quotation from Ettinger's Das Geheimnis von Salz. The secret of salt, 1770, have the salt of peace within you, or you shall be cured with salt of another kind. That reminded me of an image of freezing and thawing. Paris, the 29th of March 1943 because the clocks were turned forward one hour during the night, I vaulted into a new year of life in a single leap. Waking up from a dream. I scribbled something down on a piece of paper that I found when I got up Eva's placenta. Der Mati Reparents Talk. Eve's placenta. 16 The insight, if I remember correctly, was something like this, the physical umbilical cord is severed, but the metaphysical one remains intact. This context gives rise to a second, invisible family tree deep in the flow of life. We are forever united through its veins and participate in a communion with every person who ever lived, with all generations, and hosts of dead souls. We are interwoven with them by an aura that returns in dream imagery. We know more about each other than anyone realizes. We can multiply by two different means, by budding or by copulation. In the second sense, it is the father who begets us, in the first, we descend solely from our mothers, with whom we have a permanent connection. In this sense, there is but one single birth and death day for the whole human race. Of course, the mystery also has a paternal pole, in that a spiritual act lies at the heart of every insemination, and this association is expressed most purely in the procreation of the absolute human being. Thus the human being corresponds not only to the masculine but also to the feminine aspect of its origins, to its greatest potential. Incidentally, this dual origin can be intuited from the parables. These may be divided into those where the material aspect predominate, and others where the spiritual origin predominates. Humans speak as here lilies, as mustard seeds, 
and grains of wheat. They also speak as the heirs of heaven and of the Son of Man. Spidel telephoned me from Kharkov at nine o'clock and from that immense distance was the first to congratulate me. The day passed cheerfully and pleasantly. In the evening went with Heller and Valentina to visit Florence, this is also the first anniversary of our acquaintance. We picked up the conversation we had been having about death where we had left off last time. Paris, the 30th of March 1943 in the evening, visit to First Lieutenant von Munchausen, whom I had gotten to know during our training in Moisson. Like the Clists and Arnims or the Kieserlings in the East, his bearing makes it evident that he comes from one of our intellectual dynasties. There I also met a doctor, a Russian emigre named Professor Salmanov. Fireside chat about patients and doctors. In Salmanov, I discovered the first doctor with broader knowledge since Celsus, who treated me in Norway for a while, and we eyes, Saka. who visited me briefly in New Berlin. I would gladly have trusted him to take care of me. He proceeds from the whole, and in doing so, from our age taken in its entirety, calling it sick. He claims that it is just as difficult for the individual who lives in these times to be healthy as it is for a drop of water to be motionless in a stormy sea. He considers the tendency to convulsions and cramps to be a particular bane of our age death comes gratis. That means you must earn your health through the common effort exerted by the patient and the physician. In the patient, sickness often begins as a moral disorder that then spreads to the organs. If the patient does not show himself willing to be healed at this moral stage, the physician must refuse treatment, he would only be taking a fee he had not earned. Salmanoff is 72 years old. He has studied and treated people in almost every country in Europe and in several war zones. He left his career as a university professor in academic medicine at a ripe old age to combine his expertise with clinical practice. Lenin had been one of his patients, and he claimed that the reason for Lenin's death had been on we. His essential talent lay in the art of conspiracy and the creation of small revolutionary cells but once he had reached the highest level and attained absolute authority, he found himself in the position of a chess master who cannot find a partner, or an exceptional civil servant who is pensioned off early. Salmanov's fee took the form of being allowed to hand Lenin a small note with the names of prisoners who were then released. Lenin also arranged for his passport, thus making it possible for him to emigrate with his family. Salmanov does not think the Russians can be defeated but he believes they will emerge from the war changed and cleansed. The invasion would have succeeded, he claims, if it had been supported by higher morale. Furthermore, he predicts an alliance between Russia and Germany after an interval of a few years. Paris, the 31st of March 1943 during the midday break, visited the Musée d'Ilham, an institution where I have always marveled at the dual nature of rational intellectuality and sorcery. I see it as a finely engraved medal made of ancient, dark, radioactive metal. Accordingly, the mind is exposed to a dual influence of systematically organized intelligence and the invisible aura of its accumulated magical essence. In the evening played chess with Baumgart in the Raphael. Afterward had a discussion with him and Weniger who had served in the artillery with me in Monchi in 1915. He is visiting the troops, giving lectures and sounding out the officer corps in late night conversations. He says that there is a movement afoot among the more important generals that is reminiscent of a passage in the Gospel of Matthew, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Paris, the 1st of April 1943 visited Florence for lunch where I also saw Giradu and Madame Bowski. She gave me a letter by Thornton Wilder for my autograph collection. Letters. It's odd that I write such cursory letters to the women I am closest to and pay so little attention to style. Possibly the result of the feeling that letters are almost superfluous in this case. We exist in the physical world. On the other hand, I always make an effort when I am writing to Friedrich Georg or Karl Schmidt and two or three others. 
the effort is like that of the chess player who adapts to his partner. Paris, the 3rd of April 1943 in the afternoon, I went to a Turkish cafe on Rue Lauriston where I met Bainine, a Muslim woman from the southern Caucasus whose novel Nami I recently finished. I noticed passages in her book that reminded me of T. E. Lawrence, as well as a similar recklessness about the body and its violation. It is odd how people can distance themselves from the body, from its muscles, nerves, ligaments, as though it were an instrument made up of keys and strings. In that state one listens like a stranger to the melody played by fate. This talent always carries the danger of sustaining injury. Paris, the 3rd of April 1943 visited Salmanoff in the afternoon during his office hours when he sees patients in a small room completely crammed with books. While he was interviewing me, I studied their titles, which one might trust. Thorough physical examination. He found the small growth that is a vestige of my lung wound. Diagnosis and instructions are simple, he said that I would be feeling like myself in three months' time. Spramos, let us hope. Incidentally, he differs from my good old Celsus in that he uses medications, if only moderately. Even the best doctors have a bit of the charlatan about them. I could deduce a pattern of their interaction with their patients. That's how it is with these prophet types, they ask a question that magnifies their reputation whether the answer is yes or no. If the answer is yes, then it was a serious deliberation being pursued, if the answer is no, they resort to divination, you see, that's just what I was thinking. As a result, I am a bit disgruntled. This relates to the hyperacute sense of observation with which I am cursed, the way others have an especially keen sense of smell. I detect the shady moves that are endemic to humans all too clearly. In periods of weakness and sickness, this increases. There are times when I have seen through the doctors at my bedside as though I had X-ray vision. The good stylist. He really wanted to write, I acted correctly, but inserted incorrectly instead because that fit the sentence better. Paris, the 4th of April 1943 Sunday. As I was leaving the Raphael after eating, the air raid sirens began accompanied by artillery fire. From the roof, I saw a high wall of smoke hovering on the horizon though the bombers had already departed. Attacks like this last barely more than a minute. Then, because the metro is out of commission, walked to George's poop at on Rugerinsi ear. It was a beautifully mild blue spring day. Groups of Parisians were promenading together under the green chestnut trees of the Champs Elysees while out in the suburbs hundreds were foundering in blood. I stood there for a long time in front of the most beautiful group of magnolias I had ever seen. One of them bloomed blinding white, the second gentle pink, and the third crimson. Spring throbbed in the air with that magic felt once each year as vibrations of the cosmic energy of love. At Pupitz I met the Megrits, a married couple. Discussions about war and peace, about rising prices, about Herculean the Anarchists of 1890, for just now am I studying the trial of Ravakal. 17 Megret told an anecdote about Bakunin who was riding in a carriage one day when he passed a building being torn down. He leapt out, took off his coat, grabbed a pickaxe, and joined the work. Such men dance the grotesque opening number for the world of destruction as they lead the red mask before the eyes of the alarmed citizens. Paid a brief visit to the Church of St. Sulpice. There I examined Delacroix's frescoes, their colors have suffered. Also admired Marie Antoinette's dainty pipe organ, remembering that Gluck and Mozart had once touched its keys. In the chancel, two elderly women were singing a Latin text. An old man sang along with them as he accompanied them on the harmonium. Lovely voices rose from the exhausted bodies and shriveled throats that showed the working of subcutaneous sinew and gristle. The sounds that emanated from these mouths surrounded by wrinkles were testimony to the timeless melodies possible even on brittle instruments. Beneath these arches, as in the church of St. Michael in Munich, rational theology and intellectual cosmogony hold sway. 
as so often happens in such places, I began to reflect on the plan of creation and the spiritual structure of the world. Who can tell what role such a church plays in human history? Despite the lateness of the hour, I found the guide to take me via the narrow winding staircase described by husbands in Labars, down there, to the taller of the two towers. From here the view of the surrounding cityscape is perhaps the most beautifully comprehensive. The sun had just set and the Luxembourg gardens blazed with riotous greens amid the silver grey stone walls. It can always be said in favour of human beings that no matter how deeply they founder in their pursuits and passions, they have been capable of such achievements. By the same token, we marvel at the artistic, burnished shells produced by a mollusk's secretion, these still continue to glisten on the seashore long after the creatures that inhabited them have disappeared. They bear witness to a third power beyond life and death. Paris, the 5th of April 1943. By noon today, the death toll had exceeded 200. A few bombs hit the race course at Longchamp when it was crowded with people. As Sunday strollers emerged from the depths of the metro, they ran into a crowd of panting, injured people with their clothing in tatters. Some were clutching their heads or an arm. One mother held a bleeding child to her breast. One direct hit to a bridge swept many pedestrians into the Seine. Their corpses are now being fished out of the water. At the same moment, on the other edge of the little forest, a cheerful group of people in their finery was promenading and enjoying the trees, the blossoms, and the mild spring air. That is the Janus head of these times. Paris. The 10th of April 1943 I was on the play state early's when the air aid alarm sounded. Conversation near the little flower stand on the traffic circle while people rushed past us toward the shelters. Rhetorical figures, during the most spirited part of our conversation, fire bursts from falling bombs lit up the air. Walked through empty streets to the Eto Isle while trails from white, red, and green tracer shots were shooting over the forest, where they exploded high above us like sparks from a blacksmith's forge. That was a symbol of life's course, like the path in the magic flute. Paris, the 11th of April 1943 Human Encounters and Separations When a separation is imminent, there are days when the exhausted relationship intensifies once more and crystallizes to the point where it reaches its purest, fundamental form. And yet it is precisely such days that inevitably confirm the end. In the same way, clear days often follow uncertain weather until one morning heralds particular clarity, when every mountain and valley shows itself again in its full glory just preceding the sudden drop in temperature. I was standing in the bathroom this morning thinking about these things, just as I had before my trip to Russia when I knocked over a glass and broke it. Good prose is like wine and continues to live and develop. It may contain sentences that are not yet true, but a hidden life raises them to the level of truths. Fresh prose is usually still a bit unrefined, but it develops a pattern over the years. I often notice this in old letters. Discussion with Hattingen at lunch about clocks and hourglasses. The trickling of the sand in the hourglass weaves the unmechanized time of destiny. This is the time to which we are attuned in the rustling of the forest, the crackling of the fire, the surge of the breakers, the eddies of falling snowflakes. Later, even though the light was fading, I went to the boys de Boulogne briefly near the Porte Dauphine. I saw boys playing the who were between seven and nine years old, their faces and gestures seemed remarkably expressive. Individuation comes out earlier here and shows itself with more pronounced features. Yet you get the feeling that in most cases, starting around age 16, their spring has lost its bloom. The Latin type crosses that borderline too early, the line that marks his final stage, whereas the Germanic type usually never reaches it. For this reason, commingling is beneficial. Two deficiencies combined to create an advantage. I rested at the foot of an elm tree surrounded by a profusion of pale violet nettles. A bumblebee was visiting the blossoms, and while it hovered over the calyxes, displaying its velvet brown band and gently curved abdomen, its extended proboscis pointed like a stiff black probe. 
The insect's forehead bore a golden yellow blaze of pollen formed by countless points of contact. It was remarkable to watch the moment it plunged into the flower. Once inside, the tiny insect gripped the long throat with both forelegs and pulled it over its proboscis like a sheath, almost the way a Mardi Gras clown puts on an artificial nose. A at Valentina's, where I met Hella, Ischman, Rantzau, and the Dr. Oris. Discussions about Washington Irving, Eckerman, and Prince Schwarzenberg, who is said to have instigated the collection of a huge, still uncatalogued body of material in Vienna relating to European secret societies. Paris, the 12th of April 1943. Current reading, Carthage Punic, Punic Carthage, by Lapira and Pelgrin. The conquest of this city is rich in anecdotes befitting this phenomenal event. After the Romans had breached the walls, those citizens who were determined to fight to the death carried on their defense from the highest temple in the city. Among them were Hasdrubal with his family and other noble Carthaginians. And by their sides another 900 Roman defectors who expected no mercy. During the night before the decisive attack, Hasdrubal secretly leaves his people to look for Scipio. In his hand, he bears an olive branch. The next morning Scipio parades him in front of the temple and displays him to the defenders to demoralize them. They, however, after venting an endless stream of abuse and invective against their disloyal general, set the building on fire and throw themselves into the flames. It is said that, as the fire was being laid, Hasdrubal's wife donned her finest raiment in one of the innermost chambers of the temple. Then, in all her finery, she came to the rampart with her children and addressed Scipio first. She wished him happiness on his life's journey, saying she was leaving him without anger because he had acted in accordance with the laws of war. Thereupon she cursed her husband in the name of the city, its gods, herself, and her children, and then turned her back on him forever. Then she strangled her children and threw them into the flames finally throwing herself into the fire as well. In such circumstances, people achieve greatness in the way that individual vessels are filled to the brim with symbolic content. At the moment of its destruction, Carthage itself makes its entrance onto the flaming stage in the person of this woman approaching the altar prepared for her ultimate sacrifice. Inspired with a formidable, sacred power, she utters blessings and curses. The place, the circumstances, and the human being, all is prepared, and everything secondary fades away. The ancient sacrifice to Baal, the incineration of children, is reenacted here for the last time, performed in order to save the city and now consummated so that it may live forever. The mother sacrifices herself so that the vine may burn with its fruit. Paris, the 13th of April 1943, Carthage Punic. In that age, contact among states was more malleable and the powers of treaties more binding. When Hannibal and Philip of Macedon signed their famous treaty, the gods, notably the gods of war, were present, tangibly represented by the priests of their cult. After the destruction of the city, the site was cursed. It was sown with salt as a sign of malediction. Thus salt here symbolizes barrenness. Otherwise, it symbolizes the mind, and so we find both negative and positive poles associated with an object, as is true everywhere in symbolism. This applies particularly to colors, yellow for both the nobility and the rabble, red for both authority and insurrection, blue for both the supernatural and nothingness. This division is surely accompanied by differences of purity, as Goethe notes about yellow in his treatise on color theory. 18 We may thus imagine the salt of malediction as coarse and impure, in contrast to the Attic salt used to preserve food or to season dishes at the table of the intelligentsia. Cuban mailed me another of his hieroglyphic texts from Zikolet, I plan to decipher this when I can meditate on it at leisure. Gruninger reports the arrival from Stalingrad of copies of the last letters of Lieutenant Colonel Chrome. It appears that people show a powerful reversion to Christianity when they are facing a lost cause. Paris, the 14th of April 1943 visit from Holly, the painter. 
He brought me greetings from Celeris's wife and reported that he was mentally very active, despite his long imprisonment and poor physical health. 19 Let us hope that he will see daylight again. The conversation reminded me again of that terrible day when I had driven to Berlin and telephoned Celeris's lawyer. There, in the metropolis, I held out as much hope for assurance as I would for a drink in the desert. Standing in the telephone booth, I had the impression that Potsdamer Platz was glowing. In the evening, attended the premiere of Cocteau's Renaud et Armide in the Comédie Francaise. I noted that I clearly recalled the two powerful moments in the play that I had noticed when it was read aloud on Rue de Vernil, Armida's magical song, and Olivier's prayer. A talent like Cocteau's lets us observe the extent to which our age claws at him and how much the subject matter must resist that. His miraculous ability waxes and wanes corresponding to the level on which he is focusing his talent. At its most rarefied, it becomes a tightrope dance or buffoonery. I noticed many familiar faces in the audience. Among them, Charmil. Paris, the 15th of April 1943 conversation with Ray de Macker in the morning about the military situation. He is placing his hope in Celeris and Torun.20 visited Salmanov in the evening, who said, if the German intelligentsia had understood the Russian intelligentsia as well as the Russians understood the Germans, it never would have come to war. We spoke of the mass grave at Katyn, where thousands of Polish officers who were Russian prisoners of war have apparently been discovered. Salmanov thinks the whole thing is propaganda. But how would the corpses have gotten there? you know, nowadays corpses don't need tickets. Conversation about Aksakov, Berdyev, and a Russian author named Rosanif. Salmanov has obtained a book of his for me. Made my way home through the boys de Boulogne. The half moon stood high above the new foliage. Despite the populous city nearby, complete silence reigned. That produced a half pleasing, half terrifying effect like that of being on stage just before a difficult production. Paris, the 16th of April 1943 had a substantive dream about Mblo in the early morning hours, in which events were linked to my parental home. For some reason that I have forgotten, people were expecting him. They were making all sorts of arrangements, while I escaped into distant rooms so as not to run into him. When I finally appeared again, he had been and gone. I heard details about the visit, in particular, that my father had embraced him. When I awoke, this fact struck me in particular, and it made me recall the sinister vision that Benno Ziegler had related. 21 In discussions about the atrocities of our age, the question often comes up about where those demonic powers come from the persecutors and murderers, people nobody had otherwise ever seen or imagined. Yet they were always a potential presence, as reality now shows. Their novelty lies in their visibility, in their having been turned loose and allowed to harm other human beings. Our shared guilt led to this release, by robbing ourselves of our social bonds, we unleashed something subterranean. We must not complain when this wickedness also touches us individually. Paris. The 17th of April 1943 visited Parc de Bagatelle in the afternoon. The intense heat of these days concentrates the flowering like a symphony, myriad tulips blazed on the lawns and on the islands in the little lake. Flora seemed to outdo herself in many of the blossoms, like the violet blue and silky grey clusters of the wisteria, light as feathers yet heavy in beauty. These hung down on the walls. The whole effect produced a magical display like fairy tale gardens. I always find this enticing, a promise of endless splendors, like a ray of light from treasure vaults glimmering through doors just briefly opened. Transience dwells in the withering, and yet these floral miracles are symbols of a life that never wilts. From it comes the beguiling charm that awakens their hues and aromas as they shoot sparks into the heart. I also saw my old friend the Golden Off, 22 whose back glistened in the green water of the grottoes. It has been waiting here silently while I was on the move in Russia. Thoughts about perversions, wondering whether the source could be an aversion that existed between father and mother. In that case, 
they would have to predominate in countries and social strata where marriages of convenience are prevalent. By the same token, they ought to be prevalent among the cold-blooded races and not vice versa, as is commonly thought. Hatred and aversion for the opposite sex are passed down through procreation. That is basically it, other things come later. Naturally, selection takes place, as nature gives preference to the fruits of sensual copulation. Perhaps, however, individuals are compensated with intelligence, since brilliant types are often the fruits of late conception, like Baudelaire. The bizarre way in which Father Shandy 23 winds the clock also comes to mind. These connections have hardly been researched, and they elude the scope of science. I would have to penetrate the secret histories of entire families, entire clans. I could counter this thesis by objecting that there are rural regions where marriages of convenience have been common since time immemorial. In these places, individuation has evolved less in the meantime, any healthy person is acceptable to another one. Furthermore, in particular areas, degeneration can reach the level of that in the big cities, it is simply more covered. Perhaps the symptoms are different as well. Sodomy is probably more prevalent in the countryside than in the city. Incidentally, that which we view as aberrant can definitely be associated with a more profound view of the world. The reason for this is precisely that this view is less subject to the pressure, the veil of our species. This is generally observable among homosexuals, who judge by intellect. They are, therefore, always useful to intellectuals, quite apart from the fact that they are entertaining to have around. The Dreyfus trial is a piece of clandestine history. In other words, it is generally invisible, the sort of thing that is otherwise submerged in the labyrinths beneath political structures. When reading about this affair, I have the feeling of trespassing upon the taboo. It is like getting close to the mummy of Tutankhamun, with its dense layers of matter. As a result, the casual approach with which young historians like Frank treat such material is frightening. Career choice. I would like to be a star pilot. 24 Concerning self education. Even if we are born with infirmities, we can rise to remarkable levels of health. The same is true in the realm of knowledge. Through study, you can liberate yourself from the influence of bad teachers and from the prejudices of your age. In a completely corrupted situation, even the most modest progress in morality is much more difficult. Here is where things come down to fundamentals. When an unbeliever, let's say in an atheist state, demands that a believer swear an oath, that is tantamount to the action of a corrupt banker who expects the other players in the game to lay real gold on the table. In an atheist political system, there is only one sort of oath that is valid, and that is perjury. Everything else is sacrilege. On the other hand, one may swear an oath to a Turk and exchange oaths with him. That is an exchange without chicanery. Finished reading the Old Testament last night with the book of the prophet Malachi. I had started this project in Paris on the 3rd of September 1941. Tomorrow I plan to begin with the Apocrypha. I have also have begun a Silmont, Solitude, by Rosanif. I immediately sensed here that that Samanoff had steered me toward a mind that would trigger thoughts in me, if not actually inspire them. Paris, the 18th of April 1943 had tea with Maria Louise Bausclon Place to Palais Bourbon, the house stands out for the Roman severity of its architecture. These old apartments filled with inherited objects have adapted themselves to human beings and their nature over the course of decades and centuries, like garments that, after long wear, caress the body with each fold. These are shells in the sense of a higher zoology. Here I also met Hella, Poupet, Giridou, and Madame Oliveira de Prevox, a great granddaughter of Liszt. Madame Bowski, whom I always treat with the same caution that a chemist exercises when handling questionable compounds, showed me the small, square, wood panelled library. There I examined manuscripts, dedications, and beautiful bindings. Some of the books were bound in textured leather, touching them doubles the pleasure of reading. 
the binding stamped in gold leaf displayed a color palette from a violet so deep that it approaches black, and then to its lighter shades. The patterns in dark gold and brown were often dotted with gold or embellished flame shapes. Made my way back in the evening across the Champs Elysees. It was a magnificent sunny day. I was also pleased with myself, and note this only because it is something I can say so seldom. Finished reading Rosanif's Assailment, one of the rare moments in which authorship and independent thought have succeeded in our age. Considering such acquaintances, I always think it seems as if one of those bare patches on the ceiling that encloses our space had been filled in with paint. Rosanif's relationship to the Old Testament is remarkable. For example, he uses the word seed in precisely the same sense. This word, when applied to humans as a symbol of their essence, has always distressed me slightly. I've always felt a certain opposition toward it, like Hebel's toward the word rib, which he scratched out in his Bible. Ancient taboos are probably at work here, the spermatic character of the Old Testament in general, in contrast to the pneumatic of the Gospels. After 1918, Rosanif died in a monastery, where he is said to have starved to death. He remarked of the revolution that it would fail because it offered nothing to men's dreams. It is this that will destroy its structures. I find it so appealing that his hurried notations came to him as a sort of plasmatic motion of the spirit in moments of contemplation, when he was sorting his coin collection or sunning himself on the sand after his bath. Paris, the 19th of April 1943 New Hors, who is a great devotee of flowers had the sensible idea of getting out of the office with me for an hour and visiting the botanical garden of Ortuil, where the azaleas are in bloom. A large cool house was filled with thousands of azalea bushes so that it resembled a hall with brightly woven carpeting and multicolored walls. It seems impossible that a greater profusion or a greater exuberance of such a delicate palette could ever be assembled in one place. Yet I don't count myself among the friends of the azalea. I find its hues unmetaphysical, for they display only one-dimensional colors. Perhaps that explains their popularity. They speak only to the eye and lack that drop of arcana marcanorum supracolest, heavenly mystery of mysteries, in the pure essence of their tincture. This explains their lack of fragrance. We also visited the Gluxinias and Calciola area, ladies' slipper, or slipper wort. The calcial area constitute living cushions on which variety achieves its greatest range, for among the millions of individuals there are no two flowers that are completely identical. The varieties with dark purple and yellow stripes are the most beautiful, in order to appreciate the deep interior of these calyxes that brim with life, you would have to be able to transmogrify into a bumblebee. This remark, which I addressed to New Horse, seemed to amuse our driver who kept us company, and I guessed the reason. Only a few orchids were in bloom, but we strolled through the cultivars since New Horse is a breeder. A green and purple striped lady's slipper caught my eye thanks to the dark spots on its upper lip, each wing whimsically sprouted three or four tiny, spiky hairs. It made me think of the smile of a long-lost girlfriend who had a dark mole. It's important that the gardeners remain invisible in gardens like this so that we may see only their oeuvre. By the same token, tracks that we leave in the sand need to be erased immediately by a phantom hand. That's the only way we can fully appreciate plants and their language. Their essence could be summarized in the motto, Prasenst invisibilis, present but invisible. The prototype for all gardens is the enchanted garden, and the prototype for all enchanted gardens is the garden of paradise. Horticulture, like all modest professions, has sacred origins. I finished reading the book of Judith in the Bible, it is one of those pieces in the style of Herodotus. The description of Holophanes leads us into one of the state rooms of the Tower of Babel where the curtain of his bed is encrusted with precious stones. Preceding the night that Judith spends in his tent, Holophanes exchanges oriental compliments with her. The lip of the chalice is dusted with sugar, at the bottom lies deadly poison. Though she was ready to do so, she was spared having to submit to Holophanes. In this book, I sense the power of beauty, which is stronger than armies. 
then the triumphal song over the severed head of Holofernes. In my work on higher zoology, I want to describe the primeval figure that is the model for this, it will be in a chapter on triumphal dances following the one about Shwa Dieras Islan.25 Judith and Charlotte Corday, a comparison, Judith and Joan of Arc as national heroines. Two topics for advanced school students, but in order to do justice to the material, they must have already eaten from the tree of knowledge. Paris, the 20th of April 1943 spent a Mauritanian interlude with Bainine at midday. It is her custom to have coffee in her bed, which she does not enjoy leaving any more than a hermit crab its shell. The windows of her studio look out at the tall water tower on Rue Copernic. Just outside these, a tall Paulonia, princess tree, still lacks its leaves but is in flower. The long, light purple, funnel-shaped blossoms into whose cupids bow-shaped openings the bees descend, stand out markedly yet subtly against the pale blue of the spring sky. Conversation about the southern type, especially Ligurians and Gascons. Then about law and mysticism in religion. In mosques, the presence of the law is apparently obvious. I believe this is also true for synagogues. Finally, we spoke of expressions for fear and their nuances in different languages. Visited Ray de Macker in the evening. He returns to Paris now and then and lives on Rue Francoise. There, for a few minutes, I also saw Alfred Topfer, who has come back from Spain and is about to depart for Hanover. I asked him to look around for a little house on the heath for me near Thanson.26 Political discussions, then reminiscences about cellars and the old days of the nationalist movement. The clandestine meeting in Itchhoff in 1929 remains especially memorable. The history of these years with their thinkers, their activists, martyrs, and extras has not yet been written. In those days, we lived in the yoke of the Leviathan's egg. The Munich version 27, the slowest of them all, has now succeeded, and it has done so in the shoddiest possible way. My letters and papers from those years mention a host of people, people like Nikis, Hilscher, Ernst von Salomon, Kritz, and the recently deceased Albrecht Eric Gunter. All were men of great perception. The other players have been murdered, emigrated, are demoralized, or have higher ranking positions in the army, the intelligence branch, and the party. But those who are still alive will continue to enjoy discussing those days, people lived with a strong devotion to the idea. This is the way I imagine Robespierre and Aristotle making progress with my Bible reading and have begun the Book of Wisdom, of Solomon. Death has very different significance depending on whether it strikes the foolish man or the wise man. To the one it brings destruction, the other is purified and tested like gold in the furnace. His death is illusory, and having been a little chastised, they shall be greatly rewarded. 3 to 5. These words reminded me of the Leon Blois' nice observation, according to which death is less significant than we imagine, perhaps no more so than dusting off a piece of furniture. Paris. The 21st of April 1943 at midday, I had a visit from an old fellow from Lower Saxony, Colonel Shea. Discussed the situation. Still no olive branch. His debriefing included a description of the shooting of Jews that was horrifying. He got this from another colonel, I think it was Tipples Kirch, who had sent his army there to find out what was going on. Horror grips me when I hear such accounts and I am crushed by the sensation of overwhelming danger. I mean this in the general sense, and would not be amazed if the planet were to fly apart into fragments, whether from a collision with a comet or from an explosion. I really have the feeling that these people are probing the planet, and the fact that they choose the Jews as their primary victims cannot be a coincidence. Their highest ranking executioners have a kind of uncanny clairvoyance that is not the product of intelligence but of demonic inspiration. At every crossroads, they will find the direction that leads to greater destruction. Apparently, these shootings are going to stop because they have moved to a system of gassing their victims. Visited Gruel at midday. On the way, I again broke off one of the fresh leaves from the fig tree growing by the Church of the Assumption. 
This tree's annual budding has given me joy for three years now. It is among my favorite trees in this city. The second is the old pollarded acacia in the garden of the Palace of the Legion of Honor. Perhaps the third edition is the Paulonia in Benin's garden. Paris, the 22nd of April 1943 Breakfast with the Morands, Countess Paul Fee, Celine, Benoist Meshin also there. The conversation tended toward ominous anecdotes. Benoist Meshin told how his car had skidded on some ice, and he had crushed a woman against a tree as she was walking with her husband. He took the couple into his car to drive them to the field hospital and during the journey heard the man sobbing and groaning more than the woman. I hope you are not hurt too? No, but a pelvic fracture, that means at least three months in the hospital, what an expense! And what's more, who's going to cook for me all the time? The examination revealed that it was luckily only internal lesions but that the healing would still take eight weeks. After that time, the minister visited the woman to inquire about her health, and he found her wearing mourning. Her husband had died of some gastric complications in the meantime. When he tried to express his condolences, she responded, Oh please stop it. You don't know what joy you have brought me. We talked about the wives of prisoners of war as well. Just as the Trojan War has become the mythical model of every historical war, the tragedy of returning soldiers and the figure of Clytemnestra constantly recurred. A woman who hears that her husband is to be released from prison camp sends him a little parcel of delicacies as a love token. In the meantime, the man returns earlier than expected and discovers not only his wife but also her lover and two children. In the prisoner of war camp in Germany, comrades divide the contents of the parcel and four of them die after consuming the butter she had laced with arsenic. On this subject, Celine recounted anecdotes from his own medical practice, which seems to be studded with an array of gruesome cases. Incidentally, that he is a Breton explains my first impression that had led me to consign him to the Stone Age. He is just about to go visit the mass grave at Catin, now being exploited as propaganda. It stands to reason that such places attract him. Benoist Meshin walked with me on my way home. He is consumed by a demonic agitation. We carried on a conversation that has been repeated endlessly since the dawn of time, which type of display of power provides greater satisfaction? The practical, political form or the invisible, spiritual one? In the evening I read Cocteau's essay about the death of Marcel Proust, given to me by Maria Louise Bowski. It contains a sentence that graphically demonstrates the vast silence to which the dead descend. Il wire ignites silence qui esto silence scale tena bears some tail anchor. There reigns the silence that is to silence what darkness is to ink. I could not help thinking of Thomas Wolfe's terrifying description of a corpse in the New York subway. Paris, the 23rd of April 1943. Good Friday. Visit from Ischman this morning, who has come from Valerie. Discussion about dreams. Our conversation touched on things I thought it best not to pursue. It nonetheless gave me insights as if I were looking at myself in a crystal clear mirror. By the way, even the clearest mirrors are hazy, they possess a dream dimension. We enter into them, and they capture our aura. In the afternoon went to Quival de Viru du Faubourg Saint Honore. I tend to be late here, hourglass time controls this route. I made my way to Saint Philippe de Rule. The white chestnut blossoms with their tiny traces of red had fallen and now lay on the pavement in the courtyard like a frame of ivory and other precious materials. This gave a ceremonial quality to my entrance. Visited the chapel first, where a crucifix was on display. Then the church thronged with women. There I heard a good passion tide sermon. Great symbols renew themselves each day like the one showing human beings choosing the murder of Barabbas over the Prince of Light. Visited Valentina. Both brothers were the, as well as Ischman and Maria Louise. Discussion about Juan's novels chroniques maritals, the game of chess, insects, Valerie. Then visited the Doctor S in the company of Schlumberger. We had not seen each other since 1938. Paris, 
the 24th of April 1943 conference with Colonel Scher in the morning. I asked him once more whether I had remembered correctly that Tipplskirch had personally heard or seen details of the butchery he had told me about. He confirmed that for me. At times, these things oppress me like a nightmare, a diabolical dream. But it is necessary to view the evidence with the eyes of a physician and not to shrink from it. The general public insulates itself from such revelations. Some thoughts about the column stinkhorn mushrooms I examined yesterday in St. Rule. Despite their vigorous appearance, they are actually just dead bits, non space within space. By the same token, we too are just corpses in the flow of life. Not until death breaks us open do we gain life. In the evening, I read Titanon. Titan's 28 centimeter day by Friedrich Georg, then fell into a deep sleep as if induced by some mysterious narcotic. Paris, the 25th of April 1943, went to the boys in the afternoon. Strolled from Porti Dauphine as far as Autuil. Various types of balanini, acorn beetle, on the bushes. The creatures reminded me of my dream in Voroshilovsk.29 Then I wandered through unknown streets until I suddenly found myself in front of a large building on Quai Louis Bleriot, we once had a birthday party there for the little milliner on its seventh floor. Continued along the boulevard's exilmans. The the metro emerges as an elevated train. The enormous arches have a certain classical, ancient Roman feeling something decisive about them that differs from our architecture. People would live more agreeably in cities built on such a model. You encounter the Paulonia, the imperial tree, everywhere. It enhances this city as the exquisite grey of the buildings cloaks itself felicitously in its purple veils. Its trunks have an intrinsically stately architectural form, they resemble ceremonial candelabra flickering with gentle flames. What the flame tree is to Rio, the Paul only is to Paris. This comparison could also include the women. Visited Valentina, there I also saw the sculptor Jebhart, whose mother is in danger since his aunt disappeared without a trace. On the staircase, I met Princess Baryatinsky, who, along with Count Metternich, is caring for him. Metternich has given him asylum under the wing of the commander in chief. Walked back through the Tuileries, again, more Paul only and Judas trees too. Their blossoms shone like bunches of coral-colored grapes. A toothless old woman wearing thick makeup had carried two chairs into the bushes and waved invitingly at me with a grotesque smile. It was dusk, and this was a dreary sight. Back at the Raphael continued reading Titanon. I stride through the chapters as if through the ancient construction site of the world. I imagine the coming of the gods to be something like an arrival from other planets bathed in joyous radiance. While I was reading, I could occasionally picture Friedrich Georg smiling gently as he inclined his head slightly to examine pictures or flowers on our walks together. Paris, the 27th of April 1943 at the Morands for lunch, where I also met Abel Bart. I had them show me the picture of the Mexican goddess of the dead that Ischman had told me about and which Madame Morand keeps hidden in the half-light behind a screen in her large salon. It shows a cruel, fearsome idol of grey stone with numerous victims bleeding to death before it. Pictures like this are infinitely more intense, infinitely more real than any photograph. Discussion about the situation, then about Jide, whom Bard called Le Vieux Voltaire de la Pederasti the old Voltaire of pederasty. He went on to say that any literary movements, such as the ones that have formed around Jide, Baz, Moaras, and, Stefan, George, would soon consume themselves. He finds something inherently sterile in them resembling the rustling of barren wheat fields beneath the rays of an artificial star. By the time the sun sets, it has all passed and no fruit remains for it is all nothing more than pure emotion. Bard also accused Leon Bloy of having believed in a miracle that had been performed for his benefit, a quality I rather like. He also spoke of Galifet and about Rochford, whom he had known personally. He said that the latter left the impression of a short photographer. Talked about the Russians, 
who today are as overestimated as they were underestimated two years ago. In reality, they are more powerful than anyone thinks. It could be, however, that this power is not to be feared. This applies, incidentally, to any true, any creative power. The conversation engaged my general interest because able bod embodies a kind of positivistic intellectuality now almost defunct. For this reason, the somewhat muted, solarian character of his attributes are apparent, these have something both childlike and senescent about them in their sullenness. I sense that there are epicenters of this kind of thinking. To be sure, such conversations, like those with my own father, resemble time spent waiting in anterooms. Yet they reveal more than conversations with our visionaries and mystics. Paris, the 28th of April 1943, sent a letter to Friedrich Georg about his Titans. Also wrote about dreams in which our father appeared to us. My brother had written to me that he had seen him with me in a garden and noticed particularly that our father was wearing a new suit. At the Raphael in the evening with the Leipzig publisher Volkmar Frenzel, Leo, and Grew, the expert in international law from Berlin. From him, I gleaned details about the agonizing death of Aegu Diarus Sisantha. Continued my reading in the Wisdom of Solomon. The seventh chapter may be seen as a counterpart to the Song of Songs but on a more significant level. What was sensual desire there is spiritual here. There exists a spiritual lust. It remains inaccessible to those who spend their days only in the antechambers of the true life. Its glories are closed to them. Yet, and great pleasure it is to have her friendship, 818. Wisdom is here exalted as the highest independent human intelligence. It is the Holy Ghost that fills the cosmos with his universal presence. Even the boldest ways of the human mind lead not one step closer to it. Only when man purifies himself, when he makes an altar of his own breast, then wisdom enters into him unnoticed. Thus everyone may participate in the highest wisdom. It is cosmic, whereas intelligence is an earthly, perhaps a merely brutish power. We are more intelligent in our atoms than in our brains. It is remarkable that the sayings of Solomon incorporated the most extreme skepticism into Holy Writ. Whereas this book, so pervaded by a divine economy, is placed among the Apocrypha. Paris, the 30th of April 1943, the mail brought a letter from Helene Miranda about the worker. In it she calls the art of life the art of forcing other people to work while one enjoys oneself. The famous saying of Tolly Ranapakula du Srivivara, never knew the pleasure of life, 30 applied only to a tiny elite, which was not even particularly appealing. We all would have found the salons of Madame Dudif and or Madame Geoffrin stifling. These people had neither heart, nor wits, nor imagination and were ripe for death. What's more, they all died quite nicely. It is just a pity that Tolleyrand was able to crawl away from danger, on his belly. I am struck by the tough political flair of this woman, as well as the fascination and horror she arouses. There is some magic art in all this, especially a fiery will, which, in its brilliant light, calls forth the idols upon the roofs of alien temples licked by flames. I used to feel this too in response to Celeris. The real danger is not that people are playing with cards that decide the fates of thousands and their happiness. Rather, danger dwells in the decisions of individuals, in the way they stretch out their hands. That can reveal the demonic realm. Every one of us knows the moment of resolve when we silence all within us in order to take their sleep or to reach out. I have experienced this moment, albeit much more intensely, and this silence, though infinitely more profoundly, experienced it during particular encounters along my way. Demonic natures are accordingly more frightening when they are mute than when they speak in the midst of activity. Then I read a new issue of Zietzschicht, Contemporary History, edited by Traggart and Mainhart Sild. I don't take much pleasure in the fact that these essays draw their support from the worker, 